the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... waiting to fill your ears with the sounds of tomorrow. Some pessimists believe those sounds will be the blast of bombs and the roar of guns, the groans of suffering and the rattling chains of servitude. Personally, I take a happier view of the future, but in the story you're about to hear, those bombs have burst, those guns have roared, and the people have groaned. But this particular war of the future is over. And for Major John Gulliver of D Company Rocket Battalion, it is the beginning of a very strange sort of servitude. Our mystery story, Prisoner of the Machines, was written especially for Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars John Lithgow. There's a new object in the heavens, a new satellite in orbit. No, there's nothing unusual about that. Man has been hurtling strange metal debris into the skies for a hundred years now, in this year of our Lord, 2085. But look again. Put your highest powered telescope on the object because you've never seen one like it before. It appears to be a soap bubble, an iridescent, transparent globe. But There's something inside it. A human being. Because this, my friends, is the first experimental model of an orbital solitary station for prisoner correction. Punishment and isolation. The man inside this orbiting prison is Major John Gulliver. And Major Gulliver has nothing else to do but think. I don't know when I stopped counting the orbits. All I can do is lie against the smooth dome of my bubble prison and drift with the cosmos. My food and water tubes float about my head like friendly, mocking snakes. Some while back, I had decided to refuse their blandishments, to let hunger shrivel my stomach and thirst blacken my tongue, to cheat my jailers by dying in their death-proof cell. But the snakes had floated and coiled and mocked at my noble intentions, knowing that sooner or later I would clutch them fiercely in a loving embrace. I would eat and drink until I was sated and sick with self-disgust and fall back panting against my prison wall and sleep like the miserable, unloved infant I had become. No. No. I couldn't die. They wouldn't let me. It was against the code of my jailers. A law more inflexible than any written for humanity since the days of Moses. But of course, my jailers weren't human. I thought back to my first glimpse of him. Major, if... If we give ourselves up, what's going to happen? We'll be interned, Private. We'll sit out the war in a prison camp. I'm afraid, Major. I I can't help it. I'm afraid of them. The Max. There's there's something horrible about them. It's all in the way you look at it. You think a refrigerator is horrible? A washing machine? Because that's all they are. Machines. Yeah, that's what scares me. The idea of a a refrigerator or or a washing machine with, with the power of life or death... We were taken prisoner anyway. Every last survivor of Company D Rocket Battalion. And the Max, with characteristic efficiency, integrated our forlorn and splintered unit into a larger body of prisoners heading north. There were 18 of us assigned to the transport D-85. 
including the two Mac guards. And for a while, a rumor persisted that we were heading for the moon base itself. It wasn't true, of course. Our destination was the uncharted asteroid they called Prison One. But the rumor excited us, because it would have been the first time any of us had come face to face with the enemy on the moon. Since our outfit had been organized, we had fought nothing but Max, and never even seen a rebel. Sometimes it was hard to believe they existed at all, even if the War Department bulletins still talked about rebel ships and rebel losses. But it had been a long time since we had heard official word about anything. Major, can I talk to you? Uh, of course, Morley. You don't have to whisper. The Max can't hear us from here. Oh, I don't know about that. For all we know, they got superhuman hearing. Now, what's the difference? You're not plotting to take over the ship, are you? Oh, I, I tell you, Major, a, a couple of the guys were wondering, see. Henderson there, he, he's got a pilot's license. Oh, for what? A space buggy? You think you could pilot a transport this size? If we could get it away from our two friends up in the control room. Yeah, but that's it. There are only two of them. For sure. Neither one of those Macs could blast us all into talcum powder in one second flat. You know something, Major? I've never seen a Mac so close before. They look exactly alike, don't they? And they all look alike. They all came from the same cookie cutter. You know what Corporal Clyburn calls them? Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> Funny man, the Corporal. Still, the, the things I hear, Major... Is it true that, that they eat human flesh? They're nothing but mechanical weapons, like tanks or artillery. But they think, Major. They figure things out. I hear they're smarter than we are. Uh, then how come the rebels had to retreat to the moon base? We're beating them, Private. We're beating them good. That's why the Max are taking prisoners now. The rebels are adhering to the old Geneva Convention rules, paving the way for leniency in case they get licked. And they will be soon. Hey, thanks, Major. You, you make me feel better. I'm glad I made him feel better. But I didn't. Because no matter what happened in the war on Earth and the moon, we were heading for an asteroid to a prison camp we knew nothing about. Run by android machines. I tried to remember when I first saw a Mac. I'd never even heard of them until the night the Army Transport Hornet had been blown up during blast-off from the moon's Taika Brahe station. The charge of sabotage and the subsequent confession by Kukura, the mad fanatic, was branded by the Independent Party of Indasia as a frame-up, an excuse to outlaw them. For the first time since the world had finally united under one system of law, there was talk of war. Nobody was really alarmed. The Indasians were famous for their robot industry, but they were all made for domestic purposes. They looked human, and they were gentle, useful machines designed to do the dirty jobs humans no longer wanted to do. But suddenly there was a different breed of android coming out of Indasian factories. The Max. Mechanical brutes, impervious to cold, hunger, fatigue, despair, and homesickness. We saw headless Max charging our lines blindly. Armless Max, unable to hold weapons, lumbering along obedient to their programmed destiny. There were officer Max, with minds trained in the arts of battle, commanding their battalions with cold logic that made no allowances for human weakness. There were engineer Max, programmed to repair damage to their mechanisms. And now it seemed there were prison camp Max. And we were their first prisoners. Seatbelts, please. We will make landfall on prison asteroid one in ten minutes. Seatbelts, please. Prison asteroid one might have been a prison compound in any country, in any war. The muddy grounds were filled with prisoners and their non-human guards. There were to be 1,400 of us on that grim rock where no walls or fences were needed to contain us all. 
camp looked like a model of military penal institutions. The 26 neatly spaced barracks, a processing station, a mess hall, and administration buildings. There was a great complex that housed the oxygen-producing machinery, the hydroponic food factory, machine shops, spaceships' hangars. An intricate system of scanners covered every inch of the place, sending information back to the computer called SCAMP. SCAMP. Scanning, control, and movement of prisoners. Machines. Lousy bunch of bolts. Maybe they can fight, but they can't outthink us. Can you, Major? Well, maybe not. But we are the prisoners, Private. Yeah, but not for long. Not for me, anyway. Attention! All prisoners will file by counter A. Take one PSC and slap it about his wrist. Repeat. Prisoners will take one PSC from counter and slap about wrist. Prisoners failing to wear their PSC at all times will be turned off. Turned off? Do they mean killed, Major? I guess that's what they mean. So you wear that thing, Private. Yeah, but what is a PSC? Personal speaker command, so the Macs can deliver their commands to us individually or collectively. Prisoners will remove clothing and place in disposal bin. Prisoners will then pass through disinfection room and receive clothing ration. Any prisoner causing unnecessary delay will be turned off. in the clothing room that I had my first disillusion about Mac efficiency. The prison uniform, consisting of fatigues, socks, thick leather shoes, a cap, and a field jacket, came in only one size. Wrong. When we emerged from the processing area, we filed past a Mac who was handing out barrack assignments from a clipboard list. The system was simple. I was sent to barrack G, along with Galwest, Grady, Gunnarsson, Gruber and every other prisoner whose name began with G. The system, however, had a flaw which never occurred to the mechanical brains of the Max. Barracks G had accommodations for some 150 prisoners, but there were less than 60 of us whose names began with G. Barracks S, on the other hand, was overflowing with prisoners, some 400 of them, milling about the bunks and wondering what to do. The situation was so ludicrous that I felt like laughing. But I was sobered up when I met Sergeant Zilkowski. And the pudgy little man grabbed my arm and babbled. <laughs> They're putting me by myself, Major. They're sticking me in a barracks all by myself. Take it easy, Zilkowski. It's just temporary. They'll straighten it all out. But they won't. You know the max, Major. Once I get an idea in their heads, once I, they've been programmed, they don't change. Well, they'll have to. When they see what's happening, it's... I'll be all alone. Just because my name begins with Z. I won't have anybody to talk to. You've got to help me, Major. You've got to do something. So I tried to do something about it. I stuck my neck out. And that was the beginning of it. And here I am, floating in space. In the loneliest prison cell in history. And the worst part of the whole thing is that it was all my idea. A prisoner in orbit. That definitely comes under the heading of cruel and unusual punishment. But what can you expect from a machine? Anyone who's ever lost money in a vending machine or stalled their car on a freeway knows that machines can be tricky and temperamental and turn against you at any minute. But how will Major John Gulliver and the prisoners of the asteroid deal with their machinery problems? We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Two. Major John Gulliver, prisoner of war, circles the asteroid in his strange bubble prison and thinks back to the moment when he first came into conflict with his captors, the machine men known as the Max. Major Gulliver wasn't the highest ranking officer in the prison compound, but he must have been the most nervous officer among them when he was finally given audience with an android who wore silver bars on his artificial shoulders. 
Major Gulliver, my name is Captain 174-B. I am Adjutant 2, General 6, Commanding Officer of Prison 1. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Our CO has asked me to discuss an assignment with you, Major. Wait a moment, Captain. I came here to discuss a problem. Yes, Major, we received your request through proper channels. But as a result of studying your records, we discovered something about your past which is of particular interest to General Six. What do you mean? The profession in which you were engaged before the war. You were a psychologist, correct? Yes, I was college-trained, University of Mental Sciences, then computer instructor at the Hayward Teaching Center. Frankly, we believe you may be useful in helping us make an adjustment to our responsibility. This is our first prison camp, you know. And we are anxious to conduct it along satisfactory lines. Don't you have any reb... any invasion advisors? No. The camp is entirely in the hands of the android auxiliary. And what do you want me to do? Why, help us to understand our prisoners, to run an effective, trouble-free institution. Fine. If you want my advice, let's start with your crazy alphabet system. No, no, you Major. Know. We do not wish your advice. We are satisfactorily programmed. We merely wish your help in interpreting prisoner behavior to us when it does not track properly with previous data. You understand? If you're asking me to be a spy... Nothing like that. We will plant spies, of course. That is in the manual. All we ask of you is to be our official prison psychologist. Captain! What is it, Private? I gave instructions. A guard has been attacked by a prisoner. The man was subdued and they await your orders. Turn him off. Now, wait a minute, Captain. You wish to say something, Major? Yes, I thought your camp was programmed under the rules of the Geneva Convention. What is your point, Major? Well, the man has to have a fair hearing, a trial. You don't even know the circumstances. Very well, Major. Bring in the prisoner. Yes, sir. In here. Clybourne. What the devil are you doing here, Major? Oh, what did you do, Corporal? Oh, I jumped one of those lousy machines. That's what I did. He stuck his gun into my back and I jumped him. I wasn't moving fast enough for him. You admit to this assault? Sure, I admit it. You're really a fool, Corporal. Major, is that sufficient hearing for you? Private, you will take this prisoner outside and turn him off. Wait, you can't just kill him? Not if you don't want a riot on your hands? Kill him. Who said we wished him killed? Major, we do not kill prisoners. That is unthinkable. The manual strictly forbids us to kill humans in prison camp. But still, we must punish uncooperative prisoners. That is our order, too. You must tell us how to solve this contradiction, Major. Well, there's no contradiction. If you want to punish a prisoner, do what is done in human prisons. Put us in solitary confinement for a term. Deny us the company of our fellow prisoners. Believe me, that's punishment enough, Captain. Ask Sergeant Zolkowski. Very well. What you say seems logical. I will put the question to our commanding officer, General Six. You are dismissed, Major. <laughs> went back to my barracks and told everyone, everyone whose name began with G, the good news. The Max had been programmed not to kill their human prisoners, except in self-defense or during escape attempts. I told them about my suggestion of solitary confinement as a punishment, that it seemed like the easiest sort of penalty. Captain 174-B sold the idea to his commanding officer, but it wasn't the solitary I had in mind. Gentlemen, your attention, please. Colonel Drummond, Major Gulliver, you and your fellow officers have been asked here to witness the first experimental model of Prison One's orbital solitary station for prisoner correction, punishment, and isolation. Your comments, please. You mean that... Bubble is an orbital satellite? That is correct. Surely you don't intend to send our men into orbit. It's your cruelty. Captain, you told me that you were proscribed against taking human life. Surely mu you, you must know that n no one could live in a thing like that. Incorrect. Prisoners will be supplied with oxygen, food, 
water, and waste disposal facilities in solitary orbit for the duration of their sentence. Your comments, please. How long do you think a man can survive in one of these things? We have consulted our commander, and our information is that a human can survive 28 Hundred asteroidal orbits with the oxygen, food, and water supply provided. Twenty-eight hundred orbits? That's almost three months. Your commanding officer is wrong. He is not allowed for the mental and emotional strain of such imprisonment. There is nothing in the manual concerning mental or emotional strain. You are a psychologist, Major. Such things are a matter of individual human response, are they not? Your comments, please. I say you can't do this. A man would be better off dead than in one of these things. Impossible. We cannot allow prisoners uh, to die. Captain, I am the highest ranking officer in this camp. I demand a personal talk with your superior. Impossible. The commander has no communications mechanism with humans. Such an interface would have been superfluous. What? General Six is a computer, Colonel. Don't you understand? Oh, good Lord. That is correct. General Six is a computer, and he does not interfere with humans. The sentence will now be carried out. Prisoner 110, Corporal R. Clybourne, will be launched into orbit at 0900. Colonel, you will order all your men to fall out and observe punishment. true, is it? They're not really going to do it. One thing about the Max, Private. They tell no lies. I've heard talk around. I mean, some of the guys are saying that, that it was your fault. They say you're soft on the Max, that you suggested the bubble. What do you think, Private? Oh, gee, I don't know. It's just that... Well, Major, you just accept them too damn easy. Well, we've got to accept machines. We accept them all our lives, don't we? Don't you trust the mechanism of your car, your air sled, your house power plant? You can't get angry at levers, gears, integrated circuits. Who can't? I can do it, Major. I can do it easy. So, why can't you? For 11 weeks, we watched the bubble spin over our heads. A tiny gleaming new star containing Corporal Ronald Clybourne or what was left of him. Then, weary of its monotonous journey, the bubble returned, braked by its single retro rocket. It landed undamaged, and they brought Clybourne back to Prison One, singing, singing at the top of his lungs. He didn't stop singing until he died, two weeks later, in an accidental fall in the hospital ward. I'll say one thing for the Max. Their own psychology wasn't bad. There was no more trouble on prison asteroid one. But there was something else. Talk about escape. Oh, come in, Major. Sit down. You're the only man on this rock who seems to understand that the Max are only the tools of the rebels. And we're wrong to direct our aggression against them. There's only one sensible course now. We've got to play it cool. Keep out of trouble. Wait till the war is over. Although, of course, we are duty-bound to escape if we can. Escape? It's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> escape from an asteroid, heaven knows where in the universe. Even if a prisoner got past Scamp, there's no place to go. No, Major. There's no use bothering about escape talk. But the men are bothering. What? It's true. That's all they're talking about. Didn't you know? No. No, I didn't. But it has to stop. We have to issue an order. <laughs> you can't order them to stop talking. I'm commanding officer, Major. That's what I intend to do. And that's what he did. Colonel Drummond lined up the men, eight ranks deep, and read them the riot act. He outlined the futility of escape talk, the impossibility of a return to Earth before the end of the war. When he dismissed them, 
he had a separate talk with the officers, emphasizing that it was our duty to report any escape plan to him. Remember, the Max are prescribed against killing prisoners, but they're also programmed to prevent escapes. They won't have any compunction against killing if it occurs during an escape attempt. But three weeks later came the J escape. It was called the J escape for obvious reasons. Only the occupants of J barracks were involved, led by Lieutenant Lamar Jackson. One evening, an hour before lockup, Jackson had noticed that a scanner beam on the north side of the compound, near the hangars where the spaceships were kept, failed to follow him as he crossed its path. And Jorgensen, a computer engineer, slipped out one night and examined the defective scanner. It was then that he realized they could abort the scamp system for a period of at least two hours. Jackson organized the actual escape. His idea was simple. To get his men to the hangars and spaceships and hold the ships as ransom for their release. If the Max failed to agree, the ships would be destroyed. It was a desperate gamble, of course. And the first part of their plan worked. The Max had no provision in their manual for an inoperative scan. It was supposed to work, period. General Six probably blew a dozen fuses that night as the prisoners of Jade Barracks smashed their way into the spaceship hangars like a gang of hoodlums crashing a party. But the party was over in one terrible instant. Because when they entered the hangars, there were no spaceships. Every transport had been dismantled. The hangars were empty. With the camp filled to capacity, the machine minds of the Max assumed they had no further need for space vehicles. And now we knew why Prison One was truly escape-proof. Because our guards were prisoners, too. Obviously, there is no escape from Prison Asteroid One. Not even the infamous Devil's Island could boast the security of this prison camp. But never underestimate the ingenuity of desperate men or the perversity of machines. We'll learn more about both when we return shortly with Act Three. Fourteen men died in the escape from Barracks J. Fourteen prisoners named Johnson, Jacobs, Jorgensen, James, and so forth. But four men were taken alive by the android guards and faced the punishment of the bubble. The terrible three-month isolation in space, which no one had yet survived with their minds all in one piece. But one of them, Lieutenant Lamar Jackson, did survive his three-month imprisonment. And his first visitor in the prison hospital was Major John Culliver. Can you talk about it, Lieutenant? Can you tell me how it was out there? It was dark, Major. Dark and full of nightmares. But you made it. You're a tough guy, Lieutenant. The whole camp's proud of you. You've got to be very still. You can't move around in that thing. Every, every little move spins you around, changes the axis. You get disoriented every few seconds. And then, then you start getting ideas that you're not alone. That something is outside the bubble, trying to get in. It's okay, Lieutenant. You don't have to tell me anymore. But, but then you get the worst nightmare that, that the thing that was outside is now inside. That it's touching you. That's when it really gets bad. I understand. You tell, you tell the boys to stay out of trouble, Major. Stay out of trouble. Stay out of the bubble. The lieutenant was crying. And his tears made me determined to keep anyone else out of that damned bubble. But the escape talk went on. One afternoon, a committee of three men came to see me. Two shaved tail lieutenants and a captain. We're crashing out, Major. You're doing what? We figure the only way to do it is en masse. The whole camp. Now, we need a leader, and we think you're it. That is, uh, 
if you've changed your mind about being reasonable with these beauties. Well, have you? You're a fool, Captain. Well, maybe so. And I don't think much of you either, uh, sir. But you have got something we need. You've got the ear of the Max. Tell me how you plan to escape from an asteroid. Without ships? We don't plan to. Now, our idea is to overcome the Max and take control of the entire prison. Now, once we have the facilities, we think we can build a radio transmitter powerful enough to beam a message to Earth and request aid. I see. And just how do you plan to overcome the Max? We fight. Ah. Uh, well, we outnumber them, don't we? We attack a group of them, take away as many weapons as we can, and attack the rest. Some of us live. Some of us die. If enough of us survive, we get off of this rock. We wouldn't have a chance. What we need is organization, a strategy, a, a battle plan. We need somebody to pull this whole thing together. This is a job offer, Major. Captain, don't you realize the odds are a thousand to one? Why do it? Why can't you sit it out? The war's almost over. Why get killed now? We think the war is over, Major. What? Wilcox here is a radio man. Now, a couple of months ago, we asked the Max permission to build a receiving station. They agreed, under one condition, that we receive only broadcasts from the moon and the vicinity. And the rebels. Well, we didn't get much. A few faint signals from space traffic, and they hear the propaganda broadcasts. Now, they had some pretty good music sometimes, but then the music stopped. Everything stopped. Well, maybe your set went on the blink. No, 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 it was fine. They're just not sending signals from the moon anymore, Major, and I think it's because the war is over. Captain, can you make that receiving station more powerful? Sure. We had the parts. Well, maybe I can get the parts. I got the parts without much trouble. The Max had no objections about receiving stations, only transmitters. I made promises about prisoner cooperation and got the material that helped us build a receiver with three times the capacity of the original. But we heard nothing from the moon base. Nothing at all. And then... It, it's Morse, Major. It's good old Morse language. It's got to be from an Earth vehicle. We're coming from where? The vicinity of the moon. It has to be. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And I can make out a little... There's something about a delivery, a uh, provision. Provision. Major, that isn't a military vehicle. It's a commercial vessel. They're delivering provisions to the moon base. Oh, Lord. An Earth ship heading for the moon. And it's true. They have given up. The war is over. Colonel, it's the truth. The war is over. It's been over for months. And yet we're still prisoners of the Mac. How do you know this? We picked up radio talk from Earth. The moon base doesn't exist anymore. Neither does the invasion army. They're all gone. Wiped out to the last man. All right, all right. Let's say that's true. In due course, the Max will disband prison one and return our men to Earth. Really? Who'll give them orders, Colonel? Don't you understand? Their masters are gone. The Max won't do it on their own. They're programmed to run a prison camp, period. They'll never let us go. I don't believe that, Major. But, but the men believe it. That's more important. That's why they're planning a massive uprising. They can't do that. It's suicidal. That's what it amounts to, yes. Well, we can't let that happen, Major. It's our responsibility to keep these men alive. Fine. Only how do we stop it? There's only one way. We can tell the Max. Are you crazy? They'll have the ringleaders in those bubbles before the day is out. It's not too high a price. I'm going to them right now. Colonel, wait. Don't try to stop me, Major. Colonel, something just struck me. The way you've been taking all this. The way you've been taking all your responsibilities. You don't look one bit different. No gray hairs, no lines on your face. Nothing. Let go of my arm, Major. What's in this arm, Colonel? Bones and muscles and blood? Or steel rods and wires and lubricating oil? Go! Help! Help! Somebody! Good morning.
morning, Major. How are you feeling? I'm fine, considering your guards took half my head off. Your head is all in one piece, Major. You may take my word for it. The worst damage was self-inflicted when you tried to strike Colonel Drummond. You mean Android Drummond, don't you? How did you discover the secret? It was our belief that the Colonel was a fine humanoid specimen indetectable from the real thing. Uh, He looked human, all right. He just didn't act human. (sighs) Well, what time does the balloon go up? I beg your pardon. I expect my bubble is waiting for me. There will be no punishment, Major Gulliver. In destroying our secret agent, you merely acted in the interest of your men. Incidentally, you are now the highest ranking officer among the prisoners. The war is over, Captain. I've told you that a thousand times. We still have no such information. We cannot release the prisoners without a direct order. But you can't get any orders from the moon base. They're all gone. Commanding Officer General Six will receive the instructions. Until then, we go on as we have. I want to see him. I want to see your commanding officer. General Six does not interface with humans. I'm not just a human. I'm the highest ranking officer, remember? I insist, Captain, and if I'm denied, you won't get any more cooperation from me. You can send me up in the bubble for the rest of my life. Very well, Major. I will arrange for you to see General Six. brought into the majestic presence of General Six by a brace of Mac soldiers and Captain 174B. I had never seen a Mac computer before, and it was an awesome sight. General Six required a housing of several thousand square feet, and he, I mean it, towered to a height of 16 feet. The room it occupied was eerily lit by its own diodes. That was the only illumination, since the Max, requiring no light sensors for vision, didn't use artificial lighting. Captain 174B himself stood at the console control board, his fingers poised lightly over the keyboard. Very well, Major. You may ask your question of the commander. Ask it. Ask him. If he has any means of contacting Invasion Supreme Headquarters. The answer is yes. Ask him if he can make such contact now. The answer is no. (laughs) Ask him if he knows why this contact is no longer possible. The answer is yes. Contact is no longer possible because of destruction of moon base and annihilation of all Indian forces, bringing an end to hostilities. You see, it's true. Now, ask General Six if he will issue orders for the immediate release and transportation to Earth of his prisoners. The answer is... Prison One will be maintained until orders to the contrary are received directly from Supreme Headquarters, according to Section 5 of the manual. But that's insane. The war's over. Finished. There is no Supreme Headquarters. The audience is over, Major. Didn't you hear his reply? The war is over. Your masters are dead. You don't have any reason to keep us here. Let's wait for instructions from Headquarters, Major. Please obey my order and leave. (laughs) Failure to comply will place you in jeopardy of punishment. You can't keep us here for the rest of our lives. No. Look out. Don't let him grab that rifle. Stand back. Major, don't be foolish. You can't kill us. I won't kill you all, Captain. Just your commanding officer. And so, I was condemned to my dark little prison where I flirted with the cosmos for three long months. And when I came down, I was insane. I must have been insane. Because when the bubble landed, I saw the Max standing about like so many statues. And their human prisoners roaming about free and unfettered and exhilarated. I saw 
faces smiling at me, laughing. I hadn't heard the sound of laughter in years. There could only be one explanation. I was mad. No, Major, no. You're okay. We're all okay. But what happened? It was only a week after the launch, you see. The Macs were going nuts trying to repair the damage to their mechanical commanding officer. But they didn't know how. They got so desperate they called in some of our guys, see, computer engineers, just to help them. Well, our guys went to work, all right. They rigged General Six to give one order. The only one that mattered. Turned off. They were told to turn themselves off. That's it, Major. We turned them off. We pulled out the plug of the machines. <laughs> and now Wilcox is rigging up a transmitting station big enough to contact Earth. Hey, we're going home. <laughs> I did go home. I got married and had three children and no robot servants. Not for a while, anyway. Eventually, my wife convinced me I was being foolish and we purchased two domestic robots. One a superb cook and children's nurse. The other a hard-working general housekeeper. <laughs> I named them Laurel and Hardy. And someday... I might even stop being afraid of them. And so Major John Gulliver and his men are back on Earth. Back where it all began. Will machines one day destroy us? Of course not. We can handle them. Or can we? I'll be back shortly. wise man once said, one machine can do the work of 50 ordinary men, but no machine can do the work of one extraordinary man. We think that's going to be true in the future as it has been in the past. The question is, what will the machines think now that we've given them brains? We may well be entering the age when man's own inventions will be in conflict with man himself. Our cast included John Lithgow, Ian Martin, Earl Hammond, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. about this whole setup. I don't know. Emery. What? Look. It's him. Come on. No wonder he didn't answer us, Chuck. You mean 
That's right. He's dead. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Dance of the Devil Dolls. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Have you heard of avoutement? Literally, the word means face image. The practice of avoutement is as ancient as Egypt and Assyria, and still found from Ceylon to the United States, Europe to Africa, South America to Scandinavia. A figure is made to resemble that of a hated enemy, then methodically injured or destroyed, resulting in pain and death for its human counterpart. Charles and I had gone up for a weekend of fishing. Saturday night at dusk, when the sky had dulled from blue to gray, and the gray was shading darker every minute, we were walking back up to the cabin. Not a bad haul, huh, Emery? For you, not for me. I'll bet you the smallest of those three bass weighs over four pounds. What bait were you using? A spoon. Fish just wouldn't leave it alone. Anyway, we'll have a good fish dinner tonight. And maybe tomorrow my luck will change. Well, I hope so. What time is it? About nine. We've been out five hours. Chuck. Yeah? There's someone coming down the trail towards us. Where? Oh, yes, I see. You can't be going down to fish this late. Oh, well, we can't tell. Some guys really get the bug. There's a guy I know named Lloyd Erskine who will fish off... Excuse or... me, gentlemen. He means us. I wonder what he wants. Excuse me, gentlemen. I lost something. I wonder if you found it. <laughs> I don't know what you're looking for, mister, but we haven't found it, whatever it is. Perhaps you saw it lying on the ground. It was a doll. A doll? Yes, about 12 inches tall. It looks something like... like me. I'm sorry, we haven't seen it. Of course, you can always buy your daughter It doesn't belong to my daughter. Oh. Well, we haven't seen it. Are you staying at a cabin on this lake? Yes. Only until tomorrow night. It's right at the head of the trail up there. You must have passed it as you started down. If by any chance you do come across it, I'll stop in before I leave this area, if you don't mind. Well, that's perfectly all right. Thank you, gentlemen. I must have the doll for the dance tonight. Or the old woman will be angry. Well, what do you make of that? Search me. He talked so strangely. I must have the doll for the dance tonight, or the old woman will be angry. <laughs> I think he's off his rocker. Well, it's not our worry, Henry. Come on, let's go. We went back up to our cabin, cleaned the fish, and had one of those fish dinners you talk about for years. It was about 11 o'clock, and we'd started to go to bed, intending to get up as early as possible the next morning when there was a knock on the door. I wonder who that is. I don't know, but we'll soon find out. Oh, it's you. Yes. May I come in? Of course. I see you found the doll. Yes. I wanted to let you know that I had. Well, thanks for telling us. Now I must take him to the dance. Well, the dance ought to be just about over. Oh, no, it it hasn't begun yet. Well, you'd better get there or your wife will be angry. You misunderstood me. I said the old woman, not my wife. You see, I'm not married. Oh. I hope you'll forgive me. I see that you're just about ready to retire, but I'm afraid. Afraid? Of what? The old woman is already angry with me. I told her I'd lost the doll, and she swore that if I didn't find it, she'd kill me. That's why I've come to you. If you hear that I'm dead tomorrow, that I committed suicide, you'll know it's not the truth. If I could only get in touch with Dr. George Kaltman... He could help, but I'm caught up in something I can't stop, and it's too late to get out now. I've tried to... Oh! Oh! My head! You dropped your doll. I didn't drop it. She caused it to move. She doesn't want me to talk. I've said too much already. I must go now. Here's your doll. Thank you. Remember what I told you. If I'm dead tomorrow, it's murder. Good night, gentlemen. After he dropped the doll. Did you get a good look at him, Chuck? Yeah. The doll hit the floor on its forehead. 
A few seconds later, there was a heavy bruise on the right side of his forehead. You know, he said if he was found dead tomorrow, that it would be murder. It was about 11.30 when we finally got to bed. We'd opened the windows of the cabin... The sound of the alarm clock we brought with us mingled with that of the crickets outside. The old woman said you must die. I heard something. I didn't know what it was. It sounded strangely like words, but they were uttered in a voice so tiny and shrill that I thought I was imagining things. But then, I heard his voice. No! No, I won't die! That'll help me! Emery, I didn't know you were awake. I couldn't sleep. I thought I heard a tiny little voice. I thought I... Quiet! Hey, go! Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Charles and I had retired for the night, but neither of us could sleep. Suddenly, from outside, we heard the voice of the man we'd met earlier, and another voice, high and shrill, and somehow deadly. The old woman will take care of them, too. But I'm not going to die! I'm not going to... Ah! What's going on out there? We'd better take a look. There's a pair of pants and some shoes, huh? Remember what he said about dying? Yeah. You ready? Yes. All right, let's go beginning to think that guy belongs in an institution. Maybe. Maybe not. I think his scream came from the left. I'll take a look over there, then. He didn't tell us his name, did he? No. Well, I'll try calling him. Anybody out here? Hello? Anyone out here? You don't think... I don't know what to think, Chuck. We'd better take a good look around. There's something strange about this whole setup. I don't know it. Emery. What? Look. It's him. Come on. No wonder he didn't answer us, Chuck. You mean... That's right. He's dead. That little doll that looks so much like him. I don't see it any way around. Neither do I. You know, Chuck, it sounds crazy to say it. But that shrill, high little voice we heard... You're letting this thing run wild with your imagination, Emery. Even though it looked like him, it's just a doll, nothing else. It had to be my imagination, of that I was sure. But the mere thought of it, of the doll which so resembled the man with its shining face and beady little eyes, caused a strange sense of apprehension and fear to come across me. And I glanced out into the darkness and saw only the lumbering shadows of the trees and heard the rustle of their leaves as they brushed together. I saw nothing. Yet I had the feeling that something with beady little eyes was watching us. We notified the authorities They came out Found no evidence of foul play And diagnosed his death as being caused by heart failure Our luck was exceptionally bad out on the lake Sunday And we drove home that night Speaking but little Thinking only of what had happened the night before About ten days after we returned to the city Both Charles and I were home one evening we shared an apartment together, and that night neither of us had anything to do. We were playing gin rummy. One more hand like that and you'll be out, you lucky dog. It was pure skill, my friend. No luck involved. Cut? No, I trust you. It's a good thing Pamela stood you up tonight. She knew that you wanted a gin partner. <laughs> Don't be humorous. Proposed to her yet? No, but I'm uh, working on it. You know, you deal like a card shark. I have nothing but... Expecting anyone? No, you. Mm -mm. Well, I'll see who it is. Whoever it is, get rid of him. I got a good hand. Coming right up. Is this the residence of Mr. Emery Ryerson and Mr. Charles Hunter? Yes, it is, but... I have a package for you. Are you expecting a package, Emery? Just bills, no packages. It's for both of you. All right, I'll take it. Thank you. 
And good evening, sir. Oh, yes, yes, good evening. There's an old woman. She had a package for us. Well, set it down on the table and open it, man. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. So I'll open it. It's wrapped very well. Maybe it's a bottle of scotch. Who is be sending us a bottle of... Someone has a real fine sense of humor. It's like the doll that fellow had with him. It's the same doll. Notice that little nick out of its forehead? That happened when he dropped it on the floor. What are we going to do with it? I don't know. We can keep it, I suppose. Well, let's get back to the game. No, I'm not in the mood now. You know, Emory, I can't help but remember what he said. The man who died? Yes. He said, I must have the doll for the dance tonight. Or the old woman will be angry. Yes, that's right. What brought that back to your mind? The woman who delivered this package. We put the lid back on the box and left it on the kitchen table with the cards we'd been using. Neither of us entered the kitchen again that evening. We went to bed a short time after 12. Again, I was restless and couldn't sleep. I had the same feeling I'd had that night in the cabin. And I remembered the words I'd heard spoken in that unearthly little voice. The old woman will take care of them, too. And I wondered if I'd only imagined those words, or whether they had actually been uttered by the creature in the box in the other room. It was then I heard it, like a thin, reedy piping. It sounded like music, a rhythmic, discordant melody I'd never heard before. And then, I heard another sound. Henry? Yes? Am I going crazy? I hear it, too. I think we'd better see what it is. All right. I don't like this, Emery. It sounds like... I know like... what it sounds like. Emery. No. I can't believe my eyes. The box is open. And the little doll, Emery. It's moving. It's dancing on the table. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Charles and I couldn't believe our eyes, for the scene before us was as bizarre and fantastic as the wildest dream of an insane imagination. It's moving. It's dancing on the table. Yes, I see it. This is something that... I'm going to destroy that thing. Be careful. Look out, Chuck. It's running. I'm going to get it if it's the last thing I do. It's running over toward the window. It's gone. It's gone through the glass. Maybe it's down there on the sidewalk. It's possible, but that's a two-story drop. I can't see it. No, Emery. It's gone. They turned again to the old woman. The man who had died had mentioned a name that night in the cabin. The name of Dr. George Kaltman. Now it came back into my mind. Kaltman was associated with occult research. If Kaltman could have helped the man who died, perhaps he could explain what was happening to us. We got in touch with him and made an appointment for the following evening. You have told me everything that has happened. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yes, everything. We'd like to know what it all means. Well, I shall explain it to you as best I can. Have either of you ever heard of envoûtement? No. Not that I recall. Well, envoûtement is the practice of making little dolls to resemble a hated enemy and then methodically injuring or destroying it, thus bringing about either pain or death or both in the doll's human counterpart. Dr. Colton, this doll we saw last night, it, it moved, it danced. I know. What you witnessed last night was the dance of the devil dolls. You say these dolls bring about pain or death, Dr. Kaufman. Why should we be singled out? The man who died told you about the old woman. Is that not correct? Yes. Therefore, you must be destroyed. She feels that you are dangerous to her, that you know too much. Undoubtedly, the woman you saw last night, Mr. Hunter, was the manipulator, controller of the little figures. Since you saw her, she has probably made little figures of both of you. 
But before it will live and be subject to her will, she must have a part of you, a lock of your hair, a fingernail clipping, anything that will make yours and the doll's identity one and the same. What should we do? Go back to your apartment. I shall return with you. She will send the little doll back to your apartment tonight. I'm sure of that. We must capture the doll, for it is the only thing that will lead us to her. Kaltman, Charles, and I returned to our apartment and took up our vigil in the bedroom, for that was the place the doll and the old woman would expect us to be. We made dummies of the extra blankets and arranged the bed so it looked as if we were sleeping. You left the apartment door unlocked? Yes. But why? It only makes it easier for it to enter. That is what we must do. One way or the other, the doll would find means of entrance. If not tonight, then another. You have no idea what those little creatures are capable... Listen. It is coming. Be quiet. Wait until it is in here. Then close the bedroom door and put on the lights. We understand. Now. This doll will lead us to the doll woman. You mean now? Tonight? Yes, Mr. Ryerson. She will know that we have captured her little messenger if it does not return in a few hours, and she will be prepared to stop us. We must find her, destroy her if need be, before she has a chance to destroy you. Then began one of the strangest sights I've ever seen. Kaltman took the doll out of the box in which we'd imprisoned it, tied its arms and legs while it writhed and twisted in his hand. Then he began speaking to it, softly, rhythmically, slowly putting it into a hypnotized sleep. The eyelids of the little figure finally closed, and it was in an hypnotic trance. Sleep and tell me. Now, listen to me. You must tell me where your mistress is. You must tell me where your mistress is. The house. The house of dolls. The house of dolls. That's a strange answer. Not so strange, my friends. I know what it means. What is it? She is a diabolical person, this doll woman. The house of dolls is a toy shop with rare and unusual dolls. What better place to hide? No one would suspect what was behind those burning eyes of hers. I myself have purchased dolls for my little granddaughter from her. We must go there immediately. We have no time to lose. This is the place. Let's go. Right. It's past two. There's no one on the streets. Oh, it's a better. Try the door. It's open. Probably waiting in the rear of the shop for the creature she sent out. Well, let's go in. As quietly as possible. We must catch her by surprise. All right. There's a light coming from beneath that door back there. That is where we must go. It is the dance of the devil dolls. The door's ajar. They're in there. I can see them. Yes, so do I. Be quiet. And soon, my children, you will be joined by two others. (laughs) And then, no one can harm you. (laughs) For when the new doll returns, he will bring with him what I need for the spell of the dancers. We must take her now. And they will join you in the dance of, of the devil doll. No! What are you doing here? We've come to stop you. Look out, open. She has a gun. So have I. She 
she is dead. She will cause no more harm. It seems strange to see those little creatures on the floor. All of them so quiet and still. And just a short while ago... They were participating in the dance of the devil dolls. Yes. Do not feel pity for them, Mr. Hunter. The dolls did not really live. They were a creation of evil... Sparked by the malevolence of the old woman. When she died, they died with her. Perhaps the humans they resembled will rest quietly now. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door. Throw up a tombstone and sit down. Don't mind the fact that we've carved your name on it. <laughs> well, it's rather lonesome around here tonight, isn't it? Yes, most of the folks who haunt the place are out tonight with their sleds. If it snowed near your house, you may find them ghosting down here. Mr. Host, <laughs> ghosts don't go sledding, do they? Well, of course, Mary. Now you go and perch yourself on that teapot over there and get ready to hear about the dark chamber. It's an original radio play by Robert Newman, who witnessed the story while peeking through a keyhole. Yes, and our star tonight is Kenneth Lynch, who plays the role of Joe. Our story tonight is about death, violent death, and also about something which is even more terrifying, the unknown. You don't believe that anything can be more frightening than death? Then you'll never experience the ultimate in fear. But you will within the next few minutes. If you'll put out the lights, pull your chair up close and listen to the dark chamber. Police headquarters, Ryan Svegan. Hello, police. Listen, you've got to help me. You've got to. I don't know how you can, but... My name is Watson, Joe Watson. I'm a driver for the Acme Sanitary Hand Laundry. Address? Where I am, I... I don't know. That's part of the trouble. Now, look. Hey, wait, listen. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. Check the laundry. Check the veterans. I'm an ex-GI. They'll tell you I'm straight. It... Well, I'm in a room someplace. I don't know where it is or how I got here or what I'm here for. 
I don't even know how long I've been here. It's a big room, but it's funny. No doors, no windows that I can see. It's just a couple of chairs and a table with this phone on it. I'm scared. What do you expect us to do? Find me. Find out what this is all about and get me out of here. I, I don't know. Oh, listen, this isn't a gag. Can't you tell? You don't know what it's like just sitting here waiting, not knowing where or why or what's going to happen. Can't you trace this call or something? Well, okay. Hang on. Oh, thank heaven. I was afraid. Listen, I hear something. Someone's coming. I better hang up. I'll, I'll call you back later if I can. How do you do? Who are you? My name's Helming. Dr. John Helming. And your name? I don't have to tell you anything. That's very true. Although I didn't think you were aware of it. I think I already know everything about you that I'm interested in knowing. Like what? Name? Joseph Watson, age 26, occupation, employee of the Acme Laundry, honorably discharged from the army six months ago with the Brown Star and the Purple Heart. What the... So you cased me. Went through my pockets, huh? Well, if you know that much, you know I haven't got any dough. Money? I'm not interested in money. Well, what do you want, then? Where is this place? The last thing I remember is making a delivery on Spruce Street, noticing that the lights were out in the hall and hearing a noise behind me. You or somebody slugged me. That's right. Well, will you stop grinning like that and tell me what this is all about? Of course. I brought you here because I need your help in an experiment. An experiment whose details I've already worked out with mice and rabbits and cats and other animals. What kind of an experiment? An experiment in fear. Fear? Yes. You fought in the war. You were wounded. That means you've probably known fear. And still, you won the Bronze Star, which means you overcame it. Now, the question is, can you overcome your present fears? What are you talking about? You're afraid. Nothing has happened to you yet, absolutely nothing, and yet you are afraid, aren't you? You're afraid because you're face to face with the unknown. Because you don't know what I want and what I'm planning to do. Um, which is as it should be. And uh, that's the way we'll leave it. For the moment. Hey, wait a minute. Come back here. Come back. You can't... Hello, police. This is Joe Watson again. Listen, I got a little more dope. I don't know if it'll help, but there was a guy in here just now. Said his name was Helming. John Helming. That's probably a phony. He's about 50, tall, over six foot, white hair and gray eyes. No, I still don't know what it's all about or what he's after, but... Have you been able to trace this number yet? Well, how long will it take? Okay, I'll hang on, but... What? The lights just went out. The room's pitch dark and somebody's coming in again. I better stop. But for Pete's sake, hurry! Who's that? Who just came in? Who are you? A girl. Keep away from me. Keep away, do you hear? Keep away? What's the angle now? Angle? Why did you bring me here? Wait a minute. You mean he put the snatch on you, too? When I was on my way home, chloroform or something. And the next thing I knew... Why are you pretending? You're in on it, too. You must be. It's a trap. It's a trap, all right. But I'm not in on it. I'm in it, along with you. My name is Watson. Joe Watson. I'm Betty Grant. You swear? I swear. What would I lie about it for? I wonder why he put you in here. Put us together. Who is he? What's he going to do? I don't know. He said something about an experiment. An experiment in fear, but... Hey, listen, we've got to get out of here somehow, some way. He might be listening. Very astute, my dear. Of course I'm listening. What the... Where are you? Right here in the dark. I've been here all the time. Why are you... No, Joe, don't. He must want you to go for him. He's probably got a gun. Right again, my dear. Not that I'll need it. This is stage two of the experiment. A new stimulus to action has been introduced. 
Man against the unknown has become man and woman against the unknown. Look, let's get down to brass tacks. Be sensible about this. Thank you, Joe. That's why I won't need my gun. This new uh, stimulus has been negated by an increased sense of responsibility. Responsibility towards the girl and, therefore, by uh, increased fear. Blast you, gun or no gun, if I get my hands on you! Where are you? Where are you? Outside now, so you can relax. That was the final stimulus in this stage. Injured pride. The discovery that I could read your innermost thoughts and knew exactly what you were going to do. But you mustn't let that bother you. I already know everything you're going to do from now on. Till the end. Listen, you! Help me! Help me! He's gone. Joe. I know. Hold on, baby. Don't let it get you. There must be a way, some way. Do you suppose he's still listening? It's hard to say. But I'm going to take a chance. There's one thing he didn't figure on. A telephone. Yeah? Yes. If I can find it again in the dark. It was over on the... Here it is. I put through two calls already to the police. Told them what was happening and asked them to get me out of here. I had to hang up both times before they could trace the call and get this number, but this time... Hello. Hello, operator. What? No, this isn't the operator. You're on a busy wire. It doesn't matter. Thank heaven I got somebody. I've been trying for about ten minutes now. Hey, look, get off the line, will you? I've got to get through to the police. It's terribly important. But you've got to help me. You've got to. My name's Ben Lazari, and I'm a prisoner someplace. I don't know where. You what? I it's true. A strange house somewhere. A doctor who says his name is Helmy. What? <laughs> what are you laughing at? Joe, what is it? What is it? I haven't got headquarters. I've got a guy that... I'm sorry, Ben. It's no use. What do you mean? We're in the same boat you are. A girl named Betty Grant and myself. Helming's got us locked up, too. You, too? Yeah. He said he knew everything we were thinking. Everything we were going to do. I did get through to the police before, but I guess he caught wise. We're talking to each other over an inside line. Then... Yeah. We're through. No! Joe, don't say that. Don't even think it. Look, ask him exactly where he is. Just where are you, Ben? Do you know? It's hard to say. I was out cold when he brought me here. It's a kind of a hall, a passageway. Cement floor, ceiling, stone walls. There doesn't seem to be any door or opening or anything like that. That's what I thought here, too. But there must be one, or how would he have gotten you in there? Hey, listen, start looking. See if you can find it. That's true. I never thought of that. Now, I do find the door, and it opens into where you are. That's right. Three of us together. We'll surely be able to figure something out then. Hold on. I'll start pounding on the walls. You see if you hear anything. Go ahead. What's he doing? He's going to knock on the walls to see if he's anywhere near us. And if he is, if he can find a door, we can get together. Hear anything? I'm not sure. Maybe... I'm not sure either. Sounds awful far away, is it? There, listen. That wall right there. Hello. Hello, Ben. Yes? We heard you. You're right next to us. Now, Ben, you listen and Betty will knock back. Go ahead, Betty. That way, Ben, you'll be able to tell just which wall it is. Okay. All right. I hear it. I know where it is. Now to find the door, if there is one. Hold on. He's got it. He's going to see if there's a door. There must be one. There must be. Ben. And... Ben. Ben. Hello. What is it? I don't know. I thought it hurts a moan. Joe. Look. There is a door. It's opening. It's open. Joe. Dr. Helming. Why, yes. Were you expecting someone? <laughs> Well, now that you mention it, Doctor, there was someone we've been expecting and waiting for since we first heard about that cozy little place of yours. I think he's finally arrived. He's a tall, rather striking gentleman with a skull for a face, and his name is Death. <laughs> 
Mr. Host, that Dr. Helming is insane. Oh, he gives me the chills. Oh, maybe it's just because it's so cold tonight, Mary. You know, it's getting so nippy these days that some of my friends are having fur collars put on their shrouds. <laughs> well, my <laughs> friends are smarter. They know that the way to warm up in cold weather is with a hot cup of fragrant, delicious Lipton tea. A cup of tea in front of the fireplace just hits the sot these chilly days. But make it Lipton's and your pleasure's complete. You brew up a pot of Lipton's, throw another log on the fire, and summer tiptoes right into the room. Let the wind blow and the snow pile up on the roof. There's all the magic of June in a cup of Lipton's, in its deep amber color, its tantalizing fragrance, and its rich, hearty flavor. Mmm, and what flavor that is. Never wishy-washy, always brisk and full and satisfying. Try it, folks. You can let winter do its worst when you've got Lipton's in your cup. That's right, Mary. But I think it's time now for something a little more cold-blooded. Such as a cold-blooded murder. We're having a juicy one here tonight. Tale of gore galore. So let's see what's happening in the dark chamber. It's just a moment later now. Standing in the darkness of the strange room, Joe and Betty stare at the tall figure of Dr. Helming, silhouetted against the dim light from outside. I asked you whether you were expecting someone. Then it was just a trick. It was you on the phone all the time. Now, don't you think I'd know his voice? Where, where is he? Our friend, Mr. Lazari, right outside. What did you do to him? Answer me, what did you do to him? Don't you know? Sure, I know. You killed him. You... Did you kill him? Quite a state you've gotten yourself into. Why? Is it because you finally tried to do something about your predicament and failed? Or is it because you weren't sure whether I would kill or not, and because you still don't know? You're mad. Really mad. You'll be interested to know. You have not done, nor will you do, one thing that I did not foresee. Every move you made, every emotion you felt, was charted... Outlined, and... What's that? That, I think, is probably the police. The police? Yes. I know that you're very anxious to talk to them, and I'll see that you get a chance to. Soon. Good evening, officer. I'm looking for a guy named Helming. Uh, Dr. Helming. I'm Dr. Helming. Come in, won't you? Okay. Thanks. Uh, this is, uh... It's kind of a funny business. It's about a phone call we got a while ago, finally traced here. The guy who said he was a prisoner or something. That must have been Watson. Yeah, yeah, that's his name, Joe Watson. Do you know him? Of course. I can't tell you how sorry I am. It was really very careless of me, and I'll see that it doesn't happen again. What do you mean? If you did the investigating, which I'm sure you did, then you know that I, um, well, I don't run a sanitarium exactly, but I do take a few patients. Mental cases for treatment. Ah, so that's it. A nurse, eh? I, I wish you wouldn't say that. Watson's case is particularly interesting. A 4F who wasn't able to enlist, and he developed a persecution mania. Thinks that everyone is down to me. Not everyone, exactly. His present fantasy is that he's an ex-GI and that I'm keeping him prisoner. Sure sounds plenty tough. Well, I guess I'll run along. I... I'm sorry I bothered Don't you. Don't you want to see them first, officer? Talk to them? Ah, oh, there's no need of that, doctor. We, we get calls from cranks every day. We, we always investigate a call. But I insist. After all, you only have my word for it. Uh, there's, um... Well, there's just one thing I'd like to caution you about. Sure, sure, I know. I'll play along. Humor them. Splendid. Right in here. Hmm. It's quite a room. Joe! Look! It... It's a cop, and that means... Then you did get my message. Uh, sure, sure, Joe. Took a little time to trace the call, but uh, everything's okay. Man. Oh, thank heaven. It was such a screwy story, I was afraid that... Hey, wait a minute. Then why is he standing there like that? Why haven't you got the bracelets on him? Dr. Dalming? No need for any rough stuff. He said he'd come along quietly. What? You're but... lying. I don't know why, but... There's something wrong here. Something... I know. You think we made the whole thing up. But we're crazy. I know, no, no. It's true. He told you we were and you believed him. 
course not. Look, I... I... Stop it, will you? Stop saying that. Well, if I could only prove it somehow, I'll show you. I know. Lazari. Joe. Murder. That'll open your eyes. Somewhere in that wall is a door. Make them open it. Show you what's behind it. I think maybe I'd better be going down. But there is a door there, officer. Just a second. I'll open it for you. Here we are. Joe. Body. It's gone. <laughs> it's doctors are always hiding the bodies. But turns up again later. Give us another ring, huh? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Hey, can I go up this way down? Down to the end of the corridor, then to your right. I, I'm sorry I gave you all this trouble. It'll be all right. Thank you for being so understanding. Quite all right. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doc. Well, children? Don't look that way, Joe. Don't. I know what you're thinking, and it's not true. We're not crazy. There was a body there. Of course. You hid it when you went out to let the cop in. And the telephone. You left that here purposely. Wanted me to use it. Get the police here. Obviously. I told you that this was to be an experiment in fear. What I didn't tell you was that, in a sense, I was one of the subjects, too. It was important for me to learn how I would function under pressure. And speaking objectively, I think I did rather well. Don't Why? you? Why are you doing all this? What are you after? There's no reason why I shouldn't tell you. If anyone truly understands the nature of fear, is able accurately to forecast the actions and reactions of an individual, then he can use fear as a weapon. Society will react as the individual reacts. You see, society doesn't want to believe that anything can menace it. Doesn't want to take action to protect itself any more than the individual does. This was something that Hitler and Mussolini understood intuitively. I understand it scientifically. They failed, but I shall succeed. You... you mean that you... I'm afraid that's all I have time for. As far as you two are concerned, the experiment is finished. Completely finished. I have a few arrangements to take care of, and then, uh... Well... Make the best of these last few minutes, uh, for they will be your last. Joe, do you hear anything? Is he coming back? Not yet. He's going to kill us, isn't he? Just the way he killed Lazari. You're going to try to. Why are you sitting there like that, looking at me? Hmm? I guess because it's the first chance I've had to look at you. How do you mean? When he first put you in here, it was all dark. So many things happened after that. It's funny. What is the things that you can tell about a person, even in the dark. I kind of thought you were little, and... I knew you were awful nice and had a lot of nerve, but... I didn't think you'd be so pretty. I'm not so pretty, Joe. I'm not very brave, either. I'm scared. I'm awful scared. And I don't want to die. Don't worry about it, baby. Don't think about it. Sitting here like this, waiting. And there's nothing we can do. Every time we did try to do something, it was something he knew about. He was expecting us to do. Please, baby. Joe, something happened to you. You were scared before, too, but now... It was not knowing that was scary. Not knowing what was going to happen or why or what you could do about it. But once you do know, once you make up your mind, then you've got to forget about it. Forget about everything. Make up your mind about what? This is going to sound kind of funny, especially now, but... Well, do you have anyone special? A fellow, I mean, that... Why... 
Oh, no. That's good. I mean, well, gee, it's a shame we never met before. If we had, we wouldn't be here now. I, I mean, we probably would have been out together someplace. And what time do you get through work usually? About six. The store closes at five thirty. But me too. I could have picked you up at about six. Joe. And... I hear something. He's coming. Yeah. Okay, get up. Over in the corner of the room so that he'll see you as soon as he opens the door. What about you? I'll be waiting over here, behind the door. Joe, you, you, you're not yeah. going to... I know I haven't got much of a chance, but... Well, wish me luck. But it'll be quick anyway. Oh, no. Joe, please. All right, my young friend. I'm... All my arrangements have been completed, and I'm... Where's Watson? Right here. Joe, stop it! It's okay, baby. Didn't get me. I got the barrel of the gun. And... Good Lord. Got him. In the chest. Beth, you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have. Outside, Betty. See if you can find another phone. Call the police again. And this time, tell them to bring an ambulance. But you couldn't have done it. It was all plotted. Graphed and worked out in detail. I knew just what you were going to do. How you would react. By this time, you were to be in a state of complete frustration. Resigned. Ready to die. Why did you do it? Why? I don't know. Now, just take it well, easy. I've got to know. You've got to tell me. Was it because of the girl? Out of... D -d Desperation? Because you <laughs> knew you were going to die anyway? I tell you, I don't know. I just know that... Well, a guy will take just so much pushing around. <laughs> pushing around, eh? Well, it sounds to me as if one of our characters is going to get a lot of pushing around. At the end of a pitchfork and in a very warm climate. Yes, good old Helming's finished. He's got to be if we're to have at least two corpses, the inner sanctum minimum. Oh, you think that's a little arbitrary? Not at all. We've got to have at least two corpses to play our theme song, When a Body Meets a Body. <laughs> theme song? I didn't know we had one. Oh, Mary, we've got lots of them. Didn't you ever hear our skeleton song, I Ain't Got No Body? Hmm? Mr. Host, <laughs> let's be serious for a moment, because I want to talk about one of the most serious things in life, our health. For instance, the war may eventually lead to an increase in tuberculosis, and that's why the makers of Lipton tea and Lipton soup have asked me to remind you of the annual sale of Christmas seals. Funds raised by this sale support tuberculosis control programs, x-rays, health education, and medical research. Remember, over a half million people in the United States and Canada suffer from this disease. So buy as many Christmas seals as you can. No one is safe from tuberculosis until everyone is safe. And Christmas seals can save lives. <laughs> And now, friends, here's a word of wholesome advice. If you've had any murderous thoughts lately, give them up. It uh, just doesn't pay. Well, I know a lady who killed off her husband, and you know, it just ruined her marriage. Yes, he grew very cold to her. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Fearful Passage by H.C. Branson. Yes, in next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup, next week's story is about a vampire. He's a very stingy fellow, as when you go out with him, the drinks are always on you. <laughs> Naturally, we're going to try to make him feel at home here, so uh, I've just ordered a good supply of bats with green eyes, a coffin for him to sleep in, 
and I wouldn't stake the drive through his heart. I wouldn't stake my life on it, friends, but he may visit you before next Tuesday. <laughs> Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams? <laughs> this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Like a madman. He wants to kill me. Someone does. Like the other three, lying on the floor in a pool of blood. Almost twelve o'clock. It's night. Any minute now, there'll be a ring. Or a knock. <laughs> Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Creeper. At midnight. On this program, we bring you the best and most blood curdling stories ever written. And so now we bring you a tale which you may have heard before. A tale which we consider a classic in terror and suspense The Creeper by Joseph Ruskall. In the kitchenette of the New York apartment, a man and his wife listened to the evening news broadcast. New York. The unknown killer called the Creeper has struck again, adding a third female corpse to his toll. Hmm. Virginia Peters, a comely waitress, was found strangled to death in her third floor apartment early this morning while her radio blared. As in the previous murders, a note was found scrawled on the wall with the victim's lipstick and the plea, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Oh. Police insist... Now, why'd you turn it off? Oh, how awful. Awful, and in this very neighborhood. Let's hear the rest. It's very interesting. Oh, you... Don't go turning that radio on again, Steve Grant. Heard enough. I'll go out of my mind, for heaven's sake. That's it. A good, solid clue. What is? For heaven's sake. How many men ever use that expression? Oh, shut up. Okay, Mrs. Grant. Pass the biscuits, my little pigeon. Pass the biscuits. E, D, D. Three women in three days murdered in cold blood by a mad fiend right here in Washington Heights. I'm too sick to go out, too scared to stay in. The lock's broke. He sits there eating, 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 past the biscuit. There's nothing wrong with my appetite, my love. Of course. That's what costs you your job on the police force. When I even think of Some it. men drink to escape. I eat. Escape what? What? An ugly tongue, a beautiful face, and a roving eye. In short, a wife. Oh, so you're starting that again, you and your crazy jealousy. Yeah, maybe that's the creeper's way of escaping, too, Georgia. Who knows? Shut up. Go ahead and get a divorce. Go ahead. Can I help it if men look at me? Uh. I don't know why you come home at all. Where do you go? What do you do with yourself? Where were you this morning? Why'd you come back? To eat. But someday I'll lose my appetite for that, too. And when I do, my dear, there'll be no escape. And now I'm off again. Kiss. Still using stage lipstick. Wipe it off. How many times must I tell you? You're married now, remember? Steve, wait. Yeah? At least go buy my medicine. Sorry, I got no time. Don't leave me here alone. Stay home this evening. Please, I'm afraid. Oh, don't be silly, pet. Nothing will happen to you. You got a doorman here, an elevator boy, Mrs. Stone across the hall, a phone. 
You're safe enough. But the night lock, it doesn't work. Oh, 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 now you can't lock me out anymore. It doesn't catch. Something's happened to it since last night. Steve. Get a new one. I can't get a locksmith. I've tried all day. Steve, please. If I want to phone you, where will you be? Out. Goodbye. Take care of your call. <laughs> All pearly chase. How are you? Here you got thrown off the force, Dave. Yeah, I hear you got thrown off the news, Pearly. You heard wrong. I wasn't fired. I was just warned. I wasn't fired either. Just suspended for three days, eating a lamb chop at Casey's when I should have been ringing in from the box of the 162nd with all that trouble up there. On my way to headquarters now for reinstatement. I eat too much, my trouble is. I drink too much. Hey, you're living up at the Heights, Steve. Yeah. That's funny, me too. Huh? Hey, you're married now to a beautiful and lovely young... <whistles> with admiration. <laughs> Say it again. I think I knew her. Wasn't her stage name Georgia Dixon? Yeah, that's her. I love that wench, but... the women. How does a guy handle them? You know, maybe the creeper has the right method. <laughs> Thank you for taking the words out of my mouth. Who's the creeper, Steve? Any angles? You tell me and I'll split the reward with you. (laughs) (laughs) Say, what do you think of Inspector Bradley's inside job theory? Uh, Nuts. Every janitor's a creeper? And as for that doorman, Jim Ellis, just because he worked at two of the three murder apartments? Pure coincidence. Anyway, they've released him. One thing, though, and I don't think even Bradley's put it together yet. Huh? In all three cases, just before the creeper struck, the door locks had already been tampered with. You don't say. You got a theory? Well, sure. I mean, uh, you take that note on the wall. For heaven's sake, in every case, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Right. Oh. Now, what man uses an expression like that? You want the lowdown? It's just this. A creeper is a woman. (laughs) A gimmick, huh? Yeah. Like the height of the message from the floor is a trick, six feet. And yet I'll lay odds the creeper's no more than a guy your height, say, or mine. Five nine, just like us, you or me. Only crazy. How do you figure that? How do I figure lots of things? How do I know where the creeper's going to strike next? You do? Certainly. The creeper is not so smart. He's just crazy. You play along crazy and you're one jump ahead of him. That's the trouble with Inspector Bradley. Why, he's up a tree. You expect logical clues from a madman? You play along crazy, make out you're the creeper. And what do you get? Go ahead, let's see. All right, the victims are all redheads, every one. You've noticed that, of course. Three in three days? Yeah, now that you mention it. They all lived in the heights, right? Agnes Martin, Jane Kretzky, Virginia Peters? Right. What was the number of the apartment in each case? Agnes lived in 1A, Jane 2B, Virginia 3C. Don't ask me the why or wherefore. Don't ask me the logic. Just play along crazy. See what I mean? Where's he going to strike next? Huh? I don't get you. The next victim of the creeper also lives in the heights. She's a redhead. Her night lock's been tampered with. She's going to get hers today, and her apartment number's 4D. Well, why are you looking at me? Don't you like my arithmetic? Pearly, my wife's a redhead. We live in the Heights. And our apartment number is... (laughs) You're just a boozy reporter. Your apartment number? 4D, I told you. 4D, of course. It's pretty late, but I'll have it delivered. I was busy admiring your lipstick, Mrs. Grant. I've nothing like it in stock. 4D, I should have guessed it anyway. Why? Well, a face is a number. Believe me, since you've moved into the neighborhood, Mrs. Grant, for me it has a special number, like uh, Double Dandy Delicious Dream. (laughs) 4Ds, you see? Go on. But you tell that to every customer... Female. I'm a ladies' man? Like the creeper? <laughs> what did I say? 
What's going on in this block? Raw nerves. You can't joke. The creeper, the oh. creeper. That's all I hear all day. It's mass hysteria. There ain't such an animal. Do you... You don't think so? I assure you, Mrs. Grant, it's a fairy tale for circulation of the tabloids. I'll send you a prescription up with the boy. No, uh, no I'll, I'll, I'll just wait here for it. Well, it'll take some time. You should go right home and stay there if you're just getting over the flu. I'll tell you what. I'll deliver it myself. It'll be a pleasure. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll wait. I, I may not go right back. I don't want to... I want to be there alone. I'm afraid. Very well. Suit yourself. And have a seat. For heaven's sake, stop me before I kill my What? I cannot control my... Wait! I was only joking, Mrs. Grant. Wait, Mrs. Grant, your prescription. Mrs. Stone. Why, well, yes. What's your hurry, dear? I just got such a scare. Since these awful murders in this neighborhood. Yes, isn't it terrible? Oh, I'm simply frightened to death myself. You walking home? Yeah, I guess so. Well, I'll go with you. It's good we live in the same house. At least if I had a double lock, but the night one doesn't work. Oh, really? Well, I have a chain lock besides and still. Well, it is. I sit and shiver when there's a sound at the door. Can't get a locksmith. Tried all day, but they're all so busy. Mr. Frank on the corner promised to, but didn't know when. Why are they all so busy? Well, my dear, because every woman in the neighborhood's changing theirs, too. Simply a nightmare. Oh, but don't you worry. We'll stay together this evening. Mr. Stone's out, too. Think of it, we've never visited, though we live right across the hall from each other. Isn't that like a big city, for heaven's sake? Or would you rather I dropped in on you? Well, uh, I, I don't well, know. Well, make it your it... place, then. Isn't it horrible, the ghastly things they're saying? The theories one doesn't know what to think next. You believe the latest? The latest? That maybe it's a woman, the creeper. <gasps> A woman? Can you beat it? I just can't imagine how in the world the police figure that, for heaven's sakes. Can you? I say, can you, Miss Grant? Oh, uh, I don't know. I was just thinking of something my husband Though said. I can see where a married woman now, if her husband was faithless, well, I can understand such a theory because they take my husband now. Uh, you met Mr. Stone, haven't you? Oh, Mrs. Grant, why on earth are you staring at me like that, for heaven's sake? Oh, uh, I... I don't feel well. I must get home. I uh, feel safe. But Mrs. Grant, oh, for heaven's sake. Sobbing with terror, the woman with red hair runs up the dark street, back to her apartment and the door with the broken lock. As the hands of the clock move on towards 12 o'clock and... Murder at midnight. <laughs> And now, back to Murder at Midnight and The Creeper. Back to Georgia Grant, hurrying hysterically through the dark streets towards the apartment with the broken lock on the door. Good evening, ma'am. Oh. Out late, aren't you? Oh. Yeah, you're the uh, new doorman? Just relieving Charlie. Nice night. Yeah. Yeah, it was very nice. Here, uh, let me ring the elevator for you. No, you don't have to trouble. No trouble, ma'am. There. Apartment 4D, huh? Oh. Uh, yeah. How did you know? Doesn't take long. When will this elevator come? Coming now. Terrible things, ma'am. The happenings. What? The creeper. It's sort of... Oh. Going up? Yeah, yeah. Up and down, up and down. The ups and downs of life, that's me. I'm a living milkshake, Mrs. Grant. Uh-oh. What's wrong, Jimmy? Stuck. Imagine getting stuck between a third and fourth with a production like you. Get going, Sonny. You want me to report you? Okay, okay. Can't you take a joke? <laughs> Maybe I misconstrued that smile you always give me. Maybe you shouldn't order smile that way. Fourth floor. Let me out. 
If I drop in later, will you be more receptive? <laughs> oh, home. Oh, thank goodness. I must be going out of my mind. Key. Where's my key? I've done this lock. Turn the lock. Hello. Is the locksmith in yet? Well, I want to know how soon I can get my lock changed. Yes, I know it's late, but he promised. This is Mrs. Grant. Yes, 4D, yes. I know you just explained to me, but Hello, I must... Georgia. Yes? Yes, so, so won't you... I've please? been waiting for you. Oh, 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 don't you little fool. It's oh, me. Do you want oh, the whole house to... Oh. That's better. What are you doing here? Oh, don't worry. You haven't got a thing to worry about now. I've come to protect you. Give me the phone. Hello? Never mind about the lock, thank you. Sit down. Make yourself at home. Been waiting here for you. Long time no see, Georgia. What do you want, Pearlie? Me? A headline. Your husband wants two. He wants I should keep an eye on you. What's that? Sure. You didn't think Steve and I were acquainted, did you? Oh, yes. From way back. Just met him at a bar. I don't believe you. What do you mean, keep an eye on me? Oh, just in case the creep... <gasps> oh. <laughs> oh. You heard of the character? You're mad. You've always been mad, Pearly Chase. Where is Steve? Why should he send you here? Why should he think the creeper will come here? What are you doing here? Told you. Playing along crazy. Got a drink? You're drunk now. And you're getting right out of here. You're nothing but a no-good rummy. And you're nothing but a no-good... L- you finish it. When I took the drink, it was to drown you out. And you know it. I'm still a rum pot, Angel. Which means I haven't got rid of you yet. Get out. You're a little two-time and redhead. You're all the same, you redheads. Even a wedding ring you can't change you. Oh, red. don't play the innocent. My business is snooping. I make a living at it between drinks. So your new motto's love thy neighbor, huh? Mr. Stone across the hall? Poor dumb Steve. I'm warning you. Get out or I'll call the police. Stay where you are. All right, hurry. What are you doing with that gun? I wouldn't pick up that phone if I were you. You see, there's a big reward for the creeper and a heck of an exclusive, and I don't want to share it. I'm riding a hunch. Now, sit down, darling. Just play along with me while I play along crazy. Sit down. That's it. Like we're expecting company. (laughs) Let's have some music. Don't just sit. Let's have some music. I said turn on the radio. That's it. That's the good girl. Ah, dance music. Ah, let's dance. Give me your arm. Let's dance. Ah, like old times. Around and around like my brain. Why are you trembling? I still love you, you little fool. Ask me why. I love you. I love you, you lovely redhead. I could kill you and you deserve it. With the radio on, you could scream and no one would hear. I could put my hand on your throat like this and I could strangle you. Why are you crying? Stop it. I'm here to protect you. Stop crying. Cut it, I said. Cut it out. I can't stand it. I never could. Okay. You want me to leave? All right, I will. It's your funeral. What am I saving you for anyway? Where's my hat? In a few minutes, there'll be a knock or a ring or the door will just open. And you'll be lying in a pool of blood like the other three. Goodbye, my worthless... 
Give my regards to the creeper. <laughs> what if he comes back? He wants to kill me. Wants to kill me. Somebody wants to kill me. I must lie down. My head is splitting. <laughs> Trying to frighten me. Still a spite, that's it. Like the other three. In a pool of blood. Like the other three. Like the other three. Almost. Almost twelve o'clock. Any minute now, there will be a knock. Or a ring. <laughs> yes? This is the doorman, Mrs. Grant. Yes? The druggist is here with a medicine. Shall I let him up? A medicine? Uh, yes, let it. No, 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 no. Don't let that man up. Want me to bring it up? No, 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 no. I'm perfectly all right. I don't need any... I don't need it, you hear? Don't you dare come up. Don't dare me. <laughs> oh, please, please, I must have it changed right away. My lock, my door lock. Yes, this is Mrs. Grant. Yes, I do want it. Of course, anyone can get in, anyone. They want to murder me. But I don't know who. It's the creeper. Will you come right away? Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, but hurry. Please hurry or I'll go out of my mind. Oh, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Like the other three in a pool of blood. Any minute now. A knock or a ring. Oh. Who? Who's there? It's me, dear, Mrs. Stone. Oh, what do you want? I've been worried about you. Are you ill? No, I'm all right, Mrs. Stone. I'm feeling fine. Open up, dear. Don't you want me to keep you company? No, 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 thank you. I I was just... Oh, stop that. Do let me in, silly and weird. No, no, please, go away. I'm going to sleep. Go away. You hear me? Go away. (laughs) Hello. Hello, Georgia. You all right? Oh, Steve. Steve, I've been frantic. So good to hear your voice. Where are you? At headquarters. I'm coming right home. Sweetheart, is anything wrong? You no, up. no, no, not now. Not when I hear you, Steve. I don't know what came over me all day. I've been imagining things so silly. My nerves. I'm sorry about supper tonight, honey. I wasn't myself. My job had me down, but now everything's Oh, of okay. course. Forgive me, Steve. I've been bad, bad, wicked. Oh, darling, if you knew what I've gone through tonight, the most dreadful state. And then that... Steve, did you send someone here today? Curly Chase? Then you did? Yeah, to keep you company. Isn't he still with you? No, I just got rid of him. Oh, I wish you hadn't. He's an all right guy. Smart reporter. Lives in the neighborhood, too. Honey, it sounds cockeyed. I mean, Curly's theory. But I was kind of worried when I got the thinking, so... Listen, Georgia. Yes. Don't let anyone in the house till I get home. No, no, I won't, Steve. Not anyone, do you hear? Not anyone. Oh, uh, Steve, wait. What? Wait, Steve, it's... uh, Thank goodness, at last, now I can breathe easy. Darling, just a minute. Georgia. Hello. Hello, Georgia. Mr. Frank? Mr. Frank. Can you hear me? Thank goodness you've come. Please, step in. It's uh, the lock on this door I want... Just a moment, my, my husband's on the phone. Can you hear me, Georgia? Steve? Yeah, what happened? There was something else I wanted to tell you. It's all right, darling. Everything's all right now, Steve. You needn't worry. Didn't I just hear you talking to someone? Was that somebody at the door? No, it's no one, dear. It's just Mr. Frank, the locksmith. locksmith. What a load. Georgia, listen. Listen, Georgia, that's what I was going to tell you. What is... The police are on a new trail. They think maybe a locksmith. Georgia, you're listening. They think maybe the creeper's a locksmith. Oh. Get him out, quick. What oh. nice lipstick you Georgia, need, you Mrs. Me? Grant. Oh. Yes. Very nice lipstick. Very nice. Georgia. 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 Hello, Georgia. Hello. Hello, who's this? Hurry. Catch me. 
before I kill more. For heaven's sake. Soft footsteps hurrying down the corridor, away from the door with the broken lock now standing ajar, the body of a red-headed woman. And still, should she not have known that her only visitor would be death? And the clocks struck twelve for... Murder at Remember to be with us again when death knocks at the door, wearing a familiar face, and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Georgia was played by Ann Shepard. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept a great sealed book, in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages. And stops. Ah, the strange story of a handsome and mysterious man who, wherever he went, caused fear and grief. A tale titled, My Beloved Must Die. beloved must die, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. Our story begins in a large, smartly furnished apartment. Beautiful Joan Sanders sits at a desk, a pen in her hand. Her face is white and tense as she begins to write. Dear Mr. Rand, as you have long been a friend of the family, I'm writing this letter to you so that you may know why I'm going to do what I must. Believe me, there's no other way out. I know if 
you were here, you'd say murder's never justified. But I feel positive that in this case it is. I find it difficult to gather my thoughts so that I may write to you exactly what's happened. I, I suppose it all began that afternoon two months ago when Millie returned from her vacation. <coughs> oh, Joan, I had a wonderful time. Everything was just perfect. And, Joan, I met a man. Oh, no wonder everything was perfect. Oh, Joan, just wait until you meet him. His name is Victor Duval. Oh, tell me about him. Well, uh, to begin with, he's 32 years old, a little over six feet tall, very broad-shouldered, uh -huh. dark-complected, and has the most beautiful black eyes I've ever seen. Oh, really, Joan, he's handsome enough to be a Hollywood star. But, Millie, what about Frank? Have you forgotten you're engaged to him? No, but, well, perhaps we aren't really suited for each other. Oh, you grew up together, and you know how Frank loves you. Yes, I know, but Frank seems so young and immature. Has Victor told you that he loves you? No, but he will in time. I feel certain of it. Well, promise me, Millie, that until that time, you won't break off with Frank. All right, Joan. I promise. Uh, Oh, my goodness. It's five o'clock already. Have you got a date? Yes, Victor's calling for me at six. We're having dinner together and then going to the theater. Oh, Joan, I, I was never so happy in all my life. Good evening. You must be Joan, Millie's sister. Yes. And, of course, you're Victor. Uh, come in, won't you? Thank you. Uh, Millie isn't quite finished dressing. You'll forgive me for staring, but I didn't believe anyone could be as beautiful as Millie until you opened that door. Oh, well, you're very kind. Oh, here are some flowers I brought for you. For me? Yes. Frankly, I want Millie's sister to like me. Hello, Victor. Oh, Millie. Millie, you're a vision of loveliness in that white gown. Here. This should go well with it. Oh, Victor. What a beautiful blue orchid. Thank you so much. Just matches the shade of your eyes. This is going to be a perfect evening. I just know it is. Isn't it, Victor? Millie hadn't exaggerated in her description of Victor. There was something about him that set him apart from other men. It was more than his looks, his voice. Perhaps it was his extraordinary eyes. They were very large, deep, black eyes when he looked at you, they seemed to exert a hidden power, an almost hypnotic power. Whatever it was that set Victor apart from other men, you sensed it the moment you saw him. Later that evening, the doorbell rang. I opened the door to find Frank there. <coughs> Hello, Frank. Can I see Millie a moment, Joan? Well, she isn't here. She's gone out for the evening. Gone out? With the Val? Why, Yes. So that's why she refused to see me tonight. Might have known it. What do you think of Duval? Well, I, I only saw him for a few minutes. He, he seems very nice. You women are all alike. We're all taken in by his good looks and his fine manners. But I tell you, he's not to be trusted. There's something strange about him. Strange about him? Well, what do you mean? It's hard to put into words... Wherever Duval goes, trouble seems to follow. Duval apparently has nothing to do with it. Somehow, I always have a feeling he's behind it. Oh, Frank, aren't you letting your imagination run away with you? All right, I may be wrong. But I want you to promise me one thing. That you'll, well, keep a close watch on Millie. I don't want to see anything happen to her that she'll regret. <laughs> In the weeks that followed, Millie saw Victor constantly. Night after night, they went to shows, nightclubs, parties. Millie was rarely home before dawn. 
Almost overnight, she had changed from a sweet, unspoiled girl of 21 to a woman I no longer knew. Life to her had become Victor and the excitement and gaiety he represented. Oh, hello, Frank. Come in, won't you? Thanks, Joan. Suppose Millie's out with the Val as usual? Yes, she is. And Frank, I'm worried. So terribly worried about her. Oh. So at last you're beginning to realize that the Val isn't just an, another man. There might be something to what I told you. Yes. Well, you have good reason to worry about the Val. What do you mean? I don't know who the Val is or where he came from. But in the short time we've known him, he's ruined several people we know and has broken up more than one home. Frank, what are you saying? You didn't know that our friend of Val is a gambler of the wildest type, did you? No. A few nights ago, he won $40,000 from Dan Richards. That ruined Richards and broke up his home. Oh, poor Dan. And his wife, Helen. Yes, and speaking of wives, did you know that Doris Anderson has filed suit for divorce? Doris Anderson? Yes. It seems that one night, DeVal was dancing with Doris, and he said to her, What a pity you're married. Now Doris is in Reno. Oh, Frank, it, it, it just doesn't seem possible that anyone could want to do such things. Joel knows there are only a few things that DeVal has caused. Everywhere he goes, he seems to create a tension, bring about trouble. The lights in it. I tell you, there's something unnatural about him. Frank, what can we do? I was hoping that if we just let Millie alone, she'd well, get over this infatuation for DeVal, but she hasn't. I'm going to wait here until she returns, and we're going to have it out. Once and for all. To continue the story, my beloved must die, as it is written in the sealed book. The hour slipped by as Frank and Joan awaited the homecoming of Millie and her escort, Victor DeVal. A little after 3 a.m., the door to the apartment was quietly opened, and Millie slipped in, followed by Victor. Good evening, Joan. But, Joan, I didn't expect to find... Frank, what are you doing here at 3 o'clock in the morning? It's time you and I had a little talk, Millie. Frank, you're not going to lecture me, are you? Millie, you must listen to me. Can't you see what DeVal's doing to you? He's making you cold and cynical like himself. There's something evil about him. His eagerness to create trouble to see people unhappy. One time you would have despised him. Now you've changed. You've, you've become like him. Oh, really, Frank? You're going too far. Millie, you know I love you, only saying this for your own good. I'm tired of your constantly interfering in my life. I think our engagement's a mistake. Millie, what are you saying? Millie, you don't mean that. No, I love you and I can't live without you. I'm afraid you'll have to, Frank. Here. Here's your ring. We're through. All right, Millie. I know when I'm late. But I warn you, the vow will bring you nothing but heartbreak if you don't give him up. Someday he'll stand smiling at you 
Just the way he's smiling at me now. And then you'll see him for what he really is. Morning, Joan. Anything in the morning, please? Joan, what's wrong? You're so pale. Millie, Frank was killed early this morning while driving home. Killed? Yes. The paper says he ran off the road while traveling at a fast speed and hit a telephone pole. Oh, it's dreadful. He's so young. Joan, why are you looking at me like that? You think it was my fault that he was speeding and ran off the road, don't you? Go ahead, say it. Your fault? I don't know. Somehow I keep thinking it was Victor's fault. We were all so happy and contented until he ended our lives. You haven't any right to talk about Victor like that. You know I love him. Oh, he's cast a spell over you as he has over so many others. And in the end, it can only lead to disaster for you as it has for Frank. Victor's evil, I know that now. Stop saying that, do you hear? Stop saying that. He isn't evil. And I'll never give him up. that followed Frank's death, I scarcely saw Millie. I sensed that she was avoiding me, afraid of the accusation she imagined she saw in my eyes. I knew that she was still seeing Victor every night. I began to hear stories from a dozen sources about the two of them and the life that Millie was leading. As time went by, Victor became involved in one scandal after another. And Millie with him. One night I went to his home determined to have it out with him. Victor, you and I must have a talk. Well, of course, Joan. What is it you wish to say to me? Victor, you mustn't see Millie anymore. Oh? May I ask why? You know very well why. Since you've entered Millie's life, there's been nothing but trouble. Before Millie met you, she was unspoiled and contented, ready to marry a nice boy, but you changed all that. (laughs) Perhaps, my dear, it's a change for the better. You know that isn't true. If Millie weren't in love with you, she'd never be leading the life she is. You've taken her and tried to change her into someone like yourself, someone who's evil and corrupt. (laughs) You know, you're very beautiful when you're angry. You're amused by all this, aren't you? You enjoy knowing I'm worried. Well, all right, but just remember... You'd better not see Millie again. John, you wouldn't by any chance be forbidding me to see Millie because you happen to be in love with me yourself? Me? In love with you? Yes. Does that sound so incredible? Well... Many women are in love with me. You're the last man in the world I'd fall in love with. You're nothing but an egomaniac with with an overwhelming desire to possess and to destroy. And yet, from the moment we met, you have been in love with me. Haven't you? Oh, you you fought against it, told yourself I'm a scoundrel, which I admit I am. And you've tried to forget me. But you can't. That isn't true. I've never loved you and I I never will. You have. And you still do. The dream that might take you in my arms like this. You've hated yourself for it. Victor. Victor, let go of me. You do love me, don't you? No. No, I don't love you, do you hear? I, I don't... Oh, Victor. Now tell me you don't love me. Oh, darling. Even now, a month after that night that Victor took me into his arms, I'm confused. How can a person hate Victor as I do and yet... Yet love him at the same time. I know he's evil. That he's ruined the lives of many people. Millie's, Frank's. Perhaps my own. Yet in spite of that, when I'm with him, it doesn't seem to matter. When he called at the apartment a few nights later, I was happy to see him. Victor. Good evening, John. May I come in? Yes, of course. I... Thank you. <coughs> Millie isn't home yet. I... I haven't come to see Millie, but her sister. 
Oh, what did you want to see me about, Victor? About us? Oh, Victor, you must forget what happened that night. Perhaps I do love you. I, I don't know, but in any case, it isn't fair to Millie. Oh, please, Victor, if you care for either of us, you'll go away. Leave us alone. In your heart, you know you don't want me to go. You want me close to you, as I am now. No. No, Victor. No. Darling, you shouldn't. Forgive me. Millie. I should have made more noise when I opened the door. Oh, hello, Millie. I hope you're not angry with me, Victor. For having turned up at such an inopportune moment. Please, Millie, you, you must let me explain. There's that. nothing to explain, Joan. It isn't your fault, it's Victor's. This isn't the first time I've caught him making love to other women, but to make love to my own oh, sister behind come, my... Come, come, come now, Millie. You aren't being fair to me. You know I shouldn't hesitate to make love to Joan in front of you, would I? No, you wouldn't. Nothing matters to you, nothing. You're no good and you never will be. What? My dear Millie, I, I've always told you that, that I'm a rogue and a scoundrel. It isn't my fault if you took me seriously. I was a fool, an utter fool to fall in love with you. Yes, yes, I'm afraid you were. I only hope that you're not going to be difficult like the others were. No, Victor, you needn't worry about that. I won't come crawling to you like the others did. I've got too much pride for that. Millie! Oh, Victor. Victor, let go of me. I must go to her. No, 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 no. Stay here. She'll get over it. Oh, how could you speak to her like that? Haven't you any heart? No, my dear. None at all, I'm afraid. Oh, I hate you. Do you hear me? I hate you. You only think you do, darling. But you don't. Oh, let go of me. I'm going to her. All right, Joan. Though I don't think it'll be much use. Lily. Oh. Lily. Oh, oh darling, what's wrong? That oh. bottle. Millie, what have you done? Victor, Victor, come quickly. Yes, John? What is it? Millie's taking poison. Oh. Taking poison? You don't say. Oh, don't just stand there. We've got to do something. Oh, Joan, it burns so. Oh, you're going to be all right, darling. We have to get a doctor. Oh. I'm afraid it's too late, Joan. I've seen this happen before. You, you and Frank were right, Joan. He is evil. I came to realize it. Too late. Oh. Billy. Billy. I'm afraid you're wasting your time. She's dead. To continue the story, my beloved must die, as it is written in the sealed book. Joan Sanders, her face white and tense, sits at her desk, writing to a family friend, explaining why she is going to do what she must. It's been a month now since Millie died. 
A month in which I've suffered all the torments that she must have undergone when Frank died. At times I fear for my sanity. I know I should forget the past and live for the future, but... But I can't. For the evil of the past is with me in the present. This afternoon, Victor phoned me. It was the first I'd heard from him since that night Millie died. When I heard his voice, I... I'm ashamed to say I was thrilled. Thrilled to hear the voice of the man who's responsible for Frank's death and Millie's. In spite of everything, I know I still love him. There's only one way out. Victor DeVal must not be allowed to go on running lives. I expect him here any minute now. I must close this letter. What I'm going to do must be done. I... Victor. Hello, June. Victor. Come in, won't you? Thank you. You're not looking very well, Joan. Have you been ill? Yes. Ever since Millie's death. Oh, you shouldn't think about it, Joan. It's in the past. You don't feel the slightest twinge of remorse, do you? <laughs> Not the slightest, darling. Now, what about changing into an evening gown so that we can do the town? Hmm? Oh, you're heartless. Inhuman. There's no other way out. My dear, whatever are you talking about? This, Victor. A gun. Yes, Victor. <laughs> Don't be foolish, my darling. Put the gun away and get dressed. Eh? I could hardly miss you at this distance. Well, what are you waiting for? Why don't you shoot? Even knowing you're going to die doesn't frighten you, <laughs> does it? <laughs> no, my darling, no. You see, nothing in this world frightens me. Not even death. Oh, you are inhuman. That horrible smile on your face. <laughs> Scoffing at me, at everyone. <laughs> you live only to hurt and to destroy, don't you? <laughs> yes, yes, I despise you all. Every human being. Your righteousness, your smugness, your futile attempts to achieve happiness. There's nothing I delight in more than to send you down into defeat. Watch your suffer. Kill each other, commit suicide. Oh, you fiend. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, you've done your last evil deed. <laughs> Did you fall? <laughs> I've shot you. Uh, evidently, you missed. Well, I, I won't miss this time. <laughs> why, why don't you fall? Uh, your gun seems to be empty. Oh, I I couldn't have missed you. I, I couldn't have. No. no you, you didn't miss me. And why aren't you dead? No one can kill me. No one. John, don't you know who I am? Who? Who are you? Look. Look into my eyes. Look deeply. Now do you know with whom you have fallen in love? You... You're... You're the devil. Yes. Yes, darling. The devil himself. Oh, no. No, I... I won't be in love with you. I won't be. Oh, but you will, darling. You will. Even though you know who I am. You'll be in love with me forever. Forever. And so end the tale. My beloved must die. As it is written in the sealed book. A few days after Joan Sanders had unsuccessfully attempted to kill Victor DeVal, she suffered a nervous breakdown. When the doctors questioned her, she kept repeating over and over that she'd fallen in love with the devil.
thou keeper of the book, before you close the great book, show us the tale we tell next time. This one. Ah, yes. The tale of a scientist who ventured into the unknown and whose experiment brought disaster into his laboratory. A tale titled, Beware of Tomorrow. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you a story of tension and heroism. Fragile Contents Death. Starring Mr. Paul Douglas. Before our play begins, here is a word about Autolite from our good friend, Harlow Wilcox. Hello, Harlow Wilcox. Why, it's Oscar, the orating auto. As gay as a giddy gazelle since you told my owner. <laughs> about ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs? Yep, I was down in the hood. Sluggy, slow on the hills, no pep. But then they slipped you a set of smooth, sleek, and salubrious, world-famous Autolite spark plugs. And now I'm really right. Well, sure, replacing worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs will give <coughs> smoother performance. <coughs> Quick start. Gas savings. I get a real run for the money. Now, that's because Autolite spark plugs are made by the same Autolite specialists who designed the coil, distributor, and all the other important parts of the complete ignition systems used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars. That means they're ignition engineered to perform in perfect precision with your car's complete ignition system. They're divine, and they're mine. Your car will love them too, friends. Have your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer replace worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And whether you choose the standard type or the resistor type, in accordance with specifications of the manufacturer of your car, you'll be right, because you're always right with Autolite. And now with fragile contents, death, and the performance of Mr. Paul Douglas... Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. All it took was a phone call. Until it came that morning, everything at the post office was the same as it had always been. I was just another postmaster, 40 years old, with the problems of some 80,000 people to look after. All it took was that phone call to make things a nightmare. As I said, the day was, well, just the day. I remember I was making up my mind to get busy on the stuff piled on my desk. It was 9.15. Morning, Mr. Jordan. Morning, Hartley. I was just going to send for you. Now, don't tell me that all this, this heap is for me. That's right. Well, didn't anybody weed it out? Oh, it's been weeded, Mr. Jordan. Oh, no. Well... If I must, I must. Well, even a parcel, I see. And it's marked personal. Hmm, from Paxton and Brown, something or other Broadway, New York City. Hmm, something Alex ordered? Oh, I remember. Sure, this must be that new type of lawn sprinkler I ordered. I should have had it sent to the house. Put it over there, would you? I'll, I'll take it along with me when I go home. Uh, here? Yeah, that's fine. Post office, this is Jordan. Jordan? That postmaster Jordan? That's right. What can I do for you? Plenty. You got a bomb someplace in the mail down there. What? Hey, is this a joke? This is no joke. Listen carefully. A guy I know sent another guy a bomb, a time bomb. It'll be delivered here in town. It was supposed to be set to go off at 7 tonight, but it ain't. He forgot to change the timer before he shipped it. It's set for 2.30 this afternoon, five hours from now. I don't like that. Maybe some poor guy like a mailman will get it instead of the guy who's supposed to. That's why I'm telling you about it. You got to find it and stop it. Yeah, and another thing. It's fixed so it'll go off when you open the package. You got all that? Sure, I got it, but... Well, how do I recognize this bomb? Who's it addressed to? I ain't telling who sent it. I don't care about who sent it. Who gets it? 
Who gets it? I... Hello. Hello, don't hang up on me. Who gets the bomb? Don't hang up. Look, you're still there. I can hear you breathing. Hello. Hello. He hung up. Hartley. Uh, yes, sir? You probably heard enough of that to know what's going on. Uh, yeah, something about a bomb in the mail. Yes. Now, listen carefully. I'm only going to tell you once. Get out of here on the double. I want the assistant superintendent of mails and the dispatcher, Stuart and Fox. Get them in here as quick as you can. Got that? Uh, yes, sir. All the help I can get. Operator. Uh, this is Jordan. How many inspectors are in today? Do you know? Just a moment, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Williams is in. Mr. Jackson left word that he'll be out in Lincoln County until tomorrow. Mr. Thompson entered the hospital this morning to have his appendix out. One out of three. I suppose I should be thankful for that much. Uh, what, Mr. Jordan? Uh, ring Ed Williams for me, please. Tell him to get over to my office right away. It's urgent. Yes, sir. All the possibilities. You sent for me? Yes, Foxy. Sit down. Something wrong? Plenty. Bomb in the mail. Know much about it? I'll tell you later. Williams and Stewart are in on this, too. Man, are we in for a busy day. Oh, Hartley said there was a hurry-up call in here, so I can't... Excuse the loose well, collar. Well, forget it, will you? Hey, I... practically close that door in my face, Joe. Morning, everybody. Sit down, you two. Uh, Sit down uh, and listen, will you? <laughs> Uh-oh, no raises this year. <laughs> I've been waiting for him to spring it on us. Now, button it up, Joe. Here's what we do have staring us in the face. I just told Fox a minute ago, there's a bomb in the mail someplace. A bomb? Holy... That's right, that's right. A few minutes ago, I got a phone call. I don't know who it was. All I got were these facts. It's now, what, 9.30. Well, between now and 2.30, we've got to find a time bomb which was mailed to somebody here in town. Somebody? Don't, don't have any name at all? He didn't get around to that. Either he wouldn't tell me or he was cut off. I'm hoping, just a slender hope, I know, but I'm hoping he'll call back. We can't count on it. How do we know this isn't a leg pull, Doug? We don't. If we can't afford to take chances with somebody's life, would you? Oh, no. Well, what kind of a package? We don't know any kind. Oh, that's great. That spreads your field out something terrific. Huh? You not only have your truck packages, you have carrier packages, too. Well, a carrier wouldn't have that big a package. Use your head. The powerful explosives we have nowadays and the small wiring circuits possible, why not? Yeah, that's right. Uh... Well, I'll give you another. How about a newspaper roll? That's big enough, isn't it? Carriers handle them, don't they? That's right. Well, here's what I think. If that thing was mailed early this morning, it's either out there in the parcel post bin or at one of the substations. If it was mailed last night, it's probably on one of the trucks right now. Or else it's been delivered. Or else it's been delivered, yes. A lot of stuff's off the trucks by now. Well, that complicates it, but let's do what we can as fast as we can. Fox, you round up all of the special delivery cards. Send them out after those trucks and get all packages back here. We'll go over them after they get here. Try to get the drivers to remember what's been delivered and where. Skip the insured deliveries. This won't be insured. And get as much back as you can. But if they can't remember everything? Leave that to me. But do this, too. Call the substations. Get all their stuff in here. Will do. Anything else? Not now. I'm on my way. Stuart, go through our own stuff in the back. Let me see. Delivery from the New York Central's number three hasn't come over from the station yet, has it? No. Well, that makes it a little better. Now, get everything we've got together in one place and keep it there. Now, keep the out-of-town packages out of it. Just add the stuff from the substations and the trucks as it comes in. And the pickup trucks, of course. What? Well, some of the drop boxes out in the suburbs are for letters and parcels both. We'd get some packages coming in on the pickups from those boxes. Yes, I'd forgotten that. Yeah, the trucks will be in here by 11. Well, might as well go ahead with everything else until they get here. Yeah, just so we get them as soon as they come in. I'll leave that to you. Yeah, if we're going to do all this, uh, I better get on it. No use standing here any longer than necessary. No, 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 go on, go ahead. You uh, want me to check the packages, right? I don't have to tell you your business, Ed. I know your record as an inspector. Oh, fill in a little more for me, would you, Doug? Okay. There's a time bomb? Well, that's what he said. We have less than five hours now. I got that. What else about it? Uh, would it be safe to open? No, no, it'll it'll go off if you open it. He said so. It's rougher and rougher. Well, I'm going to get help, Doug. All you want. I use your phone. Help yourself. Thanks. Operator. Outside line, please. Thank you. Sergeant Rock speaking. Oh, Rocky, this is Ed Williams, post office. Is Jesse in today? Yeah, well... No, no, don't call him. No time. Uh, tell him to come on over here right away, would you? Sure. 
What do you want with explosives experts? You got a bomb? Well, maybe. Uh, keep it under your hat. You know me. Oh, another thing, Rocky. You got uh, the uh, fluoroscope just now? Hmm, touchy one. Huh? No, we loaded the company E up in Florida. Well, I could use it, that's for sure. It's only about 100 miles. I'll call them up and get them to fly it in. Probably get it to you in a, an hour or a little over. Good. And uh, you'll tell Jesse? Will do. Oh. Now to work, Doug. Same here, boy. How about those carriers? About a hundred of them, aren't there? Ninety-four. Oh, can you do it? Can you hit them all? I don't know. All I can do is try. I'll bet you're thinking of the same thing I am, remembering the same case. Bowling Green, Kentucky? Yeah. That poor devil of a carrier, alive but barely. That's one reason I want to find this bomb before our luck runs out. We're going to see that it doesn't run out. I hope you're right, Ed. I sure hope you're right. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Paul Douglas in Fragile Contents Death. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Carlo, you know what we cars always say? No. What, Oscar Auto? There's no business like go business. Right, you are. And what a go you get with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. That's because they're precision-made and world-famous for quality and dependability. You bet. So when worn-out spark plugs are replaced with new ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, you'll get smoother performance and quick starts. And they'll save gas, too. Sure, because Autolite spark plugs are ignition-engineered to work in perfect coordination with your car's ignition system. They're designed by the same Autolite experts who design the coil, distributor, and all the other important parts of the complete ignition system used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars. Autolite spark plugs are ignition-engineered. You said a tank full, Oscar. So, friends... Have your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer replace your car's worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, standard or resistor type. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Paul Douglas in Elliot Lewis's production of Fragile Contents Death, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. They were all on it now. Williams, Fox, Stewart, and all the others we could trust to keep a cool head. The lid was on every place possible. The average man buying his three-cent stamp, it was business as usual. We didn't even let the majority of the help know it. But off in one of our fairly isolated corners, a pile of packages was growing. I looked at the clock. 10.20. Just about an hour gone. Four hours left. Stu, how are things going? Well, who knows? Well, as can be expected in a thing like this, I suppose. Uh, better wipe off that sweat before somebody tumbles. You know, the day isn't that hot. Oh, well, thank you. Are uh, many of them wise yet? I don't think so, yet. Well, we'll probably get out. You know, things have a way. Of... Uh, that they do. Uh, how are you standing at yourself? Well, uh, uh, Worried? Well, I'm not very happy. Happy? Well, none of us are. Yeah, I keep thinking... Uh... What if I get hold of the thing when... Uh, I... Have you ever been in an explosion? No. Well, you weren't in the service, no. Ever see an explosion and been close to one? Mm, yeah, well, I came by once just after a gasoline truck tangled with a pole and took off. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Mm-hmm. I see. Uh, Joe, would you like to take the day off? Oh, no, no. I wouldn't think well, of no, that. Well, wait a minute. Nobody would blame you, really. I wouldn't. No, I, I no, you. I can't do that, Doug. What if I did and the thing got by and I could have prevented it? I'm nervous, maybe. Uh, I don't like the setup, maybe, but but I'm not chicken. I'm staying with it. I didn't suppose you wouldn't stay with it, Joe. Well, they say every soldier figures that the next bullet isn't going to get him. Huh? That's the way I'm figuring myself on this deal. Good idea. The only thing we have to worry about, where is this one aimed? Eleven thirty. Two hours gone. I went back to the mailroom. 
Hello, Doc. How's it going? We have all this so far. A lot of work. Uh, any leads, Ed? Not yet. Not even anything suspicious. Well, how can you tell? Can't tell, really. Oh, sometimes there's something about the handwriting or the printing. I guess you just feel it sometimes. I don't know. I don't get anything like that in this stuff. No. Well, not even a, a fake return address? Not a one in the lot. None of the locals, anyway. Not them all. Fluoroscope in yet? Oh, plane's in. They phoned me a few minutes ago. It's on the way over. Be here any minute. That's a help. Miss Jordan, telephone. Okay, what line? Uh, eight. Thanks. I'll get it. This is Jordan. Mr. Jordan, this is Malloy on truck 15. Yes, Malloy? I got the word about getting back these packages. Everything's practically okay, only this. My second delivery, I left one off at this place, 1724 Lime Street. I got back there a while ago. Nobody's home. They were there when you left the package? Yeah. Fat, bald-headed guy took it, as I remember. Well, check the neighbors. I already have, Mr. Jordan. Nobody knows for sure where they went. There's some talk about them leaving for Washington this morning, but I can't pin it down. Uh, they drove, anyway. Car's gone, garage is empty. Mm, well, that's you in your head, Malloy. At least we have something to shoot at. Remember the name? No, I don't. But that fat guy sure looked like a crook. Tabbed him for one the minute I laid hey, by. What's this? Huh? Oh, 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 Miller came driving out and caught me and said you were hunting a package of stolen goods in the mail. Uh, maybe he shot his mouth too much, huh? Wasn't I supposed to know? Oh, no, no, Malloy, it's, it's all right. I, I forgot that he knew what we were after. You say you got everything else. Yeah, be right in if you say so. You do that. Check. Foxy. Yeah? Look up 1724 Lime Street and get the name. Anything else? Get that name and then get on it to the state police to intercept them if possible. Those people who received a package this morning and they may have left town for Washington. They're probably driving. By luck, they may not have opened that parcel yet. That's a long shot. Going on a trip, carrying an unopened package, I doubt it. It's against common sense, but we have to try. You try, Foxy. <laughs> Twelve o'clock. Lunchtime. I ordinarily eat at Bailey's. Not today. We had sandwiches and coffee brought in. The coffee was welcome, but we didn't seem very hungry. Alone in my office, sipping coffee, all I could think about was the time was half gone. It made me forgetful. This is Jordan. Haven't you forgotten something? Huh? Oh, hello, dear. Forgotten something? I'm down at Bailey's waiting for you. I've been here 25 minutes. We're lunching together today, remember? Oh, that's right. Today is Thursday. Well, uh, look, Alice, I'm afraid I'm going to have to stand you up. Uh, You'll something's be sorry. Come up. There's the best-looking man sitting in here all by himself. The tall, rugged, iron-gray type. You know how I go for those. He'd probably be glad to buy me a meal. Yeah, try him and see. I have confidence in you, sweetheart. Anything to save us a buck. Oh, then you definitely aren't coming. Uh, I'm afraid not. I'll tell you all about it tonight. Sometime remind me never to marry a busy executive again. Bye. Bye. What have you got there, Foxy? Things on my mind, Doug. First, let me get this one off. The cops picked up the Morgans. The Morgans? A couple who were driving to Washington. Found them in a service station on the edge of town. You get the package? They'd already opened it. Nothing much in it except some fancy sports shirts for Morgan himself. They're on their way again? With apologies. Understand they were scared silly. Morgan offered to show the cop the shirts. He even wanted to give them one. Afraid they were stolen goods. Well, I'm glad that's cleaned up. Just had a call from the Woodmount branch. Go on. Remember Spicer? Who? S Spicer? Yes, yes. Suspicion of robbing the mails. What about him? Looks as though he's hung one on himself this time. Well, how's that? Well, as I say, this clerk out at uh, Woodmount put a bunch of packages in the bins just before he quit last night. He remembered one for Dr. Turner. This Turner, it seems, collects magazine first editions. Sometimes these aren't worth insuring. Sometimes they are. They're always worth something more than their original price. And this package looked like one of those. What about the carrier, Spicer? Seems he blew in just as the place was about to close. Said he forgot a bag of his with some new shoes he'd bought. He drifted through and out again. Nobody paid any attention at their time. And this morning, Turner's package is gone, is that it? Where's Spicer? His day off, substitutes working. They're sure the package is gone? Well, Turner called to ask her to come, and they couldn't trace it. That's how they were sure it was missing. I don't have to tell you the next move, do I? Already tried. Call his rooming house. He's not in. Didn't come in last night either. Do I call the police? Mm, I'd better do that, Foxy. Thanks. Even if he has the thing, he surely opened it by now. I think so myself, but we, we can't be sure. We, we can't take chances. I'd better call. 
Operator. Get me the police station. Ed, any luck with this pile of stuff? One that's uncertain. Trying to make up my mind. Let's so. Let's see. Here. Uh, not very big. Well, it wouldn't have to be. Addressed to Jack Gordon, 128 Andrew Street. That anybody important? Never heard the name. If you ask me, it's a kid. And so why? Well, the return address. Oh, Columbia Foods Incorporated. I don't Cereal know. Cereal coupons. Fluoroscope indicates a watch inside. Furthermore, let's put a stethoscope on it. Here, put it in your ears. Okay. Uh, you get it? Yeah, it ticks all right. Question, is it a dollar watch or or is it it? Mm, it's a watch, probably. Probably. Look, let's play it safe. That's what I thought. In here? Ordinarily, no. But we couldn't detect anything that would trigger the thing, so we'll put her in the water bucket. Here. Did you put the wedding agent in the water? Yeah, it'll soak through the wrapping quicker and through anything else inside that much faster. Does it? Inside takes a little longer. Mm. Reminds me of the time I put in as an inspector. I, uh, I hear you're pretty good, Doug. Just lucky. Getting the walkers lucky? Hmm. Well, better have a look at your toy here. Yeah. Easy, easy. Oh, she comes. There. Oh, looks like we were right the first time, Doug. Here, have a pocket watch. Genuine hoppy. Keep it for a souvenir. That's one kid we owe a watch. Will the budget stand it? It'll strain it, but it won't break it. Let's step out back. I need a cigarette. Good idea. You heard about this carrier, Spicer? Ah, uh, Foxy told me. Got him yet? No, the police haven't. Maybe the police haven't got him, but has it. <laughs> The clock's hands were still going around. 1.30. Just about one hour to go, and still we hadn't found that bomb. We hadn't found it. We hadn't found the missing carrier. All we found was a new headache every few minutes. This is Jordan. Mr. Jordan, this is Malloy again. Who's the driver, you know. Oh, yes, Malloy. Do you have something new? Sort of. See, Mr. Jordan, it's like this. While I was eating lunch, I kept thinking, and all of a sudden, I remember this other package I delivered this morning out on Beach Ave. So I drive over here to see about it. Uh, I'm at the house now. You got the package? Have they opened it? No, it ain't open, but, uh... Well, you better talk to this lady, Mr. Jordan. She won't listen to me. Here, Mrs. Bates, this is the postmaster on the line, himself in person. Hello, this driver says you're the postmaster, is that right? That's right, this is Douglas Jordan. Well, I don't understand all this about the package which came from my husband. First this man delivers it, and now he wants it back. He's uh, perfectly right, Mrs. Bates. We'd very much like to have that parcel. Well, I don't see why. It has my husband's name on it. It's the correct address. Well, uh... I'm afraid that I can't give it back until my husband has a chance to examine it. What did our uh, driver tell you, Mrs. Oh. Bates? had some story about stolen goods, but that doesn't make sense. Well, you see, Anyone would know that my husband would never... Uh, someone may have confused him with another Bates. Have you thought of that? No, I hadn't. But I am still sure that my husband should pass judgment on this but if, if you... I were to take the responsibility, and I were wrong. Well, let me take the responsibility, Mrs. Bates. He might not see it that way. He might say I let myself be talked into something. Uh, Mrs. Bates, believe me. I'm sure your husband would be the first to thank us if he knew. Well... But on my word of honor, we must have that package. Well, it's your responsibility. Do you understand? Here, young man. Thank you, lady. But I don't think my husband will thank you. He doesn't like anyone connected with the government. None of you. For that, I'm sorry, Mrs. Bates, but thank you for giving us that parcel. One hour. Please, let this one be it. But it wasn't what we were after A box of advertising pencils That was all Then it was a half an hour 
I forced myself to stay in my office, waiting for a call that they'd caught Spicer, or that someone, somewhere, had turned up something. Ed, any luck? Not a bit. We've combed everything. Not a thing. They haven't caught up with Spicer yet? I think that's a false lead anyway. If he has the thing, he's opened it by now. Uh. That leaves us nowhere. Yes, it does. Somebody's forgotten something. That must be it. Maybe. It'll be all a hoax, you know. What's the matter? Don't you want it to be a hoax? All this effort and nothing to show for it. That it? Want to repeat the Walker business? Catch a murderer through the mail? No, no, Ed, no. I just want to be sure. He's out, you know. Who? Steve Walker, the brother. He's out of jail. Didn't you know? Why are you looking so funny? Steve. Walker, Steve, he said he'd get me. Ah, well, so what? Where do they put it? Where do they... Where's that lawn sprinkler? Lawn sprinkler? Now I know. Hey, where'd that package come from? I had it right here all day. Didn't even think about it. Came early this morning. Let's not think. Let's move. Give me that. Is there time? I think so. Better be. Hey, Jesse, got another one. Floriscope. Yeah. Get her under the floriscope. Look. That's her brother. That's her, all right. Do you have time to take it out to a safe place? Oh, sir, all we can do is put her in the water bucket. Take her into the alley and pray. Okay. Here goes. Oh, water, get through that wrapper. Jesse, get her out of here. Doug, we'll give her an hour just in case. Five minutes. Fifteen minutes. Thirty minutes. Forty-five minutes. One hour. Well, Doug, there she is, all in little pieces. Be glad those pieces aren't you. I am, Ed. Believe me, I am. Pretty good collection of evidence. You can go after Steve Walker with this, Doug. Mr. Jordan, telephone. Coming. On four. Got it. This is Jordan. I couldn't bear the thought of you plodding away down there. Maybe you'd like to hear about my luncheon, dear. It was the most exciting... But it better be good. Wait till you hear the one I've thought up for you. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Paul Douglas. Harlow, I've got a new slogan for you. What is it, Oscar? Keep your auto right with Autolite. Yes, sir, because Autolite makes over 400 fine products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants from coast to coast. These include complete ignition systems used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars. Generators, coils, distributors, electric windshield wipers, voltage regulators, wire and cable, starting motors, and many, many more. They're all engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, Mr. Fred McMurray in Windy City Six, featuring the Dixieland music of Red Nichols and his five pennies. This to be followed by the first lady of Suspense, Miss Agnes Moorhead. And then on February 22nd, in answer to your many requests, Backseat Driver, repeated for you with its original stars, Fibba McGee and Molly. All on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Portions of this program were transcribed. You can buy Autolite Stay Full batteries, Autolite Standard Type or Resistor Type spark plugs, Autolite Electrical Parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. Nearly half of the people who died in America last year were victims of heart disease, our number one killer. This week, the American Heart Association appeals for your support to combat and conquer this scourge. Send your contributions to Heart, care of your local post office. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Mystery is our middle name. And if you consult Mr. Webster's Dictionary, you'll find out that his first definition of the word is something that has not been or cannot be explained. A profound secret, an enigma. That's exactly what you will find at the heart of today's story. A profound secret, an enigma. Something that must be explained if a human life is to be saved. But there are other baffling questions to be answered along the way, such as... Who is the mysterious piano player named Joaquin Fry? And why does attorney Tom Hendricks get this kind of greeting at his door when he presents an engraved invitation to one of Mr. Fry's piano recitals? Your invitation, sir? uh, Here you are. Sorry I was late. I had a little trouble finding the house. That's all right. The concert hasn't started yet. Uh, Would you please put on your mask? My what? Your mask, sir. But, uh, I don't have a mask. Well, you better have one, buddy, or you ain't getting in here. Our mystery drama, Murder Preferred, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Tony Roberts. on his business cards read C. Thomas Hendricks, attorney at law. Everybody calls him Tom, and Tom Hendricks likes it that way, especially because the C stands for Clarence, a name not very popular these days. But it was the first name of Clarence Darrow, the famous criminal attorney, and Tom's father, a lawyer himself, admired him enough to name his one and only son after him. Tom is a criminal lawyer too, but fame hasn't yet reached his tiny office, but who knows? Perhaps that beautiful woman entering it right now may be the beginning. Please, sit down, Mrs. Haven. Thank you. It may be a bit late for condolences, but I'm sorry about your husband. Thank you. I know it probably doesn't help much uh, to know that the police have arrested his murderer. It doesn't help in the least, Mr. Hendricks. In fact, that's why I'm here. Tony Gerard did not kill my husband. I see. I'm sure you don't see it all. Oh, I'm sure you've read all the newspaper stories and heard all the broadcasts about the case. It's your business, isn't it? A murder and arresting people and... and... defending people, Mrs. Haven. Yes. That's what I wanted to see you about. Defending someone. Someone who is innocent. Mrs. Haven... Are you trying to hire me for Tony Gerard? Not because he asked me to. You're not acting on his behalf? On his behalf, yes. With his permission, no. Tell me why you're so sure he's innocent. Because of some evidence you have? Nothing tangible. But something? Yes. You just know Tony Gerard didn't commit this murder. That's right. Mrs. Haven, uh... Whenever there's a serious crime like murder, someone always comes forward and swears that the accused couldn't have done it, that he wasn't the type. But I didn't say that. You see, Tony is the type. What? Tony is a very rough young man. He has a a violent temper. He was in trouble all the time when he was a boy. He, uh... And he has a police record. Are you looking for a cigarette? Uh, no. Uh, my pills... Do you have some water? Yes, right here. Go on talking. But Tony would never kill anybody. That would be against God. He had a strong religious discipline when he was young. Its effect is still there. He... Oh, thank you. 
But you admit he was violent. Uh, th that might lead him to forget that discipline, if he had opportunity and motive. Uh... I suppose he had that, too. He... He was in the house that night. Our house. The night Walter was killed. And what about motive? No ideas about that, Mrs. Heyman? Not the idea that people have. What idea is that? My father has told me about the rumors. Your father? Yes. You see, Dad is a wonderful source of gossip. He is, uh... Retired. He used to be a doctor, and now he just plays golf and bridge, and he listens very well. I know people are saying that Tony and I were lovers. But it isn't true? Walter owed Tony some money. That was a problem between them, not me. Walter didn't want anybody to know that he owed anything to a man like Tony Gerard, especially because he was planning to run for the Senate. You're giving your husband a motive for murder, Mrs. Haven, not the other way around. Because there isn't any other way around. Tony didn't kill Walter, I swear it. Now, will you take the case, or won't you? Well, I'll have to think about it. Uh, for one thing, I'll have to find out if Tony Gerard wants me to handle it. I want you to. And I'll pay you, at least when the insurance payment is made. Are you sure it will be paid? Well, why not? Walter is dead. Why shouldn't the insurance company pay? That's a very good question, Mrs. Haven. Um, tell me, Mr. Briggs, uh, what kind of insurance policy did Mr. Haven carry? Ordinary life. And Mrs. Haven was the sole beneficiary? That's right. I understand uh, Walter Haven wasn't exactly rolling in money. How could he afford a policy that size? It was a substantial premium, I guess, but... What the heck, he only paid it for a year. And now look what he's getting for his money. You mean, what his widow is getting? Well, let's put it this way. What his widow would get. Unless we stop her. What? Mr. Hendricks, my company isn't going to pay that lady half a million dollars. Because, you see, we don't believe in rewarding murder. Are you saying you think Adrian Haven killed her husband? She's the beneficiary. That's one reason. You got a better one? Tony Gerard. That's two. One another one, she didn't love her husband. One another, she, she was a poor girl who thought she was marrying a rich man until she found out that Walter Haven had a grand old name in politics. Hardly a grand in his bank account. You know, of course, the police have arrested Tony Gerard for this murder. I also know that Mrs. Haven had a perfect alibi. She was 20 miles from the house when the gun was fired. But you know what I think, Mr. Hendricks? I think it was still her pink index finger on that trigger. Figuratively speaking, of course. Mm, you think they were in it together, huh? Gerard and Mrs. Haven? Bullseye. Mr. Hendricks, how would you like to make $10,000? How? Hop over to our side. Help us prove what we know is true, that Mrs. Walter Haven killed Mr. Walter Haven for the sake of her lover boy. That way, they get rid of the guy. Tony collects the money he was owed, and Adrian Baby gets a nice bundle to keep her for the rest of her life. Everybody's happy. But not my company, Mr. Hendricks. Hmm. I'm sorry, Mr. Briggs. I, I don't think I could do such a thing to a client. I thought you said she wasn't your client yet. She is now. Sure you wouldn't like a little brandy with that, Mr. Hendricks? No, thank you, Dr. Sims. Uh, <laughs> shame to drink coffee without brandy. <laughs> Shame to do anything without brandy. Only don't tell my daughter I said that. She thinks I drink too much of the stuff as it is. Well, you're the doctor. <laughs> That's just what I tell Adrian. Oh, hello, Mr. Hendricks. Mrs. Haven. I'm sorry about coming downstairs so late. Mrs. Haven, I've decided to take your case. Oh, I'm so glad. Oh, wait, wait a minute, I... I don't think I like the way you put that, Mr. Hendricks. You mean Tony Gerard's case? Well, I'm 
I'm not so sure it is Tony Gerard's case anymore. Well, if you're talking about those darn rumors... Your daughter told me you were a good collector of rumors, Doctor. Then you may have heard what the district attorney is considering. Not just a murder charge against Tony Gerard, but a charge of conspiracy to murder against your daughter. But they can't. It isn't true. What? That would be terrible, Adrian. If the case against Gerard is as solid as it appears, he won't have a chance. His muddy footprints are all over that room. His fingerprints are on the door that leads to the garden. There was no weapon found, but the police believe he simply discarded well, it. That still doesn't mean my daughter is involved. But if the D.A. can prove that they were lovers, if not now, then in the past... Please stop this. I don't want to hear any more. Mrs. Haven, I can't defend Gerard because I don't think I can win. But if you want to retain me... Mr. Hendricks, what I want you to do is to hear the whole truth. Adrian, now, wait, wait a minute. No, Dad. I have to tell him. Things are getting out of hand. Mr. Hendricks, the reason I know that Tony didn't kill my husband is because Walter killed himself. I'm sorry. I can't accept that. But it's true. There wasn't a single bit of evidence pointing to suicide. No note, no weapon. And as far as the police know, no motive. But there was such evidence, only I... I got rid of it. You did what? I'll tell you exactly what. When I came home that night, it was late. After 1.30. I'd been to a party, alone. Walter insisted that I go. He had a speech to write for the nominating committee of his party... That was the most important thing in Walter's life. Getting that party nomination. Becoming a senator. When I arrived at the house, it was terribly quiet. We did have a servant, an old woman who took care of the place, but she was ill in the hospital, so... Walter was alone. I saw the light on in his study when I drove up. I went inside... I couldn't believe what I saw. At first, I, I thought Walter was just asleep at his desk, his head on the blotter. But as I came closer, I saw that he was lying in his own blood. I saw the gun lying on the carpet. Then I saw the note that Walter had been writing just before he shot himself. Half of it was soaked in his blood... It said, Adrian, darling, forgive me. That's all. I guess it was enough. But then I remembered something else, something I'd heard only a week or so before. Walter on the telephone, joking with one of his political cronies, saying something about committing suicide if he didn't get that nomination. Only he couldn't do that, he said, because it would make his insurance policy void. And then I realized that's exactly what was going to happen. Walter's suicide wouldn't just cost me a husband. I would lose the proceeds on his life policy, too. I'd be penniless again, with no one to take care of me. Or my father... I couldn't bear the thought of it. I picked up the suicide note and threw it in the fire. And then I took the gun and got rid of it. Good Lord, Mrs. Haven. Are you saying that you preferred people to think it was murder? It was the only way I could get that money. I was just being practical. Why shouldn't I think of myself? Walter wasn't thinking of me when he pulled the trigger. Yes, but what was he thinking about? Why did he pull that trigger? I don't know. Did he know about you and Tony? There was nothing between us. There hadn't been for years and years, and Walter knew all about that. Mrs. Haven, you're telling me that your husband was a happy man. But he was. He was the happiest man you could ever want to meet. Oh, nonsense. He was psychotic or something. You can't ever know about people. I can tell you that. I'm a doctor. Or used to be, anyway. Uh, sorry, Dr. Simmons. But let's face it. 
Why would a happy man kill himself? It's a good question, and it deserves a good answer. Why would somebody with a beautiful wife and a brilliant future decide to put a bullet through his head? Was Walter Haven nourishing a secret so dark and terrible that the only solution for him was oblivion? How do you learn a dead man's secrets? We'll find out how Tom Hendricks tries to do exactly that when we return with Act Two. Attorney Tom Hendricks is a man with a problem. His client, Adrian Haven, has told him a story that no one could possibly believe. She has described a suicide note that has become nothing but ashes. She has described a gun that lies at the bottom of a river. She has claimed that her husband, Walter Haven, had killed himself, despite the fact that he had everything to live for. If I read one more political speech... I know, I'm sorry. I'm afraid Walter's speeches don't make very good reading, but they were effective enough. His party liked them. Well, I don't think we're going to find a motive for suicide among his political writings. But you haven't found anything in his personal correspondence? No, nothing at all. You did a good job, Mrs. Haven. Uh, please, Adrian? Yeah, you did a good job, Adrian. You preferred murder, and murder's what you got. There's not a speck of evidence to prove that your husband didn't want to live anymore. The only problem he had seems to have been that $15,000 he borrowed from Tony Gerard's private loan company. He wouldn't kill himself over that. The only reason he wasn't making those payments was... Yes? Was... Walter didn't like Tony, of course. He knew that Tony and I had known each other years ago. I I think he enjoyed making Tony wait. Hmm. But guys like Tony Gerard don't like to wait for their money, do they? Tony didn't kill him. I told you what happened in this room. Yes, you told me. But you knew something. I'd like your friend Tony to tell me, too. Yeah, I know who you are. You're the lawyer. That's right. I thought we should get together, Mr. Gerard. Why? You're not my lawyer, you're hers. Yes, Mrs. Haven is my client. I thought you might be interested in helping her out. I'm the one that's sitting in jail. I'm sure you know that the district attorney is considering a conspiracy charge against Mrs. Haven. So... It might not be too long before she's in jail, too. Ah, oh, come on, that's crazy. Adrian couldn't have killed that creep. She was at a party, 20 miles from the house. Look, I know she didn't do it. When I said conspiracy, Mr. Gerard, meaning that you and she were in this together. Well, well that's even crazier. Me and Adrian haven't been together in any way for five years. Why don't you talk to me? Okay. All right. What do you want to know? Well, to start with, what happened that night? Walter owed me 15 grand. He dropped the 15 in Vegas on credit that he didn't pay. I bought the debt from my buddy at the club and I tried to collect. Boy, I liked having that creep owe me something. Anyway... He got a little nervous about it, especially when he uh, had the nominating convention coming up. <laughs> so he said he'd pay. And that's what I was doing out there that night, coming to collect. He sent Adrian off to some dinner party, saying he had to work on his next speech. <laughs> he knew I was coming there. He told me to come in by the garden so I wouldn't have to use the front door. It was a cold wet night and dark too I uh, couldn't find the stone path to the doors right away so my uh, shoes got all muddy but I didn't care if I messed up his fancy carpet I saw a light on I pushed open the doors hey, if 
for, uh, for a minute, I, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Haven was at his desk. There was blood all over it. Blood on the papers, blood dripping down the sides. There, uh, wasn't much left of his head. I knew it was a bullet that did it. I felt sick when I saw him, but I walked up to the desk and I saw the gun lying there and I knew that he must have shot himself. And you know what I thought? That the guy had waited for me. That he had planned to kill himself that night and figured I might be blamed. I thought any minute the cops would bust into the place and arrest me. Only I wasn't going to wait for that to happen. Oh, no thanks. I turned around and got out of there just as fast as I could. And that's all. That's all. Understand? Mr. Gerard, did you see the suicide note? No. You do know that Adrian says her husband left a note. Well, if she says it, it's true. And you actually saw the gun. The one she says she threw in the river. Oh, it was there, all right. But you realize how it looks, don't you? It looks like murder because that's the way she wanted it to look. It was suicide. He knocked himself off. Why? How should I know? Because somebody's got to know. He can't think of any reason in the world why Walter Haven might have been unhappy. Are you kidding? He had Adrian, didn't he? Well, if you young folks will excuse me, I think I'll go up to bed. Oh, Dad, I think you should. I'm sorry dinner was so late. If you ask me, young lady, you're the one who should retire early. You don't look well at all. Well, I'm all right. <clears throat> well, say good night, then. Good night, Dad. Good night, Doctor. We still don't have a lead on a suicide motive. Oh... That reminds me, I uh, found a few more things in Walter's desk. A few bills and an invitation. Well, it doesn't sound too promising, but I might as well look through them. Here they are. It's just bills, as you said. And this invitation. You are cordially invited to attend a piano recital featuring the works of Bach, Beethoven, and Chopin. July 24th, 8.30 p.m., Please bring this card with you. Black tie donations. 909 St. Andrews Avenue. The Friends of Joachim. You know, there's nothing too unusual about that. Well, there is one thing. What's that? Walter didn't like music. The Friends of Joachim. That's a funny name. Well, maybe Joachim was a composer, a pianist. I wouldn't know. Anyway, Walter wouldn't ever have gone to a recital. Well, maybe that's why it's important. Hey, you know something? What? The date. Today is July 24th. This piano recital is tonight. What are you thinking of? Maybe it's time I got a little more musical education. Maybe I ought to meet the friends of Joachim. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Oh, uh, <clears throat> good evening. This is the residence of uh, the friends of Joachim? This is Mr. Joachim Fry's residence, sir. Please come in. Thank you. Your invitation, sir? Uh, here you are. Sorry I was late. I had a little trouble finding the house. That's all right, sir. The concert hasn't started yet. Uh, would you please put your mask on? My what? Your mask, sir. But I don't have a mask. Well, you better have, buddy, or you ain't getting in here. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know that it was a, a, a costume party. You mean Mr. Fry didn't tell you? No, he didn't. That's funny. Well, okay, buddy, I think I got one here. Yeah, here it is. All right, put it on. Then go inside and sit down. Good evening, gentlemen. It's quiet in here, isn't it? Oh, excuse me, is this seat taken? 
Yeah. Hmm. Thanks. Do you, um... Do you come here often? How do I can help it? It's not too big a crowd, is it? I don't suppose there are more than, um, half a dozen of us here? Hmm. Did, uh, Mr. Fry tell you to bring your mask? Of course. What's the idea, anyway? I mean, I feel a little foolish sitting around with a bunch of masked men. Huh? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, who's that? Joachim. You mean you don't know? Welcome, friends of Joachim. Uh, thank you for your attendance this evening. I've planned a very special program tonight. My first offering this evening is a familiar group of preludes and fugues called The Well-Tempered Clavier by Johann Sebastian Bach. Thank you, thank you, thank you, gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed this evening's concert. Uh, and now I shall be pleased to accept your donations. Mr. Sawyer will collect your envelopes. Uh, you first, mister. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Good night. And you, sir. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night, now. Thank you. Good night, sir. Well, you're the last one. Oh, uh, uh, how much is the uh, usual? I beg your pardon, sir? Well, this is my first recital. I, I'm afraid I didn't come prepared. To... Are you kidding me? No, it's true. Let's have that mask. Here. Fry, come out here. Uh, yeah, what is it, sire? We got a gatecrasher here. Do you know him? I never saw him before. Well, the truth is that it wasn't exactly me who was invited. He had an invitation. He gave it to me. Where'd you get that invitation, buddy? I found it. How dare you do this? This is a private recital. Sire, show the gentleman what we think of intruders. It'll be a pleasure, Mr. Fry. Now, wait a minute. You like music, huh? Okay, fella, get set to hear some birdies. <laughs> Much as we deplore violence, I'm sorry to say C. Thomas Hendricks has just become the victim of it. What's even worse, Tom Hendricks has taken this punishment without coming much closer to the solution to his problem. What connection is there between the suicide of Walter Haven and a piano recital attended only by men wearing masks? Perhaps when Tom recovers consciousness, he'll be able to make that connection. We'll find out when we return with Act Three. Tom Hendricks doesn't really remember how he got from the brownstone house of Joaquin Fry to the suburban home of Adrian Haven. But when he came to his senses, he found that he had a ministering angel at his bedside. But Tom was lucky. It was only his cheek, his nose, and his ego that were bruised. And when he was well enough to think, he found that his aching head was still clear enough to make some interesting assumptions. It, it has to be the answer. Everything points to it. Don't you see? No, I don't. All I see is black and blue. Tom, shouldn't you do something about these people? Adrian, I figured it all out. I know why your husband killed himself. You do? Well, almost. You see, I know what was going on at that so-called recital. What? Well, it wasn't for the sake of the music, I can tell you that. The name of the song Joachim Fry was playing was Blackmail. Blackmail? How do you figure that? Those guys handed over their donations because they were forced to, not because they wanted to. Mr. Fry gave them a reason to make donations. A better reason than his questionable talent. 
But why the recital? Why the friends of Joachim? Well, probably to cover the traces of blackmail. To give them some legitimate reason for their donations. Something Joachim can justify when it's income tax time. But why the masks? Well, that's the most obvious part of all. If you were a blackmail victim, would you want the rest of the world to know? No, of course not. Therefore... The only way Fry could bring his victims together in one place was to require them to wear masks. So there was no chance of recognizing each other. Tom, what you're saying is that Walter may have been blackmailed. That's what I think, Adrian. Your husband was also a friend of Joachim. But why? I'm afraid I still don't know. But maybe I can find out. Tom, you wouldn't go back to that place, would you? I have to go back, or I'll never find out what we have to know. But what makes you think they'll tell you anything? I'll just have to be very convincing, won't I? Good evening, sir, won't you... Hey, what is this? Are you back again? Yeah, that's right, Mr. Sawyer. Maybe you didn't get the message the last time. You're right. I didn't have the whole message, but I know a lot more now than I did then. Let me give you some advice. Do you have another recital tonight? Maybe, but you're not invited. Even if I brought a donation... A what? Here. Have a look at this. What is it? Hey, what's this all about? It's all about you, Mr. Sawyer. It's your rap sheet. A friend of mine at police headquarters was good enough to give me a copy of it. So you see, I know more about you than you do me. I know you've been arrested four times for dealing in what they refer to as toxic substances. Drugs to you, pal. Hey, who are you anyway? A friend of Joachim, that's all. Tell me, Mr. Sawyer, is that how you and Mr. Fry develop your list of blackmail victims? Through their drug purchases? I think you better talk to Mr. Fry about this. Oh, I was hoping you'd say that. In here. Oh, what is it, Sawyer? You know I don't like to be... Disturbed. Look who's back, Mr. Fry. You again? I think he's a cop. Police? Well, what have the police got to do with me? I'm a musician. You're a blackmailer, Mr. Fry. Oh, that is ridiculous. Everyone who attends my recitals is here voluntarily. They're here because they're users, Mr. Fry. And they don't want the rest of the world to know about it. Or because they've gotten so mixed up in things involving drugs that they want to keep quiet. Get rid of him, Sawyer. Now, wait a minute. I want to hear what he has to say, Fry. I don't want to get him mixed up with cops. He can't be the police. He would have flashed his badge the last time he was here. You're right, Mr. Fry. I'm not with the police. But I can blow a whistle as loud as any cop. And maybe I will. If you don't answer one question for me... And what is that? You were blackmailing a man named Walter Haven, weren't you? Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I never heard of him. Well, he was one of the friends of Joachim. It was his invitation I used the last time I was here. It is not true. I never heard of Walter Haven. And he was never, never at one of my recitals. Now, look, you've got nothing to lose by telling me the truth. Walter Haven is dead. Dead or alive, we don't know the guy. What the devil... What do you want in here? You've given your last concert, Fry. So, he's got a gun. Take it easy, mister. You're never gonna play another note. Ah! Give me that gun, you crazy... Then, they're dead? Both of them? That's right, Adrian. They're dead. Both Sawyer and Joachim Fry killed by one of their blackmail victims. Now we'll never know what Walter's secret was. But I do know. You what? I know the answer, Adrian. You see, the secret of Walter Haven is that he had no secret. <laughs> what on earth do you mean? I mean, the secret was yours, Adrian. My. I thought it was him at first. That he was a user of the stuff or had been once and, and that that would have killed his chances in politics. 
But it's you, Adrian. How can you even think that? I began to remember things about you. Your sudden illnesses, your reliance on pills, the long-sleeved dresses you always wear. Really, Tom? Can you honestly tell me that there aren't puncture marks on your body? <laughs> As a matter of fact, there are. You can ask Father. I need vitamin injections all the time. Those funny little B vitamins and iron and liver and all that. I may be a human pincushion, but I'm not one of those... What's that awful word? Junkies? Yes, it wasn't easy to apply the word to you, Adrian. You hired me. You wanted me to find out the cause of your husband's misery, but you really knew it all the time. No, I swear I didn't. I never heard of Joachim Frau. Oh, but obviously your husband heard of him. You became Sawyer's customer. And whatever Sawyer knew, Joachim knew. I swear I never heard of either of those two men before you mentioned their names. And you also swear that you are not a user? No, I'm not. In fact, you look very much in need of something right now, Adrian, don't you? No. Well, I'll tell you what, then. Suppose we just stay here in this library for the next four or five hours, hmm? Are you crazy? I'm not sure you can even last that long without your next fix, Adrian. Well, you are wrong. You're completely wrong. In fact, why don't I make sure that we're not disturbed? Huh? I'll just shut this door. What are you doing? <clears throat> Locking us in, Adrian. I'm closing the door against the outside world. You can't keep me a prisoner in here. You're not my prisoner, Adrian. You're a prisoner of your own habit. It's not true. It isn't true. Daddy! Daddy, help me! Yes. Yes, it was Daddy who helped you, wasn't it? He was a doctor once. He could get prescriptions filled. All sorts of prescriptions. Daddy, help! He's locked me in! Your father knows all about you, Adrian. He's the one who's been keeping you normal, if that's what you call the torment you're in. Daddy! Adrian, what's going on? Daddy, please help me. He's got me locked in here. He won't let me out. It's just an experiment, Doctor. Help me, please, Daddy. I'm sick. All right, Dr. Sims. I'll open it. Your daughter needs you. Please try to understand. I love my daughter. She's all I've got in the world. When she left home five years ago, it was as, as if... The sun went down and the stars never came out. And when she came back home, Dr. Sims, she was an addict, wasn't she? Yes. Can you imagine what I felt? I, I was a doctor. I, I knew what addiction meant. What, what an addict's life could become. Didn't you try to cure her? Oh, I tried. She was hard to handle. She didn't want cures. She wanted... Peace. I couldn't bear her anguish. So you supplied her? Yes, yes. At the time, drugs were easy for me to obtain. She didn't have to consort with criminals to get what she needed. But later, after I lost my practice... You didn't just lose your practice. You lost your license, didn't you? No, I... I was charged with misuse of drugs, but... I resigned before there was any public scandal. And then I had a more difficult time keeping poor Adrian supplied. Then I had to deal with these criminals. So you were Sawyer's contact? Yes. I had to deal with him. Walter Haven didn't know the truth, did he? Walter didn't know. I bore Adrian's secret myself, and her expenses as well. It was no small burden. And after she married Haven, did you still have the burden? An even greater one. Because this man Sawyer brought someone else into my life. Joachim Fry. Joachim Fry? I was the friend of Joachim. He threatened to tell Walter and the whole world about my poor child's affliction. 
He forced me to contribute a, a thousand dollars each time he staged one of his recitals. I had to wear a black mask to conceal my face from the others. So that invitation was yours. But what was it doing in Walter's desk? It was there because I gave it to him. Well, then he knew the truth. I had to tell him. I simply ran out of money, don't you see? And what was his reaction? Well, it wasn't what I expected. He was horrified. He screamed at me, narcotics, blackmail, the publicity, the damage it would do to his nomination for the Senate. And then he said a terrible thing to me, Mr. Hendricks. What? He said he would have to cut Adrian out of his life. You mean he was going to leave her? Yes. He was going to leave her immediately. Before the world knew about her addiction, he was going to disassociate himself from everything she represented. Right before my eyes, he sat down to write her a letter. Good Lord. He wrote, Adrian, darling, forgive me. The suicide note. I couldn't let him finish that note. I remembered the gun Walter kept in his desk. I took it, thinking to frighten him. Instead, he became angry. He stood up and lunged at me. And I found myself squeezing the trigger. I shot him in the head. He fell back into the chair and I... I dropped the gun on the carpet and ran away. And when your daughter came home, she made murder look like murder. How, how would you like a new client, Mr. Hendricks? Call me Tom, Dr. Samus. Or you can even call me Clarence. So, Clarence Thomas Hendricks has a new client. And even if the defense of Dr. Sims doesn't make him as famous as Clarence Darrow, he still had the satisfaction of knowing that an innocent man has been set free. But what happened to Adrian Haven's father at the trial? Well, we'll be back to tell you what the verdict was shortly. Charles Sims went on trial for the murder of Walter Haven, and his defense attorney, C. Thomas Hendricks, portrayed him as a father who was willing to sacrifice anything for the sake of the daughter he loved. This sentiment wasn't lost on the jury, but they still returned a verdict of guilty of murder in the second degree, and Dr. Sims is dispensing his medical advice in the prison infirmary. Well, you can't win them all, Clarence. Our cast featured Tony Roberts, Terry Keene, Court Benson, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio.
radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of... The Night the Fog Came. All right, we'd better take a look. Come on. We're getting close to the lake. If only this fog. Wait a minute. There. Right there. Let's take a look. I hope he's all right. Throw him over. All right. He's dead. I know. I know. Do you realize how he died? What do you mean? Look at him closer, Hal. His clothes aren't wet. Even his hair isn't wet. But look at the water trickling from his mouth. This man died less than a minute ago on dry land, 200 yards from the lake. And he died by drowning. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Night the Fog Came. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled, The Night the Fog Came. If the theory of evolution is correct, then there is a connection between the minute organisms which are found to be living in water and life as we know it today. But what connection with us did those things have which came from out of the fog? What connection with human life did those horrible creatures who came from the depths have? And what is their purpose? Why did they suddenly appear and destroy, then vanish as suddenly as they had come? I shall tell you as much as I know about it. Listen to the tale of The Night the Fog Came. The first inkling of their existence came to us as we were going through some routine research. I dropped over to the lab to see Hal. Harold Enroth was perhaps one of the foremost men in his field. Our friendship stretched back for many years. I'd been away for a while, and so I dropped in at the lab to see him one morning. Jeff, you old dog, you're a sight for sore eyes. How are things going, Al? Fine, couldn't be better. How'd you like your vacation? I can't wait till next year. I hated to come back. You know, Jeff, I'm glad you dropped in. I, I have a little problem. Oh? No? What is it, money? No, not that. Here, I'll show you. Pull those blinds, will you? Uh, sure. Yeah, that's fine. There you are. I have a specimen here on the slide. I want you to take a look at it. Go ahead. Turn the projector on. All right. There. What do you think of that? Hmm. I don't know. It looks like some form of water life. But I don't think I've ever seen it before. This has been enlarged a hundred times. There's no use trying to recognize what it is. It's a form of water life completely unknown to us. A new form of life. Where did you get this? It's a specimen of water one of our field researchers took from the westernmost tip of Lake Superior, somewhere near the Wisconsin-Minnesota border. Have you contacted anyone else about it? No. Why not? Well, it's... Come on, come on. Don't try to avoid telling me how we know each other too well for All that. right, all right. Listen to me, Jeff. All right? Everything I say is fact. I've conducted countless tests to discover what I do know about this form of life. That thing is able to reproduce itself. A hydra type? Possibly. But that's beside the point right now. What's more important, all trace of the other organisms, organisms in that drop of water has disappeared. Are you serious? Of course I am. And another thing, there was a little mist hovering above what was left of the water. A, a mist? That's what I call it. Something like fog. Why, well, that's impossible. No, it's not. I know that when the water evaporated, it should have been dispersed into the air. Eventually it was, but not for several hours. Oh, I'm sorry, Hal. I still can't. Here, I'll show you. We have a little of the water left. It's over here in this jar. You can see for yourself. Well, it looks just like ordinary water. I know it does. But believe me when I say it isn't. Now, it'll take just about three minutes. Do you see what's happening? I can't believe my eyes. See that little cloud of misty vapor beginning to form like fog? Yes. But what causes it? I wish I knew. Our field men say the conditions up there are getting to be unbearable. 
The whole area for a hundred square miles is almost covered completely by this fog. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going up there myself. Jeff, if I send for you, will you join me? Of course. I may need you. I may need everyone I can get. It's begun to prey on my mind, Jeff. Somehow I think there's something in back of this. Something the likes of which the world has never seen. Something evil. Hal went up there the afternoon of the morning I had seen him. At first he wrote that the reports had been exaggerated. Then he discovered that all traces of the new form of life had disappeared. He decided to return. I was quite glad to get that letter from Hal. Before he had gone up there, he had been quite worried. The only thing I couldn't understand was what had become of the new water life form. The day before he was to return to the city... Hello? Jeff, this is Hal. Where are you? I thought you... I had them put me through direct to you, Jeff. I need your assistance. What's the matter? I've already called Arnold Simpson and Jack Rackle. They've agreed to come. I need you too, Jeff. Just as soon as you can possibly make it. Don't worry, Hal. I'll be there. Remember, as soon as you can possibly make it. I knew Arnold Simpson, and he and I went up together. The train left Chicago and headed north, and then slightly west over Illinois and Wisconsin. Simpson and I talked it over on our way up there. Hal talked to you before he left, didn't he, Arnold? Yes, he did. I never had enough time to get up to his lab so he could show me what it was, but his words were description enough. Frankly, I'm worried. In what way? Jeff, why should a new form of water life suddenly appear? Why should it destroy everything with which it comes into contact? And why should the mist or the fog appear to be so dense and heavy? I don't know. That's just the trouble we don't know. Where has this form of life been, or did it just develop? What's its reason for being here? Perhaps we'll find the answers to those questions when we get there, Arnold. Perhaps. But I'm convinced of this much, Jeff. Whatever it is, whatever that fog is hiding, poses a new problem for us. A problem which may be unsolvable. And which could very well destroy the human race. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Night the Fog Came. Simpson seemed disinclined to talk, so we spent the remainder of the trip in silence, both of us lost in our thoughts. We arrived at the town and then hired a car to take us to the little village, where we would find Hal Enroth. The closer we came to our final destination, the darker the sky became, and the air was heavy with a mist which was both damp and clammy. It was an old rickety car, and the roads were little better than the ground on either side of it. The car stopped a few hundred feet from our destination. You gotta walk the rest of the way. You said you'd drive us home. Look, right? mister, I come farther than I was going to in the first place. I ain't no mood to go into the woods up there. If you're gonna go, then you walk in. Jeff, can't you do something? I don't think so. Here's your pay. Thanks. Let's go, Arnold. It could be worse, Arnold. I suppose so. He seemed genuinely afraid. Aren't you? A little. Hey, we must be pretty close to the lake. I've never seen the fog this thick. It's un- unnatural. Eventually, we made it up to the house. Hal was there waiting for us and showed us where we would sleep. Through the window, I could see that the fog seemed to be getting thicker. That's a neary, lonely sound. You get used to it after you've been here for a while. Hal, you wrote me that this fog, the new form of life, had disappeared. It had. But two days ago, it suddenly reappeared. And with it, the fog returned. Then there must be a connection between the two. Yes, but what? I haven't any idea. Look, I have to go down to the village for some food. We don't have enough here to feed the four of us. Will you come with me, Jeff? Certainly. I'll be right back, Arnold. It's only about a mile away near the lake. Go ahead. That trip made me tired. I think I'll take a nap. The house in which we were staying was on a high level of ground which tapered off on the side facing the lake. It was only three in the afternoon, but it looked almost as dark as late evening. 
And there was something about that cloudy mist. It was cold and clammy and smelled strongly of the lake. I don't see how you were able to stand it up here by yourself. Well, I had a lot of things to interest me. I was all ready to meet you at the station, but then when I got your call, I didn't know what to think. I wish I could understand this, Jeff. The fog disappeared when the water life disappeared. When signs of this strange new form of life showed again, the fog came back. Why? Maybe we can find the answer to that. And I hope so. Actually, the sound of that fog horn does get on your nerves. Yes, I can imagine it would. You know, if this were a clear day, you could see the village from here. Oh? Actually, it's just a tiny resort town for fishermen and hunters. And it's located right on the westernmost tip of the lake. Imagine it must... Ah! It! It! Ah! it came from our right. We'd better take a look. Come on. We're getting close to the lake. There's only this fog. Wait a minute. There. Right there. Let's take a look. I hope he's all right. All right. Roll him over. Okay. He's dead. I know. But do you realize how he died? What do you mean? Look at him closer, Hal. His clothes aren't wet. Even his hair isn't wet. But look at the water trickling from his mouth. This man died less than a minute ago on dry land... 200 yards from the lake. And he died by drowning. That's not possible. Are you sure he drowned? There must be a doctor down at the village. Let's take him down there and see what the doctor says. Only I'm sure he'll agree with me. Together, we carried the man down to the village. Luckily for us, he was a slight build, not too heavy. It took us almost half an hour to get him down there. When we finally did arrive, it took another few minutes to locate the doctor. What do you think, doctor? You're getting in, Mountain. All right. Will you uh, please wait outside? The doctor can't work with you in here. He's just like all the others, ain't he, Doc? Please wait outside. Thank what, you. What did he mean by he's just like all the others, doctor? Just what he said. Ever since this fog has settled down again, five people have died. All in the same way? Yes. You... You mean by drowning? That's right. I can't understand how this man we found could die by drowning when he wasn't in the water. You know, he reached him about a minute after he screamed. How could he drown? Professor Enroth, I've been asking myself that same question about all the others. I've been almost half insane these past two days trying to find the solution. And Dr. Craig, this fog, has it always been like this in the area? No. Not until about two months ago. Which coincides with the time we first discovered that new form of water life. What did you say? Uh, nothing, Doctor. We're doing a little research work up here, that's all. If this keeps up, I'm afraid of what might happen. I've never seen anything like it before. The fog, those deaths, how can they be explained? We don't know, Doctor. We just don't know. When we got back to the house, we discovered that Simpson had indeed taken a nap. Our arrival must have awakened him, for as we entered, he came slowly down the stairs from the second floor. Need any help? No, we can manage, but come out to the kitchen with us. What's the matter with you two? We found a dead man on our way to the village. Are you serious? Let's set those bags on the table. All right. Oh, I'm not joking, Arnold. We heard a scream. It took us about a minute to get to him. He was dead when we got there. A knife? Drowned. What? On dry land, 200 yards from the lake. You must be insane. No, it's the truth, Arnold. And there have been four other deaths just like it. When did they happen? In the last two days. Since the fog reappeared. That's right. Then there is a definite connection between this fog and the new life form you've discovered, Hell. That's right. But what's the connection? We'd gotten back to the house about six o'clock. It was about seven that it happened. Simpson said he was going outside for a minute. He opened the door. I just want to get outside for a minute. Good heavens. What's wrong? Take a look. The fog is so thick. I've never seen anything like that before. Shut the door. Some of it's getting inside. It's moving along the floor. Just Shut the door. Did you see it? Yes. The fog. Just like it was alive. Moving like like a living thing. Creeping along the floor. Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Night the Fog Came. And 
Simpson had opened the door, the fog crept into the house in little wisps that curled and snaked this way and that. It looked like a thing alive. You saw it, didn't you, Hell? Yes, I saw it. What does it mean? I'm afraid of what it means. You mean you... you know? I hope I'm wrong, but I'm afraid I'm not. It's just possible that this form of life is developed from something that was present in the water all the time. The great brute animals ruled the world before man appeared and then were destroyed. Eventually, mankind wrested the supremacy of the earth from the other animal and plant life. Perhaps the cycle is to continue. Perhaps, after man, this new form of life. As the minutes passed by, we noticed that little slips of the fog began inching their way through every opening of the house. It was Simpson who pointed down at the bottom of the door and first brought it to our attention. We began to plug up all the openings in the house. At first, we did it slowly, but as time passed, we worked faster and more feverishly. No matter how tired we became, we had to finish the job or the fog might claim the house, too. It was too quiet. The only thing we heard was the distant, monotonous call of the foghorn. And then Hal broke the silence. Do you know why this fog is so thick? I wish I did. This might be insane, but it has to be the answer. That fog is carrying moisture, a lot of it, perhaps enough to also carry this new form of life. To move it from place to place, to spread it even farther. To kill everything which stands in its way. That might be it. It is, I'm sure it is. Well, in that case, what happened to break it up the first time? And that's the solution to the problem. I don't know what it is, but it did break it up the first time. It drove it back, down to the depths from where it came. That's why there was no sign of it in the water. That came from right outside the house. Racco. He said he was going to arrive this evening. We'd better take a look. Uh, bring the flashlight. Right, let's go. That light can carry more than a few feet. It's so wet out here. Over there, look. Little pinpoints of light dancing up and down, all clustered together. That must be it. Come on. It's spreading out. All right, look. There, on the ground. It's Racco. The same way. The same way as the other one. specks of dancing luminescence had withdrawn from Rakow's body, but now we noticed that there seemed to be more of them. We carried the body back to the house. We'd forgotten to close the door behind us, and some of the fog had gotten inside. It wasn't too bad, however, and little by little it began to disperse. Look out that window. Yes, I see them. Gathering together with a whole mass, getting larger and larger all the time. Separating like the Hydra. It must be destroyed. Yes, but how? They created the fog. That must be the only way they can travel on land. They must have a basic water carrier. Have you realized what this means? What are you getting at? The area this fog now covers is a hundred square miles. Every animal in this area may lose its life. And then what happens? They divide again and again and again. And the area of the fog keeps getting larger all the time. If it isn't stopped now, while we still have a chance, it may never be stopped. And I ask you the same question, Simpson. How? I don't know. Someone outside. Let him in quickly. They're moving towards the house. Oh, thank goodness. I didn't think I'd make it. It's a miracle that you did. Sit down, Doctor. Thank you. I was out for a call on my way back to town. I noticed how thick the fog was. And then I noticed the animals lying dead in the forest. The smell of their death was in the air. I continued on towards the town. And then I saw the bodies lying just where they had fallen. The whole town seemed to be covered by a strange luminescent mass, which in some manner moved. I was afraid. Then I thought of you people in this house, and I got here as soon as I could. I don't know how long we'll be able to withstand them, Doctor. I'm sure the townspeople are dead now. In fact, almost every living creature in the area must be dead. But what is it? What caused it? If we get out of this alive, Doctor, we'll tell you. Look outside. It must have split again. It's twice the size it was. What are we going to do? Look under the doorway. They're getting through. Lock it up. Use some newspaper. Close anything. We've got to stop it. Constant opening and closing of the door. Loosen the other things we have down there. I think that will do. Look. The things that did get in. First you see their light and then they're gone. What happens to them? Perhaps we can't see them. Or perhaps they die. Now, wait a minute. Your first letters to me mentioned the fact that the mist had been dispersed. What caused it? I don't know. Doctor, you're a native of these parts. Yes. I want you to tell me about anything unusual which happened that day. Well, I don't remember anything about that day particularly. I, I remember I was quite pleased to see that the fog had lifted. It was a beautiful day. Unseasonably warm. 
In fact, the, the sun was quite hot. Heat. I wonder if... If what, yeah? These things, these hydrotype creatures must die in the heat. This house is quite warm. The day the fog was dispersed was warm with a bright sun. Perhaps that's the answer. Doctor, is there any fire break around this area? Well, there was one cut through the trees several years ago. Yes, in case of a fire, a bad one in the heavy timberlands. Everyone was instructed to get into this area. In other words, there's a complete fire break around this entire area. Yes, it comprises about 150 square miles. Then that's it. It's the only chance we have. We'll burn out this area and hope it dries them back. There's some oil downstairs. Get it. We'll start the fire here and hope it sets fire to the trees surrounding this house. Be right back. We'll have to make a run for it once this place is on fire. We may not come out of this alive, but we can try. Everybody knows what... You'd better light it. Those things outside, they're going to get in. Each man will carry a torch. Yes. All right, light your torches. All right. And then set fire to this house. All right. right. Lighting mine. All right. And yours now. All right. One more. Good night. Uh, under the door. They're pouring in under the door. Set the house on fire. Let's get out of here. No matter what happens, keep holding those torches. They're afraid of fire. All right, make a run for it. fire caught hold and the entire area was burned out. A week later, the smoke had cleared and the fire was out. There was no sign of the fog which had meant death to so many things. I had caught a glimpse of the doctor. He had dropped his torch and it had gone out. He was immediately engulfed in those luminescent killers. I'm going back up there with Enroth and Simpson. Though there is now no trace of those things in the water, still we know they lurk somewhere waiting for their moment. We must destroy them once and for all before that moment arrives. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you Mr. Ralph Edwards in Ghost Hunt, a suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. Friends, replace worn-out narrow-gap spark plugs with a set of those new wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Your motor will idle smoother, give better performance on leaner gas mixtures, actually save gas. These winning benefits are all made possible by a newly developed Autolite 10,000 ohm resistor built right into every Autolite resistor spark plug, making practical a wider spark-gap setting. And that's what does the trick. What's more, Autolite resistor spark plugs with this exclusive Autolite resistor have greatly increased electrode life and cut down on radio and television interference. So folks, see your Autolite dealer and have him replace old, worn-out, narrow-gap spark plugs with a set of the new Autolite resistor spark plugs. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And also remember, the Autolite suspense show is now on television. Every Tuesday night in many parts of the country. And now... Autolite presents Ralph Edwards in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense.
Yeah, didn't that leave you high, huh? Left me feeling treetop tall. That was Louis Armstrong's I Can't Give You Anything But Love. And that's all we have time for on the Hot and Mellow Hour tonight. Yes, 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 this is Smiley Smith, your favorite disc jockey. I hope, I hope, booting the Hot and Mellow Hour home for this evening. I'll be back again tomorrow night, minus the music, but with a little surprise for you. Tomorrow night, Friday night, as you know, is stunt night here at Station WXP. And have I got a stunt for you. Last week, if you remember, I planted my wire recorder in the steam room at a lady's Turkish bath and let you listen in on the playback, remember? <laughs> well, tonight, as soon as I leave the studio, do you know where I'm going? Hmm? Your friend Smiley is going to spend the night in a haunted house on a spook hunt. You heard me, a spook hunt in a haunted house. I'm bringing my little old wire recorder along with me, and if you tune in tomorrow evening at this time, you'll learn what it's like to spend a night in a haunted house. Ain't that something? <laughs> yeah. A real haunted house. No kidding. Four people are known to have committed suicide there. So tune in tomorrow night and share a real thrill with your old pal Smiley, I must be crazy, Smith. Good night. <laughs> Care for a cigar, Mr. Thorpe? I got some cigars in the dice there. No. Well, no reason for you to carry a chip on your shoulder, Mr. Thorpe. Oh, really? Well, I don't like this fool stunt. Well, I don't see it as a fool stunt at all. I really don't. I think it's the only way you're going to unload this house. Ordinary selling methods won't work in a case like this. I don't forget the reputation saddling this house. Four suicides since 1939. You know what people call it. The death trap. Yes. It's a lot of nonsense. Sure, but try to convince people of that. Anyway, when this disc jockey offered me this chance to kill all the rumors about the death or about the property, I just naturally jumped and took him up at it. Especially since it don't cost a cent. You sure about that? I'm not liable for a penny. Not a cent. We're doing him a favor letting him use the place, he said. Thanked me for the chance last night when I drove him out here. So one hand washes the other, as the feller says. He got a chance to pull off a stunt, and the wire recording will prove the people the property is A number one, and we increase the chance of selling the place. Well, as long as it doesn't cost me anything. Not a thing. He's using his own recorder, and I'm paying for the rental of a couple of walkie-talkies he hooked up to it. Well, uh, what about this, uh, Reed? Does he charge anything? He comes gratis, too. Dr. Reed is a, uh, whatchamacallit, a psychic investigator. Belongs to a couple of societies that do nothing but hunt ghosts. <laughs> He showed me articles he's written about it in their magazine. Uh -huh. Well, here's the house. Yeah, looks real nice in the sunshine, don't it? Yeah, man, smell that sea breeze. You don't have to sell me. Well, let them know we're here. Yeah, probably asleep up all night and everything. Why don't they come out? You think they've gone? Well, I told them last night I'd pick them up around 11. Uh, Smith! Smith! Hey, Smiley! Dr. Reed! Yeah, fast asleep, I guess. We better go in and wake him up. Of course, they may have taken the bus back to town. No, oh, no, no. It's a two-mile hike to the main highway. Uh, Smith! Hey, uh, Smiley! Where are you? Wake up! You don't suppose, uh, do you? Oh, no, no. Uh, uh Smith! Uh, Dr. Reed! What's that, that, uh, clicking noise from in there? Well, it's his wire recorder. He left it running. These machines cost a lot of money. Doesn't he care if he uses up his batteries? Well, where is he and where's this reed? Maybe they're upstairs. Uh, Smith? Hey, anybody home? They must have walked to the highway and taken the bus. Well, he wouldn't have left these machines. Well, where are they then? Where are they? No, 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 don't get excited, Mr. Thorpe. Don't tell me not to get excited. If something's happened to them in my house, I'm liable. Well, you try this side. I'll try that one. All right. Uh, Smith. Hey, Smiley. Smith. 
Smith. Oh. McDonald, come here. No, what? What it? Oh, no. Ree. Dr. Ree. No, no, don't touch him, Mr. Thorpe. You'll get your hands off. Look. Blood. Is he dead? I can still feel his pulse. We better get him to hospital fast. for a cigar, Mr. Thorpe? No, no, thanks. Well, why not try to relax? The nurse said Reed would be all right as soon as he's had a blood transfusion. You told the radio station to be sure and call us as soon as they had any word about Smith? Yes, I told him. Uh, why don't you sit down? No, oh, I'm all at sixes and sevens. What do you suppose happened out there last night? Uh, we're going to know in just a second, just as soon as I can get this, this recorder set up. You don't suppose Smith and Reed got into a fight, do you? Yeah, there. Huh? A fight? I don't know. Well, what's wrong? Won't it work? Yeah, it works. Uh, take it easy. One, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. There. Testing. Listen. One, two, three. All set, Dr. Reed? Mr. McDonald? Hey? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> this is Smiley Smith speaking. Smiley Smith, the ghost hunter. I don't know whether to hope this will turn out to be a success for the sake of the program or a failure for my own sake. Anyway, all the preparations have been made now, and it's up to the spooks. I better tell you where we are. Right now, we're standing on the lawn of a house about 12 miles above Malibu Beach. The ocean is 100 feet away, straight down. The house is perched on a cliff, and there's a sheer drop of about 100 feet right into the old Pacific. Maybe you can hear the surf pounding. I'll turn up the volume. You hear it? Now... I'm going to have you meet two gentlemen who are here with me. Incidentally, we're the only people around for miles and miles. First, I'd like you to meet Dr. Clarence Reed of the British and American Psychical Research Guilds. Dr. Reed is a famous investigator of uh, psychic phenomena, and I'm very honored to be associated with him on this ghost hunt. He's smiling in an embarrassed sort of way. You're much too kind, Mr. Smith. Dr. Reed has conducted experiments in this field with such great believers in spiritualism as Oliver Lodge and Arthur Conan Doyle. He looks a bit like Santa Claus. He's short and stocky. You don't object, do you, Dr. Reed? Hmm? <laughs> no, 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 indeed. And he has a magnificent white beard, a truly great beaver. Dr. Reed is so enthusiastic about ghost hunting that he got out of a sick bed this evening to be with us. <laughs> Excuse me. My lungs. Mm -hmm. I was uh, gassed in the First World War. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Dr. Reed and I are here on the lawn looking at the house. Can't see much. It's around, oh, 11 p.m. now. Seems to be a rambling sort of house, two stories high. Since it was built, there have been four suicides here. Is that right? Uh, that's right. Now, in, into the mic, please. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> four suicides since 1939. I better tell them who you are so they won't think you're a ghost. Huh? Standing with the doc and me is a real estate agent, Mr. Charles McDonald. He handles his property, and he can tell you a lot more about it than I can. Well, the house was built by a man named Marcus, Toby Marcus, an orange grower. Built the house as a wedding present for his wife. A month after they moved in, she took her own life. On the day of her funeral, he committed suicide the same way. There have been two other cases since then, and did, I... Did they all uh, jump into the ocean? Yeah, yeah, all four of them, right over there. Yeah. The last one was actually seen doing it. About three years ago, he was seen running like all get out the edge of the cliff, and he was shouting and laughing and yelling as though there was people at his side running right along with him. You kidding? No, it's a fact. He was laughing and yelling and running, and when he got to the edge, uh, right over there, huh? he jumped and never came above water. <laughs> as good an argument against cold baths as ever I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since then, people just refuse to live in this house. Silly, I call it. Anyway, if you and Dr. Reed find any sign of a spook, I'll advise the owner to pull the house down and rebuild. But if you don't find anything, I'm hoping this will convince folks that here's a real buy. Yeah, okay, Mr. Smith, you and the doctor are on your own. I'll be by in the morning to pick you up around 11. Goodbye, Mr. McDonald. I hope yeah. there's something left for you to pick up in the morning. <laughs> well, it's almost pitch black, folks, and I guess Dr. Reed and I ought to begin. I don't believe in ghosts, never have, but what I say is this. If you're dead set on looking for them, this is a dandy place to do it. So long! Mr. McDonald just checked out, and then there were two. Well, three. Hmm? Oh, my dog, yeah. Uh, folks, I have my dog, Jeff, with me. He's a wire-haired terrier, three years of age, and he can talk. Yeah, say hello, Jeff. Come on, Jeff, say hello. Come on. 
Well, anyway, he's a wire-haired terrier, and he's three years old. Uh, shall we go inside now, Dr. Reed? I was about to suggest it. Now, uh, how do we hunt ghosts, Doctor? How do we do it, huh? Well, we don't really hunt them. If there should be any in the house, they will come to us. Oh, how cozy. And please, uh, not ghosts. Do not refer to them as ghosts. We know them as apparitions. Now, remember, I've no desire to hurt their feelings. Where ghosts are concerned, I say live and let live. <laughs> Well, we've opened the front door now. Maybe you heard the hinge squeak a little. Now we're standing here looking in. Can't see much. <laughs> Smells sort of musty and damp. The... What's the matter, Jeff? What's the matter, boy? Jeff. Oh, come on now. Come on. My dog seems to object to entering this house. He has all four feet braced and he's straining against the leash. Perhaps he senses something we don't. Like apparitions, maybe? Perhaps. It's not unusual. Animals lack the veneer of sophistication we humans possess and are more sensitive to such emanations. Yeah, come on, Jeff. Now, stop this nonsense. He probably smells a mouse or rat or something. Come on, Jeff. We're going in whether you like it or not. Well, there's a short entrance hall, and over there at the end of it is a flight of stairs leading to the second floor. Jeff! And uh, over here at the left is what seems to be a large reception room. We're entering this large room now. There are windows over there, French windows, and through them I can see the ocean. The electricity hasn't been turned on, so all I have to see by is a flashlight. Not a very powerful one at that. Dr. Reed is now adjusting his walkie-talkie. It's hooked up to my recorder so that he can cut in while he's hunting and tell us what he's found. Here's a few words from Doc before he sets forth on his investigation through the house. Ladies and gentlemen... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Smith has introduced me as a ghost hunter. He spoke, I think, in a spirit of skepticism and, and levity. I'd like to assure you all that my purposes here are serious. I have spent my entire life seeking reliable proof of the appearances of apparitions. Mm. Have you ever seen any, ever? I have seen phenomena which lead me to believe in the possibility of their existence, although I have never seen any. I account myself sensitive to the evidence of their existence. This house, for example, affects me profoundly. It doesn't seem to affect you in the same way. I'm not too happy about all this, if that's what you mean. You are not psychic and therefore not sensitive to these matters as I am. I imagine the question in the minds of those of you listening to us is, shall we find apparitions? I don't know. But I feel they are here and that they are evil. I sense danger. I shall soon know. Dr. Reed's leaving the room now to make a tour of the house. First thing I'm going to do is open the windows and let some fresh air in. Ah, it feels better already. Cooler anyway. I know that. Out! What was a bat? A, ba a bat just flew flew into the room. I, I think it's a bat, not a bird. I didn't actually see it. Just its its shadow as it fanned my face. There it is again. It touched me as it passed. Oh, oh, oh. Jeff! 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 Come back here! Jeff, you fool dog! Come back here! Doctor Reed. Doctor Reed. Dr. Reed! For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ralph Edwards in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hello, snap out of it. Huh? Oh, oh, uh, I'm reading a letter about the new Wide Gap Auto Light Resistor spark plugs, Hap. Oh. It's from Mrs. Clark Perry right here in Hollywood. She says, our 1948 station wagon has given constant trouble. Finally, the garage man said all the difficulty was spark plugs, and he installed a set of Auto Light Resistor spark plugs. Now the car runs beautifully. The very first time my husband has been really pleased. Well, smart garage man. Smart people to take his advice. Hap, you know, as more and more people learn about wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs and how they make an engine idle smoother, give better performance on leaner gas mixtures, actually save on gas, why then more people will replace old, worn out, narrow gap spark plugs with sensational new wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs. Any more letters like that, Harlow? Plenty, Hap, plenty. Why, here's another one from New York City. Oh, uh, read it to me later, Harlow. We haven't time because here's suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Ralph Edwards as Smiley Smith in Ghost Hunt. 
A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Here. Jeff, you fool dog, come back here. Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed. Reed speaking. What is it, Smith? Uh, Jeff has run off. My dog, he, he jumped through the window and ran off. Oh, so? I told you he sent something about this house, didn't I? Yeah, you want to come and see if you can determine what it was exactly that set him off? Uh, soon. I'm making my way slowly up the stairs toward the second floor now. I'm halfway up. I'll be down with you soon. <laughs> Folks, my dog's run away. You probably heard him howling. He jumped through the window and took off. Never did anything like that before. Frightened by the bat, I guess. Personally, alone here in this big room, I can understand how he must have felt. This isn't a cheerful spot by any means. I may not be psychic, but I sure have a feeling this house doesn't want us here. Read again. <coughs> Excuse me. I have something of great interest to report. I'm now standing in an alcove on the second floor trying to recover my breath. As I reached the head of the stairs, I felt what I think is a definite psychic manifestation. I felt suddenly as though I had been punched in the solar plexus. That's the only way I can describe it. At the same time, I began to perspire. Uh, my head is still swimming slightly, uh, and I have difficulty in swallowing. My pulse rate is around 110 in a minute. The sense of evil is very strong. I feel very... What shall I say? Profoundly depressed. Do you want me up there? Uh, no, I prefer to remain up here alone. The presence of a disbeliever such as you might interfere with my investigation. Folks, I'd like you to get a picture of what it's like here. It's very quiet, for one thing. I've never been in such a quiet place. And it's pretty dark. No light except my flashlight. Tell you what, you go now and douse all the lights you have on. Go ahead, put out the lights, and that'll give you a clearer feeling of how it is here with me. Go ahead, put out the lights. Hey, did, did you hear that? <laughs> Real estate agent told me I'd probably hear rats and mice in the walls. Well, I can certainly hear them now. Even you can hear them, I think. It's as though... Dr. Reed speaking. I've been working my way toward the front room, the one directly above the one in which Mr. Smith is now. The vibrations have become stronger and more and more pronounced as I approach it. I think I am on the verge of an important discovery. Important discovery? Did you get that? Now I can hear Dr. Reed moving about in the room above. I don't suppose you can. Have a try anyway, huh? Hear him? I hope he finishes his investigation soon because... Quite frankly, I'd like to get out of here. I can well imagine people becoming unhinged in this place. Right now, I find myself pretty jumpy. I'm not being very brave, am I? It's being alone in this room down here that does it. This, this darned old house, it's, it's a very, I mean, you know, the atmosphere, it's so very... I wish only to make this hurried report before continuing with the investigation in this room. I have carefully sounded out all the parts in this room, and the emanations are most strong from what appears to be a closet before which I am now standing. As soon as I open the door to this closet, I will have, I think, a thing of great interest to communicate. I find no key to the lock, and so I will attempt to remove the hinges with my penknife, and I will tell you what I find when I open it. I'll tell you what it would cost to get me to open that door. In the basement at Fort... <laughs> There's that bat again. It seems to like me the way it keeps... Each, each time it passes, it touches my face or my neck with its wings. <laughs> Smelly things, bats... I don't suppose they bathe very often, if at all. I wonder how... Get away, you bat! That bat'll be the death of me. That's like a jingle, isn't it? Bat'll be the death of me, the death of me, the death of me. Bat'll be the death of me. It isn't far from London. No, that isn't the way it goes. It's uh, come down to um, Q in lilac time, in lilac time, in lilac time. Come down to Q in lilac time. It isn't far... I haven't thought of that since I was a kid in grammar school. See, I had a lonely childhood when you come right down to it. I mean, uh, oh, that's my affair, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. It well, certainly is. I have succeeded in removing the hinges to the door, and I find inside it is not a closet, but much larger. It is, I think, a dressing room. I have not yet been inside, but I am about to enter. Uh, what was I talking about? Uh, oh, yeah, bats. Well, the bat flying back and forth in this room is... Did you hear that? Did, did you hear it? Dr. Reed must have knocked something over in the dressing room. A chair, a chair, yeah, a heavy chair by the sound of it. The chair, or whatever it was, must have fallen right right over my head. That's the way it sounded. I, I, I can see a small stain forming right on the ceiling, right, right over my head. <gasps> something ran across my foot just there. A rat, I think it was. I've always hated rats. Most people do, of course. That 
staying up there bothers me. It, it's gotten so big so soon. I think I'll take a chance and bother Reed and ask him what it is. Dr. Reed. Reed. Can you hear me? Are you all right? Hello? Al, he didn't answer. I, I, I think he's just a little bit deaf. I think so. What do you suppose he's found, huh? I'm afraid this is rather dull for you listeners. I, I'm not finding so, of course. There. there I, I heard him cough. Did you hear that cough? I hope he's all right. He's, he, he got out of a sick bed to come here this evening, you know. He was gassed in the First World War, and this place is beginning to get on my nerves a wee bit. Just a teensy-weensy bit. <coughs> Speaking, I... Hello? He switched off. That's a bad cough he's got. I feel so lonely. I've been alone so much in my life. Not so much now, of course, but when I was younger, I was alone so much of the time, you know, struggling to get ahead, living in a hall bedroom, wondering where my next meal is coming from. I get the blues just remembering it. Seem sad, young people having to spend so much time alone. Sad for old people, too, of course. I'm saying of course a lot. Of course I am. Hey, that stain on the ceiling, it's grown amazingly. It, it, it's actually beginning to drip. I mean, form bubbles. They'll start dropping soon. Colored bubbles, they seem to be. Odd-shaped stain, like a, a, a body lying on its back with its arms stretched out. <laughs> it's cheerful. <laughs> oh. I'll certainly advise Mr. McDonald to have this place pulled down. I'll go upstairs in a minute or two to see how Dr. Reed's making out. You know, listeners, I, I really believe I'd go completely crazy if I had to stay here much longer. Wears you down. That's exactly what it does. It wears you down. It's so close and musty in here. I feel sort of trapped. <laughs> Don't know why I said that. That's, that's what they call this place, you know, the death trap. There, what did I tell you? That stain started to drip drops. Drip drops. Drip drops. Drip drops. Drip. I'll catch the next one with my hand. Let you... <gasps> Reed! Dr. Reed! I'm, I'm going upstairs now, listeners. I'm, I'm afraid something has happened to Dr. Reed. I'm not kidding now. I mean, this is on the level. I, which room could it be now? Right? Le no, right, right. This is it, I think. Well, <laughs> oh, evening, gentlemen. And, and madam, I'm so glad to see you. I, I, I was just aching to see somebody, anybody. I, I've been so lonely down there. Uh, what have you done with the doctor, huh? I know, I know he's been hurt. See the color of the bubble on my hand? What have you done with him? Make way, please, gentlemen, make way. Well, <laughs> well this isn't the, the funniest darn thing. <laughs> this can't be Dr. Reed lying here. He didn't have a red beard. Now, don't crowd me, gentlemen. Don't, don't crowd me, please. Huh? You want me to go where with you? You want me to do what? Speak up, gentlemen. To the cliffs. Down to the cliffs. You mean right now? <laughs> well, well, all right, if you'll come with me. I don't want to be alone anymore. You will come with me? All of you? All four of you? You too, ma'am? Oh, good. Come on, then. To the cliffs. To the cliffs. To the cliffs. To the... He jumped over the cliff. He jumped over the cliff, McDonald. He jumped over... Mr. McDonald, Mr. Thorpe, you may come in to see Dr. Reed now. What? Uh-huh. Dr. Reed is conscious. You may see him now. Is... is he able to talk? Just for a few minutes. In here. Come in. Come in, gentlemen. How are you, Dr. Reed? We've been waiting to see you. Yes, and I must apologize, gentlemen. I had a most unfortunate accident. Hemorrhage. A hemorrhage? Yes. My lungs, you know. No, gentlemen. Hemorrhage? Dr. Reed, what happened in that house? What happened to Smith? We've just been listening to a playback of the recordings you made out there. Smith? Well, isn't he with you? We've just heard the recording, Dr. Reed. Smith jumped over the cliff, into the ocean. Oh, that poor boy. Dr. Reed, will you please tell us what happened? We heard on the recording there were ghosts in that house. Ghosts? I didn't see any ghosts. But Smith, what about him? If he went over the cliff, it was fear that drove him over. But Dr. Gentlemen, I didn't see any ghosts. As for that unfortunate young man, who can say now what he saw or thought he saw?
thank you, Ralph Edwards, for displaying your versatility by appearing as guest star on Suspense. Say, Harold, that Edwards does everything. Uh Uh-uh, half. No, does. Don't use that word on our Autolite show. Oh, come now, Harlow. I can make you use that word, as you call it. How? (laughs) Now, don't you say that Autolite resistor spark plugs make your car engine idle smoother? Yes, but... And your car gives better performance on leaner gas mixtures. Saves gas. Sure does. I mean, do. (laughs) I mean, does. (laughs) Aren't we devils? (laughs) Ah, Ralph, you tricked me. Well, anyhow, it does my heart good to tell people that Autolite resistor spark plugs are ignition engineered by Autolite, which makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats in 28 plants from coast to coast. Autolite also makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, starting motors, spark plug wire, battery cable, coils, distributors. All ignition engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. The lifeline of your car. So, folks, don't accept electrical parts that are supposed to be as good. Remember, you're right with Autolite. And now here again is Ralph Edwards. I want to thank Tony Leader and his great cast of actors for helping to make my appearance on Suspense a very pleasant consequence. (laughs) Like all of you, I'm a great suspense fan, and I'm looking forward to next week when radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you Joseph Cotton in The Day I Died, another gripping study in... Suspense! Tonight's suspense play was adapted for radio by Walter Newman from an original story by H.R. Wakefield with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Make it a point to listen next Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Remember next Thursday, same time, here, Joseph Cotton in The Day I Died. You can buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite stay-full batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Return from Death. You mean that you can bring him back to life? I know I can. There, everything's ready. Will you step back, David? Of course. How to turn on the machine. You'll see for yourself what I mean. Now to induce the charge. How much voltage are you using? 25,000. That's enough. Now look at him, David. Wait. He's alive. He was dead, but now... Now he's alive. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Return from Death. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Return from Death. Dr. Jason Sinclair was a brilliant man. He was one of my instructors at medical school. He gave of his knowledge freely, creating in the students a desire to learn, imparting some of his own enthusiasm for his subject into the minds of his students. I always looked forward to his classes. After I received my degree, I lost track of him for several years. But one evening when I was ready to leave the research center... 
Hello? May I speak to David Cummings? Speaking. David, this is Jason Sinclair. Dr. Sinclair, it's good to hear from you. I was wondering if you'd remember me. Of course I would. All of us who studied under you owe you more than we can ever repay. What are you doing this evening? Well, actually nothing. I'd like to see you, David. Why don't you come over to the house tonight? It'll be a pleasure. You still live at the same place? Yes, the world may change, David, but Jason Sinclair and his habits don't. I'll be expecting you about 8 30. Good to see you, David. Come in, come in. Good to see you, Dr. Sinclair. You can forget the doctor part of it, David. Call me Jason. You're not in school now. How long has it been? I've I've lost all track of time. You received your degree in 1943. It's been ten years. <laughs> I didn't realize it was so long. You haven't changed, you know, Jason. You're only ten years older, that's all. Oh, do you remember my daughter, David? I believe she was that's in... That's right. She was in my class. How are you, Elaine? Fine, David. It's good to see you again. Are you working with your father? Yes. Sit down, David. Sit down. Now... <clears throat> Can I pour you a drink? Not right now, thanks. Are you still with the college, Jason? No, I left there some time ago. Oh, really? How come? I wanted to devote more time to research. I see. David, are you happy with your present position? Well, I hadn't stopped to think about it. I guess I am. That's a shame. Why do you say that? I was wondering if you'd like to work with me. I don't know. I hope you'll forgive me for hesitating, Jason, but I've... I've been with Associated Chemical for several years. I understand, David. It's only natural that you'd hesitate. Why, of course. Dad doesn't want to push you into this, David. You're perfectly free not to accept. Of course, I would like to have you with me. I can guarantee you more than you're getting now. Well, that's a pretty good inducement. I'd like to work with you, David. I'm sure you'll find it interesting. What are you working on, Jason? Come, I'll take you downstairs. And you can see for yourself. Do you remember some of our discussions years ago about death and the possibility of bringing back to life a man that medical science had pronounced dead? Yes, I do. Well, that's what I've been working on. Oh? Have you had any success? Quite a lot. More than I'd expected this early. I'll show you. The rabbit you see on the table is dead. I'd like to have you examine it, if you will. Yes, he's dead, I'd say, for... uh... For at least two hours. Very close, David. A few minutes longer, that's all. What do you intend doing? You'll see. I've already given him the preliminary injection, David, to save time. You know, of course, that all life has a connection with electricity. And we think we send out small charges of electricity along the nerve network, which in turn activates our muscles. You mean that you can bring him back to life? I know I can. There, everything's ready. Will you step back, David? Of course. Now to turn on the machine. You'll see for yourself what I mean. Now to induce the charge. How much voltage are you using? 25,000. That's enough. Now look at him, David. What? He's alive. This animal's alive. Yes, David. But there's something strange about him. How do you mean? I don't know. I I can't explain it. You're imagining it, David. You saw him dead, now you see him alive. The sight is foreign to your mind. Perhaps. I've learned the secret, David. Now we can restore to the living those who have passed into the realm of death. Although Jason Sinclair passed over my objection, I still couldn't get the thought from my mind. There was something strange about the animal. Something seemed to be missing. We went back upstairs. Jason left the room to get the papers he'd written explaining the various steps he'd taken in his experiments. I was left alone with Elaine. Did you see it? Yes. It's amazing. Are you going to work with him? I think so. David, I wish you wouldn't. Why not? Did you notice the rabbit after he returned it back to life? Yes. David, didn't it look foreign to you as if something were missing? I noticed something, but I I couldn't put my finger on it. That's what I mean. David, I don't think you should do it. I don't see why. Elaine, think what a boon this will be to the world. Will it, David? Of course. I'm not too sure about that. Elaine, you of all people should have faith in your father. I don't, though, David. 
Why not? Because I don't believe that once an animal is dead, it should be returned to life. It should remain dead. Because when it dies, its spirit dies with it. And when Dad brings these creatures back, the animal lives, true enough. But, David, it's like an automaton. The body may live, but the thing which gave it personality is dead. I'm still going to work with him, Elaine. Do you know what you're getting into? Dad is a precisionist. He'll experiment and experiment until finally he'll want to try it on a man. And where is that man going to come from, David? Where is he going to come from? Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Return from Death. I was in the house of Jason Sinclair. A few minutes before, I'd been witness to a scene which had amazed me. As I saw it, I made up my mind to work with Jason. We went back upstairs, and when Jason left the room, his daughter tried to dissuade me from my decision. I'm serious, David. Where is he going to come from? I don't know. Then you're going to go through with it? Yes. I warned you, David. Remember that. Here are the papers, David. Oh, thank you. Look them over. They contain all the notes I've made on the experiment. I will, Jason. Are you going to work with me? Yes. Good. You'll have to give the organization for which you're working now at least two weeks' notice. Of course. If you like, you can live here with us. Do you have any relatives, David? No. Glad to hear that. I'll see you in two weeks. Two weeks later, I moved in with Jason Sinclair and we began working. We conducted experiments making a few changes, altering the content of the preparatory injection, resetting the amount of voltage required, progressing from the lower stages of animal life ever higher. And then one night, he told me what he intended doing next. David, have you heard of Terry Whalen? Whalen? He... Oh, yes. He's going to die next week for the murder of that old man. That's right. We're going down to the prison tomorrow to see him. Why, Dad? Whalen has no relatives, no one to bury him after his death except for the state. What do you mean? I believe we can have access to his body after he's executed. You mean you intend using him as a subject? That's correct. But if we're successful, Jason, won't it, won't it be dangerous to return a killer back to life? Not if we watch him. Not if we can destroy his urge to kill. Dad, I don't think you should do it. He's a dangerous man. Nonsense, Elaine. We'll increase the amount of voltage, David. Enough to destroy that part of his brain which motivates his desire to kill. Perhaps he'll completely change. You someone else, Dad, not Terry Whalen. Where would I get someone else, Elaine? We rose early the following day and drove out to the prison. Jason was well known and thought highly of in official circles. We were allowed to talk to the warden and Jason convinced him that Whalen's body would be used for medical research, but... He neglected to tell him how it would be used. Then we were allowed to talk to Whalen. Just a few minutes, Dr. Sinclair. I understand. Uh, who are you? My name is Jason Sinclair, Mr. Whalen. Uh, what do you want? To talk to you. So talk? You're to be executed next week, Mr. Whalen. Look, if you come here just to tell me that, I got a surprise for you. I already know it. I'm a doctor, Terry. We'd like to use you as the subject of an experiment. Sure, sure. Go right ahead. Not now, Terry. After you've been executed. Ah, huh? What do you mean? Who are you from? You from one of those medical colleges? Listen, now, don't go for that stuff. No, sir. If that's what don't you're here Terry. for, I... I propose to bring you back to life. You mean... You mean after I'm dead? That's right. You're crazy. <laughs> you sound like you've been in stir too long. <laughs> I'm serious. We can do it. You mean... <laughs> you mean you can actually bring me back to life? That's right. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> ah, and they can't punish me a second time, can they? They can't kill me twice. <laughs> you agree to it, then? Yeah, sure. Sure, Sawbones. Sure, I agree to it. Anything. Anything to get another chance. <laughs> <laughs> Jason made arrangements for an ambulance to pick up Whalen's body a short time after the execution. That night, 
The night Whalen settled his debt with the state, a storm broke. We stayed at the house and waited. The ambulance was already at the prison, waiting for its passenger. What time is it? Almost 12. I wish you hadn't arranged all this, Dad. Nonsense, Elaine. Well, that is, 12 o'clock. The time is to die. It's only taken three hours, even in this storm, to get back here, Jason. That's right. When they do, David, they'll have Whalen with them. We waited there at the house. The storm was the perfect background for the strange mood which had seized hold of each of us. A short time after three, the ambulance pulled into the driveway and we went down and opened the basement door. They brought him in and sat him on a table. Yes, that's right. Thank you. You ready, David? I guess so. I'll prepare the hypodermic then. We'll give him 20 cc's of this. No more than that? Of course not. There. That does it. Now, help me attach the wires. Dealing with the death has always frightened me. It's foolish, my boy. A scientist, you should never allow yourself to be subjective about things. You must be completely objective. There. I believe that'll do it. Dr. Sinclair. Anything wrong, David? Maybe... Maybe we ought not go through with this. We can't turn back now? No, I suppose not. Shall we begin? Switch it on. There's a pleasant sound, hasn't it, David? What's the reading? 10,000. Increase the charge. The reading? 15,000. 20,000. 23,000. 24,000. 25,000. Shall we stop? No. We must destroy his desire to kill. 26,000. 27,000. That's enough. Turn it off. Place the contact microphone on his chest, David. Yes, Jason. Listen, David. You're listening to the sound of his heart, David. The beating heart of a dead man. We've succeeded. We've brought him back from death. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Return from Death. It was a wet and storming night. Jason Sinclair hovered over the body on the table in the center of his basement laboratory. I stood just behind him, watching a dead man return to life. Listen, David. You're listening to the sound of his heart. We've brought him back from death. Remove the contact, Mike. Jason. Look at his eyes. They're open. Yes, I see. Whalen? Can you hear me? Answer me, Whalen. Uh, Think what uh, this means, David. Uh, he can tell us what it was like to be dead. The first man ever to know the secret. Whalen, answer me. Uh, uh, the strap's taken off. All right, let's loosen them. Uh, how do you feel, Whalen? Look out, Chasen. He's getting off the table. Nothing to be afraid of, David. He didn't limp before, did he? No. Some of the motor section of the brain must have been damaged. He's coming toward us. Don't move. You might frighten him. Look at his eyes, Jason. They're not human. Go ahead, David. He's trying to say something. I can't understand you, Whalen. What are you trying to say? 
He's patting you on the back. I'm trying to thank me, no doubt. All right, that's enough, Wayne. I understand you appreciate... Take his hand away from my throat, David. That's enough, Wayne. Ah! Look out, David. I see him. You knocked him out. Yes. You shouldn't have done that. Are you serious, Jason? I was protecting myself and you, for that matter. He wouldn't have hurt me. You didn't seem to think that when he had his fingers around your throat. Well, I admit that I was frightened. All right. What are we going to do with him? Well, keep him down here. Teach him to talk again. Seems to have lost the power of coherent speech. Look at him, Jason. Why? Is there anything wrong? I don't know. But looking at his face now, I have the strangest feeling that he's not really a human being anymore. That something's missing. That he's a mad, vicious creation of a devil. You're talking like a fool, David. Perhaps you're tired. I know I am. He can't get out of here. He'll lock the doors and the windows are barred. Let's go upstairs. All right, Jason. But remember what I said. We placed him back on the table, taking the precaution of strapping him down in case he should awaken. Then Jason locked the doors and took the keys with him. We went upstairs. I've been waiting for you. Then I thought you were asleep. No, no, I couldn't sleep. Should have come downstairs and joined us then, Elaine. You brought him back? Yes. How did he react? Not as well as he might have, Elaine. Anything wrong? No, nothing. He tried to kill your father. What? He was merely trying to thank me, David. He's probably suffering from a sort of amnesia. He doesn't realize his own strength. He's like a baby. You know, that's not true, sir. He's an inhuman, vicious killer. Oh, you should never have done this, Dad. Will you both be quiet? I'm tired of listening to you. What? I don't like to admit it. But I know I've been wrong. I'm sorry, my dear. I lost my temper. I shouldn't have. I know it's because I think you're both partially right. How do you mean, Jason? There is something inhuman about that thing that was a man downstairs. I noticed it tonight when his hands were around my throat. In his eyes, that intangible something that makes an animal a man is missing. In its place, I see... The eyes of a madman with no soul. Oh, what are we going to do? I don't know. Maybe we haven't failed, sir. Maybe because we're tired, we think we have. It may look completely different to us after a few hours of sleep. I said, oh, what was that? Came from downstairs. Whelan. We had him strapped to the table. He must have gotten loose. That was the door. He's trying to knock the door down. We have to stop him. But how? Elaine, oh. get my gun. All right, Dad. I'll be right back. I tried not to admit it, David, but that was only lying to myself. You and Elaine brought me to my senses. You were right, right all along, about the rabbit, about the other animals, and especially about Wayland. He must be destroyed. He's a monster without feeling. Here, Dad, his gun. Thanks. I'm going down there and... You don't have to go down there. That was the door. Listen. Listen, he's coming up the stairs. Turn the lights out, David. Yes, sir. I'm going out in the hall to meet him. No, Dad. No, let him come in here. Stay right over here on this side of the room. All right, Dave. Be quiet. He's coming. I don't want to shoot him. We'll have to take him alive. You have to shoot him. Oh, yes, Dad. He's just outside the door. David, I'm afraid. Be quiet. <gasps> there he is. Where are you now? He's searching for me. Shh, be quiet. He's looking this way. Uh, Use the gun, Jason. face now, David. Yes. I see it. It's composed. It looks human again. Perhaps we're not meant to tamper with the natural laws of life and death, David. I see that now. But it took Wayland's return from death to prove it to me. Unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we join.
journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Once again, we meet everyone's favorite sleuth... Sherlock Holmes, and today we find him deeply involved in solving the riddle of the Musgrave Ritual, an ancient catechism handed down for centuries, a seemingly innocent passage into the rites of manhood, but its dark secret led to murder of the most horrible kind. <laughs> mystery drama, The Musgrave Ritual, was adapted from the Arthur Conan Doyle classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Murray Burnett, and stars Gordon Gould. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We tend to think of Sherlock Holmes as always having been famous. We also tend to think of the police he came in contact with as being skeptical but respectful of his prowess. Indulgent of his idiosyncrasies because they realized that he had hit in some lucky or miraculous fashion upon clues they'd overlooked. But of course, it wasn't always so. When he first started on his career, it was quite different. And today we embark with him and Watson upon the third case of his fabulous career. The Musgrave Ritual. In chronicling the cases of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I found the most difficulty in setting down the events in those dramas in which I played no part. The Musgrave Ritual is one affair that happened before Holmes and I met. He told me that it started when his old university friend, Reginald Musgrave, visited him in his room in Montague Street, hard by the museum. Come in, come in, Musgrave. I pray to heaven, Holmes, that you can make a proper deduction in my trouble. Although I must confess, the police were against my coming to you at all. Perhaps you'd better start at the beginning. Your problem may be one that lends itself to a simple solution. I wish it was so. I, I, I doubt it very much. You see, it's one that concerns my servants. Two of them have disappeared without a trace. And I'm afraid I may be somewhat to blame. Time enough to place the blame and we've solved the problem. Who are the missing people? The butler, Brunton, and the second housemaid... Rachel Howells. You have a large staff, then? Oh, yes. Although I'm a bachelor, Hurlston is a large, rambling old place. Takes a good deal of looking after. How long had the two been with you? Oh, Brunton's been with us for 20 years. Uh, my father, who passed away some years ago, hired him. He was a, a school teacher with no job. He became invaluable. He's a great linguist and an accomplished musician. And extremely handsome. He sounds like a paragon among butlers. But he did have one fault. He was a bit of a Don Juan. A few months ago, I thought all our problems were solved because he became engaged to Rachel Howells. But the more I think of it, the more I believe that this is where all the trouble started. Rachel had come in to dust the study. 
I looked up from my newspaper. I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but I'm not disturbing you. No, 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 not at all, Rachel. Tell me, have you and Brunton set a date yet? No, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but very sir. I shouldn't burden you with my troubles. My dear child, I, I don't understand. <laughs> it's all off between me and Brunton. He's found someone else. What? When did this happen? Yesterday, sir. Mr. Brunton came to me and apologized and said he'd found someone else. Someone he'd fallen deeply in love with. It wouldn't be fair for us to go ahead with our plans. My dear girl, I, I, I really don't know what to say. Nothing to say, sir. I thank you for your kindness and... I, excuse me, I, I really don't feel very well. The girl had a breakdown. We sent for the doctor, and I must say I was shocked when I heard that Brunton's new love was the daughter of the head gamekeeper. Hmm. I take it she's not missing. Oh, no, no, no. She's upset and baffled like the rest of us, but there's more to the story. A really shocking incident which happened regarding Brunton. Last Thursday night, I couldn't sleep, so I decided to continue with a novel I had been reading... However, it was in the billiard room. As I was passing the library, I saw light. My first thought was burglars. But after picking a weapon off the wall and stealing silently into the library, I was astonished to find Brunton fully dressed and unlocking one of the bureaus. So, Brunton... This is how you repay the trust my family has reposed in you. Sir, this is not what you think. No. I find you rifling a bureau drawer in the dead of night, looking through my family's papers, and you tell me it's not what I think. Nothing is missing, sir. I, I'm not a thief, Mr. Musgrave. Whatever you are, you're no longer in my employ. Please, let me explain. I think twenty years of service entitles me at least to that. Very well. Well, as you know, sir, when your father first hired me, I was a school teacher. I've never lost interest in scholarship. History holds a fascination for me. I'm consumed by it. The Musgraves are one of the oldest families in England and are an important part of our history. All I've been doing is looking through the old papers you have here. In the dead of night... Secretly? And behind my back? That's a bad mistake on my part, sir, but I was afraid you might deny me permission. There's no excuse for what you've been doing. You leave tomorrow. Mr. Musgrave, please, sir. I'd ask you to consider the years I've spent with the family. Holmes, I turned a deaf ear to his pleas, and he walked off. The taper was still on the table, and by its light I could see the paper that Brunton had taken from the bureau. And to my surprise, it wasn't anything important. Simply a copy of the questions and answers in the singular old observance called the Musgrave Ritual. And that is? A ceremony peculiar to our family, which each Musgrave was centuries past has gone through on coming of age. At any rate, I relocked the bureau, and I had turned to go, when I was surprised to see Brunton standing before me. Mr. Budgrave, I've always been a proud man. I, I can't bear disgrace, sir. Disgrace will kill me. Believe me, my blood will be upon your head if you drive me to despair. If you cannot keep me after what has passed, then... Let me give notice and leave in a month. A month is too long. Take yourself off in a week and give whatever reason you like. Only a week, sir. A fortnight, say at least a fortnight. A week? And consider yourself fortunate that I have been this lenient. The trouble with presenting an accurate picture of Holmes cases in which I wasn't involved lay in working from Holmes notes, which were sketchy at best, and in a particular peculiar shorthand, which I sometimes found baffling. 
In this case of the Musgrave ritual, I found it necessary to ask him what part the police had played. The police? <laughs> My dear Watson, remember, they weren't Scotland Yard, and I dealt with a Sergeant Davies of the County Constabulary. He was somewhat less than enthusiastic. Well, no, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Musgrave thinks the world of you, and he's asked me to give you every assistance. And I appreciate that, Sergeant. Would you mind telling me if you've reached any conclusions? We most certainly have, Mr. Holmes. And I know that the simple professional solution doesn't please you amateurs. And your conclusions, Sergeant? Brendan was quite a slippery character. And once Mr. Musgrave caught him red-handed, so to speak, he knew the jig was up, and he took off. Now, we've got bulletins out all over England and the continent for him. He'll turn up. I see. And the girl, Rachel? Well, no. <laughs> that was a pretty piece of acting. Brunton must have been serious about her all along, and just used the engagement to the gamekeeper's daughter to cover his traces. Meanwhile, she acted heartsick and then ran off after him to meet him somewhere. Well, Mr. Holmes, that uh, ties everything up nice and neatly, eh? There are a few questions. You describe Brunton as a slippery character, meaning that he had been engaged in acts of thievery before. Oh, yes, of course. Then how do you account for the fact that Mr. Musgrave says that in 20 years he'd never once missed anything of value? Neither cash nor jewels. Hurston's a very large place, Mr. Holmes. I suspect that if Mr. Musgrave were to take inventory, he might change his tune. So you have it marked as a case of theft and flight? That's what our experience tells us. Now, don't you agree? I think it may be a little more complicated than that. On the train up here, Mr. Musgrave told me you were very thorough in checking Rachel Howell's footprints. Oh, yes, oh, yes. We traced them right across the lawn to the edge of the pond, then on to the gravel, which leads out of the grounds. That was good work. Thank you, sir. And this leads you to believe that Rachel Howell left the grounds? Of course, sir. Don't you? Yes, Sergeant, I do. Only, Musgrave also told me you had the pond dragged and fished up a linen bag containing a mass of old, rusted, and discolored metal and several pebbles. That's so. Now, at first we thought the poor girl might have done away with herself, and that... Surely I... she wouldn't have thought of killing herself if she were going to join her lover. Uh, that was before we hit upon our solution. You see, before we knew she went off. I see. But then... What about this linen bag? Oh, probably some junk that had been there for years. But then, wouldn't the linen have been eroded? As I understand it, the bag looked as if it had been only recently immersed. There's that, sir. I give you that. Thank you, Sergeant. Now, did you consider the possibility that the girl threw that bag into the pond before she left the property? Now, why would she do a thing like that? Why, indeed, Sergeant. If we had the answer, we'd know a lot more about the case. But why else would she go out of her way to stop by the pond if she were leaving the property? I have been told you'd had some success at amateur detecting, but you amateurs are apt to carry things too far. Next thing you know, you'll be coming up with those old wives' tales about the old Musgraves dabbling in witchcraft. You're the first one to mention that, Sergeant. But it does hold some interest. For the amateurs, not the professionals. If we listen to half the tales the Widow Sykes spins, we'd be chasing shadows every full moon. The Widow Sykes? She's the village historian and the village gossip. If you don't want to waste your time, Mr. Holmes, steer clear of the Widow. Holmes... I'd like very much to know more about this thing called the Musgrave Ritual. But surely the whole ritual is outlined in my notes. Oh, yes, yes, I, I do have it here. Read it to me, please. I'd like to refresh my memory. Mm. <coughs> it seems to be in question and answer form. That's so. Let me see if I can recall the answers if you will read the questions. Very well. Uh, first question, whose was it? His... Who is gone. Oh, that's right. Well, now, second question. Who shall have it? He who will come. Where was the sun? Over the... Oh, let me recall. Over the oak. Oh, 
Where was the shadow? Under the elm. <laughs> remarkable, remarkable memory, yours, Holmes. Thank you, Watson. Go on. Uh, how was it stepped off? Oh, your compliment came a question too soon, Watson. I have completely forgotten the numbers. Give them to me. Uh, north by ten and by ten. East by five and by five. South by two and by two. West by one and by one. And so under. <laughs> it's just gibberish, Holmes. Go on. What shall we give for it? All that is ours. Why should we give it? For the sake of the trust. Hmm. Well, that seems to be all. It's amazing how you record most of it. <laughs> now that you've heard the Musgrave ritual, what do you think? Well, for the life of me, Holmes, I, I, I can't make head nor tails of that rigmarole. But you realize its importance, Watson. Perhaps it would help you if I told you that the spelling of the original catechism was definitely middle of the 17th century. <laughs> The secret of Sherlock Holmes' unparalleled fascination for readers was that he not only amazed Watson, but also his readers. Once you embark upon an adventure with the famous sleuth, you eagerly join in the chase, whether it be to hunt down a criminal or solve a riddle, and in some cases, both. We'll find out which this was in Act Two shortly. A classic Gershwin tune goes, A Foggy Day in London Town. It had me low, it had me down. Whenever I hear it, I can't help thinking that Fogg and London and Sherlock Holmes make for one of the most exciting combinations in all of literature. We return to 221B Baker Street, where Watson is patiently trying to unravel Holmes' notes in the case of the Musgrave Ritual. Holmes, I, I know you're trying to help me, but from your notes it appears we have three separate mysteries to solve. The disappearance of the butler, Brunton, Rachel Howell's vanishing, and this ancient Musgrave ritual. That's just it, Watson. Suppose there was only one mystery, one problem to solve, and by solving it, all three questions would be answered. What then? Well, I don't see how that could be possible. I was convinced that the roots of all these happenings lay in the past. And so I disregarded the advice of Sergeant Davies and went to visit the Widow Sykes in her small cottage in the village. Come right in. Come right in, Mr. Holmes. Never mind the case. They're better than dogs for guarding the house. Sergeant Davies said you might be able to help me. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, I can see you're not one to too close to the truth. <laughs> if that windbag said anything at all about me, it was to tell you to pay me no mind. <laughs> Would you like a cup of tea? No, thank you. Would you mind if I have a cup? No. Earlston is a dark place. There were dark deeds done in the old days. Did you know, Brunton? Since he was a lad. He was smart, I'll grant him that, but not as smart as he thought he was. A lot of people knew what he was up to at Earlston. Oh, what was that? Oh, looking for things that were best left lost. Hmm, can you give me some idea of the nature of those uh, things? I'm old, Mr. Holmes. And I hold to the old ideas about good and evil. And there were people at Earlston long ago who knew too much about the nature of evil. They did evil deeds. I'm talking about the Musgrave. Back more than 100 years, they dabbled in witchcraft. And you think Brunton was... Looking to find out how they work their spells, trying to find out how they got their powers. And? And either he found out or he, he made a mistake. Either way, Mr. Holmes, he's gone. I see. And what about Rachel Howells? She's Welsh, Mr. Holmes, and they're a fine people, but there's darkness in some of them, and there was a lot of it in her. <sighs> Mark my words, sir, if you want to find the answer, you'll find it in the old days, and the dark days. 
thank you, Mrs. Sykes. You've been most helpful. You really mean that? I do. Then you believe in witchcraft? No, but I share your belief that the answer to the mystery lies in the past. I know this must seem a nuisance to you, Holmes, but really, your notes leave a good deal to be desired. No need to apologize, Watson. As my biographer, you have every right to ask questions. Go back to the ritual, Watson. Mm. You were on the right track there. Ask yourself why Brunton should be so anxious to master this old formula. Uh, I, I cannot imagine. Oh, that's because there's no guile in you, my dear friend. Obviously, Brunton expected some personal advantage from it. What was it, then? And how had it affected his fate? Holmes, I haven't the foggiest. If you'll continue reading, you'll find that I went back to Hurlston and sought out Reginald Musgrave. Here yeah, you've been looking for me, Holmes. You'll forgive me, Musgrave, if I say that this butler of yours appears to me to have been a very clever man and to have had a clearer insight than ten generations of his masters. I hardly follow you. His avid interest in the Musgrave ritual. But uh, the ritual has no practical importance. On the contrary, it seems immensely practical, and I shall need your help in proving it. First, that magnificent old oak tree on the left-hand side of the drive. Was it standing when your ritual was drawn? In all probability, it was there at the Norman Conquest. It has a girth of 23 feet. Have you any old elms on the property? Well, no, there used to be a very old one, some yards from the oak. But it was struck down by a bolt of lightning ten years ago, and we cut down the stump. You can still see where it used to be? Oh, yes. I should like to see where it grew. All we have to do is uh, step outside. There you are, Holmes. You can see the scar in the lawn. Mm. I don't suppose it's possible to find out how high the elm was. I can give it to you exactly. It was 64 feet. How did you come to know it? My old tutor gave me exercises in trigonometry. They invariably took the shape of measuring heights. When I was a lad, I worked out every tree and building on the estate. Tell me, did your butler Brunton ever ask you such a question? On my word, Holmes, I don't know how you ferreted that out. But he did ask me some months ago in connection with an argument he said he had with a groom. Uh, but I, 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 I still fail to understand what's behind it all. Holmes, I, I must confess that I sympathize with Musgrave's bewilderment. Look at my notes. Go back to the ritual and read. Where? What? Where was the sun? Oh. Uh, over the oak. Ah, I see, Holmes, and the shadow was under the elm. Precisely. It was obvious from the first that the trees and the measurements were used as guides to some location. Oh. And if we could find that exact location, we should be well along towards finding the secret the Musgrave family thought necessary to cloak in so curious a fashion. Uh, hold on. Uh, the, the ritual mentions shadow under the elm. Now, that must mean the far end of the shadow. Otherwise, they would have chosen the trunk as a guide. Excellent, Watson. Uh, <laughs> but how in the world would you measure the shadow when the elm is no longer there? Oh, come, Watson. I know if Brunton could do it, I could also. I went with Musgrave to his study and found two lengths of a fishing rod which measured exactly six feet. Then I whittled myself a peg to which I tied a long string with a knot at each yard. And then we went back to the elm. I see the sun is just grazing the top of the oak, which is fortunate for us. Now, this is the spot where the elm stood, Musgrave. Right there, Holmes. We put the fishing rod in place, so, and lay out the peg along the lines of the shadow. And we see that it comes to exactly nine feet. And my mathematical training tells me that if a rod of six feet throws a shadow of nine feet, then a tree of 64 feet will throw one of 96. Correct. 
Let's get back to the oak and pace out the measurements step by step. Three, four, five. That's five to the east. I see now, Holmes. I believe we're really onto something. The next is two to the south. One, two. We're right at the very threshold of the door to the old house. West by one. We have to go in. One by one. Two steps in and... Here we are. Just a passageway. My deductions were correct, and yet there's obviously nothing here. We've left out the and under, remember? One by one, and so under. There's a cellar under this thing? Yes, and as old as the house. Down here, through this door. Mm. Ah, there's a lantern down here. I will strike a match. People have been here, Musgrave. See, the wood has all been piled carefully along the walls, leaving a clear space in the middle here. That's Brunton's muffler. I swear to it. What's he been doing here? On the same quest as we, I'm afraid. There's a stone with a rusted iron ring in the center. Holmes, let's have it up. By all means, Musgrave. But I think we should first send for Sergeant Davies. Well, now, Mr. Holmes, think we've found something, have we? Did you bring anyone with you, Sergeant? I think I can handle this by myself. I hope you're right. All right, then. What do you want me to do? Help us lift this flagstone. Right, Char. Let's get a grip on the ring. Huh? And... Here. Uh, 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 uh. It's too dark to see anything down there. Now stand back. And let me flash the lantern down. Good Lord in heaven. Is that thing Brunton? I'm afraid so, Musgrave. But his hands, what happened to them? I imagine he wore them away, scratching at the slab to move it. Hardly room enough for a man to stand upright in that hole. I should hazard a guess that there wasn't enough air for more than an hour. What made him do it, Holmes? What made him do it? Greed, Musgrave. Greed and love. <laughs> That wasn't all, Holmes. Far from it. I was as disappointed as you when we uncovered the body of Brunton and were still faced with several unanswered questions. When the police took Brunton's body out of that hole under the cellar, they also found a chest. <gasps> with buried treasure? Empty. I knew it was empty when Sergeant Davies, with a great many flourishes, brought it to Musgrave's study to open it. It had to be. I, 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 don't, I don't follow. Because you don't use my methods. Think back to what you already read. What happened in the cellar? Well, I remember exactly what you wrote. You sent for Sergeant Davies and waited until he got there, and then you and Davies wrenched open the stone. Both of us, Watson, with some difficulty. Ah, I see. Well, Brunton must have had an accomplice. Exactly. And therefore, Brunton opened the chest and handed the contents over to his accomplice. What about the accomplice? That required some logical thinking and deduction. I asked myself what we knew. First, that Brunton had solved the riddle of the ritual. Secondly, he'd located the place and found that flagstone was too heavy for him to lift. Hmm. Where could he find help? From outside? Too risky. Even if he could find someone he could trust. He had to have someone inside the house. But who? Uh, Rachel Howells. Of course. But remember, he had jilted the girl. How would he then proceed to enlist her help? Well, from the picture you've given me as to the kind of rogue he was, I imagine he would have attempted to convince her that he still loved her. You hit it, Watson. I tell you, I could see the action as if I myself were a witness. 
Brunton, slipping upstairs to her room late at night and tapping softly on the door. There are times in everyone's life when one feels like murdering his best friend. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle tells us that this was one of the times that Watson could cheerfully have killed his friend Holmes because Holmes broke off his narrative to fill a pipe. But he did continue, and so will we, right after these messages. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle isn't noted as an author who writes cliffhangers, but we must remember he penned the longest cliffhanger of all time when he left Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty dangling over the Reichenbach Falls for three years before resurrecting him. And now, in explaining and filling out his notes on the Musgrave ritual, he'd left Watson waiting while he filled his pipe before picking up the narrative where he'd left off with a soft tapping on Rachel Howell's door in the dead of night. Who is it? It's Richard. Richard? What do you want? To talk to you. Go away. Rachel, please. It's important. You know what to me? To both of us. To our life together. Please, open the door. All right. Just for a moment. Thank you, Rachel. Why'd you close the door? If you think you... Rachel, I'm here to ask you to forgive me. I... I treated you shamefully. Oh, it took you until tonight to realize that... No, no, I knew it all along. But I'm a weak man, you know that. And she... she tempted me. This isn't a church. My room is no place to bear your soul. What do you want? Why are you here? I want you to promise to come away with me, to start a new life, together, as my wife. What? I mean it, Rachel. It took these weeks away from you to realize you were my true love. And what about your engagement to Jane? Well, it's only justice that she'll be treated as... as I treated you. <laughs> and where'd we go? Anywhere you want, anywhere in the world. Oh, well, I know you've got a glib tongue. This isn't just talk. I've discovered the secret. Are you still talking about that old piece of paper? That old piece of paper is going to make us rich. Rich beyond anything you ever dreamed. So you told me when you first said you loved me. But then I didn't know where to look. I found it, Rachel. I found the place. Oh, and what is it? Gold? Diamonds? What? I don't know yet. We'll find out together. I thought you said you'd found it. I found where it's buried. I need your help to get it up. Rachel, do you hear me? Get out. What? So Jane wouldn't help when you ask her? Of of course, you have every right to think that, but I, I swear to you, it's, it's not true. I've not even whispered a word of this to Jane. I don't believe you. How can I convince you? You come to my room in the middle of the night. You tell me you've had yet another change of heart. You don't love Jane. You love me. I've always loved you. And Jane. then you ask my help. Well, you can have it when you announce our engagement. But I... Can't do that. Why not? Because of the repercussions. I'd look like a fool in everyone's eyes. Think of what the other servants would say. But that didn't bother you before. Do just what you what you did with me. Impossible. That's what I thought. Well, now you can leave. There's nothing to keep you here. Rachel, I've been sacked. <laughs> Is there no end to your lies? It's true. Mr. Musgrave caught me in the library studying the ritual. I found the treasure, but I've only got three days to get it. The treasure? That's what's important to you, isn't it? It's important to us. With the treasure, we can do as we please. Live the life we want. Think of it, Rachel. You and I together, master and mistress, we'll hire servants instead of serving others. Oh, if only I could believe you. Listen, you can test me. Go to Mr. Musgrave. Tell him I told you I was leaving. He'll admit that it's so. 
Now, do you believe me? If only I could. I want to. My heart wants me to. But I... Rachel, I... trust me. Just let yourself trust me. Listen to your heart, Rachel. <gasps> Come here into me arms. <gasps> Don't think any more. My word, Holmes, you made me actually see it. It's just as if you were there. The science of deduction, Watson. Now, we have Rachel enlisted firmly on Brunton's side. They don't have much time, so I suspect that the very next night, Brunton and Rachel crept down to the cellar, very cautiously and quietly, and... All right, here we are, Rachel. But there's nothing in this old cell except logs and wood. Uh, that's what everyone thinks. But if we lift these pieces of wood from the center of the floor and put them over there, hey, what do we find? A stone with a ring in the center. Right, my girl. <laughs> and now... Please give me a hand with this. But there isn't enough room on the ring for me to get a grip. Ah, there. Uh, is that uh, better? Yeah. All right, now, when I say Eve, we'll both pull. All right. All right. Eve! <coughs> Again. Eve! Oh, my God. That's no good. <laughs> See if you can squeeze your fingers closer together so I can get my... Hold hand underneath the ring. All right, but then I can't use all my strength. Well, let's try it. Mm -hmm. All right, Nadie. That's it. Keep pulling, Rachel. Got it, got it. Hang on. Hang on. I can't for long. It's too heavy. Kick that piece of wood over to me. Right, quickly now. Uh, hang on, hang on. Just let's get this wood under. See? It's done. All right, you, you can let go. One minute more. I'd have let it drop. <coughs> All right. I'll climb down. You flash the lantern so I can see you. Oh, I hope this is no wild goose chase. Never fear. It's all in the ritual. There. The light. Ah, the chest. See the chest? Yes, I see it. Ah, it's locked. But the wood is rotted. There, I have it. Here. Hold it for me. I'll pass it up to you. What is it? I don't know. I didn't look. I'm glad I was right about you, Rachel, my darling. <laughs> I knew I needed a big, beautiful girl like you. A slight wisp of a thing like Jane would never have been able to... Watch out! The wood! The wood wedge! It's slipping! Rachel! Push it back under the edge! Rachel! Help me! Please! Holmes, what a horrible picture you paint. Horrible? Certainly. But well, that must have been the way it happened, Watson. <sighs> that explains her behavior with Musgrave when he questioned her the next day about Brunton's whereabouts. You recall she became hysterical and was almost incoherent. <sighs> no wonder. That's a picture I can never quite get out of my mind. I still sometimes see that woman's figure dashing out of the cellar and up the stairs, clutching the treasure. Was it chance that the wood wedge slipped? Or some smoldering fires of vengeance awoke in Rachel when he said what he did about her rival Jane? Or perhaps he didn't have to say anything. Perhaps she saw she had him in her power and kicked the wood support away herself. What do you think, Watson? <sighs> I, 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 I really don't know. But does it matter? Unanswered questions nag at me. Holmes, aside from the fact that I know what happened to Brunton and why, I'm still at a loss about the treasure. Come, Watson. 
You know exactly what happened to it. Look at the facts. Well, I assume from your notes and what you've told me that Rachel discovered it was worthless and threw it in the pond before she ran away. That's half right. Half? But didn't you tell me that all that was found when they dragged the pond was a linen bag with some old worthless metal in it? Rachel did indeed throw the bag in the pond. But the contents were far from worthless. Oh, dear. I'll never get this straight. You will if you hang on to your original hunch. The answer lay in the ritual and the coins that were found in the chest. Are you playing quite fair with me, Holmes? That's a shrewd question, Watson. I should have added that part of the answer lies in the history of the Musgrave family. They were staunch cavaliers opposed to the roundheads. Uh, that doesn't help much. What was the first question in the ritual? Uh, whose was it? And the answer was, his who is gone. That can only refer to one person, Charles I. Remember the coins. Well, I see that now, but still... And the ritual continues, who shall have it? Watson, you can give me the answer. Yes, uh, he who will come. But that could be anybody. No, Watson, it could be only one person, Charles II, whose advent was already foreseen. Watson, the treasure was the crown of the Stuarts. But how was it that Charles did not get his crown when he returned? The only explanation is that the Musgrave who held the secret died suddenly, and by some oversight left the ritual to his descendant without explaining the meaning of it. From that day to this, it had been handed down from father to son, until at last it came within reach of a man who deciphered its secret and lost his life in the venture. <sighs> And the girl, Rachel? No trace of her has been found to this day. Is it possible she did away with herself? I have considered that, Watson. And I knew, whether she had or not, I'd have the answer to the question that bothers me. How so? It stands to reason that if Rachel Howells committed suicide, then the wood wedge must have slipped, and she couldn't stand the guilt and remorse she felt because she did nothing to help Brunton. If, on the other hand, she didn't kill herself, then she must have felt justified in taking her terrible revenge and making a successful escape. To my knowledge, this is the only story Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote that ended with any sort of conundrum. And this one, about whether Rachel Howells deliberately entombed her former lover or was unable to prevent a horrible tragedy can surely take its place alongside the justly famous The Lady or the Tiger. I'll be back shortly. The question about Rachel Howells and did she or didn't she commit suicide is most intriguing and each of you undoubtedly has his or her own answer. I lean to the theory that it was deliberate because Conan Doyle and Holmes make much of her dark, Celtic, passionate background. And I'm a firm believer in the old adage, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Our cast included Gordon Gould, Court Benson, Marion Seldes, and Bernard Grant. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present... 
Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you a story of a mind reader who discovers his nightclub act is not a fake. A story we call A Vision of Death, starring Mr. Ronald Coleman. Before our play begins, here is a word about Autolite from a good friend of ours. Greetings, I Wilcox. Why, it's that amazing, magnificent mystic and great glass globe gazer, Sabu the Swami. What's on my mind? You think of your best friend. Everybody's best friend. The Autolite stay full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Now the glass shows a glass even more powerful than mine. Well, that's the fiberglass retaining mat protecting every positive plate in the Autolite stay full battery. They prevent shedding and flaking and give the stay full longer life. As proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Now I see many smiling faces. On the thousands of drivers who visit their masterful, merry, and marvelous neighborhood Autolite battery dealers. For an Autolite stay full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Now the crystal ball shows words of wisdom. I know. You're always right with Autolite. And now, with a vision of death and the performance of Mr. Ronald Coleman, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. If I speak too rapidly for your stenographer, you'll tell me, won't you, Lieutenant? No offense, but um, he impresses me as someone who has to sit on the floor to put his shoes on. And don't hesitate to stop me if I seem to wander away from the point. I mean to say this is my first, and I hope, final appearance in a police precinct, and I should hate to give a sloppy performance. We were always known, Aurora and I, for the smoothness and gem-like precision of our act. And as for this murder uh, rap, I suppose it's called, is concerned... An acquaintance with our act is the essential rabbit. Awfully good act. Smart, informal, occasionally humorous, and always mystifying. Well, the act always began with music. Never with the cliché fanfare of trumpets or roll of drums. I would saunter out to the center of the floor and say something like, Good evening. You are about to witness an exhibition of mental telepathy. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce Aurora, my wife. Uh, they never failed to give her a hand. What would they applaud? Why, the, the vision she presented as she came toward me. There has never been anyone as lovely as Aurora. The most beautiful flash in the profession. Uh, Aurora, would you care to tell the audience or shall I? You tell them, Judd, while I tie the blindfold across my eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, all mind readers employ a gimmick. A gimmick is a trick, a device. For example, when the mind reader, threading his way through the audience, says to the mind reader sitting blindfolded on the stage, a lady has given me a small object which I now hold in my hand. What is it? And the mind reader sitting blindfolded replies, a silver coin. The answer has not come through mind reading. No, it has come through the gimmick. A cue or signal communicated through the very question itself. But we don't do that. We do not. Uh, you will notice, ladies and gentlemen, that I never speak to Aurora at all. Are you ready, Rory? Ready, Judd. Here we go, then. You, sir. You have something? Good. Concentrate upon it, like a good chap. The gentleman <coughs> holds a and coin you, madam? in his hand. It is a Mexican peso bearing the date 1892. Oh, that's... <laughs> that, that, that's very clever of you, madam. I'll be surprised if she gets this one. The lady holds oh, how in her about hand you, young man? her other hand. <laughs> a sucker once born remains a sucker till death. The audience never realized, never in all the years we worked, that although I was not speaking to Aurora directly, my chatter nevertheless was loaded with signals and cues for her guidance. By revealing the gimmick, we concealed the gimmick, and that, Lieutenant, is the knee plus ultra of gimmicks. Yes, it was as crude as that, but it enabled us to work 50 weeks a year here and abroad at an average of over a thousand a week. 
Of course, I always gave some credit for our success to our agent, Harry Arnold, although Rory was inclined to give him no credit at all. Good news, Judd. I've managed to book the act into the College Inn in Chicago with a four-week guarantee. Not bad, huh? Get him. He managed to book the act. Yeah. I suppose they never heard of us in Chicago? I suppose we weren't held over there six weeks when we played the Sans Souci in 1948? You think it's easy to get a four-week guarantee these days? Money is short. Money is tight. I've never yet heard you say money is long. Money is loose. You have to sweat for your 10%, don't you? Yes, you do. In a pig's ear, you do. Agents. They're all like... Oh, there's gratitude for you. There's the milk of human memory. What were you when I first saw you? Nothing. Not this much. Playing ten a day under canvas in, in, in Menasha, Wisconsin, and paid off in bottle tops. I worked, I schemed, I sweated. Listen to, to you... him. You'd think he had to get out there on the floor every night. You'd think he was the one spent 11 months, 12 hours a day memorizing the code. You'd think it was his name in lights. Agents. All they know is how to live off a dead whale. Scum of the earth. Look, I'm not going to take that from you, you hear me? You'll take I... it, baby, along with the 10%. You'll take it and you'll chew it and you'll swallow it and you'll keep it down, too. How do you like that? I'm warning you, kid. Don't push me too far. No, don't push children, me to the po- children, on your way, Harry, and don't let it get you down. I think a four-week guarantee is pretty good. Oh, thanks, Judd. If it wasn't for you, Judd, I'd... Oh, why go into it? I'm going for a walk. But aside from these altercations between Rory and Harry, it was smooth sailing. We wore the best, ate the best, drank the best, stayed at the finest hotels. And every Saturday night after the performance, Harry would bring us our salary. He'd bring it in cash. Thousand, twelve fifty, fifteen hundred. I have the old performer's distrust of checks. (laughs) Been given too many with a high latex content. (laughs) Anyway... Life couldn't have been more placid. And then one evening, about five weeks ago, soon after we opened at the Grove here in town, a frightening thing occurred. We'd just begun the act, and I was out in the audience. You will notice, ladies and gentlemen, that I never speak to Aurora at all. Are you ready, Rory? Ready, Judd. Here we go, then. Now, you, madam. The lady holds in her hand a compact. It is platinum and bears her initials R.C. Uh, 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 you, you, sir. You, the sir. The gentleman you, you... is holding an engagement ring. In it are three small diamonds. I, uh, I, uh, miss, the miss, young have lady, you, uh, The young lady is holding... It, it, it's a small cameo brooch and... Uh, 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 Rory, Rory, quick, uh, 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 Maurice, Maurice, music, music. I picked Rory up from the floor and hurried with her to our dressing room, almost beside myself with anxiety. I placed her on the couch, dampened a towel, and put it on her forehead and began to chafe her wrists. Rory, Rory, honey, Rory. John, what happened? I was in the bar. Do you want me to get a doctor? No, no, no. I, I don't know. Get out. Leave us alone. Get out, Harry. Get out. John. John. I'm here, Rory. Are you all right? Well, I guess so. I don't know what happened. Well, you fainted away. Try to remember what happened. Oh, I felt funny. I don't remember. No, no, try, try, Rory. Try. Try to remember. It's important. Oh, I can't. Why is it important? Oh, you don't know? Rory, you don't know? You were calling out the answers before I even had a chance to give you the cue. Do you believe in telepathy, Lieutenant? I don't mean the sort of thing Rory and I usually did. I mean real telepathy. Uh, I never did either until that night. I don't mind telling you I was badly shaken. I mean, after all, I knew we'd been using a gimmick and suddenly it began to happen without the gimmick. Scared us to death. We didn't know what we were getting into. But we went on with the act and in my mind I began to search about for the answer. I found it, of course. You'll find a gimmick in almost everything if you look hard enough. I've got it, Rory. We've worked together so long that you know what I'm going to say before I say it. From my inflection, my pauses, even my movements. You see? Judd, that has to be it. Oh, this is marvelous. When Harry gets back, I'll tell him about it. 
And if I last until tomorrow, he can ask the management for more dough. Yeah, as soon as he gets back. Next Thursday. Tonight. How much more should we ask for? Well, we... Tonight? What made you say tonight? I don't know, Judd. Oh, you were there when he told me he'd be in Palm Springs till Thursday. What... What made you say tonight? I, I don't know. What difference does it make? Stop picking on me. So I made a mistake. So what? Well, I don't see how you could make such a mistake, that's all. Judd, leave me alone. I've been worried half crazy about really being able to read your mind. I've been under a strain. So Harry's coming back Thursday and not tonight. All right. You satisfied? He'll be here Thursday and not tonight. You, Judson Stone, mister? This dressing room, eh? Uh, what is it? A telegram. Uh, sign here. Oh, sign for it, will you, Rory? Uh, there you are, kid. I'm sorry I blew up in your face, Judd. I... Judd. What's the matter? It's... It's from Harry. He's coming in tonight. And he did, too, Lieutenant. Rory was so upset by it, she couldn't go on at all that evening. She had no explanation for how she knew, none whatsoever. I don't know, Judd. I just don't know. My mind seems to go blank, and I seem to hear a voice whisper in my ear, and Harry Arnold will be with you tonight, that's all. When we got to our suite at the hotel, Harry was there waiting for us. What happened? What happened? You both look like ghosts. Oh, Harry, I'll tell you some other time. Leave us alone, will you? All right, all right, I'm going. Just came back to wish you a happy birthday and to give you this. Birthday? Oh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Harry, thanks. What is it? Well, open it, why don't you? It's a bathrobe. A red silk bathrobe with your initials. That's right, it's a... How does she know? How do you know? Get out of here. Get out of here! John, make him get out of Look, here! I won't be talked to like that. I don't care who she is. I won't be oh, talked Harry, to like that. Harry, shut up! For heaven's sake, shut up and go away. What? Leave us alone. What? Go, get out, get out! You... You too, Judd? She's got you talking against me too, huh? All right, I'm going. I'm going. But from here on in, it's strictly business between us. I wash my hands. He kept his word, Lieutenant. From that time on, he kept himself to himself. And I was prepared to let it go at that, much as I liked Harry... Until the night I was awakened no. by Rory, no. moaning in her sleep. No, no, please. Oh, oh, Rory, no. Rory, wake up. No. You're having a bad dream. Rory. No. What? What? Judd? No, shh. Just quiet. Is it all right? I'm here. I'm here. Oh, Judd. What, Rory? The voice. Whispering again? Yes. Oh, Judd. What? He's going to kill me. Harry Arnold is going to kill me. And that, Lieutenant, was the beginning of the end of that. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ronald Coleman with Kathy Lewis in A Vision of Death. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. <laughs> Rory, Rory, get a grip on yourself. He's going to kill me. Harry is going to kill me. No, don't be ridiculous. Stop it now. It was just a bad dream. Harry is going to kill me. Will you stop that? Will you stop saying Should that? Hold me. I'm frightened. Harry is going to kill now, me. Now, you've had a bad dream, I tell you. He hates me. He hates me, John. John Harry is going to kill me. <laughs> I'm a rational man, Lieutenant. I've always felt, for example, that when Hamlet says there are stranger things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio, Horatio ought to reply, tell that to Sweeney. I knew there was no such thing as mental telepathy. I knew it as well as I know I'm sitting here talking to you. Up here in my head, I knew it. And yet, uh, the next afternoon, 
I found myself entering a gun shop and purchasing a revolver and a box of bullets, determined that before Harry Arnold could so much as injure one hair of Rory's head, I would kill him. Uh, I should have gone directly to the police first. <laughs> You're using hindsight, Lieutenant. I had all that out with Rory. Please, Judd, please. Go to the police and tell them about this. Let them handle it. Well, tell them what? That by reading his mind, we've learned Harry intends to murder you? They'll believe us. They've got to believe us. Oh, now, they're reasoning like a child. They'll decide that it's either a publicity stunt or else they were both lunatics. Well, if I tell them about the telegram and the birthday presents... Rory, we have no proof. But we have to do something. What? Tell me what. You know he intends to kill you. I know he intends to kill you. But what can we do? I can't simply put a bullet in his heart next time I see him. How could I explain it? My wife had a premonition that he was going to murder her. Huh? And you, do you know when he's going to do it? Or how he's going to do it? No. He hasn't decided yet. Isn't there anything we can do? Nothing. Except wait. I reacted to the waiting, as you might expect, Lieutenant. Sleeplessness, loss of appetite, growing irritability. I flared up at everyone. Waiters, chambermaids, elevator boys, the manager of the club. The manager of the club, yes. He finally said to me... Stone, what the devil's gotten into you? I'd really like to know. None of your business. Well, I'm only trying to be nice. Oh, shut up and let me alone. Yeah, sure, I'll let you alone. I'd let you alone right now if your contract didn't have another week to run. But after that, I'll let you strictly alone. You'll never work this club again, maniac. I began to drink quite heavily, quite noticeably. I was going crazy just from the waiting. And then, and then the waiting came to an end. It was around three in the morning. I was sitting up in bed, in the dark, smoking, when Rory opened her eyes and said... Judd? Yes, the voice. Yes. He's... He's going to kill me here. Right here, in this room. Rory. Saturday. This Saturday at midnight. <laughs> John. Oh, Rory. Rory, sweetheart. He's going to shoot me. He has a gun. And he's going to shoot me. He's going to get you... Downstairs in the manager's office at the club. And why is there? He, he's going to come up here. Uh, Rory, Rory, listen to me. I want you to listen to me. You're mistaken, do you understand? You've been having another bad dream, and that's all there is no, to it. Oh, no, Jed, I swear it. He, he just thought of it. Just this minute. He's standing at a bar. Standing there all by himself. Drinking. And he, he just this minute decided... Oh, you're making it up. Yeah, no. Uh, it's, it's the bar over at the Tuscany Hotel. I see it so clear. Oh, you're wrong. You're wrong. I'll prove you're wrong. <laughs> Dad. Give me the bar at the Tuscany, will you? Over on Sunset. One moment, please. Now, you'll see, Rory. He's not there at all. You'll see. It's just a dream. Just a bad dream. Tuscany Cocktail Lounge. Hello. Is Harry Arnold there at the bar? Harry Arnold? No, I'm sorry, he's not. He's not, huh? You sure of that? Oh, sure, I'm sure. He was here all evening. Left about a minute ago. I said goodnight to him myself. You want me to call? It wasn't a dream. Yes? No, 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 Rory. Don't, 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 don't worry. Trust me. Trust me. When Harry comes tomorrow night, you won't be here at all. But I will. Look, Lieutenant, my hands, see? Just the memory of how I felt at that moment and my hands begin to tremble again. Amazing, isn't it? Well, that was last Thursday night or rather Friday morning and towards daybreak, Rory subbed herself to sleep. But I was restless... I got dressed and went downstairs and got into my car. A long drive has always relaxed me, but when I got behind the wheel, I don't know what it was, possibly the fresh air, but all at once I felt as though I couldn't keep my eyes open for another moment. I simply, I simply had to have sleep. 
So I crawled into the back seat, curled myself up in one corner, pulled the rug over me and went out like a light. Hello, Satin Skin. Hello, Harry. I was awakened Don't around noon by the sound of voices. You may see us. Look businesslike. Where is he? I don't know. Since he hasn't got the car, he must be out walking. Don't you have some papers or something I could be examining just to make it look good in A case... A pocket of... full here. All right. He fall for it last night? Just like he fell for all the rest of it. Red bathrobe, the plants in the audience. He even phoned the bar just after you left. Timed it beautifully. Oh, satin skin, satin skin. I can hardly keep away from you. After tomorrow night, we'll have all the time in the world for each other, Harry. You bought the whole story, huh? Midnight tomorrow, your place? Every word of it. Just do what you have to do. Remember to come to the dressing room before the 8 o'clock show and tell him you've set up a meeting with Stamper, the manager, in his office at 12. I want them to shake hands and be friends again, I'll tell him. Don't forget, when you come to the door at midnight, keep talking to the elevator boy. Don't let him go, whatever you do. You'll want him to testify with self-defense. Don't worry, I won't forget a thing. You'll handle all the rest of it? Yeah, yeah, just leave it to me. No, I mean about his gun. That's pretty important, you know. Don't worry. It will misfire. It'd be difficult for me to tell you what I felt as they walked away, Lieutenant. One part of me felt the way a man ought to feel, I suppose, when he learns that the woman he loves is not only unfaithful, but plotting his death as well. But another part of me felt only relief. Relief at learning there was a gimmick in this, too. (laughs) They'd been fairly clever for amateurs. Harry had a good excuse for carrying a gun to protect the cash he brought me each Saturday. My own behavior in recent weeks would lend weight to what he would probably offer in his defense, that I must have been crazy. That for no reason at all, I'd pointed a revolver at him and threatened his life, that he had to shoot in self-defense. The presence of the elevator boy. That that could mean only that Harry would shoot just as soon as I opened the door. I'd be found dead with a revolver in my hand and a heartbroken agent at my side. Tableau. Then I... Then I found myself hoping, as I never hoped before, that they'd come to their senses before Saturday. That they'd realize what a vicious, inhuman thing it was they were planning. But just before the eight o'clock show that night, there was a knock at the door of our dressing room. Come in. Judd, I've been talking to Stamper, the manager. He's sorry this bad blood between you wants to square it. I told him you'd be in his office at 12 to talk things over, all right with you? Yeah. We don't want it so that we never work here again, do we? I mean, there's no reason we should. No reason at all. Button my dress, Judd. See you later, Judd. Yeah, later. We did the show and then went up to our suite. I helped Rory pack a small overnight bag. I loaded the revolver and then there was nothing to do but wait. The minutes passed. Nine o'clock, ten, ten thirty. And I waited. Judd. Yes? I don't want you to go. It's best that you do. Doesn't seem right to leave you here alone. Uh, Things might not go as I planned. I might not be able to stop him. And if I fail to stop him... No, no, it's best that you go. Just wait at the motel until you hear from me. What time is it? Almost eleven. Two minutes of eleven. I'm out of cigarettes. Yes? This is Mr. Stone in 1101. Please send up a carton of players, will you? Right away, Mr. Stone. I want you to go now, Rory. Judd, let me call the police, please. It will be useless. We've gone into it, and it'll be useless. Then come with me. He won't find anybody here. Well, then he'd choose another place, another time. Here's your valise. You have your gun? In my pocket. You won't take any chances. I don't know what I'd do if you were hurt or anything. I won't take any chances. Now, let me help you on with your coat. Judd, I love you so. Yes, I know. And I love you, Rory. I really do, you know. Ready? Yes. Eleven o'clock. He'll be here in an hour. Go now, Rory. Kiss me goodbye. Judd. The cigarettes. Get them, will you, darling, while I find change... Rory! 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 
I shall always remember the look on Harry's face, Lieutenant, as she sank to the floor. They'd concocted a bad dream between them and it had come true. I'll bet he still doesn't know how it happened, and if you pass his cell, Lieutenant, you might tell him. Whisper the word gimmick into his ear. That's what I said, gimmick. I gimmicked the clock while Rory was dressing. Set it back a full hour. It was 11 to her, but 12 to him. <laughs> I adore gimmicks. Don't you? Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Ronald Coleman. My occult powers do reveal that every driver's automobile has a life both long and bright when it has parts by Autolite. Well, that's fortune telling. There's no doubt about, Swami. You know, Autolite makes over 400 fine products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants from coast to coast. These include complete ignition systems used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars. Generators, coils, distributors, electric windshield wipers, voltage regulators, wire and cable, starting motors, and many more. They're all engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're all part of the Autolite team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, our star will be Mr. Van Johnson in Strange for a Killer. And in weeks to come, you will hear such famous stars as Miss Joan Crawford, Mr. Jack Carson, and Mr. Jack Benny, all on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. In tonight's play, Kathy Lewis was heard as Aurora and Larry Dobkin as Harry. Others in the cast were Florida Edwards, Joseph Kearns, and Charles Calvert. A Vision of Death was written by Jerry Hausner and adapted for suspense by Walter Newman. Ronald Coleman may be heard each week on his own radio program, The Halls of Ivy. And remember, next week on Suspense, Mr. Van Johnson, as a man who suspects a murderer is holding as hostages his wife and child. A story we call Strange for a Killer. You can buy world-famous Autolite Staple batteries, Autolite resistor type spark plugs, or standard type spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Dead tired. But I kept on walking through the mist. And suddenly I started hearing footsteps behind me. I turned around, and then I saw him. He was walking along slow, dragging his feet, walking as if he couldn't see. His face was all covered with blood. But I know who it was. It was Miller, the guy I killed. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fear is the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute, then. The dead come back. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by William Morewood will threaten your sanity. Its title, The Dead Come Back. About 
about one o'clock in the morning on a dark, deserted street. Standing in the doorway of a gloomy brownstone house, a man with a wild expression on his face rings the bell desperately. There is no answer, and he rings again. Then... Hey, Doc Padgett. Why, yes. The brain doc knows what goes on inside a guy's head? Well, yes, I'm a psychiatrist. I've got to talk to you. It's very late. If you come back tomorrow during office hours... Now, Doc. Something's been happening to me. Something that's driving me nuts. I'm sorry, but... Get inside. Be careful with that. It won't go off until I pull a trigger. Better sit down, Doc. Very well. Well, Just to make sure we understand each other... I put this gun here on the desk. And my watch. We got just half an hour to get everything cleared up. And then? And then... I got a guy to kill. Suppose we start at the beginning. Your name? Lefty O'Connor. O'Connor? So you heard of me, huh? I'm not sure, but... The Tilson murder case. That's right. But as I remember That's it... That's right. But... He decided I was nuts. Put me away. But get this straight, Doc. Yes? I wasn't ever out of my head. And I ain't now. I see. Insanity was something that I cooked up to keep from burning. I played it up all right. Good enough to make monkeys out of the doctors and the jury. But when I got to the nut house, it was different. I didn't have to pretend no more. You know, Doc, some of them wax act just as sane as you and me. Yeah, I was getting along fine. Till two nights ago... When I was called in to see the superintendent, he was a white-haired old guy. Name of Miller. Ah, oh, sit down, Lefty. Cigarette? Thanks, Mr. Miller. Here you are. What's that? This? Just a music box. Plays when you open the lid. That ain't just a... What are you trying to do to me? Oh, what do you mean, Lefty? I just offered you That's a... That's the box they kept talking about at the trial. The one old Mrs. Tilson kept her jewels in. I'm afraid you're mistaken, Lefty. In a pig's eye. I know what you're trying to do. But I don't remember nothing. Nothing, you hear? And why does this tune seem to disturb you, sir? Never mind why. Turn it off. Yes, of course. Take it easy, Lefty. I called you in here because I want to help you. You're trying to trick me into admitting I knew what I was doing when I hit old lady. Nothing of the kind. Next, you'll be asking me where I hid the jewels. Don't you think I know that routine? There's no routine here, Lefty. You're but... a liar, Mr. Miller. You got me in here to give me the third degree to try to break me down all over again. Well, you won't do it. Not again. I've had enough. Lefty, I'll put down that paperweight. Uh, so I... Oh. I didn't have no idea of escaping when I hit him, Doc. I was just scared. I was scared of what would happen if he kept after me. When I found a gun in his desk drawer, I began making plans fast. I brought him around. I told him exactly what he had to do. We went out, got into his car, started for the gate. Okay, Miller, it's up to you now. I understand. Now remember, I'll be lying back here with this gun against your spine. Evening, Mr. Miller. Hello, George. Going out kind of late, aren't you, sir? Uh, Yes. Something unexpected came up. (laughs) You wouldn't be smuggling out anyone under that rug and back, sir, huh? I... Might. (laughs) Yep, looks suspicious. Just the right shape for a man. But I'll take a chance on you, sir. Okay, Charlie. Open up for the super. Good night, Mr. Miller. Turn the left fork here. The Ganville Road. I was afraid of this, Lefty. The Tilson Estate's up this way, isn't it? You're too smart for your own good, Mr. Miller. You can turn off here. But there's no road. In under the trees. All right. What happens now? Do we walk the rest of the way? One of us does. Get out. You're no use to me anymore. Let you know. Put that gun away. You can't. You fool. You won't get rid of me this way. You won't. I left him there beside his car and started walking. I don't know how long I was at it. 
Maybe an hour. When I hit the outskirts of town, the light was kind of funny. It was different from anything I'd ever seen. It was kind of yellow. Kind of yellow mixed with a mist that was curling up. Maybe I was tired, I don't know. But suddenly I began to hear footsteps behind me. I looked around, and then I saw him. He was walking on the other side of the road, blind, as if he couldn't see where he was going. And his feet were kind of dragging along. His face was covered with blood. But through the blood, I could see that it was him. Miller. I don't know what happened then, Doc. I must have passed out. Because the next thing I knew, somebody... People, faces bending over me. He's coming too, Tom. Yeah. How are you feeling, chum? Hey. He's as as white as if he'd seen a ghost. Who who are you? I'm Ruth Mason. This is my brother, Tom. We live right by. We heard you yell and came running out. Did did, did you see anyone else? I know. No. No. You were lying right in the middle of the road till we pulled you off. What happened? Did a car hit you? Yeah, I don't remember. Well, take his arm. Help him up, Tom. Okay, sure. Here we go, Mo. <coughs> the name is uh, Sims. Johnny Sims. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm all right. <laughs> you look kind of bushed to me. Uh, I, I, I've been walking all night. Uh, out of a job, see. So and broke. Well, our house is right over there. You come on in and we'll... Oh, thanks. You. I gotta keep moving. What's the rush if you're just looking for a job? Well, I... Uh, hey. Cops coming this way. Probably looking for that man that escaped from the state hospital. That's but, right. They said that... But, Johnny, what's the matter? <laughs> you look as if you're going to fade again. I guess I must be worse than I thought. Look, does that invite still hold? Well, of course. Right this way. Something more, Johnny? No, thanks, Ruth. Couldn't manage another thing. Full up. Oh, well, then you lie yeah. right down on that sofa. That is, if Tom will get off with his paper. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. I was just reading some more about that guy, Lefty O'Connor, that broke out of the asylum. Seems he forced the superintendent to drive him out in a car. Please, Tom. Let's not talk about it. Gives me the creeps to think of anyone like that being loose. Maybe he ain't so bad. He's a murderer, Johnny. A homicidal maniac. How do you know? Maybe the super deserved killing. The super? Yeah. But the paper doesn't say anything about the super being killed. Well, Ruth said... I meant the old lady, Mrs. Tilson. Oh. Yeah, I I guess I must have heard. Maybe I just thought... I'll try the radio. Maybe there's some late news on it. Well, you're probably right, Johnny. The super wouldn't stand a chance. Sure. The way I figured... Johnny. Turn that off. What? I said turn it off. Why? Johnny. Hey, what gives? Well, I'm sorry. I, I don't like radios. Well, it's all right, Johnny. We understand. Now, suppose we show you to your room and you take a good long sleep. I must have slept like a dead man, Doc. It was dark when I woke up. There was nobody in the house. I switched on the lamp and looked at my watch a few minutes before midnight. I didn't have much time if I wanted to get the jewels and blow town before morning. So I started for the door, and before I reached it, it opened. And standing there, smiling, kind of sad-like, was Miller. Hello, Lefty. Did you get the jewels? You! It can't be you. You're You're dead. I told you you wouldn't get rid of me so easily. What do you want with me? Nothing, Lefty. Just what I wanted before, to help you. You're lying. You still think you can break me, get me to confess, but I'll show you. I must have hit the lights, Doc, or maybe they were never on, because suddenly the room was all dark. I struck a match. I bent down to look at Miller, make sure that he was really dead this time. And... I ain't crazy, Doc. You gotta believe me. But the man lying face up on the floor was Tom Mason. A dead man who came back. And now, a second victim. 
as the hands of the clock move inexorably to the witching hour. And yet another... Murder! At midnight! <laughs> And now, back to Murder at Midnight. To Lefty O'Connor, sitting in a psychiatrist's office with a gun in front of him, trying to convince the doctor and himself that he is sane. My hand was shaking so much that the match went out. It was Tom, all right. Tom Mason, dead. But it was better that way than what I'd thought, because it meant that Miller hadn't come back from the grave. I probably just imagined I heard him talking to me. I frisked Mason, I got the keys to his car, and went out. It was a little coupe parked in the driveway. I opened the door. I was just getting in when... Hello, Johnny. Huh? Ruth. <laughs> you look a little better than you did before. How do you feel? Oh, I, uh, fine, fine. Oh, that's good. You were sleeping so soundly when I left it. Well, are you going somewhere? Well, yeah, yeah. There was something I had to do, and, uh... Tom told me I could borrow his car. Oh, all right. I'll go inside. No, and... you can't go in there. Well, what do you mean? Why not? Well, I mean, uh, such a swell night. Uh, have a little drive, Ruth. <laughs> but what about your errand? Well, that'll just take a minute. It'll be swell having you along. Well, I don't know. I I don't suppose Tom will mind. But... I'm sure he won't. <laughs> well, then, all right. <sighs> I guess that's one of the wonderful things about life. You just never know when something completely unexpected will happen. That's right, baby. You just never know. Why so quiet, Johnny? Huh? <laughs> you ask me to come driving with you, and I do. You don't say a thing to me. What should I be saying? Well, you might start by telling me something about yourself. Like I said, I'm just a guy looking for work. What kind of a job did you have before? Chauffeur. Well, that sounds interesting. Did you work around here? Why? I just wondered. You seem to know the roads so well. Listen, baby, let's not talk about me. I'd rather hear about you. Well, there's not much to tell. I'm 21, fancy free, and I work for a living. I'm a nurse in a psychiatrist's office. A what? Psychiatrist. A doctor who, well, helps people who are disturbed mentally. Like people who, uh, see things that ain't there? Oh, yes. He gets a lot of those kind of cases. What does he do? Mm, talks to the patients, explains away the hallucination. His name is Dr. Paget, and he's really wonderful. Johnny? Yeah? Where are we going? Why, baby? We've turned off the main road. This leads past the old Tilson mansion. What's that? The house where that terrible murder took place about a year ago. It's all boarded up now, of course. Yeah, but... yeah, that's the job Lefty O'Connor pulled, yes. huh? Yeah, he was old Mrs. Tilson's chauffeur. Uh, what? Chauffeur. Quite a coincidence, ain't it? Johnny, you're turning in the driveway. Yeah. See, a couple of nights ago, I broke into this place to sleep. It was just an empty house to me. I didn't know anything about no murder. I left the parcel behind. I want to pick it up. Oh, oh I, I see. You think I had any other reason for coming here? No, Johnny. Sit tight, baby. I'll be back in a minute. All right. All right, Johnny. I... Well, why are you taking the keys? Just to make sure the car stays here and you with it. But of course I'll stay. You better, baby. You ought to be just too bad. Loose from one of the windows, climbed into the old house. It was black as pitch inside. That musty, shut in smell. Felt my way along the wall of the stairs, climbed to the second floor. The old lady's room was at the head of the stairs. It wasn't so dark in there. The windows hadn't been boarded, and the moonlight was coming in. I saw that marble fireplace with a gargoyle in the middle grinning at me. So I picked up the poker and smashed into it. And there, 
Behind where I pushed it past a loose brick was the paper bag containing the jewels. I looked inside to make sure that everything was safe. Moonlight sparkled on them shiners. And then... And Doc, suddenly... Suddenly, out of nowhere, it started. That music started. Johnny, stop it! Stop it! Johnny, stop where it. are you? What? Who? Oh. Ruth! Ruth, get her to stop. Get her to stop. Oh, get her Mrs. Tilton, that tune. What tune? You, you mean you don't hear nothing? Well, no, Johnny. But you must. Yeah. It's gone now. Johnny, you're shaking all over you. Johnny, what's that? What's what? Well, they're all over the floor. They look like diamonds, jewels. Didn't I tell you to stay in the car? What are you doing up here? I, I heard noises and you You were spying on me. No, I wasn't, Lefty. I... What did you call me? Nothing, I... So you guessed it, huh? Okay. I am Lefty O'Connor, and I came back for the jewels. But that information ain't traveling far. Mm-hmm. Not with you, anyway. What do you mean? No! I was rattled, Doc. The music did it. That and everything else. I left the lion there and I picked up the jewels and beat it. It started to come fast. Just about hit the main highway when the wheels started acting funny. I stopped and got out to look. It was a flat. My luck had played out. If I took the time to change it, someone might come along. And just then I did hear a car coming. I I froze, waiting for it to pass. Instead, it stopped and... Hi, Johnny. Come. Come, mate. I got out as soon as I could. Which is the flat? What? How did you know? How did I know why you just called me? You told me you couldn't find the tools. I called you? Why, yeah. Don't you remember? No, no, I don't. I couldn't have. I, 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 I... Of course, it's none of my business, Johnny, but... Look, you've been acting awful funny. I'm beginning to think maybe you ought to go see a doctor. Someone like Doc Patchett that Ruth works for. There's nothing wrong with me. Nothing. Okay. Okay. Get started with this, Jack. The rest of the tools are under the front seat. I'll get them. No, no, wait. Hey, what's this paper bag doing? Give me that! <laughs> You're calling in some pebble collecting, eh? Pebbles? Yeah, look at them. Oh, they are pebbles. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's happening to me? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> But I told you, you don't look well. Hey, where are you going? Hey, wh- wait a minute. I told you that was a borrowed car. Get out of that round, boy. Yeah. I say get out. You're nuts, Johnny. You're nuts. You're crazy. Well, there it is, Doc. Yeah, huh? That's the story. I kept hearing what he said. Tom. Over and over again. I'm nuts. I'm crazy. But I couldn't stand it anymore. So I looked you up in the phone book and I come over. Well, what do you expect me to do, Lefty? Do? You're a brain doc. I'm not nuts. I know I'm not. Why am I seeing these things? What's happening to me? Well, it's rather difficult to make a diagnosis this quickly, but uh, I'd say that you were suffering from hallucinations because of a sense of guilt. Guilt? About why? Well, it probably started with that first murder, Mrs. Tilson. And it's been weighing, preying on your mind ever since. Now, if you could extrovert that, get it out of your system. But I, I did. Uh, that's true, but not as a confession with all the details. That's the only way you can achieve a complete catharsis. Well, that's crazy. All right. You wanted my advice, but you don't have to take it. And you think... Okay. Okay, I did kill her. I knew all the time what I was doing. I waited for a night when there was only the two of us in the house, and then I beat her brains out with a tire iron. There. There, I said it, I told you. 
Yes, Lefty. And I think that now I can promise you you'll never be troubled by hallucinations again. You sure, Doc? Quite sure. That's good. Because... Remember I said that in half an hour I was going to kill someone? Yes. Well, the half hour is up. And you're the man. Am I, Lefty? Yeah. I'm sorry, Doc, but you know too much now. You're the only one who does, so... I wouldn't, Lefty. Why... Why are you sitting there like that? I shot you. Yes, Lefty, with blanks in your gun. All right, boy. Take it easy, Lefty. We got you covered. No. And Mason. Did you get it? Uh Uh-huh. Every word. The cops. No kidding. Then the whole thing, letting me escape and everything that happened afterwards was just a trick. That's right. You wanted to show I wasn't nuts, get me to confess. Smart boy. You made just one mistake, Lefty. Or rather, Ruth did. Following you into the Tilson mansion. She paid for that with her life. But now, now you're going to pay. No, no. Shut up. Yes, Lefty, for that and for the Tilson murder. And my only regret is that rats like you can only burn once. Two grim-faced men take hold of Lefty O'Connor. And Lefty knows that he's come to the end of the road. The road that began when he first heard the clock from the old Tilson mansion strike 12 for... Murder! At midnight! Remember to be with us again when death's face peers out of the darkened windows of deserted houses and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Lefty O'Connor was played by Joseph Julian. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. of these somewhat macabre ceremonies which will illuminate darkly the next hour of your life. The executioner waits. He waits, we are taught, 
for those who commit evil. He waits for them patiently, secure in the knowledge that they must come to him in the end. But this was true of a more orderly, organized era. Today, the executioner still waits, but not only for the criminal. Patiently, calmly, he waits for any of us, for all of us. He could be waiting for you. He could be waiting for me. But why? What have we done? Who knows? Today, there are executioners who have reasons of their own. Our mystery drama, The Little Old Lady Killer, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Diane Baker and Anne Seymour. People die for serious reasons, and some people die for trivial reasons, and some people die for no reason at all. Tom Fessler is about to die in less than ten minutes from now because he decided to stop at a roadside diner for a cup of coffee. Well, it's not so much the coffee. Perhaps Tom feels like bragging a bit to Sparky Wilson, who runs the place. This has been a day of days for Tom, a red-letter day. After all, it isn't every day that a man's efforts are crowned with success, that a man can become the envy of all his friends. Tom wants to savor this day to its fullest. He wants it to last as long as possible. And so he turns off the highway and pulls into Sparky's parking lot making sure the station wagon is parked just outside the front door where everybody inside can see it and marvel. But as Tom Fessler walks into Sparky's, he is immediately disappointed. The place is usually jammed with a hunting crowd, but tonight there isn't a soul, save Sparky himself and a gray-haired lady sitting at the counter. Evening, Tom. How's it coming, Spark? Can't complain. Who'd listen, anyhow? <laughs> Coffee? Yeah, cream and sugar. Anybody been around? In and gone. Anybody bag anything? Oh, they'd be here bragging if they had. <laughs> well, Spark, take a look out the window. Yeah? See what I got on top of the wagon? Tom! Yes, sir. That's, That's a ten-point oh. buck. Oh, he must wait. Yeah, look at it, a buck that tips the scale at 350. You're terribly proud of yourself, aren't you, mister? I beg your pardon, ma'am? What have you done, actually? You've transformed a magnificent animal into a mass of decaying carrion. Well, look, ma'am, I don't ask what you do for pleasure. Pleasure? To butcher an innocent living creature. This is how you find pleasure. Look, I, I'm not bothering you, and please. I'm afraid you are. Your very presence, indeed, your very existence is an insult. Now, look, Mum, this is a public place. I'm sure it is, indeed. Much too public for my taste. How much do I owe you, sir? Tea and toast and tax. It's 37 cents, Mum. Please, be my guest. I'd rather not, thank you. There's a judgment and there is a judge. And you have been judged. Your eyes will beg for mercy, as did the now sightless eyes of that poor beast. And the mercy you will receive is the mercy you have shown. None. Well, goodbye, ma'am. It's a creepy old dame. Yeah, yeah. This one's nothing. You should see some of the others who come in here. Just rolls off your back. Tell me, where'd you bag him? What'd you use? I'll never believe it. My 30 caliber carbine. You're right. I'll never believe it. A 10 point? You can buffer. kill anything with a 30 if you hit him right. Yeah, that had to be a lucky shot. Why not? It's my lucky day. you for stopping. Well, look who's here. Aren't you the lady that gave me that hard time back in the diner? Oh, my car, it, it, it simply won't go. Well, ma'am, if you ain't too proud to accept a hand from a killer of innocent animals. My car, it, it just won't go, and, and I, I'm stuck in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Okay, ma'am, you just hold on. 
Let me get my flashlight and take a peek under the hood. Well, you got to get something anyhow, man. It's a good, clean sport. Okay. Now, let me check her out and see what's wrong. You want to get in there and turn on the ignition? No. Just turn on... What do you mean, no? I don't want to turn on the ignition just yet. Why not? Turn around. Huh? That's... That's a little pistol. Yes. I intend to kill you. You're crazy? What do you want to kill me for? That poor animal lashed to the roof of your station wagon probably asked the same question. You can't, lady. Pray. Now, now look. Probably need another shot. Did you use more than one? Your eyes. I told you they would beg for mercy. How large they are. How round. How bright. I told you. The mercy you will get will be the mercy you have given. Please, don't. Have you ever shown mercy? Doctor. Justice. Justice. What do you have, miss? Information. Information? What do you want? I'm a police detective. Uh, my credentials. You? A detective? My name is Lieutenant Kramer. I'd like to ask you several questions. Yes, ma'am. Your name is Harold Wilson. You're known as Sparky? That's right, ma'am. Last night, a man was shot to death at the side of the road a mile and a half south of here. Yeah, yeah. To Tom Pressler. You knew him? Oh, we were old buddies. I guess I'm the last one who saw him alive. That is, aside from the killer. When did you see him? Well, he was in here. Uh, it was about 10.30. When he left here, was there anything unusual about his manner? No, he was laughing and joking. You, you know, he bagged himself a deer. And, and... He was in this place at 10.30. Was anyone else around? No. You and Tom Fessler were alone? Yes, ma'am. All the time he was here? Well, yes, we were alone after she left. After who left? Oh, I don't know. Some dame. A dame? Yes, a crazy old dame. How old? Oh, she could have been 60. She could have been 70. How crazy? Well, she had this thing against hunting. What thing? Well, Tom had the dead buck on top of the station wagon. She didn't go for that. No way. What, what do you mean? She said, oh, she said, you are going to be judged. Your eyes will beg for mercy, but you ain't going to get none at all. Something like that. Can you describe this woman? Just an ordinary looking old dame with white hair. She was wearing? Uh, wearing, wearing. A uh, 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 trench coat. And uh, 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 what do you call them things? Uh, my wife wears one. A uh, 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 kerchief. A kerchief round the red. Oh, what, what, what color was the trench coat? Well, trench coat color. Well, you know, uh, uh, cocky. What color was the kerchief? Well, it was, uh, it was blue. Yeah, kind of, kind of a bright blue. Yes. You'd never seen her before? No, I tried to keep nuts out of here. I don't mean nuts exactly. I had starved to death. I mean the kind of nuts that starts fights. You didn't say she started a fight. Well, she was going at it pretty good, you know. This and that and the other thing about butchering poor innocent animals. She walks out of here mad. How mad? Well, mad enough to kill somebody. Except she wouldn't do it. Why do you why do you say that? Well, how could she? She's so dead set against killing. We know it was a woman, Inspector. Look, Louise, just because Fessler had a few words with an old dame back in a diner. Put the old lady aside for a moment. Look at the rest of it. It's late at night. He's got this dead animal on the roof of his car. Suddenly he stops. Why? You can see he was speeding by the skid marks. He pulls over to the shoulder. You can see the tire treads clearly in the dirt. And there was another car there, too, parked and waiting. How can you tell? They were tire marks. You can see what happened. A woman flagged him down. Why do you insist there was a woman? Well, he wouldn't have stopped for anyone else, given the lateness of the hour and his rush to get home. So, it's a woman in trouble. What kind of trouble? Car trouble. Well, that's good theorizing, Louise, but you need something solid or specific to support but it. But I do have something solid, and it's, and it's in the report. What? Found at the scene. Flashlight with Fessler's name stamped on but it. But that flashlight doesn't necessarily prove... Picture it, Inspector. 
A woman flags him down. She says she has car trouble. The normal thing for him to do is to take the flashlight so that he could look for well, it. From what we know about Fessler, he was a big-hearted guy. He might have also stopped to help out a man. The gun. What about the gun? A twenty-two caliber. It's not a man's gun. Oh, now, Louise, I know of guys who committed murder with those little pistols. But your average killer, who's a man, likes a good-sized weapon. It's all part of his psychosis. Now, go back to my little old lady in the diner. Yeah? Uh, she's basically afraid of guns, so she uses the smallest one possible. Why does it have to be your little old lady? Suppose she was young, good-looking. He fixes a car and says to her, Now, wouldn't you like to thank me? He forces her to thank him. With a couple of twenty-two caliber bullets. Yeah. But your young lady doesn't exist. My old lady was in the diner. She goes around passing judgments. She loves animals. She hates hunters. She goes down the road a mile or so, pulls over, waits, and flags him down. How are we going to find an old lady in a khaki trench coat and a blue kerchief? Inspector, I'm afraid we haven't heard the last of her. Hello? Who? Yeah, he can have credit. He's the kind of chump we're looking for. But you gotta let him win a couple of hands. One or two big pots, and he's hooked. I'll be out in a little bit. Sure. Good evening, Mr. Weller. Yeah. Huh? Mr. Arnold Weller? How'd you get in here? We have some business to discuss. Look, lady, I don't know how you got in, but before I throw you out, let me wise you up. Hundreds of old dames like you come around beefing because her husband's lost money gambling in my joint. But it's legal. The place is legal. I, I, I got a license. My husband never gambles. Neither do I. Well, what do you want? What's your name? My name is Bernadette Cobb. Mrs. J. Martin Cobb. My consuming interest... Look, lady, I don't have time. You have time. You have all of eternity. Now, look, I don't want to be impolite, but be that. Certainly. After I attend to my business. In my purse, I have a... Um, <laughs> Here it is. Hey, put that thing down. What are you pointing that gun at me for? I intend to kill you. Look, all, all I do is run a joint. People come here, they gamble. I don't force nobody. I don't care about this place, Mr. Weller. Well, 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 what place are you talking about? I don't own any... any uh... The other place, Mr. Weller. The other place. What other place? Look, you got it all wrong. The other place. The other barbaric, sadistic, fiendish, infernal place. No, don't. Please. I'll, I'll, gi I'll give you some dough. And I'll give you justice. <laughs> justice. Justice, says the lady. Well, obviously we have here a freelance dispenser of justice. Mrs. Martin J. Cobb. Justice and humanity. She certainly seems to have the purest of motives, but somehow, like so many dedicated reformers, it all comes down to the same thing in the end. Murder. Evidently, Mrs. Cobb agrees with the poet who, in describing nature, depicted it as a place where every prospect pleases and only man is vile. Well, we may consider Mrs. Cobb an extremist in her attitude towards animals, but let us be fair. Animals in general have not been getting a good deal from us members of the human race overall. And so even if they have found a somewhat over-enthusiastic partisan, it still isn't going to seriously change the basic balance of things. Well, what with Mrs. Cobb as the killer and Lieutenant Louise Kramer as the detective, it appears to be Ladies' Day in our little show. The ladies will present us with more check and mate when I return in just a few moments with Act Two. Wasn't it one of our outstanding men of letters, Mr. Henry David Thoreau, who said, If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it's because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music he hears. 
Well, now, this is one of those philosophical gems which sounds fine on paper. It may be all right to listen, but to march is something else. Mrs. J. Martin Cobb has been marching to the beat of her own drummer lately, and so far, she has killed two people. Because by this time, you have become a fine, highly perceptive, experienced, and discerning audience, you know that we shall hear her deadly little 22 caliber pistol bark again. Oh, Martin, Martin, what color you give those strings? Darling, I was merely one of the players in the violin section. Is there anything new in the newspaper, my dear? Nothing new. Same murder, robbery, assault. Same saber rattling, threats and squabbling. Changed only are the names of the peoples and the nations. Is there anything of uh, uh, purely local interest, Martin? Well, if murder is interesting, we seem to have a minor crime wave. Indeed. You recall a hunter a shot to death last week? I consider that supreme and sublime justice, a hunter. No, 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 dear. You must not take on so at the mere mention of the word hunter. Well, for the stupidity and arrogance and carelessness of a depraved hunter, you would not be condemned to spend the rest of your life in a wheelchair. Darling, the man meant no harm. I should have known better than to stroll through the woods during the height of the deer season. That's what I mean. Martin, you had no right to stroll peacefully, but he had the right to stalk and kill. At any rate, the same person who killed the hunter killed a rather unsavory individual named Arnold Weller. How do the police know that? They have scientific tests of one sort or another which reveal that the bullets were fired from the same gun. And do the police have any idea as to who the murderer might be? According to the newspaper, they're following certain significant leads, which is another way of saying that they're completely in the dark. These two victims of, of no great loss to civilized society. Well, the hunter wasn't a bad fellow, according to the press. Are really depraved. You should have seen that poor dead beast slung across the top of his car. Darling, you talk as if you actually had seen it. Well, I've I, I read the description and, well, my, my vivid imagination. Mm -hmm. Uh, the latest one, uh, he was a professional gambler. He operated a rather questionable establishment. He also did other things. What do you mean? Well, I, 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 I assume he did other things. My dear, you become much too emotional about these sensational crimes. I don't think we'd better even discuss them anymore. They're too traumatic for a person of your delicate nature. <laughs> Well, Louise, how do you square your little old lady with Arnold Weller? Inspector, there has to be a connection. Show me. Your own reports, you can't find any link between Fessler and Weller. You can't even find any evidence that Arnold Weller ever hunted. I'm convinced that my old lady killed Tom Fessler. But with Arnold Weller, your cruelty to animals premise goes out the window. And without that, you don't even have the little old lady. I know why she could have killed Fessler. I agree, but why should she kill Arnold Weller? He didn't hunt or fish. He never even owned a cat or dog. He was never involved with animals in any way, shape, or form. That we know of, Inspector Farley. That we know of. Well, if we'd like the lady detective... How's the crime business these days? You knew Tom Fessler. Oh, yes, ma'am. Did you also know a man named Arnold Weller? Arnold Weller? He was shot to death the other day. Oh, yes, I think I read about it. You didn't know him? Uh, no. No, definitely, or no, after a pause for thought? Well, you know how it is. I'm just trying to give a straight story to a cop. Are you saying you didn't know Arnold Weller? Well, yes, I, I knew of him. I, I knew enough to make me want to wring his neck. Is that a fact? Yes, Mum. Maybe I shouldn't say that to a cop who's investigating his murder, but... Uh... But what? Oh, he had a little action going and I just couldn't see it all. He used to run dog fights. Dog fights? Oh, it's against the law, but who am I to tell you? But he used to stage those things. Dog fights? I don't mind cock fights. I even go, and I bet. But they're nothing. <laughs> just chickens. And we eat chickens, don't we? The dogs. To train dogs to tear each other up. Dogs! How can any human being be so cruel to a dog? And 
He would stage dogfights? Oh, he had this big barn not far from the intersection eight off the turnpike. I'm surprised the cops never tumbled. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. But I don't know what for, Lieutenant, but you're welcome. Inspector, my old lady is right back in. The cruelty to animals angle is back in. She killed him because he ran dog fights? That's right, Inspector. I don't know, Louise. You can take a premise and run it halfway to the moon. What else have we got? Uh, nothing. I realize it's embarrassing. What's embarrassing? The fact that such an illegal activity was flourishing within the city limits. Well, it's not embarrassing to me. Let the uniform guys worry. Well, how about the little old lady now? Do you realize how many white-haired old ladies there can be who wear trench coats and blue kerchiefs? And carry twenty-two caliber pistols? Well, suppose she isn't carrying it at that time. Thin lips, too. All right, Louise. It'll go out to every station house in the city. Bernadette? Yes. Yes, I'm home. I'm furious. But why, my dear? Why? I don't know if I can talk about it. Now, sure. No. No, it was too terrible. Now, perhaps if you told me. No, no. I mustn't. My darling, when you share a load with someone, it's only half as heavy to carry. No. There's no point in making you as furious as I am. Darling, perhaps a nice hot cup of tea. Usually in those matters, I, I, I have been prepared to act almost on the spot. But this time, I lack the proper... Yes? The proper what? My dear, you do talk in riddles, you know. Her day of reckoning is soon to be upon her. Day of reckoning? My dear, you do say the strangest things. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have upset you, Martin. Here it is. Staunton Road. Nice, quiet, deserted. Number 427. 425. And this should be 423. The name in the mailbox says Harris. Right. And we shall go around the back way. Summon it to the back door. And... Aha! There's the dear girl hanging up the clothes. Mrs. Harris. She doesn't hear me. Wait. It's better that she doesn't hear me. Because if she heard me, she'd turn down her transistor radio. And in that case, someone might quite possibly hear the shot. No. This way. I am hidden by the trees in her yard. And the shot will be masked by the sound of the music. So, Mrs. Harris... Mabel Harris, I say to you, justice. Justice. I don't know, Louise. We may have your old lady. Who is she, Inspector? If she's your old lady, her name is Mrs. J. Martin Cox. Who found her? A very smart young rookie cop. He saw this old lady going into an apartment house on his beat. He stared at her because she was wearing a blue kerchief and a khaki trench coat, see? All right. It seemed to him she was uncomfortable just because he was looking at her. I understand. It's an extra sense every good cop develops, but he must have been born with it. Well, he remembered. He'd seen her come in and out of the house dressed just that way, but the next time he saw her, after he gave her the once-over, she dressed differently. How differently? Blue coat instead of a trench coat and no more kerchief. And she even had a different hair color. It's if she's on to something. Ooh, let me get Sparky Wilson. Do you want to be in on it, Inspector? Something tells me I'd better. I appreciate your giving us your time, Mr. Wilson. Well, look, if it helps us bag Tommy Fessler's killer, you can have all day. A look through the windshield. Look at the people coming toward you. And if any of them reminds you of anyone you've ever seen before... Well, this guy coming along here, he reminds me of a guy I was in the army with. Mm -hmm. But he's different. And that young tame, Lord lovely, I used to run around with a chick like that. Oh, look, how can this be helped? Just keep it up, please. And uh, that older tame, he's turning into the apartment house. She reminds me of... Yes? Where have I seen her before? Have you seen her before? 
Dad, sir, the old woman who was in my diner the night Tom Fessler was killed. The one who threatened him with retribution? She's got different hair, but I'd never forget that face. Well, Inspector? Well, what, Louise? Do I pick her up? And suppose she doesn't have the gun. You realize the only thing that can hang her is a twenty-two caliber, nothing else. Suppose I arrest her right now. Suppose she isn't carrying the gun. No, the only thing we can do is put a tail on her, have her shadowed night and day, and wait until she wants to use that pistol again. But if we delay, it could be too late. And if we move now, it could be too early. <laughs> Timing, as most people would agree, can be the most important thing in life, and in death, too. For all of Lieutenant Kramer's insight, and for all of Inspector Farley's experience, these two, unfortunately, don't know what we know. As it happens, when she turned into the apartment house just 30 seconds ago, Bernadette Cobb did have the deadly little 22 caliber pistol in her bag because she had just returned home from a fresh murder, the murder of a Mrs. Harris. And uh, who is Mrs. Harris? A seemingly inoffensive suburban housewife who was, as we saw, obviously minding her own business while she was hanging her clothes on the line. It seems that all occupations are becoming more and more hazardous, especially with Mrs. Cobb on the loose. More hazards in Act Three when I return in just a few moments. Cracking a murder case can be like splitting a diamond. When the diamond is struck perfectly, it breaks into a number of smaller precious stones. But let the wrong force be employed in the wrong direction, and one runs the risk of reducing a precious stone to dust. And just as a jewel can be lost, so can one lose the opportunity to catch a murderer forever. Precision. That's a key word for diamond cutters and detectives alike. Diamond cutters and detectives. How similar their professions can be. Each has at his fingertips a wealth of scientific guidance. And yet, when the time comes to strike the crucial blow, success or failure depends on pure instinct. What's the woman's name, Inspector? Mrs. Mabel Harris. She was killed this morning. And it becomes our party because the lab reports a bullet was fired from the same twenty-two caliber. Okay. A woman named Mabel Harris killed this morning. At noon, we were staking out the little old lady's doorway. Along comes our little old lady. Now, just a minute, Louise. She was probably coming back from her latest killing. She probably had the gun in her purse. Louise, you can't get carried away. Okay, look, we made the decision not to take her. Yeah. Now, I could have been wrong to want to risk letting her escape forever by trying to take her right there. But I went along with you then. Now, don't you back down on me now. Who's backing down? The little old lady theory of approach, whatever, rests on one fundamental premise. She's out to punish people who were cruel to animals. Now we have a dame named Mabel Harris, dead. If you can't find me a cruelty to animal angle there, your little old lady is out the window. I know I'll find that angle. What makes you so sure? Because it has to be there. Bernadette? Y- yes, Martin, my dear. Is everything all right? Of course, of course. Are you sure? My darling, why do you ask? Because you seem so... so out of sorts lately. Oh? Do I? Uh, for one thing, you insist on wearing that... that ridiculous red wig. Is it ridiculous, Martin? Mm, my darling, your own hair is so soft and silky. Why would you even think of hiding it? Because, darling, there may be Danger? Danger? From whom? Oh, my dear Martin, you've been away from the world so long, confined here the way you are. You don't know what it's like on the streets anymore. Bernadette, 
What's troubling you? What's really troubling you? I feel that people are looking for me. Looking for you? I feel their eyes seeking me out. Searching for me. Dear, dear, dear. You've been working so hard to support both of us. You're just exhausted. Physically and emotionally. Now, sit beside me. Yeah. Now rest. Relax. Close your eyes. You feel better. Yes, my darling. I'm tired. I'm so tired. Mr. Harris, did your wife have any enemies that you knew of? Enemies? Mabel with enemies? Everybody loved Mabel. A woman, kind, loving, generous woman, hanging up her clothes in her own backyard. Some depraved, some Mr. human Harris. beast. Just answer one question. How did your wife feel about animals? Inspector, is this woman for real? How can anybody in their right mind ask a question like that at a time like this? Do you suppose you could answer it? Mabel loved them. A stray dog couldn't walk down the street, but she'd give him something to eat. What do you mean by that question? She made a mistake. One very, very unfortunate mistake. But it was an honest mistake. You don't know how sick that mistake made her. What mistake? Well, that's why when this lieutenant asked a question about animals, it was as if she was trying to make poor Mabel be some kind of a, a monster. I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan? Her, uh, her big Doberman pincher. He was big, mean-looking, and that's why she called him Genghis Khan. But he was really very gentle. Yeah? Yeah, he'd been sort of out of sorts. A couple of days ago, she thought she might drop by the vet. Well, she had some shopping to do first, and so she stopped off at the supermarket. Yeah, yeah. And she parked in a lot. You know, the heat wave we've been having? Well, they got this law about how you can't bring dogs into the supermarket, you know? Yeah, I know. So she left him. She, she had to leave him in the car. Well, she never does this. I mean, she's always sure to leave one window open. But that day, she just wasn't thinking. Well, maybe being sick and all, Jengus was so quiet, she may have forgotten he was inside. But she closed all the windows. Oh. And she ran into some people she knew, and you know how women are, they can gab about nothing for hours. It was a terrible hot day, and the sun boiled down the inside of the car, and after a while, there was a commotion out on the lot. Some people must have noticed a dog just lying on the seat. He was a big dog. Yeah, go on, Mr. Harris. He... He was dead. And people were angry. And they were saying, find the owner of that dog and that person should be arrested. And Mabel, she remembered, she told me there was one old lady there who was shouting, the person who owns that dog should be shot. A little old lady. <laughs> What are you doing here, Louise? Waiting for her, Inspector. You don't have to. We got it staked out all around the clock. Collins and O'Neill are on watch now. I want her, and I'm not taking any chances. Louise, you're a lieutenant. This isn't your kind of work. Look, I'm on my own time, Inspector. Yeah. Well, sooner or later she has to try to make another move, and then we got her. We've been waiting for two weeks. We'll wait for two months. More if we have to. I wonder. What? Oh, I better not tell you. You better not tell me why. Well, maybe we can help her move. How? Well, I'll do it on my time off, and then you won't be able to turn me down. Darn. Darling, you're so nervous. That was one of the few plates we have left from our wedding. You remember my sister Martha presented yes, darling, this? darling, I remember. No. It's broken. My darling, the ultimate fate of any dish is to be broken one day. Now, tell me, why are you so nervous? What's upsetting you? Darling, I really, I, I'm very much concerned. Oh, no, Martin. We can't afford to have you... Please, forget. listen, dear. I was looking in the desk drawer a few days ago. Martin, that's my desk. I didn't mean to pry, but Martha had called and asked for Millicent's address, and I thought you kept your little book there. Bernadette, 
Why do you have a pistol? Well, darling, the world has become so dangerous. Thieves, bandits, burglars. But the only function of a pistol is to kill somebody. You don't know what the world has become. We must be able to protect ourselves. To kill is a sin. Martin, I know the kind of world you want. And we shall have it. Certain people must be taken care of first. What are you talking about? Oh, nothing, nothing. Now, please, you must get rid of the pistol. Why? I'm afraid. There are times when you show so much anger. I, I don't think it's wise for you to have a gun. But Martin, don't be silly. I, I couldn't kill anyone. Well, this gun, it, it, it's, it's just to scare people with. I'd feel better if you'd let me make sure about that. What did you say, Martin? What do you mean? Make sure of it. Nothing, dear. Nothing at all. Sometimes I just talk aimlessly. Forget it. Oh. Excuse me, ma'am. W would you know the price of this cocoa? It's marked on the side. Oh, of course. Here it is. It's so strange. Strange? Strange to be paying anything at all for cocoa. I was just down in South America where it uh, kind of grows wild, do you know? Uh, that's that's where I shot this uh, Caverina. This what? Uh, this Caverina, a very rare species of ocelot. Yes. I've noticed you wearing that scarf. Fantastic fur. Thin enough to wear on a cool summer day and warm enough even for the coldest winter. Yes. And such terrific hunting. Well, I have to get down there again soon. The Caverina is practically extinct. And I want to make sure I get my share. Proud of yourself, aren't you? Well, I don't like to brag. But I'm a great shot. I blasted that cat right between the eyes. A living, breathing animal. A sacred creation must give up its life. A cruel sacrifice to your vanity. Excuse me. Thank you for helping me. There is a judgment. And there is a judge. And you have been judged. Uh... Goodbye. And found guilty. This is Lieutenant Kramer. Any messages? Call Inspector Farley urgent. Oh, thank you. Don't touch that phone, please. <gasps> How did you... Put it down. That's it. Now, don't move. You can't get away with this. I'm not getting away with anything. I'm not committing a crime. You're pointing a gun at me. Obviously, you intend to kill me. That's a crime. No. I'm ridding the world of those people who make the world an abomination. The murderers. But you are also a murderer. Clever talk and twisted logic cannot save you. Nothing can save you. Just as you shot that poor, beautiful animal, I shall shoot you. Strange. You are also a poor, beautiful animal. And I shall now administer justice. 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 <laughs> Let go of the no, gun, no. Mrs. Cobb. No, no. I don't no. want let to hurt you. Oh, please don't. don't force me to hurt you. Drop it. Oh, it didn't go off. Why didn't the gun go off? Louise, I was trying to reach you here at home. She gave us the slip she got. Oh. Here's the gun, Inspector. Here's your little lethal twenty-two caliber. It didn't go off. What is she saying? She had me. She pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't fire. Must be a faulty cartridge. Is you all right, Louise? Uh, you sure? I'm sure. Let me see that pistol. I can only say the Lord did not want that gun to be fired. I'll tell you why that gun didn't fire. It has no firing pin. The firing pin's been removed. Oh, no. No. Oh, that... That's what he meant. That's what who meant, Mrs. Cobb? It's what Martin meant when he said he'd make sure of it. Oh, Martin. Why did you do this to me? Come along, Mrs. Cobb. Martin had no right to do that. He shouldn't have taken the firing pin out. That was very underhanded, very sneaky. Everyone's against me. In the end, they all show their true colors, even Martin. But I'll settle accounts with him one day. <laughs> Eventually, I think she forgave Martin. As you might suspect, the little old lady killer has been committed to an institution. 
And since Martin would be all alone in the world, he lives there too and helps take care of her. However, it's hard to say. She could be biding her time and awaiting her opportunity, as are so many other people, all of whom are certainly acting from the purest of motives. What a world it used to be that only demons and devils and the blackest-hearted villains were the killers. But what do you know? It seems that some very fine people are moving into it also. And so, if you should be rudely snuffed out, the chances are that you might have been murdered by a very nice person. I shall return shortly. several. But the one that would appear to be the most obvious is, as a philosopher once said, all extremes meet in eternity. Super kindness is the other face of super cruelty. Obsessive love is the other side of super hate. And isn't it strange sometimes that so many people who so strongly protest cruelty to animals tend to overlook cruelty to one of the most prevalent animals on this globe, Homo sapiens. Well, why not? After all, since when was consistency one of mankind's most deeply ingrained virtues? Never. Consistency is supposed to be the hobgoblin of little minds. Therefore, all of you, the only consistency that has any real value is the consistency of listening to our broadcasts here seven times each week. Our cast included Diane Baker, Ann Seymour, Alan Reed, Marvin Miller, and Barry Kroger. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Beautiful music. This is KIXI, Seattle. CBS News. Four Palestinians have released their Egyptian hostages after landing in Algiers. I'm Ann Crosman reporting on the CBS radio network. The terrorists freed the three Egyptian diplomats who were hostages. The other two hostages, the Iraqi and Algerian ambassadors to Spain, offered to escort the Palestinians into Algiers. The group was flown there in Algerian President Boumediene's personal plane. The terrorists had seized the hostages inside the Egyptian embassy in Madrid, threatening to blow up the building if the Egyptians did not renounce the recent Sinai agreement with Israel. The Egyptians refused to do that, but they did sign a statement denouncing the peace agreement. In Cairo, Egyptian President Sadat had some strong words of his own. John Sheehan has that story. President Sadat lashed out at virtually all his critics in the Arab world, chiefly the Syrians and the Palestinians, and he accused the Soviet Union of being behind the Arab campaign against Egypt. Sadat made his speech to commemorate the second anniversary of the 1973 war against Israel, but he delivered the address under the shadow of the Palestinian terrorist attack on the Egyptian embassy in Madrid. Sadat referred only briefly to the Palestinian attack and then aired a number of his disputes with the Soviet Union, accused the Soviets of delivering inferior weapons to Egypt and said that's why he expelled the Russians in 1972. 
Sadat said the only reason he consented to Geneva as the site for signing the interim agreement with Israel was to please the Soviets. Had he known the Russians would refuse to attend, said Sadat, the signing could have taken place in the United Nations buffer zone in the Sinai. John Shayan, CBS News, Cairo. More news in a minute. General Motors reports its domestic car sales in early September were the best they've been in four years. The other big three automakers, however, reported lower sales. Industry analysts say the better-than-expected sales are a result of continued improvement in the economy and initial strong sales of 1976 car models. Another economic indicator, the country's industrial output, registered its biggest gain last month in nearly three years, an increase of 1.3% over the month before. Mitchell Krauss has more on the story. The latest industrial production figures, which government economists are calling a sign that the recovery is well on its way, may not be as encouraging as they seem. Though the production index did go up 2.7% since May, proof that new orders are being filled, it still has a long way to go to make up for the 12% drop in production since last July. Even if the August recovery rate were to continue, it would still not be until next May that production levels would be up to where they were a year ago. And so far, the increased production has been accomplished with the higher of far fewer workers than were laid off. As for the latest on inventories, down for the sixth month in a row, that's a good sign, except that economists are still divided on how much more inventory is still to be liquidated before a rush of reorders becomes essential. On balance, though, the latest government-collected figures are being viewed as a definite indication of economic recovery. The only unanswered question, will the trend continue? Mitchell Krauss, CBS News, New York. More news coming up. The 30th session of the United Nations General Assembly opens Tuesday in New York. The 75 non-aligned countries that form a majority are expected to push for the expulsion of South Africa. Reuters News Agency reports that South Africa's ambassador says that his country's delegation will boycott the opening meeting and probably the entire three-month session. According to the ambassador, the time has come when we have to find a justification for remaining in the U.N. I'm Ann Crosman, CBS News. And now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of the Shadow People. Elaine, have you been. I mean, have you seen anything else since you spoke to me last? No, I haven't. Ever since Mother died, nothing's happened. Well, I only hope. That... <laughs> came from upstairs. Come on. <laughs> I don't know what to think. I only hope it. Oh, David, if anything's happened to him, we'll see in a moment. There's no light in this room. You wait here, Elaine. Where's the light? Over to your left. David, what's wrong? Why didn't you leave the light on? Your father's dead, Elaine. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Shadow People. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled The Shadow People. Somewhere along the line of your life, you've met them. You have come in contact with The Shadow People. When did we first discuss it? Oh, yes, Brian and Elaine and I. It was in my apartment. There was only one light on in the entire place. Oh! What's wrong? Oh! Elaine, what's the matter? Oh, it, it, it's silly, I know, but I, I, I thought I saw something in that doorway over there. Where? Over there, right over there. Where are you going, David? Over to that archway, just to let you know that nothing's here. Huh. You see, Elaine, nothing's wrong, nothing at all. Are you satisfied that there's no one else here but us? Yes, I... Oh, I'm sorry. I just thought that I... Leave the overhead lights on. 
I'm sorry. I thought... Put them back on, David, please. All right, Elaine. Look, what's bothering you, sis? I don't know. It's just that... I don't know. Tell us about it, Elaine. Tell us what's bothering you. You promise that you... You won't laugh at me? Of course not. Brian? Elaine, I'm your brother. If something's troubling you, I'd like to know about it. All right, then. The reason I was so upset was the fact that I saw someone or something standing in that archway. But Elaine, David showed you that there was no one else in here. When the lights were put on, you saw for yourself that we were alone. I'm not talking about something you you can see in the light, Brian. I'm not talking about a human being. Then what's it all about, Elaine? In the darkness, I, I saw something that can't be seen in a lighted area. And I've seen it several times before. You're sure you're not imagining this, Elaine? Oh, I don't have that good an imagination, Brian. How long have you... Have you seen this thing, Elaine? Well, it... It started about six weeks ago. You were in Detroit on business, Brian. Mom and Dad were on vacation. I was in the house by myself. In the library. There was only one light on. I sat in the chair beneath it, reading. Several times I thought that something was watching me. I felt there was someone in the room with me. Standing right in back of me. Every so often I'd glance back over my shoulder, but there seemed to be nothing there. And then... Then I thought I heard someone whispering. I wasn't sure, but when I heard it again, I got up and I, I, I looked all over the house. Oh, I'm not easily frightened, you know that, but... But out in the hallway... It was almost entirely black. Luckily, I was near a light switch. I looked back over my shoulder, and, and I saw this huge, hulking shape for the first time. And I heard a voice. Or rather, the whisper of a voice. I couldn't distinguish the words, but that dark shape seemed to be moving towards me. My hand was on the light switch, and I turned it on. And the minute the light flooded the hallway, the shape was gone. There was nothing there. I was alone again. As long as there's light, I know it can't hurt me. I know it can't reach me. You might have imagined it, you know. Of course, that's possible, but I'm sure I didn't. It was so real. So real, that shape in the darkness. It was the very essence of evil itself. <laughs> There was an old man I knew of, a Dr. Hesedius. I'd heard that he knew quite a good deal about the supposed supernatural manifestations which had taken place in the world. I went to him to see if he knew anything that might explain the events of the story Elaine had told us. Yes, my good sir. What do you wish? I have an appointment with Dr. Hesedius. Oh, yes, yes. He mentioned something about it. You are Mr. Drake. Yes. I if you'll come inside. Thank you. Dr. Hesedius is in the study. Please come with me. Doctor? A visitor for you? Oh, yes. Bring him in. You may go now. Yes, Doctor. Mr. Drake? Yes. Sit down, please, in that chair over there. Thank you, sir. Now, what is the nature of your visit to me? Well, I understand, Dr. Vesalius, that you have a great knowledge of the supernatural manifestations which have occurred on the earth. Great knowledge, Mr. Drake? No, hardly that. I have only scratched the surface in my years of study. Perhaps I can help you, then again, perhaps I cannot. Well, may I tell you the story? By all means, my good sir. All right. Now, this didn't happen to me, Doctor, but to my fiancée. It seems that about six weeks ago, when she was alone... But when the light was on, the dark form disappeared. And that's the story, sir. As much of it as I can remember. Mm -hmm. I see. It's a strange tale to tell. I'm fully aware of that, Dr. Vesalius. You say she seemed to hear whispered voices? Yes, that's what she says. I see. A moment, please. I have a book in my file. Oh, yes. Here it is. This is the one. Yes. 
Perhaps I may be able to help you after all. Let me see. This is a very ancient book, Mr. Drake. I seem to remember... Yes. Here is an account of a happening such as you relate. And we shall live on earth and they shall not see us. Yes, it has been foretold by the ruler of the darkness. They who live by day, retire to sleep by night, shall never know that we walk with them, that we watch them, that we wait for our chance. Only in the night will they see us, for in the daylight we are not seen. Only in the night... When the darkness grows together and the forms of the shadow people are shaped from the blackness, they will know us. Then they will know that we are their companions, for we are the shadow people. I knew I had read something similar to the story you have told me, Mr. Drake. Dr. Asilius, what can we do? Well, give me a little time. Let me see if I can find any more references to these uh, people of the darkness. One more thing, Mr. Drake. Be sure that your fiancé is never left alone at night. Be sure that there is some living thing, animal or human, which accompanies her every second of the night. For she is in danger, Mr. Drake. A terrible danger. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled... The Shadow People. That night, the night of the day I had seen Asilius, Elaine's mother died. She died in her sleep. When she failed to appear for breakfast, Elaine's father went upstairs to see what was wrong. When he entered her room, he discovered that she was dead. The family doctor couldn't explain it, for Elaine's mother had been in perfect health. A few weeks later, I was out of the house spending a weekend with them. I glanced at the clock on the mantel and it showed 11. I can't understand why Brian hasn't returned from town. Well, he said he had some extra work to catch up on. He told me this morning that he might be late. Well, 11 o'clock, I'm going upstairs. Glad you came out, David. It's good seeing you again. It's a pleasure to be here, sir. Well, don't stay up too late. See you both in the morning. Good night, Dad. Good night, Mr. Davis. He isn't the same, David. Ever since Mother died, he hasn't been the same. I didn't realize that until tonight. It's changed. I only hope that he'll start living again. Ever since she died, it it seems that a part of him died with her. Elaine, have you been... I mean, have you seen anything else since you spoke to me last? No, I haven't. Ever since... Mother died. Nothing's happened. Well, I only hope. <laughs> Came from upstairs. Come on. You don't. Think I don't know what to think. I only hope. That... David. David, if anything's happened to it. We'll see in a moment. There's no light in this room. You were here, Elaine. Where's the light? Over to your left. David, what's wrong? Why didn't you leave the light on? Your father's dead, Elaine. <laughs> I had walked into the darkened bedroom. On the bed was Elaine's father. It didn't take a second look for me to know that he was dead. I switched off the light and walked back into the hallway to tell Elaine what happened. And then from the room there had come an eerie, quiet laughter... In the darkness of that room was some unknown evil power. The voice itself was unearthly. There was no substance to it. It sounded as if... as if it came from the darkness itself. No. No, I don't believe you. It's the truth, Elaine. There's nothing more I can do. We'll have to notify the police. Tell me it's not the truth, David. Tell me it's not true. I'm sorry, Elaine. I wish I could. Your father's dead. After the burial, Dr. Hesselius got in touch with me. He said that he wanted to meet both Elaine and Brian, that he wanted to talk to the three of us. 
Accordingly, a few nights later, he came out to their house. Miss Davis, will you tell me just when you saw the first manifestation? The night Brian was in Detroit. No, Miss Davis, you have even seen this apparition in the company of other people, is that correct? Yes. The night at David's apartment. All right. Now I'll tell you what I think. You are in deadly danger, Miss Davis. These beings want to claim you. So far, they have had no success. Only in the darkness do they have power. Little by little, step by step, they have been removing the obstacles in their way to reaching you. First your mother, and then your father, Miss Davis. Both died in the same fashion. In the darkness, death struck at them. Now tell me, do you feel their presence here in this room as I talk to you? Yes. Turn out the lights, Brian. Stand by the switch, if you please, Brian. If anything happens, turn the lights back on. All right. Dr. Vesalius, I don't... Do you want me to continue working with you? Yes, sir. All right, then. Brian, turn off the lights. Yes, doctor. The room now is in darkness, Miss Davis. Do you feel or see anything? No, I... Yes. Yes, I do. Do you see anything? Yes. Doctor, I don't... Be quiet, you fool. I know what I'm doing. In front of me. The darkness gathering together into a huge, terrible... Not only do you see us, Miss Davis, but everyone else in the room also will see the vague shapes forming themselves in the blackness. We do not want you, Dr. Hesselius. The girl we want. We advise you to drop this case. You will only bring down the wrath of the shadow people upon your head. The girl. We want the girl. Do not stop us. Let us take her now. Turn on the light. They're gone. Miss Davis, are you all right? Yes. Yes, I am. Just as she said. The darkness. I, I saw it form into something, too. So did I. What are we going to do, Dr. Hesselius? At the present moment, I don't know. But this much I do know. You must leave this house immediately. You must try to get out of their reach. I don't know if that is possible. I hope it is. I shall have to return to my home. I must learn if there is some manner by which we can defeat these creatures. For the moment, leave this house. Dispose of it. In any manner you may see fit, but leave this house. <laughs> Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Shadow People. We spent the night in my apartment, the three of us. The following day, Brian and Elaine made arrangements to dispose of the house. In the afternoon, Dr. Vesalius called me and asked that I come to see him. David, I'm glad you're here. Anything new, Doctor? Yes and no. You realize, of course, that this spiritual manifestation is not new, that it has gone on for centuries. No, I wasn't aware of that. It's true, David. De Maupassant wrote uh, what was supposedly a fiction story about the manifestation, David. He called it uh, the Orla. However, according to the information here on my desk, it was taken from an actual case history. Of course, he embroidered the story, added a few touches to something he didn't realize actually existed. But have you found anything with which we can fight them? Everything depends upon an answer I received from a colleague of mine in Paris, Dr. Henri Renault. I dispatched a telegram to him last night. Why hasn't he answered by now? There are certain things that must be done. It will take a few days, I'm afraid. We have to wait, David. There's nothing else we can do. In the next few days, the house was sold, and Brian and Elaine moved into a newer, more modern home a few miles from my apartment. Cecilia said it might take a few days for them to build up their power. I spent the night at the new house. The lights were left on, and I watched for any unusual occurrence. In the daytime, I'd return to my apartment and get some sleep. About four days after Elaine and Brian moved into the new house, I was at home when Hesedius phoned me. Hello? David? Yes, Dr. Cecilius? They hate to 
tell you this, David. What's the matter? What's wrong? They were a step ahead of me, David. I just received word that Renault died or was killed. At the very moment I sent the telegram to him. <laughs> Step by step, they had outwitted us. For they had anticipated every move we'd make. Even Dr. Hestelius was at a loss as to what to do. He agreed to meet me at the Davis house. What did you want to see us about, Dr. Hestelius? Did you find out anything more? I'm sorry to say that I haven't. At the moment, I'm at a complete loss. I don't know what to do. But what did you want to see us about this evening? Merely to check, to see if anything else has happened. Miss Davis, have you seen or heard anything? Not in the house. Only in my dreams. Your dreams? Yes. When I go to sleep at night, in my dreams, in the darkness, I see them. And it's grown worse, much worse. I was hoping that it would not have progressed so far. There has been no disturbance in this house, but now they disturb your sleep, Miss Davis. Now, you must stay a week for as long as you can. I want the three of you to move into my house. Perhaps that will give you more protection. That night, we moved over to Vesuvius' house. Perhaps Elaine would have more protection there. From there, we might be able to devise some plan of action, some way to beat those beings. For a few days, things were quiet. The shadow people seemed to have withdrawn. For a while, I thought that we might have succeeded in thwarting their purpose. Elaine no longer complained of troubled sleep. But that condition lasted for a few days only. About ten days later... They made themselves known and felt again. That night, we were in the study. When suddenly, Hesselius whirled around and... Elaine, what are you looking at? Outside the house. Right where the light leaves off, I see them. She's right, Dr. Hesselius. I can see them, too. What should we do, Doctor? Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? There's nothing we can do. We can't just... We can't do anything, Brian. Don't you understand that they have us at their mercy? The greatest man in my field was Henri Renault. If he could do nothing against them... What do you think we can do? He's right, Brian. There's nothing we can do. As long as the house remains lighted, just so long will they remain outside. If the lights were... To... <laughs> that sounds... When my father was killed. The same sound. We heard the same sound. The lights. What's happened to oh, the lights? Right? I don't know. Brian, please. I thought of this emergency... A candle. That's right, Miss Davis. As long as this burns, this one candle will be safe. For they cannot advance into the light. They are limited by the darkness. As long as the candle burns, they will have to remain outside of this room. <laughs> Around you, in every room of the house, in the darkness outside, we are around you. This time you shall not escape. This time we will blame you. Take it easy, Brian. I can't stand it. I'm getting out of here. Brian, come back. Don't be a fool. I'm going after him. Stay here. We just can't let him go. He won't have a chance. I doubt it. (laughs) Miss Davis, I'm afraid that your brother is dead. The wind, Doctor. Listen to the wind. I know. Yes, Doctor. Listen to the wind. You must realize by now that the three of you haven't a chance. You must know in your minds that we can destroy you at any moment we desire. But, Doctor Hesselius, you may still save your own life. Let the others go. Give them to us. No. No, you will have to take all of us. Shall we destroy your light? Shall we move in on you now? (laughs) As you will. Do as you will. Sorry, David. The candle is out. In the darkness. (laughs) 
We warned you, Hercelius. You and the others are dead now. And we shall live on the earth. And man in the day shall not see us. They will know that we wait for our chance. That we walk with them. Only in the night, when the darkness grows together and the forms of the shadow people are shaped from the blackness will they see us. Then they will know that we are their companions. Look next to you. There, in the shadows. <laughs> Tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridor of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Soups present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you once again to the Inner Sanctum. Do come in and join our circle, but watch out you don't get double cross. <laughs> What's that? Oh, you're disturbed by those bodies dangling from the ceiling. Well, you know some people, they just die to come here. Then they hang around week after week and never say a word. <laughs> well, I have a theory about that, Mr. Host. Yeah, What's that, Mary? Maybe the reason they're hanging around is because they think we're going to serve refreshments later on. Sure, that could be, all right. You know, lots of folks are like that. And who can blame them? When there's good food ahead, they just won't leave. And that's especially true if there's a chance that Lipton tea is on the menu. Now, the reason for that is simply this. Lipton tea is tea at its delicious best, because Lipton's has such grand, brisk flavor. In fact, brisk is the very word the tea experts themselves use to describe Lipton's full, hearty taste. You'll agree, I'm sure, the very first time you try it. For Lipton's is so lively and full-bodied and satisfying. Yes, it's that brisk flavor that makes more people buy and enjoy Lipton's than any other brand of tea in the world. So whenever you ask for tea, make sure you ask for Lipton tea. And now, friends, draw close your chairs. If there are no faint hearts among us, we'll begin tonight's tale of terror. A story written especially for Inner Sanctum by Michael Sklar. Our star tonight is Santa Sotega, who plays the role of Elwood Fitch in You Could Die Laughing. We wanted to escape our problem, to forget about it, so we went to the movies. But there was a doctor in the story, and every time he appeared on the screen, I remembered. Halfway through the picture, I, I couldn't sit there anymore. I nudged Catherine, and we got up and walked out. The street was cold and dark and empty. Elwood, what do you want to do now? I just want to go back home. All right, dear. Get in the car. Elwood, I... I want to talk to you. All right, there's time for that. Please, dear, 
Let's stop being silly about this thing. Let's face it. I am facing it. But you're not. Don't argue with me. For heaven's sake, don't you understand? The doctor said you only got a year to live unless we moved to Arizona. Doctors are human. They can make mistakes. Not three, doctor. I don't care. Why are you so stubborn? Why are you so dead set against Arizona? You ought to know why, Catherine. Me? Yes, you. Because of me? Yes. I haven't given you much, Catherine, not even children. But I've been able to make a living. We've been able to get along... What would I do in Arizona without a job and without money? Elwood, slow down. I can still drive a car, Catherine. You're speeding. Let me alone. Passing through a red light. Elwood, that man crossing the street. Look out, you... I... Catherine. Did I... Yes. He's lying on the ground. Good Lord. He walked in front of the car. Well, we... we... We've got to help him. Is... Is he... He's dead. Oh, hell! I didn't mean to do it. I couldn't help it. It happened so fast. Better call the police. Police? Well, you said he's dead. The police. Catherine, there's no one but us on the street. Nobody else saw it happen. What difference does that make? Get back in the car. Edward, are you suggesting I was speeding. I passed a red light. And now this. They'll arrest me. They'll put me on trial for manslaughter. But my... He's dead, isn't he? We can't help him. It won't do many good if I go to jail. But running away, leaving the body... Catherine, but... we've got enough troubles without this. We're going to get into the car and drive straight to the garage. <laughs> I've got a year to live. And I'm not going to spend it in prison. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Fitch. Want me to put the car away for you? Yes. Show must have let out early, huh? We we didn't stay to the end, Dan. I didn't care for the picture. Ah, them pictures. I always tell my wife... Say, what did you hit? Hit? Yeah, your front bumper. Blood on it. Oh. Oh. Uh, that, that blood... Uh, a, a dog ran in front of the car. Uh, do me a favor, Dan. Wash it off before you put the car away. Sure thing, Mr. Fitch. I didn't sleep well that night. Bad dreams, all mixed up. Well, doctors. They all looked like the man lying on the street. And their faces were covered with blood. I woke up... exhausted... Breakfast is on the table, Elwood. Uh, just a moment. That newspaper can wait. Your toast is getting cold. Oh, here it is. What are you looking for? The story. You mean last night? It's in the newspaper? Listen to this. Stenger, victim of hit-and-run driver. The body of Augie Stenger, underworld character, was discovered early this morning at the intersection of Broad and Main Streets. Police believe Stenger was the victim of a hit-and-run driver. <gasps> The front door. Yes. Do you, do you think it's, it's the police? I don't know. Get a grip on yourself. I'll see who it is. Morning. You, Mr. Fitch? Uh, yes. What can I do for you? I don't like to talk business on the front doorstep. Business? It's about last night, that accident. <laughs> what accident? Don't try to act innocent. I saw that hit and run. Now can I come <laughs> Let me handle this, Andrew. Who are you? My name is Chandler. I was sitting in my car last night at Broad and Main Street. I saw the accident and I followed you home. Thought I ought to talk to you about it this morning. What do you want? The cops are looking for that hit-and-run driver. I'm the only guy that knows you're him. It ought to be worth something for me to keep my mouth shut. You want money? Yeah. Blackmail. Don't talk to him, Edward. Send him away. No, we can't do that, Catherine. He'd go to the police. But Elwood... Leave this to me. All right, Chandler. I'll give you the money. How much? Five hundred dollars. That's chicken feed. A thousand. Ah, now you're talking sense. When do I get it? I'll give it to you now. It's in my coat pocket. Here. 
Here it is. You'll find exactly $1,000 in $20 bills. Thanks. Now, get out of here. Now, wait a minute. Don't get nasty, Fitch. I'm doing you a favor. You got your money. Now get out. I'm going. But I'll be back. I call this the first installment. Elwood, where did you get that money you gave him? Money? Last night you said we couldn't go to Arizona because we had no money. You, you just gave that man a thousand dollars. Where'd you get it? I was ashamed to tell you. I took it from Stinger. Stinger? The man we hit. I put my hand inside his coat to see if his heart was beating. The money was in the inside pocket. Elwood, how could you? Don't look at me like that, Catherine. We've been married a long time. Long enough for you to know that I'm not a crook or a murderer. But to kill a man and then take his money. Try to understand. All day long I've been thinking. A year to live. A year to live. When you know you're going to die, it does something to you. You forget what's right and what's wrong. I thought with that thousand dollars and a few hundred we've got in the bank, I thought we might be able to go to Arizona after all. Well, the money is gone. Yes. Don't think about it anymore. How can I stop thinking? You heard what Chandler said? That thousand dollars is the first installment. He'll blackmail us out of everything we own. <laughs> Shut the door, quick. Who is it, Catherine? Shut that door, Mrs. Fitch. You were here only yesterday. What do you want now? The cops are after me. You and me are on the same boat. What have you done? What do they want you for? Murder. Murder? You shouldn't have come here. I figured this place ought to make a pretty good hideout. No. You can't stay here. Oh, who's going to stop me? I won't allow it, Elwood. I won't have this man in my house. All right, cut the squad. No. I stood a lot in you, Chandler, but... Stay away from me. Yeah. Don't you dare touch him. Elwood! Oh. Elwood! Oh. No, no. Don't, don't cry, Kathy. I'm all right. Any more back talk, Fitch? No. Okay. I'm moving in. He took over the house... He used Catherine and me as servants, treated us like dirt. There was nothing we could do about it. Just the three of us, cooped up in that little house. We couldn't go out. Food and cigarettes were sent up from the store. Went on like that until Tuesday morning. Hush, Elwood. Chander will hear you. He can't. He's in the bedroom. You're... You're going to give yourself up? I can't stand this anymore. I can't stand it. Well, do what you think is best, darling. I've made up my mind. Rather than put up with that man, I'd prefer to go to prison. I'll call the police right now. Hello, operator. Get me police headquarters. Got a pal at headquarters, Fitz. Hey, Chandler. Oh, don't, don't point that gun at me. Cancel that call. Oh, oh, all right. Hello, operator. Operator. Never mind that call to police headquarters. No, 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 nothing's wrong. Yeah. I, I just made a mistake. Thank you. You made your last mistake, Fitch. Imagine that black villain, Jack Chandler. First he blackmails Elwood, then he blackjacks him, and now he blackballs him from using his own telephone. You know what I'd do if I were Elwood? I'd apply for a writ of habeas corpus. That is, if Chandler doesn't turn Elwood into a corpus first. <laughs> Things do look bad for Elwood, I must admit, Mr. Host. My, what a lot of unpleasant surprises he's been having. Yes, and he's in for a lot more, Mary. Goodness. Well, right now, I'd much rather talk about pleasant surprises. Well, that's a lady's privilege, Mary. You go right ahead. A good instance of a pleasant surprise happened to me one of those glorious sunny days last week. 
Florence Perry and I drove out to the woods to gather spring wildflowers, but we'd scarcely reached the woods when the sky clouded over, and in a few minutes we were chilled to the bone. Back to the car we hurried, figuring the whole afternoon was ruined. And it was then that Florence brought out that pleasant surprise I mentioned, a whole big thermos of heavenly hot Lipton tea. Well, we sat down and had ourselves a regular tea party right there in the woods. Suddenly, everything seemed bright and cheery again. Lipton's had certainly saved the day with its bracing, cheery taste, its delightful, brisk flavor. The same thing happens so often with so many folks. Any time during the day, Lipton's is a pleasant, refreshing treat. Tea with a glorious, full-bodied tang that adds extra zest to every occasion. The reason? It's worthwhile remembering, friends. Lipton tea has brisk flavor. Now, friends, let's get back to those lovely people, Jack Chandler and Elwood Fitch. Chandler the murderer and Elwood the hit-and-run driver. It's quite a pair. Together, they make a full house. A moment ago, Elwood tried to give himself up to the police. But Chandler caught him at the telephone. So, you were going to double-cross me, eh? No. I was only going to tell the police about myself. What do you suppose would happen to me when the cops came for you? I ought to kill you right now. Oh, no. You shut up. First thing I'm going to do is pull out that phone so you don't make no more calls at headquarters. Yeah. That settles the phone. Now, stand up. What are you going to... The door. Can you see who it is through the window, Fitch? Yes. Take a look. But remember, I still got this gun. Don't try any tricks. It's a man. Recognize him? No. Now listen. Before you open the door, I'm taking your wife into the next room with me. I'll be able to watch you and hear every word you say. You know what I'll do to Mrs. Fitch if you double-cross me. Yes. Okay. Now answer the door. Fetch, Elwood Fetch. That's right. May I come in? Yes, of course. I'm Detective Farley from headquarters. Here's my badge. Mind if I ask a few questions? What about? Well, I've been assigned to the Stenger case. Familiar with it? I... I read about it in the newspaper. A hit-and-run driver. That's the case. What do you know about it, Fitch? Why, Nothing. Are you sure? See, here, you, you don't... You think... and your wife went to the movies Friday night, correct? Yes, that's right. Did you drive straight to your garage from the movies? Why, uh, no. It wasn't a good movie, so we left early and went for a ride. Did you pass the corner of Broad and Main Streets? Uh, no. We went in the other direction. You're lying, Fitch. I've been checking garages for that hit-and-run car. Your garage man told me you brought your car in Friday night with blood on the bumper. I told him... We ran into a dog. Don't make me laugh. Your story wouldn't hold up a minute if that fool garage man hadn't washed the blood off. Are you going to arrest me? I need evidence first. When I get it, I'll come back. Blood on the bumper. That cop is wise to you, Fitch. He, he said he'd be back. Sure. He'll be snooping around looking for proof. This is one heck of a hideout. I'm leaving. You're going away? Uh, glad of that, ain't you? Well, you got nothing to celebrate. What? What do you mean? I need time, plenty of time to get away from the city. I'm not going to leave you here to squeal to the cops as soon as I'm out of the door. We wouldn't tell the police. Yeah, I'm going to make sure you don't. I got one murder rap on me already. It might as well be three. Three? Elwood, he means... Listen, Chandler. I swear we won't tell. Why should we? Remember what you said. We're both in the same boat. The police are after me, too. You tried to double-cross me once before. I ain't taking any chances. Please, please. There's no use begging. It won't do no good. When? When When are you going to do it? Before I go. Sometime after dark. The rest of that day was a nightmare. Chandler wouldn't let me separate from Catherine. Everywhere we went, everything we did, he was always behind us with that gun in his hand. The gun. I had to take it away from him. 
He was much younger than I. Big and tough. But I had to try. I watched for my chance. It came late in the afternoon. He was lighting a cigarette. He put the gun down on the living room table while he felt in his pockets for a match. Both of us were the same distance from the gun. I made a dive for it. Hey, get away from that rod. No, let go. Oh. I kill you for this. Catherine, you help me. Grab his hand. Let go of me. Let go of me. Hold him, Catherine. Hang on to him. I He's dead. I had to shoot him. I had to. Now what will we do? I don't know. What would he do if the positions were reversed? Call the police. No. The money. The money I gave him. The thousand dollars I took from Stenger. He still got it. It's ours again, Catherine. We're going to Arizona. Arizona. Don't you see? It's just like it was before he came. We'll take the money and we'll go to Arizona. But his body... He's a murderer, he said so himself. We'll put the body into the car, drive out to the suburbs and leave it on the highway. The police will think it was just another gangster murder. I was just able to squeeze the dead body into the luggage compartment. Hurry, Elwood. Let's get away before one of the neighbors sees us. Oh, my gosh. Now what's the matter? The gasoline gauge. It's almost empty. We'll have to stop at the garage. I drove back to the garage. Had Dan fill the tank. And paid him with one of the $20 bills I'd taken from the body of Stinger. Dan gave me a queer look as he brought me the change. Here you are, Mr. Fitch. Thirteen gallons out of a $20 bill. Thanks, Dan. Oh, uh, by the way, did a detective come around to your house the other day? Uh, yeah, yes, he did. <laughs> I, uh, I hope you don't hold it against me telling him about that blood on the bumper of your car. Oh, of course not, Dan. Why should I? After all, I had nothing to hide. <laughs> oh, that's right. Well, you know, to tell you the truth, Mr. Fitch, I, I was a little suspicious of you. I, oh. I thought you really might be that hit-and-run driver. Not that it matters much now. No? No, no. The police don't care much now about that driver. Why not? Oh, he's small potatoes now. I just heard over the radio that uh, that guy Stenger was just about dead even before that hit-and-run driver hit him. Hey, how could that be? Well, uh, the way the radio explained it, Stenger was shot in the back, and uh, he staggered out into the street, and then the car hit him. But you said he wasn't killed by the car. Yeah, that's right. The coroner's inquest showed that he, he died of a bullet wound. He'd been murdered. The police even know who killed him. They, they know the killer's name? Uh-huh. I heard it over the radio just a minute ago. Oh, yeah, um, Chandler. Jack Chandler. <laughs> I don't remember driving away from the garage. It kept going around in my brain. Chandler had murdered Stenger. Catherine and I had run away from a crime we hadn't committed. No wonder Chandler had seen the accident. No wonder he feared the police. And now he was dead. His body packed into the luggage compartment of the car. Elwood, you're not listening to me. What? Oh, I, I, I was thinking about Chandler. That's what I was talking about. If he killed Stenger, why can't we go to the police and confess everything? Because we killed Chandler. But it was self-defense. Would the police believe that? They'd have to believe it. Even if they did, it would be murder in the third degree. They'd learn about the thousand dollars. I'd be held for trial. We'd never get to Arizona. No, Catherine. We've got to go through with our original plan. Elwood, that's Iron. It's a police car behind us. What are you going to do? They may not be after us. If they do stop us, let me do the talking. Hey, pull away. Stop that car. Don't be afraid, Catherine. I'll handle it. Uh-huh. Middle-aged man and woman. You answer the description, all right. Name Fitch? Yes. What's the trouble, officer? There's an alert out for you. You bought gas back at your garage a few minutes ago. Paid for it with a $20 bill. That's right. Got any more of those bills on you? Why, yes. And I'm over. Here. Here they are. 
Uh-huh. Looks like it's all here. This is the stuff, all right. What stuff? What are you talking about? This money. It's counterfeit. Just like the bill you gave the garage man. Counterfeit? Phony money down to the last dollar. Move over. We're driving to headquarters. <laughs> Well, that's the story, Detective Farley. You'll find Chandler's body in the back of my car. Willing to put your signature to this confession, Mr. Fitch? Yes, I'll, I'll sign it. Oh, you could have saved yourself a lot of grief. I know you were the hit-and-run driver when I came around to your house. But I needed the proof, and you gave it to me when you broke one of these phony $20 bills. Well, did you know then about the money? Sure. Stinger had a long record as a counterfeiter. His girl told us he was carrying $1,000 in bad money the night he was killed. Naturally, when we didn't find the money on his body, we knew it had been taken by the hit-and-run driver. And the blood on the bumper of your car was the giveaway. Well, now that you've caught me, what's going to happen to me? Well, depends on the jury. You might get 20 years. Might get life imprisonment. You might even get acquitted. <laughs> I'm in the courtroom now. Catherine beside me, waiting for the decision. The jury just filed in. The judge has asked if they reached a verdict. The foreman of the jury is rising to his feet. Your Honor, we find the defendants not guilty. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Catherine. Oh, Elwood, thank heaven. I don't know whether it's to laugh or cry. Oh, darling, you were right in the very beginning. Money or no money, we're going to Arizona. Well, fooled you that time, friend. Slipped you a happy ending when you weren't set for it. But that jury decision... I don't know. It sounded a bit fitchy. <laughs> but seriously, friends, do you like happy endings? I don't, but then some people do. You know, someday, just to make sure, I'm going to have some research organization take a gallows pole. Well, Mr. Host, that seems a lot of trouble to go to when there's plenty of proof right in front of your nose that says people love happy endings. And what is that proof, Mary? It's the way thousands and thousands of families every day top off delicious meals with delicious Lipton tea. There's a real happy ending for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, folks. Try it and see. In fact, so that you won't forget it, add Lipton tea to your grocery list right now, this very minute. It's the world's favorite tea, and you're always sure of getting tea at its tastiest when you get Lipton's. Because remember, Lipton tea has that marvelous brisk flavor. <laughs> A parting word of advice, friends, drawn from the experiences of Elwood Fitch. If your wife wants you to take a trip, don't argue. No, don't protest. Simply bash her on the head and deliver her to the police. You can always say she tripped. <laughs> oh, yes, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is I Hate Blondes by Wolf Kaufman. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups will bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown and called Screams in the Night. Of course, there'd be lots of screams. The kind you like. Blood-curdling. And there's the usual triangle. A man, his wife, and another girl. But the joker is... He who grafts best gasps last. Don't get it? <laughs> and for the details, better be listening to Inner Sanctum next week. Mm -hmm. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Let's 
begin at the beginning of the meal, friends, with the soup. If you want soup to be both delicious and easy to prepare, make it Lipton's Noodle Soup. Here's a soup that has real honest-to-goodness chickeny flavor. It's full of tender noodles. And because it comes in modern soup mix form, it saves both time and money. Lipton's Noodle Soup Mix is quick to make, and it makes lots more than canned soups, yet costs less. Try Lipton's Noodle Soup. And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight, The Nightman, starring Virginia Bruce and Richard Waugh. Suspense, presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live. To your happiness in entertaining guests. To your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you... Suspense! This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight bring you as stars Miss Virginia Bruce and Mr. Richard Wolfe. They appear in The Night Man, a new study in terror by Lucille Fletcher. It is a story of dark midnights, and of a woman to whom the familiar face and voice of murder return for vengeance. But before we raise the curtain on our suspense play, here is a message from Roma Wines. In many foreign countries where discerning tastes have found Roma Wines, they are an inexpensive luxury imported and treasured. For Roma Wines are in every sense fine wines from the choicest vineyard country of California. They are products of age-old winemaking skill, aided by modern quality controls and tests that assure unvarying excellence of taste and character. Yet, Roma wines cost you mere pennies a glassful. Such enjoyable flavor and constant quality, such low cost, such high wine value, have made Roma by far America's largest selling wines, enjoyed by millions with meals when entertaining any time. Try Roma wine yourself. Tomorrow at dinner, no matter what you are serving, place on the table a cool bottle of ruby red hearty Roma California Burgundy. See how much new zest it adds to food. How it makes a real occasion of even the simplest meal. To enjoy this extra mealtime pleasure, just ask your dealer for R-O-M-A, Roma wine. Made in California... For enjoyment throughout the world. And now with the performances of Virginia Bruce as Stella Rhodes and of Richard Worf as the Nightman, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Warden Graves. Yes, Miss Rhodes. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. I hate to disturb you like this, but I've traveled clear across the country. They wouldn't give me the information over the phone. I know. You know what this visit is all about, Warden. To some extent, yes. You think one of our prisoners, Tom Nixon, has escaped. He has escaped. I'm as sure of it as, as I'm sure of sitting here now. I saw him at large in New York City two days ago. You knew Tom Nixon well, Miss Rhodes? Knew him? Well, he was my mother's murderer. My mother was Mrs. George Rhodes of Huntington, Long Island. She ran a boarding house there. He killed her on September 18th, 1932. We have all the records of the crime, Miss Rhodes. Tom was mother's chief boarder for ten years. <sighs> know him. Why, I sat opposite him at dinner table from the time I was a girl of 15. 
I knew him as well as I knew Mother. I'd, I'd know him anyway. I see. And now he's at large. He's free. He's escaped this place. Maybe you're not aware of it. Maybe even his fellow prisoners aren't aware of it. But he's wormed his way out. And he's after me. He's after oh, me. Oh, now, my dear young lady. Warden Graves. Ten years ago, when Mother was found murdered, I knew it couldn't have been anyone but Tom. I testified against him. I was practically the only witness at the trial. And when they sentenced him here for life, he swore to kill me. He swore in the open court to get even with me. For ten years, I've lived in deadly fear. I've watched the newspapers for prison breaks. I've moved from house to house, made few friends. He's hung over me like a shadow. Even though I told myself he was locked up here, locked up here forever. And now it, it's come. And where exactly did you see the prisoner, Miss Rose? That's just the point. That's why I know he's after me. I saw him in my own apartment house. Well. He has a job there, running the elevator at night. That's what makes it so horrible. I've never married Warden Graves. I live all alone in a small three-room penthouse on the 18th floor of an office building. The other night, about a week ago, I came home alone from the movies after midnight. The big marble lobby of my building was deserted, except in a far corner near the elevator with his back toward me, there was a man down on his hands and knees, scrubbing the floor. Good evening. Evening. Well, where is everybody? Isn't the elevator working tonight? You want to go up in the elevator, Mum? Certainly. I'll be right with you. Okay, Mum. What floor? I was in the elevator, and he had started to ascend before I really saw him. It was Tom. His hair had turned white, and there was a horrible stoop to his shoulders. But everything about him, the crook of his head, his high, thin, bony nose, the hollow cheekbones, were all the same. And then he turned and stared at me. I could see those deadly pale cold eyes, those heavy eyebrows, still black, that familiar, quiet, sarcastic mouth. What floor, Mum? Oh, oh, my floor. Uh, yes, the penthouse, please. Penthouse? Where's that, on the roof? Yes, on the roof, please. 18th floor. Okay. Warden Graves. It was like being in a cage with a wild beast. He kept watching me. Peering at me furtively as the elevator moved with agonizing slowness up and up past the floors. I shrunk back, averting my face. The light in the car was dim. My only hope was that he did not recognize me. Here's your floor, miss. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. You can go back down. I, I don't need anything, thank you. What's the matter? Forgotten your door key? No, no, it's just, it's right in my bag. I'll find it in a minute. You want me to let you in? Let me in? No, no, good Lord. I got pass keys to all the doors. It's no trouble. No, thanks, but I... No, 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 I, I have it right here. Good night. And uh, that was the first time you saw him? Yes. Oh, I wanted to die. I didn't know where to turn. And that was all he did or said? Yes, but it wasn't so much what he said as the awful resemblance. The feeling that he was only playing with me, torturing me like a cat with a mouse. Warden Graves, I didn't even have a phone. I've always been afraid to be listed in the phone book. And the only way up to that penthouse was by that one elevator. I was trapped up there, at his mercy whenever he wanted to come. What did you do? I spent the night crouched against the wall with a flat iron in my hand, waiting for that key to click in my lock. And uh, the next morning? <laughs> the next day, I began to wonder if it all wasn't just a dream. Good morning, Miss Rhodes. 
Good morning, Gallagher. Lovely weather we've been having, lovely, dry and brisk, but not too brisk, not overcoat weather yet. No, not overcoat weather yet. I was only saying to Foley this morning. Gallagher. Uh, uh, yes, Miss Rhodes, yes. Who's that new nightman running the elevator? The one who came on last night? Oh, Foley? You mean Foley, Miss Rose? Why, that's Charlie Foley. Nice old chap, ain't he? Very friendly and obliging to treating me to coffee this morning before I came on. Charlie Foley? Yep, that's his name. They're very partial to the Irish here in this building. Gallagher, Foley. Ah, but he's a nice, trustworthy chap, Miss Rose. Honest, too. Good morning, Miss Rose. Good morning. Forget something, Miss Rose? No, no. Uh, just about this Mr. Foley, it's, it's just that he's rather um, odd-looking. I was wondering where he came from and if he's perfectly all right. <laughs> all right? Let me tell you something. He was personally recommended by Ellsworth, Hitchcock, Pearson and Scott, the owners of the place. And that's the first time that's ever happened in my experience. Don't you worry about him, Miss Rhodes. He's a good man, member of our union and married with two children. Believe me, with the owners recommend a man. Well, it all sounds like a foolproof alibi, Miss Rhodes. And so you went back? Well, I didn't want to, even then. I spent the day hunting for another apartment. But you know wartime New York, Warden Graves. There wasn't another apartment to be had. I let myself be convinced until that night when I saw him again. Good evening, Miss Rhodes. He called me Miss Rhodes. And now there was a cruel, sarcastic smile about his lips kind of smile I'd seen him give to Mama. You think he recognized you then? Recognized me? Warden Graves, I haven't changed. Perhaps I've grown a little thinner. Don't you see he'd come there only to trap me? He'd taken that particular job, plotted, schemed. Here's your floor, Miss Rhodes. It was only a question of when. When he was going to do it. When the axe was going to fall. He kept grinning at me as I stepped out of the elevator. Good night, Miss Rhodes. Good, good night. Who, who is it? Who's there? Oh, excuse me, Miss Rhodes. There, there wasn't any answer to my ring. What do you want? What are you doing here? It's your laundry. They told me to put it inside the door in case you weren't home. My laundry? Oh, but you knew I was home. You just brought me up. That's right. Excuse me, I... I guess I must have been thinking of something else. Yes. I'm sorry, Miss Rhodes. Very sorry. That's all right. Good night. It was a crazy mistake. There I was thinking you could get up here some other way. But... There isn't any other way, is there? No. Even the service elevator doesn't get up this far, does it? No. It's just like you're all alone here. Alone. On the roof. Yes. Don't oh, you come any closer. I'll kill you to hear. I'll kill you with my bear. What was that, Mum? Get out. Get out. Get out. It's my buzzer. I better answer it. <laughs> and then what happened? Nothing. He came back again that night? No. I haven't seen him since. I barricaded myself in that night. Once it, it, it occurred to me that I might escape by running down 18 flights of fire stairs. But the thought of meeting him back in the gloomy darkness kept me back. And I didn't know where the fire stairs ended. Perhaps in the cellar, where I would be utterly defenseless. It's too bad you don't have a telephone. Oh, it's horrible. The next morning, I got down to the public phone and put through the call to here. But it wasn't any use. That was the day I was out of town. Yes, but, Warden, I still don't see why they couldn't have told me. After all, I was giving them information. It's one of our strictest regulations at Osawapotomy State Penitentiary never to discuss any of our prisoners over the telephone. That's what they said. So you came all the way out here in person? Yes. And now you wish me to send someone to 
apprehend this man. I want you to bring him back, that's all. Back where he belongs. Miss Rhodes, Tom Nixon doesn't need to be brought back. He's here. Oh, no, Warden Graves. Please, I I've seen him with my own eyes. Talk to him face to face. Maybe there's someone here calling himself Tom Nixon. But he's escaped. He's free. I know it. Will you just step this way with me, Miss Rhodes? No, no, I, I don't want to see him. I don't want to see his cell or, or talk to anybody. Or... Tom Nixon's dead, Miss Rhodes. He's buried in the prison yard. I'd like you to see his grave. And this is the photograph taken of him just a week before he died. You see, he wasted away quite a bit. He was in the infirmary all last year. Became very religious, too, toward the end. Spent a good deal of his time praying. Praying? Mm-hmm. All the fights seemed to go out of him as soon as he knew he was seriously ill. But uh, you'd say this was his picture, wouldn't you, Miss Rhodes? Yes. It's Tom, all right. Mm-hmm. And these little personal belongings. Ordinarily, we turn these over to the family. But in Tom's case, well, there wasn't uh, uh, much family. You'd uh, recognize these as his? Yes. I don't know them all, but... <laughs> that gold watch... He used to wear it every Sunday at Mama's. He wrote a couple of notes before he died to a fellow prisoner and to the prison chaplain. You remember this handwriting? Yes, this seems to be it. <clears throat> well, Miss Rhodes, now you feel a little better about your elevator operator? Hmm? You must think me a fool. No. An not, awful fool. Not at all, not at all. But the likeness was so extraordinary. It was almost like seeing... A ghost. A ghost? <laughs> come, come, Miss Rose. <laughs> Snap out of it. Now that you've gotten all this off your chest, isn't it perfectly obvious that that poor night man's done nothing or said nothing to you at all out of the ordinary? It's only that, uh, well, you seem to be the victim of some kind of uh, guilt complex. Guilt complex? Oh, I'm not guilty of anything. Oh, what I mean is Tom has been on your mind now for ten years. You testified against him... He threatened you gradually. You see him everywhere. No, no, only this once. Only these, these last few nights. All right. But now you know the truth. That should clear your fears forever. Tom's dead and buried. Now go back and take a look at that night man again. Now that you know Tom's dead, I'll lay odds. The whole resemblance will vanish. Well, I hope so. My advice to you, Miss Rhodes, would be to go straight home. Use that elevator as much as possible. Get acquainted with this Foley fellow. For your own sake, try to get the better of these hallucinations. Otherwise, you'll start seeing poor Tom everywhere you turn. Well, I'll try, Warden Graves. Well, thank you. You've been very kind. Not at all. Good evening, Charles. Good evening, Mum. I have some bags here, Charles. Will you help me with them, please? Okay. That all, Mum? Yes, thank you. Uh, this is for you, Charles. No, thanks, ma'am. I uh, never take tips. It's all right. I, I'd like you to have it. I'm sure the superintendent wouldn't mind. The superintendent hasn't anything to do with it. <laughs> well, aren't we going to start? Yeah, in a minute. Been out of town? Why, why, yes, I have. You've gone quite a while. I didn't see you for three or four nights. Well, I was in the country, visiting a friend. Oh. Why, it's beautiful weather out there. The leaves are beautiful. I wouldn't know. You live in the city, Charles? Of course. Oh, isn't it hard to bring up children in the city? Children? Yes. Uh, didn't I understand Gallagher to say you had two children? Me? What chance I have to have any children? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a bachelor. By the way, my name is not Charles. Well, guess this must be my floor. No, it's not. Then, why are we stopping? The elevator's stuck. Power's been cut off. Cut off? Mm-hmm. 
Oh, but how could that happen? It's never happened before, as long as I've lived here. Yeah. Well, sooner or later, I guess it had to happen. Isn't there some way we can get it back on? Some buzzer for the cellar or something? If the power's off, the buzzer isn't working. It's a wonder the lights are still on. The, the lights? Yeah. They'll go out in a few minutes, though. And then it'll be black in here. Black as a grave. <gasps> let's, let's get out of here. Open the door. Can't. She won't budge. But you haven't even tried. I don't have to try. We're stuck between floors. The door's flush with the solid wall. Solid wall? Yeah. We're kind of bricked up in a cell. But there must be some way out of here. Some Isn't there a little door in the roof? Something you can pry open? Something you can climb up out of into the shaft? I don't see any. Oh, but there must be. Climb up and, and feel around before the light gives out. There's nothing to get hold of. It's nothing but steel and mirrors. And I'm not tall enough. Stand on my bags. That's a good idea. They'll never hold me. Oh, it's all right. Just hurry. Here. The Gladstone's strongest. No, never make it. Oh, but, oh, but stand on your tiptoes. Stretch. No. Let me try. Oh. oh, dear. No, I can't. I didn't think so. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Wait. Wait? Wait until somebody comes along downstairs and finds the elevator stuck and then rings up the superintendent. Oh, but that might be ours. Sure. No! Help! Help! Somebody help! time. Oh. Everybody's left the building, I know, because they've all signed out. This air shaft's thick, isolated. Nobody's down in the basement, and there won't be any passengers ringing for an elevator this time of night. You seem awfully sure about all that. Why not? Cigarette? No, thanks. Do you think it's safe to smoke in here? Sure. And supposing it isn't, what's the difference? Yeah, have one. It'll soothe your nerves. No, thanks. The air's so close. Jumpy, ain't you? No, I suppose really there's nothing to be afraid of. Sooner or later, they'll come. Oh, sure. Eventually. It's just that this waiting and all these mirrors and, and being stuck. You're not jumpy on account of me? You? Oh, no, no, of, of course not. But you were kind of... Jumpy with me the other night, weren't you? The other night? When I came into your apartment unexpectedly. Oh, oh, that, that was a mistake. A mistake? Yes, I, I just thought you were someone else, a, a friend of mine, someone I've always been afraid of. Oh. But now I've learned it couldn't be you because this friend's dead. Dead and buried. Dead and buried? Yes. What was his name? Maybe I know him. Oh! What was that? Only the lights. I knew they'd give out sooner or later. Oh, no. No, they can't. They... I can't stay here alone in the dark with you. So you are jumpy with me. No, no. I thought you said this guy was dead and buried. He is, he is. I saw his grave. Then and... why are you screaming like that? I'm not screaming. I mean, it, it's so dark in here. So close and, and creepy. What did you do to this friend that makes you so jumpy? Do? Do to him? Nothing. I, I didn't do a thing. No. It, it was he. He threatened me. He was a murderer. He killed my mother in cold blood ten years ago. He was our boarder for ten years. And one afternoon... Don't move! Don't move! I'm not moving. Go on. One afternoon, I, I came home, and, and there was mother lying on the floor with her, her throat. No, no, where are you? I can't... Go on. No, no, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Tom! It's you, Tom, isn't it? I thought you said your friend was dead and buried. <gasps> Stop playing with me. Stop torturing me. Tell me the truth. You escaped, didn't you? You didn't die, and it was someone else, someone else's grave, just as I thought. You escaped and found me here. Answer me, Tom. Where are you? I can't see you. I can't. Ah! Oh, no. No, Tom. I didn't mean it. I didn't. I didn't mean to send you there. It was only because I loved you, Tom. Loved you so blindly, passionately, for years. And hated Mama. And hated you for loving her. It was only to get revenge on you both that I killed her and framed you. Mama was so cruel to me, Tom. She treated me like a slave. And all the time flaunting you in my face. 
<laughs> if you'd spoken one kind word to me, Tom, at the trial. One word to let me know you loved me. <laughs> you. You're going to kill me, aren't you, Tom? Here's the lobby, Mom. You can get out here, or I'll take you back up to the penthouse as soon as we've picked up the other passenger. The, the lobby? You brought me down to the lobby? Yes, ma'am. Then you're not Tom? No, ma'am. You're, you're not going to... You're not going to kill me? I, I'm free? Yes, ma'am. Then it was all just a crazy illusion. <laughs> a nightmare because the power went off and, and you look so much like Tom Nixon. <laughs> oh, forgive me. Please forgive me for being so absurd. It's okay. <laughs> and you'll forget about those silly things I said, won't you? I didn't mean them. It, it was just because I, I was beside myself. What silly things, Mom? Those silly things about, about my mother and, and Tom. And, oh, now, this is for you. No, no, I, I insist this time. I insist. I'm sorry, Mom. But I'm afraid I never accept tips. Oh, but you, you must. Particularly from people who... Framed my twin brother. Good evening, Warden Graves. Good evening, Lieutenant Nixon. Well done. And so closes The Nightman, starring Virginia Bruce and Richard Waugh. Tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. To every woman listening tonight, I want to say a special word about making every dinner or supper you serve taste better. I want to urge you to start serving Roma wine with your meals. It's simple. The cost is very, very little, and it works magic in making food more enjoyable. You can serve Roma wine with any meal or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Serve it chilled. Try different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you enjoy most of all. Try hearty red Roma California Burgundy or the delicately delicious Roma California Sauterne. The cost is only pennies a glass, but you'll find even a pickup supper tastes like a banquet. Get Roma wines today. If your dealer is temporarily out of them, please try again soon. Just ask for R O M A, Roma wines, America's largest selling wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Richard Worf appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Mrs. Parkington. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Van Johnson and Mr. Keenan Wynn as stars of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Remember this. The war is not over. For every reason, patriotic and personal, continue to buy and keep war bonds. Put as much of your money as possible where it will serve as a reserve to be used in the future. War bond dollars now can mean the realization of your long-range peacetime objectives. <laughs>
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. time, Walt. Please let me go. Nuts. Then it has to be this way. Hap, no. Drop that gun. Uh, I'm sorry, Walt. Very sorry. I've known all along you had to die tonight. But I didn't know. I killed you. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Man Who Died Yesterday. <laughs> Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by William Morwood is The Man Who Died Yesterday. Afternoon on a little traveled highway. A strange-looking man in threadbare clothes stands hopefully by the roadside. A car comes around a curve. Slows up. Stops. Looking for a lift? Are you headed for New York? That's me. Hop in. Thank you. It's very good of you. I... I'm in a hurry to reach New York. I haven't much time, you see. Yeah, sure. I picked you right off for a big executive on his way to a board meeting. Oh, nothing like that. <laughs> it's just that, oh, there's something terribly important I've got to do. A mission. Oh, Salvation Army, huh? No, United Nations. I have to see the Secretary General before midnight tonight. That leaves me only eight hours. The United... Are you feeling all right, pal? Yes. I was sick, but... I'm feeling fine now. You don't look so good to me. What is a ghost? Of course, you could do with a haircut, too. I suppose so. I'm afraid I've been out of touch with civilization a long while. By the way, my name is... Rather was... David Hepgood. I am. I'm Walt Griggs. Can't you drive any faster, Walt? We've still got a long way to go, and... Well, I'm worried about this part of the road. There's going to be a rock slide and... Rock slide? Oh, you mean those signs? Ah, uh, that's nothing to worry about. They put them up on... What the... It's all right. Keep going, Walt. We got through safely. Yeah, but... There was a rock slide, just like you said. Of course. But... How did you know? I can see ahead, Walt. See into the future. For 24 hours. <laughs> was nuts, of course, but still, what are the odds against calling a long shot like that? A million to one? A billion? I gave up trying to figure it. We drove along for about an hour and then stopped for gas. There was this hamburger joint right by. Where are we going, Walt? Grab a bite. Oh, but there isn't time. I've less than seven hours now, and by midnight you I... got a gas up anyway, and I'm hungry. Come on, Hap. Hello, sugar. Sit down, Hap. 
What'll it be, boys? Hamburger for me, sweetheart, with onions. What's yours, Hap? I... I'm not hungry. Oh, busy with your speech for the United Nations, huh? Well, I'll just read this racing form while you're thinking. Racing form? Sure, I play the G's all the time. Got some important dough on today's meet. Fifty bucks on Alistair to win in the sixth. Alistair? Yep. I'm afraid you'll lose your money, Walt. What? Don't kid me. Alistair's the hot favorite. It's going to be a walk away. Marble the third won that race. Marble? What are you nuts? He's a rank outsider. A hundred... What do you mean, won the race? It hasn't been run yet. Hasn't it? I didn't know. Look, I... Wait a minute. Sweetheart. Yeah? You think you can get the races on the radio? Oh, sure. It's all tuned in. A lot of our customers like to listen. Walt, we can't waste time like this. Who can think about a horse race? I like... can. Remember my 50 bucks. What? Losing for the great race. The crowd is going wild with excitement. They're around the bend now, coming into the straight. Alistair is out in front by two lanes. Uh-huh. The rest of the horses bunched. Alistair is going strong. And a boy, where's your marble half weight? Entering the last stretch now. It's a walk away for Alistair. Nice, eh? Four lanes ahead and no challenger. Wait a minute. Alistair stumbles. Can't regain stride. He's down. What? The jockey's going clear, but Alistair is... The other horses have gone past. Number eight is out in front. Number eight. Marble the third. Marble the third. Marble the third. And Marble wins. We go. Ah, turn that thing and off. And run for the books, folks. The most extraordinary... I'll be... You knew it all the time, Hep. You knew Marble had to win. Of course. Thought we've got to go. Sure. Sure, Hep, anything you say. You're the guy I've been waiting for all my life. I didn't need no more figuring to tell me Hep was a gold mine. And I had him first before anybody else could get their hooks into him. The only thing that worried me was the way he talked. All this about midnight, not having much time. I had to use him while I had him, even if it meant taking chances. So while we drove, I worked on a plan. Walt, we've left the New York road. The signs are pointing the other way. I know, I'm taking a shortcut through a town called Hassock. Hassock? Yeah. That name mean anything to you, Hap? Hassock? Think hard. Let me see. There's going to be a hold-up there tonight, at the factory. Two men involved. They steal the week's payroll, ten thousand dollars. Ten grand, huh? They get away with it? There's a chase, but they take off the police. Great. Couldn't be better. Why? Where the two men have. You and me. What? No, Walt, no, I'm not a criminal. And I have something else to do with what little time I have left. You're coming with me, Hap. Maybe this will convince you. Her gun doesn't frighten me. Stop the car and let me out. I've got to get to New York. All right, look, I'll make a deal with you. You come with me on the stick-up and I'll drive you straight through to New York without stopping. Are you on? But, but I can't, Walt. My message concerns the whole world. It's the only way you'll get to deliver it. Well, if, if it is the only way. All right. Now, there's something more I've got to tell you, Walt. What's that? We leave a dead man behind. <laughs> getting dark when we hit town. I drove down the main street and onto the factory building beyond. It was all dark except for a light in the cashier's office. Hap and I went in. There was a guy sitting at a desk. Who? Who are you? What do you want? The ten grand in that safe. This is a stick-up, brother. Y- you're crazy. There's no ten... Open up. I'll do the talking. I, I warn you, men. You'll be caught for Shut the... up and start turning that dial. All right. Well, I guess you win. Come on, come on, snap into it. I'm doing the best I can. That's it. Now hand out those greenbacks. Come on, get a move on. Watch out, Walt. He's turning in an alarm. Oh, you double cross and rat. Oh. Hey. Hey. You. Is the guy that had to be killed, Hap? Yes. Okay, then step on it. The cops will be swarming around like flies. <laughs> Gaining on us, Walt. I can't go any faster. I'm down to the floorboards already. He'll start shooting soon. You sure we get away? There's no slip up? No. We get away all right. Good. 
Where did they get you, Walter? My arm. What do we do, Hap? Keep driving till we hit that bend in the road. Yeah? There's a clump of willows around the corner. Pull in there. Okay. Here goes. Start the lights. Off. We ship him happy. Just like you said. No hurry. Get back to the New York road. I've less than three hours left. Okay, but i got to stop and see a doctor. A doctor? Sure, my arm. Oh, what's the matter, Hap? I... I'm afraid of that doctor. Something happens there that I don't understand. What is it? I don't know. It's something I should have explained before. I can see into the future for you, Walt. And for everyone else. But not for myself. You the doctor? What can I do for you? Oh, my arm. I had a little accident. I was cleaning my gun and it went off. Come into my office. Okay. And this man? He's oh, just a friend of mine. Nothing the matter with him. I don't agree. He looks much sicker than you do. No, doctor, really. Your face. It's the color of... No, no I'm all right. Believe me. Please hurry with my friend. It'll only take a second. Just get my stethoscope. Look, and... Let's quit kidding around, doc. I'm the one Quiet. that... Hmm. Good Lord. What's the matter, Doc? Why are you looking at him like that? Well, it's, it's impossible, of course, but there's no heartbeat. No. But but that's impossible. If, if your heart wasn't beating, you'd be... Dead? Yes. I've been dead since yesterday at midnight. Staring at him. The living corpse of the man who died yesterday, Walt, and the doctor draw back in horror. Just who is David Hapgood? Perhaps we'll know when the clock strikes twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> Midnight and the man who died yesterday. The goose pimples were standing out on me. Here I found the guy, I'd been with him for hours through a hole up in a killing. And now I was hearing from his own lips that he was dead. He gave me the creeps. I wanted to take it on the land, but instead I was froze to the floor. I heard the doc saying... You've been dead since yesterday? Yes, doctor. But that's, that's impossible. There must be some explanation, some obscure heart condition. There is an explanation, but not that kind. You see, I was cheated out of 24 hours at the time of my birth. Eh? And I'm just speaking up for it now. How do you mean? This will sound fantastic to you, but nevertheless it's true... I was born on a ship crossing the international date line. I started coming into the world during the last moments of a Friday and finished up early on Sunday. So I skipped a whole day of my life. I've always been living 24 hours ahead of myself. But, but that's sheer... That's gospel, Doc. He can call the turn on anything like he was reading tomorrow's paper. I told you it would sound fantastic, Doctor. But it is true. When I realized it, I... Well, I tried not to use it for selfish hands... I wanted to help people, but I never could. People would never listen to me, believe me. Finally, I realized that there was no place for me in the world, that man wasn't meant to know the future. So I went away, up into the woods. Uh, how long ago? About ten years ago. Away from civilization, it was easier. I still knew what was going to happen, of course, but with no way to communicate my knowledge, my conscience was at rest. That is, until last night. Last night? 
I had caught a cold. It developed into pneumonia. I was deathly sick. I couldn't breathe and uh, lost consciousness. And then suddenly, at midnight, I was well, quite well. Not a trace of my illness. I knew what had happened, of course. I was dead. Duh. But I still had my missing day to live. I knew I must use it for the benefit of mankind. Oh. There's something I know. Something that involves the fate of millions of people. Unless some action is taken within the next few hours. What action? What is it? I'm sorry, but I can't tell you, Doctor. I can't tell anyone except the Secretary General of the United Nations. And I must reach him before midnight, before I'm really dead. It's getting on to ten o'clock. Now, do you understand why I'm in such a hurry? I'll say, let's get going, Hap. Never mind about my arm, that can wait. No, listen to me, Hap. You can't leave. What? As far as your being able to read the future is concerned, well, it doesn't matter whether I believe that or not. But that heart condition of yours, that's something unique in medical history. Now, you've got to let me take you to a hospital where it can be studied properly. Lay off that stuff, now, I'll phone for an ambulance. Stay away from that phone. He's mine. Yours. But do you realize what this can mean to science? To don't you? give me that talk. You just want to grab them off for yourself. Uh, nonsense. Stop it. Stop it, both of you. I don't belong to anyone. I'm not a specimen to be examined. I've got a mission to perform for all of civilization. I've got to get to the United Nations before. Now, now, no matter how you've been deluding yourself, young man, you're terribly sick. I'm going to phone the hospital. Okay, and... you asked for it. Do you? I must get away from here. Have, have come back here. Come back here. Okay, you did that. It won't hurt you if you're not. Oh... Holy smoke. That bullet went right through you and only knocked you down. Let go of me, Walt. Try to run away, huh? I've got to get to New York. Nothing can stop You're coming me. with me, Hap. i got plans for us as long as you last. You've got your 10,000. What more do you want? A chance to run it up to 100,000 and we can do it. I know the police and you can call the cars. But there's no time. I'm figuring on only a couple of hours. That's plenty. Listen, Walt. I'm asking you for the last time. Let go. Do a decent thing for once in your life. Nuts. What I'm trying to do, it's for you as much for millions of others. I never gave a cuss about the others and I'm not starting now. All right, Walt. And has to be this way. Hap, drop that gun. Oh! I'm sorry, Walt. Very sorry. I'd known all along that you had to die tonight. But I didn't know that I'd kill you. a silent type, ain't you? Sorry? Oh, that's all right. I don't like fellows that gab too much. You know, it, it was nice of you to pick me up back there on the road. I was lonely. Besides, I, uh, well, I needed reassurance. How's that? You see, I've been out of touch with civilization for some time, and the people I've met today weren't inspiring. <laughs> You're a strange guy, do you know it? Am I? Yeah, I mean, the way you talk and look. You don't look quite real. Oh, now, now don't get me wrong. I, I like you a lot. Oh, I'm glad. Well, for instance, we've been driving for nearly an hour now, and you haven't even made a pass at me once. I'm afraid that wouldn't do either of us much good. Yeah, but just the same, a girl appreciates a little thing like that. Incidental, what's your name? You can call me Hap. Hi, Hap. I'm Hazel. How do you do? Well, I guess I ought to tell you something about myself. Well, I know a little already. Huh? You're going to New York to find your fiancé, aren't you? Yeah, a guy called... Say, how'd you know that? You're going to look him up in the phone book and call. And then you're going to uh, find out that he's married. What? Oh, you're kidding me. Jim wouldn't do a thing like that. He'd wait for me forever. He said he would, and... Hey, why are we stopping? Almost out of gas. Howdy, folks. Uh, fill her up as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, how far to New York from here? Well, you ought to be at George Washington Bridge in about ten minutes. Fine. You folks hear about all the excitement on the highway? No, what happened? Well, the cops are looking for a crazy killer. Murdered three people. One was a stick-up, the other two was a doctor and his own sidekick. Oh, what's he look like? Well, according to the radio, he's got got a chalk white face, a mop of hair that looks like it hasn't been cut in weeks, no hat, and, uh, and... What's the matter, bud? What are you staring at? Your, your friend, I, I... I gotta get something out of the office. I'll be back in a minute. He's going to phone the police. This is your chance to get out, Hazel. Oh, no, I'm staying with you, Hap. 
Now, you better get moving and keep moving. No sign we're being followed. We may make it yet. Are you frightened, Hazel? Being with me? I guess I should be, but I'm not. Thank you. Somehow I, I can't believe you're crazy. If you killed anyone, you knew what you were doing and you had a good reason. Thank you again. You don't know what that means to me. Have people always been scared of you, Hat? Most people. Till I met you. Why couldn't I have met you sooner, Hazel? Well, what's wrong with now? It's a little late. Not for me. You honestly mean that? Sure. Well, then perhaps it's going to be all right after all. Perhaps we'll meet again. What do you mean? I didn't mean to tell you this. Perhaps I shouldn't now. It may cause you pain. Go ahead. I can stand it. After you call Jim your fiancé and find that he's married, you start across the street in a daze. A taxi is driving too fast and... Uh, it's got my number on it, huh? Yes, I'm sorry. And yet, in a way... Uh, what did that sign say, Hazel? Uh, uh, George Washington Bridge, two miles. Oh, I'm going to make it. There's still time. The Secretary General is in his home. They'll let me in when they hear my message. I'll have most of an hour with him. It's not quite 11 yet. 11? Hey, your watch must have stopped. What? Look, look, there's a clock on the building. Where? Up to the right, there. Three minutes of twelve. Oh. Well, what's the matter, Hap? Oh, I can't make it. Oh, I've lost. Unless... A telephone. There's still time for that. Well, what are you stopping here? There's no phone. In that house, the family's all in bed upstairs. There's a telephone in the parlor. But the door is sure to be locked. They've forgotten to latch the parlor window. Hey, how do you know all these things? Never mind now. Goodbye, Hazel. But I'll be waiting here. No, you better start down the road. The police mustn't find me. But when you come back, I'll be here. I won't be back, Hazel. This is goodbye. For keeps. But you've got to come back. You've got to. Operator, get me the Secretary General of the United Nations at his home. Hurry, please. It's urgent. Hello? The Secretary General, please. It's terribly important. No, I've got to speak to him personally. I... Uh... Midnight. Hello? Will you get him for me? There's no time left and... Uh... Never mind. I'll tell you. It's... It's about... <gasps> I'll swear to that. You must have climbed in this window. You better go in and have a look. There was a girl with him when he left my gas station. She ought to be around. Where's the light? Here. There he is. On the floor. And he looks... He's dead, all right. No wonder. Look at that hole in his chest. Wait a minute. There's something funny here. That wound never bled. Huh? And the only way that could happen is... if he was dead before the bullet hit him. Two men staring at a corpse that is finally still. And still forever. The corpse of the man who died yesterday, while outside, somewhere in the night, a restless spirit keeps a rendezvous that none can avoid, and the distant clocks chime the last notes in epilogue for murder at midnight. Thank you.
again when death brings time to a full stop and the clocks strike 12 for murder at midnight the part of david hapgood was played by stuart brody vandell kramer was walked with music by charles paul murder at midnight was directed by anton m leader and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you the story of an accidental death and an attempted escape. Death on My Hands. Starring Phil Harris and Alice Fay. Well, flood my carburetor if it isn't Oscar the orating auto. What's up? My hood, Harlow. It's been nearly 5,000 miles since my last spark plug check. And you're set for a session with your Autolite spark plug dealer, eh, Oscar? His exclusive new plug check indicator will quickly show the condition of your spark plugs and whether they're right for your style of driving. I'm not up to par, Harlow. I've lost my usual pep on the hills, and I'm using too much gasoline. Well, if the plug check indicator shows your spark plugs need cleaning or adjustments, your Autolite spark plug dealer has all the equipment to do the job right. And if my plugs are worn out, Harlow? Then he'll replace the worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite. Resistor type or standard type spark plugs to give you smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. So, friends, have your spark plugs checked regularly. And when you do, see your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with Death on My Hands and the performances of Alice Fay and Phil Harris, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. I won't mention the name of the town. It won't help any. I don't think I'll even tell you what part of the country it's in. It's just a place in a long valley with hundred-year-old elms and hills you can't stop looking at. And the people? Well, maybe they're not much different than anybody else. Twenty-five hundred of them. The kids went to schools with big lawns and long walks. And the men walked up Oak Street from the mills right after the five o'clock whistle. Some stopped for a beer at Mike's or the Green Rooster or Eddie's Tavern. And some went right on home. Sounds wonderfully ordinary, doesn't it? That's what I thought. Until they tried to hang me. Dixie! Dixie! Oh, Dixie. I can't believe it. It's me, all right. I, I saw you from across the street. Well, what in the world are you doing in this little town, Julia? Oh, just... Just getting a little rest. <laughs> Don't give me that. Your idea of rest was always to sit in a, an air-conditioned cocktail lounge. Gee, you look good. Well, what about you? I wish you'd have stayed with the band, Julia. I just, just felt like drifting, Dixie. Where did you drift? All over. Ended up with a carnival. A carnival? Uh, I saw the posters about you and the band playing for the high school dance tonight. I, I couldn't believe it. Well, you don't get young doing one-nighters, but you see a lot of country and some swell people. 
You, for example. Oh. Well, how are all the boys? Well, I'm the only one of the original bunch left. No. Yeah. Sugar Thompson went with Kenton. Bill Candoli joined the circus in Cleveland and married a snake charmer. Oh, no. Yeah. And then Squeak Hanley lost himself up with the law in Virginia. You know how it goes. I got all new sidemen now, just kids. Yeah. Things change, don't they? Yeah, they do. Hey, look, Julia, why don't you drop in at the dance? They'd think I was an old science teacher. Nah, you'll knock them dead. No. No, look, Dixie, I want to talk to you. I'm at the embassy, across from the railroad station, the only hotel in town. I'll see you after the dance, outside. And we'll have a sandwich and a drink and a talk, huh? Okay. That's the way you want it. Look, it's the high school auditorium, you know. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I'll see you. Uh, Dixie. Yeah. Who's singing in my place now? (laughs) Me. We walked opposite directions and caught each other looking back a couple of times. She looked good. But then she always had. There had never been anything wrong with, with how Julia looked. That night at the high school dance, I played like I hadn't played for weeks. Man, that band caught fire. You should have seen the faces of those kids dancing by the bandstand. They looked at me as if I invented music. <laughs> and me, a third-rate clarinet player. Trouble was as far from my mind as Carnegie Hall is from Bop City. It was backstage after the dance that the bubble blew up in my face. Here's the loot, boss. Look at it. Big, coarse notes. Yeah, what does it come to, Teddy? Well, the cashier says 1,200 round simoleons. But I count it myself. That's not bad for this town. Listen, it's a lot better than standing on Vine Street waiting for a recording date. I'll take this kind of loot any day in a week. Yeah, I better put this in my bag. Hey, that bag must be loaded by now. I got two weeks' take in there. But I'll drop it in the bank when we get to Kansas City. Are you still carrying that gun for protection? Yeah, Ted. Right here. <laughs> I wouldn't know how to use it, though. Loaded? Every chamber. See? Oh, those things give me the creeps. Hey, what else you got in that bag? Just some publicity pictures of me. I'm going to get some new ones, though. Get them while you're young. When they start camouflaging those age lines in your face, the cost goes up by leaps and bounds. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, Teddy, uh, tell the boys I'll be at the next stop tomorrow. Oh? Huh? Who'd you tie up with? Julia. She here? Well, I'll be done. Small world, huh? What's she doing now? I'll tell you tomorrow. We got about six years talking to do in eight hours. Now get on out of here, huh? Yeah, right, boss. Come in! Come in! I'll be in with you in a minute, Julia. I just want... My, my name isn't Julia. It's Emily. Oh? Oh, Emily. Hello. Well, what can I do for you? Well, they all dared me to come in and tell you how much we liked your music. Well, bless you. So you liked it, huh? Never had such a good band at our dance before. It was like having Benny Goodman. Well, now, aren't you sweet? I'll tell Benny when I see him. Do you have a picture I could have? Well, I don't have any real good ones, but... Hey, I'll tell you what. You give me your name and address, and I'll send you one autographed. With love to Emily, my prettiest fan. I can see some in that suitcase. No, those aren't any good. They're kind of old. I mean, uh... I just gotta get one. They dared me. All right, but don't pull that suitcase, kid. Look out! Oh! Kid! Kid! What did you do? She fell to the floor and her head suddenly spurted red. For a moment I was so shocked I I didn't know what to do. Then I bent over and I picked her up and I ran to find the nearest doctor. I ran almost four blocks with people staring at me like I was crazy. I couldn't even feel myself. I was just a thought. Get to a doctor. Get to a doctor. And I finally did. She died instantly. No doctor in the world could help her. From then on, it was a nightmare. There was only four policemen in town, and they were all handling highway traffic 30 miles away because of a big mill fire. I told the doctor and the people who crowded around me that I'd stay in town and face a police inquest the next morning. There were some grumbles and some nasty words, but nobody stopped me from checking in at the embassy hotel. But I was there only an hour when I realized I wasn't going to get off that easily. 
group of men formed outside the hotel and stood looking up at my window. Then all of a sudden I realized they wanted to lynch me. down there. I know you're there. You don't need no rocks through no windows. You don't need any lousy notes. I know why you're there. How long are you waiting, Dixie? How tight are the ropes going to be? You're never going to use a rope on me. Never. Do you understand? Never. Who is it? Who is it? Julia. What do you want? Who are you doing all the shouting at? them. Those people down there. If you can call them people. They threw a note through the window on a rock. They want me for killing that girl. Well, maybe I can help you. What can you do? Don't kick a friendship in the face, Dixie. You never know when it'll come in handy. Yeah, tell me all about it. Look at them down there. Watching the window like hound dogs with a treed possum. Oh, Dixie, why don't you think of something to do instead of just burning off steam? Think. In the past hour, I've thought more than that Greek philosopher did in a lifetime. But it all boils down to me ending up with a tag on my toe. Oh, I wish I could help you. Look, what are you hanging around me for? They might try to do something to you if they find out you've been nice to me. I'll take my chances. I got nothing else to do. Oh, thanks. Don't waste your time. I don't think it's going to pay off. You know what? They make me feel like a criminal. They found my car. They did? Yeah, somebody told the manager. What's his name? Uh, Abdo. Uh, his car's three miles north of here in an empty riverbed. Burned to a crisp. The only thing in the world I own. Oh, Dixie, don't let it get you. But how much do they want? Julia, an accident is an accident. That means it wasn't done on purpose. She grabbed the bag and the gun went off. And she would... She would just a little... Kid. Oh, Dixie, Dixie, stop it. You're not doing yourself any good this way. It could happen to anyone. To me, or the people next door, or, or even to one of them down there. Oh, come on, sweetheart, and sit down here with me. Wait a minute. Well, what is it, Dixie? More of them. And they got guns now. Not just clubs and ropes, guns. Get away from that window. Maybe I don't want to. Maybe I could get them to shoot me from here, and then it... Well, it'd be over with like that. Get back from that window. Come on. Let go of me. They wouldn't shoot. They want their fun later. Do what I say. You gotta think, Dixie. You gotta think of some way to get out of here. I'm sorry that girl get killed. Sorry as an honest man can be, but... Well, there's no point in dying to prove it. I think God understands, Dixie. <laughs> Just another rock. No, it isn't. Look what the... Oh, never mind, Dixie. It, it, it's just what you said, a Wait rock. Wait a minute now. It's something else. What is it? Don't hide it from oh, me. Oh, Dixie. Give it to me! Oh, shoe. One of her shoes. What are they going to throw up next? Her body? Dixie, let me take it. Let them keep it! You dirty, dirty! Oh, Dixie. Dixie. If there was only something we could do. There isn't. When people get like that, there, there just isn't. Oh, I'm not going to let this happen. I'm not going to... Julia, listen. They're breaking the door down. They're coming in. Well, we've got to get out of here somehow. Get out? There's no way to get out now. Now go back to your room, Julia. I won't. I said go on. It's too late, Dixie. They're coming down the hall. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Phil Harris and Alice Fay in Death on My Hands. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Yippee! 
Why the loud levity, my loquacious limousine? I just visited my neighborhood auto light spark plug dealer, Harlow. Did he check your spark plugs with the nimble nemesis of nefarious spark plugs, the auto light plug check indicator? Yes, sir, Harlow, and it showed that my plugs were not functioning properly. So he replaced those worn out spark plugs with the matchless magic manifested by the multiple magnificence of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Eh, Oscar? Right. And now I'm giving smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. (laughs) Well, it pays to see your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer. He carries ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, the world-famous spark plugs that are designed by the same engineers who design complete ignition systems for many leading makes of our finest cars. And I'm off for a spring fling. So long. So, friends, see your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer soon and have him replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite, resistor-type or standard-type spark plugs. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Alice Fay and Phil Harris in Elliot Lewis's production of Death on My Hands, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Don't make any noise. It only sounds like one person. One person can carry a gun. Couldn't be them, Dixie. They wouldn't knock. Who is it? Half dog. The hotel owner. Let me in. All right. What's on your mind? They broke in the door downstairs. But I stopped them in the lobby. They had ropes and guns. Thank you, Abdo. Oh, don't thank me. I told them that they couldn't come in after you, but that you would go out. You don't mean that. I told them within 15 minutes. Abdo, let me stay a little longer in the name of humanity till till, till I can dope this out. I, I got enough money. I don't worry about money. Well, what have you got to lose? Listen, I give you a break. They could have come in here and got you and torn you up in little pieces, but I said no. One little word. How long after you are gone, I have to live in this town. You've got your troubles, I've got mine. That's the way things work. What's the matter with this town? Why does it act the way it does? After what you did, you expect them to treat you with brotherly love? You've got to be born here before they think you're human? There's a lot of world outside this flea-bitten town, and most of it's better. They should be happy that someone brings a little of it in with them once in a while. What you brought in was tragedy. But it was an accident, a statistic, the kind of thing insurance companies make a fortune predicting. Oh, blame me. Blame that big wheel of chance. Dixie. I just didn't get the right number on this spin, that's all. Well, you got now 13 minutes to to think of another one. What can I do for you, Dixie? Tell me something. Just let me alone. Well, I'm going to do something anyway. Did you turn on the radio? I turned on the radio. Turn it off. I'm not going to. Turn it off! I'm not going to! What do you want music for? Because I want to dance. Are you crazy? Oh, come on, Dixie, dance with me. Come on, it used to take your mind off things. Oh, I know, but I... Oh, come on, come on, that's it. Oh, pull me closer, Dixie. Oh, I wish this hadn't happened. So I could enjoy you, Julia. Let's let's just pretend this is the future. And we're dancing somewhere in, in love and, and How can I uh, think like that when all I can see are those guys down there loading buckshot and guns just Dixie, to... Dixie. Shh, 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 shh. Just dance. But I can still think. Oh, honey. This is wonderful. You know? I've played for a lot of dances, but I never realized until now what it does to you inside. What does it do to you, Dixie? Makes me wish I'd have gone to high school. I never got there. That was early autumn, done by the Woody Herman aggregate, the band that plays the blues. Not that you're blue right now. (laughs) 
And this is Charlie Schaefer, your early evening flatter party host on KNOK. And I want to remind you that if you have any request whatsoever, just dial KNOK. The switchboards are waiting. Now, how about a little bit of Glenn Miller? In the mood. I like that. I can request any tune in the world. But I can't save my life. What a great place to live. Let's dance some more. Yeah, yeah. What should I request? Don't break the news to mother, or maybe I'm in the mood for life. Oh, Dixie, don't talk like that. Dixie! Give me the railroad station. Um... Uh, freight division. Dixie, what are you doing? Stop talking. Hello? Hello? Um, what time does the next freight train leave? Yeah. I, I, I have some valuable freight I want to put on board. Oh. An hour, huh? Are you sure the time? Exactly one hour? Well, I, I guess there wouldn't be time tonight. Thanks anyway. Dixie, you just couldn't get to that train. It's my only chance, but I need an hour. An hour of safety to get to it. I'll be right back, Dixie. Where are you going? To find a policeman or to talk to those men or to do something. The police are all over in another town. They couldn't get here in time. Now you just wait here. I'll be right back. Emily, if... If anybody caught me on my knees like this talking to you, I suppose they'd think I was crazy. But I'm not. Emily, you know it was an accident. Pure and simple. It wasn't my fault. Only nobody really believes it. They're waiting for me outside. Your people. And they want me in exchange for you. Only it isn't an exchange. It's... It's just blood revenge, an eye for an eye. And it doesn't make sense. I know that saying all this will never do you any good. But, Emily, I just wanted you to hear how sorry I am, how deeply and tragically sorry I am. Emily, have a good long rest. Maybe someday I'll meet you in person again and we'll talk about it. And that someday might be today. Hey, what are you doing down in the lobby, young lady? Where are you going? Mr. Abdo, we've just got to do something. Get some police or get rid of those men out there. I have long ago sent somebody for the police. But I don't expect them to get here. Why don't you let him stay here longer? Because I can only hold these men a while. After that, they come in. I don't want to see it. Why do these men want him? I, 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 I don't want to talk anymore. Well, I'm going to find out. Where are you going, lady? I want to ask you why you want Dixie. That ought to be plain. He didn't kill that girl. It wasn't his fault. You must have a better reason. Whose little girl was it? Yours? Or yours? Whose? Is that why you want him? Because it was one of your children? Lady, you'd better go on about your business and leave ours to us. We got our own reasons for getting that skunk. What'd you find out, Julia? What happened? Well, Abdo's been trying to get the police. They won't come. Don't worry. How many of their neighbors do you think they'll shoot down to save me? I don't know, Dixie. I don't know. Look, I got five minutes, that's all. Five minutes to walk out of here. And I need an hour. I'm sure the ringleader of that gang would... I talked with him. I'm sure he's the father. Oh, what's the use? I give up. But you can't, Dixie. You can't. What do you expect me to do? Perform a miracle? It's Abdo. Let me in. Are you... Are you ready to go, son? No, I'm not ready to go. I still got five minutes. You must have made a mistake with the time. Your time is up. It is like... Look at this watch. Look at it. Still better than four minutes. I'm sorry. 
But now is the time. Before they come in the hotel after you. I don't get it. I don't get this whole setup. Why did you bother to stop them once if you send me out to them now? I did what I felt I must do. For me, that was enough. Well, I'm not going. Do you understand? I'm not going. They'll have to work to get me. Haven't you done enough to me already? To you? The little girl you... who was killed... was my little girl. Oh. Mr. Abdo, I'm... I'm really sorry. I'll go. You won't have any more trouble from me. I'm going with you, Dixie. Here. I'll turn off the lights in the lobby. That might help. Shall we take the elevator? No, honey, the stairs. I want to make it last as long as I can. Dixie. Not see, I want to cry. Do I? But it wouldn't help. I'm having trouble enough seeing now. I'll go out with you and fight. Let me, Dixie. You're going to stay right here in this lobby. You said you'd do anything for me, and that's what I want you to do. How, how are you going to do it? I'm going out. Turn right alongside the building, and then I'm going to run. Run, you hear me? Then maybe somewhere, somehow, I can find help. So long, Julia. Dixie, I love you. Good. Take it easy. Colin, stay right where you are. Why should I? Shut up. Now, if you know what's good for you, walk over to that car and make it fast. Take that gun out of my face. You know what I tell you? Stop talking. Hey! All right, everyone, stay where you are. Hey, what do you think you're trying to do? I said stay where you are. I'll put a bullet through the face of the first man who moves. Are you going to let a guy get away with a crime like that? Maybe kill him? Whatever or not. Come on, guys. The next one will go through somebody's head. I want you to notice this badge on my coat. You people pay me to protect you and everybody against lawlessness in this town. And I'm going to earn my money whether you want me to or not. Some more police will be here in two minutes and anybody standing around will be arrested. Now go on home. Break this up. All the fun is over. Can you drive? Thank you, officer. I said, can you drive? Well, I could yesterday, but I don't know now. My knees... Well, try. I've got to be ready for anything. Where do I go? To jail. Oh, that's all right, mister. You'll be safe there. Hello. Hello, Julia. Would you care to go and get that sandwich we talked about a thousand years ago? Oh, I'd love to, Dixie. What did they say? The coroner acquitted me ten minutes ago. Accidental homicide. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, well, what are you going to do now, Dixie? Oh, just catch up with the band and drift, I guess. Dixie, I, I don't suppose I could... Go uh, back with the band? Well, j just singing, that's all. You could do a bigger job than that if you want to. You mean it? Sure. Look, here's your wedding ring. You know, I never threw it away... Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's stars, Phil Harris and Alice Faye. Friends, this is Harlow Wilcox again to remind you that Autolite is the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, tractors, planes, and boats in 28 plants from coast to coast. These products include world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, which are carried by your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer. See him soon, and have worn-out spark plugs replaced with ignition-engineered Autolite resistor-type or standard-type spark plugs for smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. 
And remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, our star will be Mr. Charles Boyer in Another Man's Poison. And in weeks to come, you will hear such famous stars as Jeff Chandler and Dick Powell on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Death on My Hands was written for Suspense by John Michael Hayes and E. Jack Newman. Included in tonight's cast were Joseph Kearns, Herb Butterfield, Barbara Whiting, Byron Kane, Franklin Parker, and Gil Stratton, Jr. Alice Fay and Phil Harris may be heard on their own radio program every Sunday over another network. And remember, next week on Suspense, Mr. Charles Boyer in a tale we call Another Man's Poison. You can buy world-famous Autolite resistor or standard type spark plugs, Autolite staple batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. We want to thank the National Safety Council for choosing Autolite for the Council's Public Interest Award of 1950. This award is presented in recognition of exceptional service to safety. Autolite is proud to have been chosen as one of the leaders in this important field and pledges continued efforts toward accident prevention on the highway. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Sealed Book. Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault wherein is kept the great sealed book, in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of two scoundrels who would stop at nothing for money. A tale called The Ghost Makers. the tale, The Ghost Makers, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. It is an autumn afternoon in the ancient New England village of Wilton. In an old stone house a mile from the town, Agatha Wainwright is serving tea to her nephew Ned, and a little man Ned is introduced as Professor Piedmont, a friend who has come to spend a few weeks with them while he works on a book to be called... Old graveyards of New England. Uh, so this is your graveyard, friend Ned. Uh, he looks like a man who'd be happy staring at tombstones. They make a fascinating study, Miss Wainwright. Well, I'll take your word for it, Professor Piedmont. 
Myself, I'd rather read about them in a book. The professor not only writes books, Auntie, but he's also an expert on psychic phenomena. Psychic phenomena, eh? Oh, you mean ghosts. Hmm. Foolish fiddle-faddle dreamed up by silly people without the brains to know better. Ah, but Miss Wainwright, I assure you, you are wrong. Oh, nonsense. When a person's dead, he's dead. And I see anything I'm willing to call a ghost, I'll know I'm crazy and I'll admit it. Why, Auntie, this very house is supposed to be haunted. You know that. Oh, rubbish. This is a perfectly normal house. I've lived here a month and I haven't heard so much as a board squeak. Ah, but Miss Wainwright, that may be only because you're new to the house and not yet sensitized. It takes time to become aware of occult influences. Oh, stop and nonsense. Who started all this talk about ghosts, anyway? Here, here, now let's have some tea and no more talk about ghosts. Well, Ned, now that we're alone, suppose you tell me a little more than you put in your letter. I'm still not sure why you sent for me. All right, Professor. This is the gist of it. Three months ago, Aunt Agatha's brother died, leaving her in a state of $400,000. And I'm Auntie's only living relative. I see. Yes, light begins to dawn. No, wait. My uncle arranged his will so that Aunt Agatha gets only the interest, about $20,000 a year, and this house to live in. On her death, the entire estate goes to charity. I'm cut off without a penny. I see your uncle didn't like you, Ned. <laughs> a shrewd man. Very shrewd. Yes, he was making sure I couldn't get my hands on any of it. But that's where you come in. Hmm? If Aunt Agatha were to become, uh, oh, shall we say, ill, mentally ill... <laughs> so that she was incompetent to administer the estate, you mean? Exactly. If Aunt Agatha were to lose her mind through shock or fright... Who but me, her only relative, would be the logical one to administer the estate for her. You would, then. Then you'd have the whole income for as long as she lived. Yes, and part of the principal, too. I know ways to manage it. But I've got to get my hands on some of it before the end of the year. I'm sunk. I owe a little money, about 25000 If I don't get it quickly, well, the people I owe it to are rather short-tempered. I understand. Yes, Ned, I remember when I knew you in Chicago. You liked to gamble, didn't you? But that's your affair. Personally, I prefer to stick to my own profession, creating ghosts. Yes, I've heard of some of your jobs, Professor, and some of the ghosts you've created to order. Yes, I pride myself on having a unique occupation, Ned. I believe I'm the only ghost maker there is. And the ghosts I've created have been effective, too. (laughs) So I understand. (laughs) Now, what I want you to do is this. I want Auntie frightened to the point where she... Yes, yes, I understand. Well, Ned, it's going to be difficult. She's a tough-minded woman, hard to scare, hard to uh, drive insane. It's got to be done. Got to get my hands on the estate. If you succeed, Professor, there's $5,000 in it for you. Hmm? All right, Ned, I'll try. It won't be easy, but she may crack suddenly when the time comes. That type does, you know. Good. That's settled, then. You brought everything you're apt to need... All my apparatus and gadgets are in my trunk. They'll be here tomorrow. I'm not altogether sure I like this job, Ned. I hope you're not going to turn moral on me, Professor. No, 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 no. There's something about this place that disturbs me, though. You know, I am psychic at times. Not altogether a faker. (laughs) Next you'll be scaring yourself with your own stories. As we were driving past that old cemetery this afternoon, I suddenly felt a premonition and a chill... The kind of chill you're supposed to feel when you go near the place you'll someday be buried. Oh, it was just the wind. Ah, We'll have to get you some red flannels. Here. Here's something that'll give you your courage back. Drink it down. Ah. Yeah, that does me good. (laughs) Of all the different kinds of spirits, I prefer those in bottles. (laughs) I thought you'd like it. Now, let's go downstairs again. We won't talk about ghosts anymore tonight. But tomorrow night, who knows what may come knocking at Aunt Agatha's door.
And now to continue the story as it is written in the sealed book. The following evening, Ned and the professor joined Aunt Agatha by the fireplace where she sat knitting. Outside, a cold winter wind blew. Oh, listen to that wind. We may be in for a storm. Uh, we're in for an early winter, that's what. The first snow will fall any day now. Yeah, it's good to have a fireplace to sit by when the wind blows like that. Here's the cider and donuts, ma'am. Very well, Emmy. Bring it right in. Ah, cider and donuts. Just what we need on a night like this. Will you have a glass, Mr. Ned? Oh, yes. Thank you, Emmy. Will you have some cider, Professor Piedmont? Professor, Emmy's trying to give you some cider. Uh, oh, excuse me, I was listening. Thought I heard someone knocking on the front door. Someone knocking? Well, there is someone there. Well, they can't be very anxious to get in if that's all the noise they can make. Shall I go see who it is, Miss Agatha? Yes, yes, girl, go see. Though I can't imagine who'd be calling at this hour of the night. It sounded like someone who didn't expect to get in anyway. A timid child, or, or maybe a ghost. Yes? Yes, who is it? Why? Why? Miss Agatha! Well? There wasn't anyone there. No one there? Of course there was. Someone knocked, didn't they? But I opened the door and there wasn't anyone there. Then who was knocking? Answer me that. I don't know. But it wasn't anyone... Anyone you can see. Emmy, I'll stand for no foolishness now. No, ma'am. But just the same, there's nobody at the door. Someone's playing tricks on us, and I'm going to see who it is. I'll come with you. You won't find anybody there. Well, we'll see. Well, what is it? What do you... There isn't anyone here. No, but there was. They slipped away into the bushes. That's what they did. Yes, yes, of course. Some small boys playing tricks, I suppose. Mm, if I catch them, I'll tan their hides. Who was it, Miss Wainwright? Just some boys playing tricks, Professor. That's all it could have been. Come on, Professor. Drink your cider. Uh, what? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, professor, you look like a man who was listening to something then. What was it? Oh, no, no, I assure uh, you. I... I'm too old not to know when a man is lying, Professor Piedmont. What were you listening to? To tell the truth, I thought I heard voices. What kind of voices? Far away voices, crying something I couldn't make out. I bet it was just the flames in the fireplace. I'm sure it was. <laughs> of course, that's all it was. <laughs> well, what do you say we all turn in? <clears throat> this New England air makes me sleepy. Hmm. Knocks at the door when there's nobody there. And voices. Yes, it's high time we were all in bed instead of sitting around here imagining such nonsensical things. Highly pleased with their first effort in creating ghosts that didn't exist, Ned and Professor Piedmont went to bed. But before they retired, they held a brief, low-voiced conference in Ned's room. Well, Professor, that door-knocking act was all right. You did it very nicely. Yes, Ned. An ordinary length of black thread run through a crack in the window sash and attach the door-knocker can create a very satisfactory ghost indeed. Now tell me, <laughs> what comes next on the program? Well, we can't work too fast. Tomorrow the hired girl, Emmy, will spread the story of tonight's happenings. The whole town will start talking about it. Good. And then? And tomorrow night, nothing happens. Your Aunt Emmy is reassured. But tomorrow, I'll be busy. I notice today there's an old hollow tree in the woods about a hundred feet from the house. Mm, what about it? I'll run wires to it, hiding them under the leaves, and install a small loudspeaker in it. I'll conceal the microphone and batteries behind the drapes in the living room. <laughs> I see. So two nights from now, we'll hear ghostly voices, eh? <laughs> exactly. They'll accompany the ghostly knocks on the door. And But that won't be all. <laughs> There'll be other surprises on the program. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, remind me to tell you sometime that you're about as unpleasant an old rascal as I've ever met. <laughs> The next evening, Agatha Wainwright listened nervously for a repetition of the ghostly knocks. But nothing happened, and she regained her composure. The evening following that, however, as she and Ned and the professor sat in the living room around the fire... Uh, nine o'clock. 
The evening may just be starting in New York, but here in Wilton, it's bedtime. Hmm. Seems to be someone at the door. So there is. Shall I go? No, Emmy can answer the door. She does little enough to earn her money. Emmy? Emmy? Yes, Miss Agatha? There's someone at the door. See who it is, please. Why, must I, Miss Agatha? Must you, indeed. Answer the door, Emmy. I'd... I'd rather not, ma'am. Emmy, see who is at the door. Yes, Miss Agatha. I'm going. Who is it? There's no one there. There's no one there again. Emmy, get control of yourself. But I tell you, there's no one there. Then it's someone playing tricks. That's all you hear, Emmy. Yes. Yes, Miss Agatha, I hear. But I don't believe it. Go to your room. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, Miss Agatha. But there wasn't anyone there. I hope I'm not going to have to discharge that girl. Shall I go this time, Auntie? No, Ned. If the rascals play their tricks, whoever they are, they'll soon stop when they see we pay no attention. I wonder if I could see them from the window. Maybe we could trap them if we were to go quietly out the back door and slip around to the front. What was that? Someone calling. Really? I don't hear anyone. It's someone calling to us to let him in. Strange. I can't hear it. You must have heard it, Ned. It was perfectly plain. There are some voices certain people can hear and others can't. If there's someone calling, we better take a look. Come on, Eddie. We'll see what goes on. Who's there? Show yourself, whoever you are. Yeah, it's perfectly empty. No. There isn't a soul in sight. Both the knocking and the voices seem to have stopped. Perhaps we ought to search the yard and... <gasps> and Agatha, look. Eh? Gone at the edge of the trees. Lights. Three balls of light moving around just above the ground. Really? Three spheres of light? And dear me, luminous spheres are common manifestations of spiritual presences. Oh, nonsense. And... They're just uh, will-o'-the-wisps, that's all. Well, whatever they are, we're going to see. Come on, Professor. If it's a trick, we'll soon know. Yes, Ned. Wait for me. Don't scare them away. I want to see what they look like. Ned! Ned, they're rising. They're floating away by the trees. And Agatha. Annie, are you all right? Shall I get a doctor for you? What do, do you... I want with a doctor? I'm all right. I'm an old fool carrying on like that. Just because of some will of the wisps or whatever it was, I... I shan't do it again, I promise you. You need not be ashamed, Miss Wainwright. Unless I'm much mistaken, we've witnessed a psychic visitation of a kind unsurpassed in my suspense. Oh, stuff for nonsense, Professor. You may believe in spirits, but I don't. I never have believed in ghosts, and I'm not going to stop now. It was just that it was, well, unexpected. <laughs> In the days that followed, Ned Wainwright and Professor Piedmont found it impossible to shake Agatha Wainwright's iron nerves. Emmy, the hired girl, resigned in terror, but Agatha remained seemingly unmoved. Resolutely, she ignored the ghostly knocks, voices, and footsteps that Professor Piedmont's ingenuity devised. The whole town buzzed with tales of her haunted house, but she refused to pay any attention to them. After a month had gone by, Ned was ready to admit defeat. Well, Professor, you're a washout. And Agatha hasn't turned a hair at your ghost. No, Ned, I told you it might take a long time. She's a very strong-minded woman. Believe me, anyone else would have cracked by now. Well, she hasn't, and she's not going to. I still say it may happen all at once. She's nervous and distraught. She doesn't sleep well. Every evening she sits listening for ghostly voices, though she won't admit it. But she's made up her mind not to believe in ghosts. And I'm afraid she never will. Well, what do you suggest? It's the middle of December. I've got to get my hands on her money by the end of the year and I'm sunk. We must play our last card. You. Me? What do you mean? She's fond of you. You're her only relative. What are you getting at? How would she feel if you, her only relative, were to die and come back here as a ghost? I don't follow you. My plan is simple. We'll say goodbye to your aunt and drive off as if we were going away. Then, secretly in the night, we'll return to the house. Yes? And then what? We'll see to it that she receives a phone call from a friend of mine in Boston. He'll announce to your aunt that you and I have been in an automobile accident, and that we've been killed. Oh, I see. 
Yes, I begin to understand. Uh, immediately after the phone call, we'll knock. She'll come to the door and see us standing there. And having just heard that we're both dead... Exactly. And if that doesn't work, Ned, we are defeated. But it'll be a strong mind indeed that can withstand such a shock. A strong mind indeed. And now to continue the story, as it is written in the sealed book. Two days later, Ned and Professor Piedmont said goodbye to Agatha and drove away. It was starting to snow as they left, so they made their way by a roundabout route to an isolated roadhouse, and there they spent the day waiting. After darkness had fallen, they started back towards Aunt Agatha's house. By now, there was snow feet deep on the road. And the cold blast of the north wind made even the heated interior of the car uncomfortable. I'll be dead when this is over, Ned. The thermometer must be down to zero. Yes, at least. Well, we're almost there. We'll drive up to within a hundred yards of the house and wait in the car with the heater on. What time did you arrange to have that phone call made from Boston? At nine o'clock, exactly. We want to knock the instant after she gets it. Right. Isn't that our turn there? I think so. This snow makes it so hard to see that... Professor, look out. We're going up the road. Up... Ned. Ned. Are you hurt? Uh, my ankle. I'll be out of here. <laughs> Come on. Uh, hurry, Ned. I smell gasoline. The car may catch on fire. All right. Help me out of the road. Yes, yes. What happened? We skidded down a ten-foot bank and turned completely over. Well, if you'd watched where you were going, it wouldn't have happened. I couldn't tell there was ice under the snow. No, but never mind that. We've got to get to shelter. And I think my ankle's broken. Yes, I can't step on it. Yes. You can lean on me. But where are we? A quarter of a mile from Aunt Agatha's. There isn't another house within a mile. Then come on, we've got to get there quick. Lean on me. Help all you can. If we don't get there soon, we'll freeze to death. Half an hour later, numb with cold and scarcely able to struggle on, Ned and Professor Piedmont staggered up to Agatha Wainwright's house. The windows all had heavy wooden shutters over them. Shutters they themselves had helped Agatha put in place to keep out anything that might come knocking at the door in the night. But through the small pane of glass in the front door, light showed as they stumbled thankfully up the steps. Thank heaven we're here. Couldn't have gone another hundred yards. Oh, no, I, I'm almost frozen. We've got to get inside. Yes, here, help me. 
All right. Uh, one more step. Uh, there. Uh, Ned, the phone call from Boston. What time is it now? Time? I, it's nine. Nine o'clock exactly. Then knock quickly. We've got to get inside before that phone call comes. <laughs> Inside, Agatha Wainwright heard the knocking. But before she could go to the door, the telephone rang and she answered it first. Hello? Yes, this is Wilton, 317. Boston, calling long distance? Yes, I'll hold on. Uh, Just a minute. Hello? Yes, this is Miss Wainwright speaking. The Boston General Hospital. My nephew Ned. What is it? What's happened to him? Dead. An automobile accident. Both of them killed? No. Oh, no. Yes. Yes, I'm all right. Thank you for letting me know. I'll come in the morning. Dead. Killed. Oh, no. No, no, he can't be. It's Ned. Let me in. Let me in. Ned. Ned's dead. He's been killed. Let me in, please, Ned. It's Ned. Let me in. No. Ned's dead. Ned's dead. Yes, no, you can't be Ned. Ned was killed. He's dead. Stand Agatha, please. It must be Ned's ghost. The professor was right. There are ghosts. It's Ned's ghost out there. Stand Agatha. We're freezing to death out here. Please let us in. No. No, you can't come in. You're a ghost. You're Ned's ghost. You can't come in. I won't let a ghost in here. I won't. <laughs> The next morning, Ned and Professor Piedmont were found frozen to death beside the house. For they made a vain effort to pry open the heavy wooden shutters that covered the window. You see, Agatha never did let them in. She knew better than to open the door to ghosts. the tale we tell next time. This one? Ah, yes. Why, this is amazing. It's a tale of murder. Queer, unexpected, fiendish murder. Murder of a very different and unusual kind. A tale such as you've never heard before. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Seal Book. The Seal Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. The Summer Theater. (laughs) 
Welcome to the Summer Theater, a dramatic hour of romance, love, and adventure. Tonight, we present Daphne du Maurier's startling tale, The Birds, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Don Wilson. Tonight, we're presenting a brand new story by the famous author of Rebecca, Jamaica Inn, Frenchman's Creek, and many other favorites, Miss Daphne du Maurier. Now, this new story, however, is far different from any of these, and in many ways far more exciting. It's a tale I am sure will haunt you for a long time to come. The title is simply The Birds, and our star is Mr. Herbert Marshall. Our scene is London and the office of a successful publisher of books. With him sits Jenkins, his editor. Before them on the broad, shining surface of the desk is a manuscript, tattered, worn, its bulk held together with a bit of string. Strange way to submit a story. You say there was no address on it? No, the author left no address. But I wish you'd read it, sir. You like it, huh? Do you think it's publishable? I don't know. It's terrifying. I can't seem to get it out of my mind. Hmm. All right, Jenkins, all right. I'll read it. But mind you, it better be good. Just read it, sir. Title, The Birds, by John Waite. John Waite. John Waite. My name is John Waite. I'm writing this as a minute record of what has happened thus far because I I cannot help feeling that in the recounting of these events I may, in some measure, come to an understanding of what has happened and even perhaps why it has happened. The whole business is monstrous and overwhelming and I'm not sure that human eyes will ever fall upon this, my journal. I am a writer of moderately successful fiction, and this small house on the Dover coast is my castle, which I share with my wife, my 16-year-old daughter, my mother-in-law, and one yellow canary. (laughs) The canary. His name is Chippikins. No, I didn't name him. My mother-in-law did. Chippikins belongs to Mother Dobbs, and bringing him here was an open and shut case of coals to Newcastle for Dover is alive with birds. And it has been my daily custom, work over, to sit at the cliff's edge and smoke my pipe and watch and listen. The birds, soaring and wheeling in great rushing flocks, flickering in a fat gray sheet just above the grassy slope of the hills, and then bursting all of a bunch, erupting into the sky, restless, ceaseless, Ever moving, ever moving, slashing as one in a perfect arc up, and then for a split moment, almost invisible as in their turning, the profile, thin as glass, presents itself against the sky. And then as one, in cadence, back again, and with a slow chorus, gone. Black and white, jackdaw and gull, Mingling in strange, restless partnership, seeking some strange liberation, never satisfied, never still. Flocks of starlings rustling like silk, and the smaller birds, finches and larks, scattering from tree to hedge and back again, compelled by what? And below the seabirds, waiting for the tide, they have more patience. Oyster catchers, red shank, sandaling, and curl you, watch by the water's edge, race the surface it sucks away, revealing the prize. 
farther out, the fishermen. Slim, soaring gannets. Ancient, patient pelicans. Black gulls, grey gulls, pale gulls. Soaring, sighting and plummeting. Wings folded. Feet tight in, beaks out. Knife through the surface. Down in a flash of silver to the prey below. Autumn had been a long one, mellow and soft. The leaves had lingered on the trees, red and gold, somehow reluctant to fall. The days grew hazy and benevolent, shortening imperceptibly. And with their passing, the birds seemed more restless, more driven, more agitated. My neighbor, the farmer, drove his tractor. Long, even lines across the western hills and his figure silhouetted in the driver's seat would be lost from time to time in the great cloud of wheeling, crying birds which followed his movements. And I remarked on this. Lots of birds around today. Aye, there are more birds than usual, and daring too. One or two goals came so close to my head this afternoon, I thought they'd knock my cap off. As it was, I could scarcely see what I was doing when they were overhead. And I had the sun in my eyes. I have a notion the weather will change. It'll be a hard winter. That's why the birds are so restless. My friend the farmer said the weather would change on Tuesday, and he may have been right. I'm not certain. The fact is, the weather changed that night. And it was that night that it began. I've been asleep. What's that? Mm-hmm. Oh, something at the window. Can go back to sleep, dear. Well, I'm going to find out what it is. It was a bird. What kind, I could not tell. The wind must have driven it to shelter on the sill. I went back to bed and, feeling my knuckles wet, put my mouth to the scratch. The bird had drawn blood. I suppose it was frightened, panicked, seeking shelter. The wind was indeed very cold. The weather had turned. John, are you awake? Yes. See to the window, will you, dear? It's rattling. I've already seen to it, Megan. There's some bird out there trying to get in. Shoot away. I can't sleep with that noise. All right, dear. What? No, get, get away. Get out. Oh, what was that? What happened? Well, they went for me. Oh, John, you're still half asleep. Come back to bed. No, I tell you, they did. Yes, dear, of course. Come to bed. <laughs> what was that? Mother, and Jill. I'll get a, light a candle. No, no, hurry. I opened the door to our bedroom and crossed the landing to the room Jill shared with Mother Dobbs. It was pitch black in the room and the air was filled with small birds. I could feel them all about me and I, I swung my arms. They poured through the open window. They stuck the walls of the ceiling. Oh, Father, Father! Quickly, Jill, come out. Mother Dobbs! I'm under the cover! Run for the door! I slammed the door after them. I didn't want the birds spreading through the house. Now in the darkness they sensed me and dove for me, tiny beaks and needle claws set to pierce and tear. I seized the quilt from the bed, wound it over my head, and then, swinging a pillow at random, I went to work. I couldn't see what I was doing, but I could feel the thudding of their bodies. I swung, swung, till my arm began to numb. How long I fought with them in the darkness, I do not know. the beating of wings subsided and withdrew. And through the density of the quilt, I became aware of light. I waited, listened, but there was no sound. I dropped the quilt and stared about me in the cold gray light. Dawn and the open window had called the living birds. The dead lay on the floor. They were all small birds. 
Robins, finches, sparrows, blue tits, larks, bramblings. Birds that ordinarily kept to their own flocks. Now dead and still in a shambles of feathers and broken glass. Outside it was cold, bitter cold. And the earth had all the hard black look of frost. Not white frost to shine in the morning sun. But black frost that the east, the east wind brings. And across the field, the sea. Fiercer now with the burning tide. It broke and crashed in the bay. Of the birds, there was not a sign. Not so much as a sparrow. Nothing but the east wind and the sea. Do you want the wireless left on? Please, Mother. Oh, easy, Meg. That stuff stings. I suppose, too. Don't want these scratches to infect. No, I suppose not. I'd say you ought to thank the Almighty they didn't get in your eyes. That's what I'd say. Yes, Mother. Nasty little creatures. One would hardly believe they belong to the same species as little chippy chick chippikins here. Mmm, you're a proper little gentleman, aren't you, Master Chippikins? Not a bit like those horrid little savages, hmm? That's odd. What? He won't speak to me. Speak? Speak? Chip, chip, chip. Did Jill get off to school all right? Yes. I hope I brought the right clothing down. I didn't want her to see the room. Didn't want her frightened. <laughs> she thought it quite a joke. Imagine she's telling the class all about it right now. I suppose. Come, come, little chippikins. Speak. Speak. Good morning, Mr. Waite. Good morning, Mr. Bell. An ounce of tobacco, please, my usual. Your usual? Yes, sir. And what do you think of the weather? Wireless says it's going on all over. Uh, something to do with the Arctic Circle. Oh, really? Black winter, that's what it is, out of the east. I heard the wind come up in the night. Um, did you hear any birds? Birds? What birds? We had them at our place last night. Scores of them came into the bedroom. Quite savage they were. Here, look, look at my hand. Well, well. My goodness, I never heard of birds acting savage. Not our birds. I assure you, these scratches are real. Oh, maybe they were some of those foreign birds from the Arctic Circle. Tell you what, put out some crumbs for them. That's what I'd do, put out some crumbs. Bring the paper, John. Yes. No mention of birds. I've been watching the field. So have I. I haven't seen a single one. I know. Strange. Yes. Do you tell anyone? Yes. What'd they say? Put out crumbs. I'll get a sack and clean up the bedroom. Their bodies filled the sack. The ground had frozen during the night. It was too hard to dig. I went down the cliff path to the beach. The sky was leaden. The sea was flat, calm, oily. Not a sound of birds. I kicked a hole in the sand. And as I did this, I saw them. The gulls. Out there. Riding the sea. What I had thought at first to be sea scud, wind froth, were gulls. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. They rose and fell in the trough of the sea, silent, like a mighty fleet at anchor. 
To the eastward and to the west, the gulls were there. They stretched as far as the eye could reach in close formation, packed line on line. Somebody ought to know of this. Something should be said. But what? Could I call the police? Hello, constable? I want to report some birds. Oh, no, they think me mad. They think me drunk. Take my report with great politeness and thank me. But they were out there, waiting. Waiting. For what? John, come quickly. It's on the wireless. What? About the birds. The home office at 11 a.m. today. Reports from all over the country are coming in hourly about the vast quantity of birds flocking above towns, villages, and outlying districts, causing obstruction and damage and even attacking individuals. It is thought that the Arctic air stream at present covering the British Isles is causing birds to migrate south in immense numbers, and that intense hunger may drive these birds to attack human beings. Householders are warned to see to their windows, doors, and chimneys, and to take reasonable precautions for the safety of their children. A further statement will be issued later. There, you see? Wait till Mr. Bell hears that. And just now, down on the beach, I saw a million gulls riding on the sea, waiting. Waiting? Waiting for what, John? I, I don't know. Well, the bulletin said the birds are hungry. In the shed were all sorts of boards and sheathings left over from the blackout days of the war. And I spent the next few hours putting these up. There was no thought of my novel this day. Actually, the, the writer is a lazy creature and welcomes any diversion from his work. Somehow this seemed to be something a little bigger than diversion. Do you think that's really necessary, John? I don't like to take chances. But they were such little birds. I'm not thinking of those. Oh? The gulls. I see. Are you going to do the downstairs, too? I think I'd better. It would be dark with the windows all boarded up. At each window, the process was the same. I nailed the boards to the sills from within the rooms. And by the time I reached the kitchen, Meg and Mrs. Dobbs were listening to the and wireless again. The sky was so dense at one o'clock this afternoon that it seemed as if the city was covered by a vast black cloud. The birds settled on rooftops, on window ledges, and on chimneys. The sight has been so unusual that traffic came to a standstill in many thoroughfares. Work was abandoned in shops and offices, and the streets were, and still are, crowded with people standing about to watch the birds. We take you now to our roving microphone in Piccadilly Circus. I've been standing here for hours. We cannot begin to describe the enormous variety of birds which are circling overhead. I have never seen anything like it. Uh, standing beside me is the gentleman... Uh, what is your name, sir? Jenkins, Peter Jenkins. Uh, what do you think of the birds, Mr. Jenkins? Oh, never saw nothing like it. I swear I never did. Well, uh, just before we went on the air, you were telling these people and myself about your cap. I wonder if you would mind repeating that for our uh, audience. Oh, lummy, they, they wouldn't want to hear none of that. Oh, I, I'm sure they would. Well, I, I've got these three mouses, you see. Big bully and alley cats they are, hard as nails. And out where I live, the birds keep a wide berth around my cottage. Well, this morning I looked out of the window and saw uh, what we all saw. And I says to my cats, I says, All right, men, Arthur, Freddy and you, Leon, at and at em. You see, one of their jobs, my cat's job, that is, one of their jobs is to keep the birds scared out of the vegetable patch. So I opened the door and they started out. Then they saw all them birds, and they just turned around with their back hair all up and their tails looking like porcupines. They turned and run into the bedroom and under the bed and wouldn't come out for love or money or the dish of cold water I throwed at them. Oh, thank you, Mr. Peter Jiggins. Uh, now we have a lady here at our microphone. Uh, uh, what is your name, miss? Uh, come, come out. There's nothing to be nervous about. <laughs> what, what are you doing? 
Oh, I thought I'd see if the American stations have heard about it. She lies. Listen to the mockingbirds. Listen to the mockingbirds. The mockingbirds. That? <laughs> That's the American's reaction. Do you think they never do take a thing seriously? Uh, it seems that we're having a little trouble with our mobile unit, a uh, number of birds have settled on the antenna. Uh, well, can't you chase them off or something? You've got to complete this broadcast. Well, try throwing something at them. I don't know, stones, anything. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we regret this unfortunate circumstance. I, I'm sure we'll have the situation straightened out in a moment. Do you please bear with us on this most unusual of all days? And uh, now we return you to our main studio for a brief program of recorded music. There. That ought to hold it. If you want my opinion, it's all nonsense. That's what it is. Oh, Mother. Boarding this place up so we have to light the lamp, and it's only three in the afternoon. Tell me, how much singing has Chippikins done today? Not a note. He's off his feed, that's what. Look at him. He's so nervous and agitated. What with all your banging. See? I saw. The bird seemed possessed. He flew from one corner to the other, his shiny black eyes flicking from one of us to another, yellow wings quivering. John, look out there. Where? The ocean. Hmm? Oh, you mean that cloud, that big black cloud? It's not a cloud, John. It was the gulls. A black mass of them that towered a mile high. They circled thousands upon thousands, lifting their wings against the wind. And they were silent. They made not a sound. They just went on soaring and circling, rising and falling, trying their strength against the cold east wind. John, where are you going? I'm going for Jill. I'll wait for her at the school bus stop. You keep the door closed. I'm frightened. Keep it closed until you hear me call. Hurry. All right, but you look so funny. What is it? Please, Jill, do hurry. What's that strange cloud? That's it, I tell you what. Let's race the rest of the way. Oh, Father, you know I can beat you. Oh, come on, then. Get your shilling. Wait a minute. Look at the cloud, Father. Hurry, Jill, in the name of heaven. Why, it's birds. Look, Father, birds. And it's coming this way. Run! They won't hurt us, will they? Faster! I'm scared. Meg! Meg! Open the door! Hurry! Yes! Quick, Jill! Can you go? I'm holding the door for you, Father. Look out! Oh, wait! I'm almost there. Hey! John, there's a gannet above you. He's driving. It's Linklater Times 2, Tuesdays on CBS Radio. That's right. Tuesdays in the daytime, you enjoy a lively arc Linklater on House Party at its regular time. Then Tuesday nights on most of these same stations, Art is back again on People Are Funny. House Party in the daytime, People Are Funny in the evening. It's Linklater Times 2, Tuesdays on CBS Radio. Tomorrow... 
Your share of fun is waiting for you on both of these laugh-packed shows. And now, Act Two of The Bird, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall as John Waite. My wounds were fortunately not deep. Had the gannet struck, I would surely have been killed on my own doorstep. The other birds, black gulls, white gulls, and so forth, had pecked and torn, but they were as yet still inexperienced at attacking human beings. And so had done no very serious damage. My preparations had been most fortunate. Throughout the afternoon, the birds assailed the house without luck. And we sat in the kitchen and... Listen. We listened, and we watched Chippikins. The madness which had seized the other birds now was his, too. He glared at us with malevolent hatred in his tiny eyes, thrust his short, pointed beak at us through the golden bars of his cage, threw himself again and again at the little gate, hoping to break it down. Oh, I'm afraid for him. He'll hurt himself. Good. Poor little man, he can't help himself. He must have caught something from all those awful birds outside. Turn on the wireless. Let's have the wireless. I'll do it. Father. What? The school bus. Do you suppose it... Do you suppose the kids are all right? Oh. Yes, I wouldn't worry about it. I hope so, Chippy Kings. Do leave off that, darling. You'll hurt your little self. Yes, baby. The Mars here. Oh! Father, what happened? He bit me. Here, look at my finger. <laughs> oh, dear. I'll get the iodine. And you can leave off that, John Waite. As you said, Mother Dobbs, he can't help himself. I'm going upstairs and check things. Upstairs, it seemed worse. What worried me most were the bedroom fireplaces. They were quite close to the roof, and I could hear many birds which had made their way down the chimneys. Now, with only a thin plywood thickness between them and the interior of the house, they screamed and scratched at the wood. I reinforced whatever I could, particularly on the windows. For wood, I tore the bottoms from the bureau drawers, knocked the panels out of several closet doors, tore down shelves wherever I could find them. And then, deciding it would be too dangerous to hazard a night upstairs in separate rooms, I started carrying down armfuls of bedding to the kitchen. John, what on earth are you doing? I thought just for fun we'd sleep down here. Oh, you're carrying this game too far. How's your finger? Oh, be still. Here, Jill, help your mother. Right, old father. And Meg, uh, what's for supper, huh? I very glad for the cheese sandwiches. I had intended going to the market this afternoon. Oh? I'll go in the morning. Yes, yes, of course. When I finished moving things, I locked both bedroom doors. If they should break through the bedroom windows or fireplaces during the night, the doors would hold them for a while. And perhaps in their mad jamming of the rooms, they would smother. Perhaps they would die. At the landing, I piled as much furniture as I could made a solid wall of bureaus, tables, chests, mattresses, and so forth. Now, should they break through the doors, they would have this third barrier to assail. But by that time, it would be over, surely. I regarded my handiwork with some pride and wondered. Outside, I could hear the birds beating against the house. (laughs) 
Wings brushing the surface, sliding, scraping, sneaking away of entry. The sound of many bodies pressed together, shuffling on the sills. Now and again a thud, a crash, and some birds dived and fell. Many would kill themselves that way. But not enough. Never enough. John. Yes, Meg. There's to be another report in a moment. The man said so. Good. Yeah, eat your cheese sandwich. It's good. Mm, oh, thank you. This is London calling. A national emergency was proclaimed at four o'clock this afternoon. Measures are being taken to safeguard the lives and property of the population, but it must be understood that these are not easy to effect immediately, owing to the unforeseen and unparalleled nature of the present crisis. Unparalleled? Get him! Every householder must take precautions through his own building, and where several people live together, as in flats and apartments, they must unite to do the utmost they can to prevent entry. It is absolutely imperative that every individual stay indoors tonight, and that no one at all remain on the streets or roads or anywhere without doors. The birds, in vast numbers, are attacking anyone on sight, and have already begun an assault upon buildings. But these, with due care, should be impenetrable. The population is asked to remain calm and not to panic. Owing to the exceptional nature of the emergency, there will be no further transmission from any broadcasting station until 7 a.m. tomorrow. We had a gramophone. Father, could I have a gramophone for my birthday? Yes, sweetheart, a gramophone. You shall have the best that money can buy. Mother, did you hear that? Yes, Angel, I heard. Now, suppose we all go to bed, hmm? It's been a long day. Wait. Shh. What is it? It's planes. The RAF. Good old RAF. I wonder what they intend doing. What was that, I wonder? Oh. Probably a bomb of some sort. I wouldn't worry about it. Mm. Well, I must say, I feel better now. Mother Dobbs, mind you say goodnight to Chippikins. I'm not speaking to him, the ungrateful little wretch. That booming. I knew the sound. The sound of an exploding plane. And I remember tales of flyers who had blundered into flocks of geese and ducks. Bodies that splinter propellers and smash windshields. And what could pilots do against birds? Suicidal birds. But at least it showed that somewhere in the country they were trying. Somewhere in some small back room at this very moment they were thinking, working. And they would succeed. They had to. Had to. Had to. John! John, wake up. What? What is it? John, they're gone. Listen. What's the time? Ten o'clock. Ten? That means the tide has turned. It's on the ebb. I wonder... Meg, do you suppose it could be that they only attack with the flood tide? I don't know, dear. What are you going to do? Where's the flashlight? On the mantel. I'm going outside. Huh? Uh, uh, what, what's happening? The birds, they're gone, Mother. Not gone, you say? Yes, John's going to have a look about. Oh, don't you do it. And why not? They're all out there waiting, Mother. Waiting all around the door silently for you to open it. John, do you suppose that... Well, there's one way to find out. It was 
a scene of such violent death as few men have witnessed. All about me, wherever I threw the torch, lay their bodies, drifted as snow drifts, as sand drifts, their eyes bright in death, twinkling in unwinking points of fire. It was silent, so silent, yet I had the feeling that out there, somewhere, there was life. There was a shovel near the door, and I put it to use. First, I cleared a path from the door to the side of the house, and there I flashed my torch up. Every pane of glass had been smashed. The jagged edges flashed back my light. Many had birds impaled on them. Beyond, I saw the boards. They looked roughened and strange. There were flecks and streaks of blood on the boards and a fine crisscross of splinters where the thousands upon thousands of bills had driven again and again into the wood. I shoveled the birds up against the windows and jammed them with my hands into the broken panes. Piled them on the sills and the cracks. A futile gesture. With the flood tide, another wave of assaulters would come and drive through these. But it would take time. And we needed time. John, what are we going to do now? I ought to go over to the farmers. They've got food there and wood. I need more wood. Well, you're not to go. I won't let you go. I'll not be left here alone, John. All right, Meg. I'll wait until morning, until the next ebb tide. Sorry. I understand you. John, what's that? Where? On the hill. See? Fire. Fire. It was just next to the spot where I'd spoken to the farmer as he drove his tractor. How long ago? Two days? Two months? On the same little hillside. One of the planes, Meg. Come on, let's, uh, let's go back to bed. The second attack was much worse. There was something different about it, something I found difficult to analyze. And while I was thinking about it, I watched the canary. He too had been quiet during the low, but now he stormed and raged again, beat at the bars of his cage. And I thought of the birds in cages all over the world. Parrots, lovebirds. Peacocks, yes, and ostriches. What of the ostriches? and the great red flamingos and the big swans in the parks with their powerful wings and beaks. Father, what's that noise? Noise? From the chimney. I don't know. Let's see. Hmm? Sounds like... Sounds like they're trying to get at us through this chimney. We've got the fire. Get too low. John, do something. Here, give me that can of paraffin oil. Now then, everybody stand back. Careful. Back. This will tear them out. Yeah, that's got it. Jill, you keep the fire up. Don't spare the wood. All right, Father. I'll start the promise. We'll have some cocoa. Good idea. Shall I check and see what's happening upstairs? No, Jill. You watch the fire. Keep it blazing. Poor Chippikins. Now what? He's hurt his wing against the bars. Has he really? Silly looking man. Mama warned you. <laughs> At the head of the stairs, I pushed the barricade aside and listened at the bedroom doors. They'd broken in, and I could hear them screaming and scratching at the thin doors. And with the scratching, I became conscious of a new sound. It sounded like talons. Could the hawks have taken over what the gulls had failed to do? The hawks. The birds of prey. Buzzards. Kestrels, falcons. I'd forgotten the birds of prey. And as I listened, I could hear the soft patter of thousands of feet across the floors of the bedroom and the sounds of talons, of splintering wood. I rebuilt the barricade, descended into the kitchen. 
The others have not yet noticed that soft patter just above our heads. I pray that they would not. Outside, the birds continue to dash against the ground, against the walls. Those were the herring girls, the suicide boys, kamikaze fighters. They had no brains. The blackbacks were something different. They knew what they were doing. So did the buzzards, the hawks. I thought of the things to do in the morning. There were so many things we needed to withstand siege. A car. If I could hire a car between the tides and use it to carry things. Food. Oil for the stove. Lumber and nails. Sheets of metal for the windows. Oh, so many things. I wondered. And worried. And dozed. John, it's sudden. Don't you want to hear what the wireless has to say? Yes. It's 20 after. I can't understand it. Don't touch the knob. Leave it on the home station. I thought if I just jiggled it a bit. No, no, they've made a mistake. They meant they'd go on at eight, not seven. Oh, well, that must be it. Ten after eight, John. Maybe it's broken. No, I've checked that. It's working all right. Birds are letting up. Shh. I thought I heard something. No, 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 nothing yet. Oh, nine o'clock's past. There's nothing on the wireless. Nothing. I know. What does it mean, John? Don't you see? Not even the short wave. Not even the cold things. No. Birds are gone. Look at Chippikins sleeping. Sure is someone, somewhere in the world. Some one of the countless transmitters. Shall we open the door? Yes, there's a lot to do before the next flood tide. This is America's 10th Farm Safety Week, proclaimed by the President, supported by all agricultural organizations. The occasion is far more than academic interest to non-farms, too. Every farm accident that cuts production affects supply and prices. This week, on the farm and off, in all farm-connected industries, check your equipment and habits for safety first. One billion dollars a year is lost from farm accidents. Eliminate falls, fires, and equipment failure accidents. Live to farm as you farm to live. We now pause for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now we return to the Summer Theater as the curtain rises on Act Three of The Bird, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall as John Waite. A single brief glimpse through the open door was enough. I slammed it and paused to consider this new dilemma. The birds were out there, silent and watchful, waiting, 
Not a single one flew. They stood across the yard and in the fields, perched on the fence and on bushes and in the trees, all silent, watchful, and waiting. What are we going to do? I don't know. They didn't move, just like chippikins, every one of them. Yes. Here, chippikins. Here's my finger, see? Go on, take a bite. He won't move. Is he asleep? No. No, he seems drugged. Or exhausted. What are you doing? Look at them. They're just sitting there. Here, give me that book. There. It's like they're all hypnotized. I'm going to the farm. Then you'd better take me. Me too, Father, please. All right. I guess we better all go. There'll be things to carry. Bundle up warm now. It's a bit of cold out there. We went by way of the field. I didn't want to risk the road. It was a strange gray day. Funereal. And the birds all about us. Black and silent and waiting. These were the land birds. Out on the bay, I saw the endless gray carpet of seabirds riding the soft swells of the ebb tide and waiting. Well, there it is. Oh, they did have a time of it. Yes. John, hadn't you better go in alone? Yes. Yes, I think you three had better wait here. I want to go with you. No. I want you to stay and take care of your mother. Look, John, the cows are unharmed. And the sheep. I guess it wasn't them the birds were after. The poor thing, she wants milking. Good idea. There are some buckets over there in the shed, Joe. You and Mother Dobbs milk some of the cows. And I'll come with you, John. You sure you want to? Yes. All right. Here in the yard, the birds sat motionless, watching... And on the roof of the house, and in the trees, and on the sills of the broken windows. Sprawled near the back door, I found the farmer's body. Inside, the place was a shambles. But the lard in the storeroom was intact, and we took sacks of flour, and a tub of butter, and sugar, and tinned meats. Supplies for, for a siege. Upstairs, sprawled by the telephone, was the farmer's wife. I, I want to try the wireless. Oh, it's no use. Here, carry these things out of the car. We have much time, you know. We're taking their car? Yes. Is it right? Call it a neighborly loan, if you like. We'll need more oil for the stove. Yes, I'll get it. Come on, Meg, we have work to do. The farmer had been planning to build a new silo and stacked in the barn were large sheets of galvanized iron. I found snips too and a keg of nails. I was racing against time. The second trip I made alone. This time I was in search of lumber, hardwood. I tore up the flooring in the hall of the farmhouse. There was a bale of barbed wire. I tied it to the back of the car. And as a final, futile gesture, I went upstairs to the telephone. Oh, block that. One last look round. It was growing late. And the final gesture. Man lives not by bread alone. I took their gramophone. As 
As I came down the little lane to our door, I glanced out to sea and my heart stood still. I couldn't believe my eyes. There were ships there. Great battleships, three of them. The Royal Navy. Throughout the proud history of this isle. In time of crisis. No, I was wrong. The Navy was not there. The gulls were rising from the sea. The tide was turning. Help me quickly, it's time. All right. Come on, dear, mother. Quickly, we'll have to leave the rest. Yes, hurry, in the house. The gramophone. No, not now. It'll only take a minute. Help her. Oh, here then. You take the records. Come on, they're coming. What? That sound upstairs. They're in. Oh. I'm going to build a barricade at the foot of the stairs. Can you do it in time? I've got to. And and at the door. The sound is different there somehow. Don't worry about it. All right, dear. Mr. Chippikins, you're an evil little man. Father. What? These are all Harry Lauder. Really? Every single one. Well, now, Jay. He may seem a little old-fashioned to you, but your father and I used to find him quite entertaining when we were courting. Did you really? There was a soft scratching at the windows. This didn't bother me. Those were the small birds. But at the door were the hawks. There, I would put up sheets of metal, but that meant nails, and the nails were in the car. Still, I had the snips. Oh, there were so many things to do. Fortifications to erect. A plan of defense to follow. I have done all I can until the next ebb tide. The barbed wire stands in the hall. I intend to nail it across the outside of the windows. I don't think they will be able to get through that. And the galvanized metal is cut to, to size. And when I get the nails, I will put it up. I am becoming distressed about the main door. The falcons, the hawks, the birds of prey continue to dig at it. But if we can but survive this phase of the attack, we may make out. We have food and fuel for a week. But with each new attack, they grow more intelligent. Their numbers are increasing steadily. When will it end? How will it end? And as I sit here staring at the pages that I have written, I cannot help wondering why. Why the Almighty has decreed that this is to be the end. Is this the entire manuscript, Jenkins? Yes, sir. That's all there is. Well, you're our editor. What do you make of it? I'm not quite sure, sir. I wish I could talk with the author about it, but as I told you, the story was submitted with no address. I, I haven't been able to find a trace of John Waite. Undoubtedly, he's one of those curious, shabby fellows who live in squalor and great prophetic visions. You know the sort. That's it, sir. What? Prophetic that's what the story is. Almost a warning. Oh? In what way, Jenkins? Well, sir, I think it has to do with nature and her system of checks and balances. You see, 
what he's saying is that a man with his ever-recurring wars, his new weapons of destruction, threatens to destroy not only himself, but all forms of life. And nature might find a way to prevent this. By wiping out man, you mean? Getting rid of him? Yes, sir. Nature, or the Almighty, call it what you will, just isn't going to allow all life to come to an end. And so, through the birds, it will quite simply take care of the situation. Hmm. Yes, Jenkins. Perhaps that's it. Perhaps. Who knows? <laughs> And now, once again, here is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. You know, Don, it was a pleasure doing a story as odd as the bird, even though I do think you billed me incorrectly. Mm, what do you mean, Bart? Well, after all, I was scarce of the star of the piece when you considered the gulls and the gannets. Villains that they were, they ran the whole show. Well, I suppose you're right, Bart, but after all, we uh, couldn't bill a bird... Bill the bird, indeed. <laughs> oh, you made me say it, Bart, but seriously, you still like birds, don't you? Oh, of course I do. But now I understand something I never did before. Hmm? What's that? You remember during the war we had airplane spotters, men and women, too, who spent hours scanning the skies on watch for the enemy? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, tonight I think I've at last discovered what bird watchers are for. <laughs> <laughs> well, I give up. But anyway, thank you, Herbert Marshall, for being with us tonight. It was a great pleasure. Good night, everybody. Tonight, you have heard Daphne du Maurier's terrifying tale, The Birds, especially adapted for the summer theater by James Pohl and starring Mr. Herbert Marshall. Featured in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson as Meg, Gloria Gordon as Dobbs, Betty Harford as Jill, Herb Butterfield as the publisher, William Johnstone as the editor, Tudor Owen as the shopkeeper, Ben Wright and Alistair Duncan as BBC announcers. Our producer-director is Fred McCoy. Herbert Marshall may shortly be seen in Riders to the Stars, a United Artists release. And now, this is your host, Don Wilson, reminding you to be with us again next week at the same time when the Summer Theater will present One Foot in Heaven by Hartzell Spence and our star will be Mr. Dana Andrews. This is the CBS Radio Network. Nighttime, the hushed voice and the prowling step, the stir of nerves at the ticking of the clock, the rescue that might be too late, the crime that is almost committed, mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventures. We invite you to enjoy stories that keep you in suspense.
Can a man stake his life against $25,000? Can another and cleverer man track him down like a hunter, stalking his prey and kill him within five hours? Can you make a bet with death and win? For suspense, tonight we present Will You Make a Bet with Death by John Dixon Carr. Pony Island on a summer day. There's the beach, bright colored with bathing suits. There's the boardwalk, all straw hats and summer dresses. There's the Ferris wheel and the roller coasters. There is all humanity eating hot dogs and having a good time. And over there, beyond that souvenir shop, is the haunted mill. You get into a little boat. You float through a narrow tunnel into the dark while witches scream. But that fools nobody, does it? There couldn't be any real terror. Could there? While the bands are playing and the crowd goes by and... A unique attraction. It hurts me to see you stand there and miss this. Only ten cents, one dime, the tenth part of a dollar to go through the old haunted mill and get the thrill of your life. An overstatement, if you ask me. One ticket, please. Did you say one ticket, lady? That's right, one ticket. What's the thrill? A big pardon, lady. I said, what's the thrill? Lady, the gals who come here with their boyfriends don't have to ask that. Ten cents, please, this way and mind the gate. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. Get your ticket for the old haunted meal where ghosts will walk and call to... Give me some tickets. Uh, Hurry. Just a minute, young fella. I know you want to get into the old haunted meal, but there's plenty of time. How many tickets? I don't know. You better give me ten. Ten tickets? Do you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? Here's a young fella who likes the old haunted meal so much, he buys ten tickets. Don't call everybody's attention. Listen, I've got a better idea. Whatever boat comes after mine, yeah, I'll give you an extra dollar to send that boat through empty. Now, what's the matter, son? Are the cops I ain't after you, are they? No, 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 no. It's nothing like that. Will you do it? Well, money talks, young fellow. Okay, go ahead. Isn't there an empty boat here? Well, really? You've got such a great objection to riding in the same boat with me? Oh, I... I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean that at all. Don't misunderstand. Then you'd better get in if you want to go. This boat's starting to move. <laughs> Yeah, I, I... I better sit down. You certainly had. Look here, I, I... I want to apologize. That's quite unnecessary. This place is rather childish anyway, isn't it? Yes. Isn't it? But I've seen everything else, so I may as well see this. Here we go in the dark. <laughs> oh, what was that? Uh, one of the ghosts, I imagine. From a machine. It sounded like him laughing. There isn't anybody in the boat behind us, is there? Oh, I can't see. It's pitch dark. Listen, Miss... Uh, uh, Miss... My name is Andrews, Betty Andrews. If it's customary to exchange names in a place like this. Mine's Pendrel. Bob Pendrel. Did you say Pendrel? Yes. Do you know it? Oh, no, no, not exactly. It's, it's an unusual name, that's all. I... I don't want you to think I'm out of my mind. Though I very nearly am. But I've got five hours to go. Just five hours. At the end of that time, either I'll have won $25,000 or, or else... Or else? Or else I'll be dead. <laughs> you know, I wish I'd kept you away from this boat. Well, there's nothing to get alarmed about. For you. I can't tell you much, but I had to tell somebody that or I'd have started yelling. There's just one other thing. Is there? In these places, they've usually got little dim-lighted rooms along the way. Yes, Exhibits. and things. Yes. Well... When we come to one, I'm going to get out of this boat and hide there. Just don't get alarmed, and don't tell anybody when you go out. Why should you do that? I think I see a light ahead. Well, there is a light, but... Dim, too. That's all for the good. It's... Yes? We're coming around the corner. Look, I'm going to have company when I get off. A waxed dead man on a pile of straw. <laughs> oh, I hope I can stand these noises. Goodbye, Betty Andrews. I wish we'd met at a different time. Mind the boat. Here, what are you doing? Getting out, too. Don't be an idiot. What's the idea? You need looking after, Mr. Pendrel. And if we must hide, I suppose this is as good a place as any. I won't have it. Quick, quick. There'll be more boats along. Over behind that dead man on the straw. He'll hide us. Hurry. Well, 
Now, Mr. Pendrell, in the queerest place I ever get into, please tell me what this is all about. I can't tell you. You said it yourself. If you don't tell somebody, you'll go crazy. <sighs> Maybe you're right. It's against the strict terms of the bet. But this is the last day. And I tell you, I can't hold out any longer. Lower your voice, lower your voice. There's a boat coming. I wonder... I wonder if you ever heard of my stepfather, John Destry. Yes. I imagine everybody has. He's a millionaire and... And I'm not. I'm just a chemist. An analytical chemist. Not very successful. So if I'd had time, if I'd had money... I might have worked out a process that would have... Well, I think it would have helped in the war. But he's got money. Yes, he's got money. Well, my mother died years ago. This, this Destry's a, a big, white-haired, fine-looking fellow. You'd think butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. He's got an apartment in the East 60s. Secretary, I never met her. Valet, cook, that kind of thing. Well, he used to invite me there. I wouldn't go. Then he got hold of a book I had to have. A German work on chemicals. So I went. After dinner in that study of his, over the brandy. <laughs> oh, my dear Robert. You're quite welcome to the book. Don't mention it. Oh, uh, what do you think of this brandy, by the way? <laughs> it's excellent, thanks. Yes, yes, I thought you'd like it. And now that we're all relaxed, comfortable after dinner, tell me something. Yes, Mr. Destry? You hate me, don't you? <laughs> Frankly, I do. And always have. Good, good. <laughs> then you'll be relieved to hear I've always felt the same about you. <laughs> but tell me something else. Did you ever know me to break my word... No, I never did. I'll give you that. I asked you, Robert, because uh, I want to make a little bet with you. That is, uh, if you have the nerve, which I doubt. Well, I'm afraid I can't afford to make bets. Uh, you were always careless with money, Robert. <laughs> well, I've been thrifty. I saw that when your mother was alive. But you can afford to make this bet. Look here, in my desk. Well? $25,000, Robert. $25,000 in five $100 bills. And what would I have to bet against that? Your life. What? My life? There's the money in the drawer. Look at it. What wouldn't you give for that money? What wouldn't you give to have it for this precious work of yours that you're so fond of <laughs> and that you've failed in miserably? So far I've failed, yes. Oh, I've had a fairly good life as lives go. My heart isn't as good as it might be, but the doctors say I've... I'll last a little while yet. But before I go, there's one pleasure, one little exquisite thrill for me to experience. I want to commit a murder. Yes, I said a murder. My bet is that I can kill you within six months... And that you can't stop me. And that I'll never be punished for it. What do you say? Yes or no? I believe you mean that. Of course I mean it. And just how would you propose to kill me? Ah, that would be telling. You know, if I had time to think this thing over... There's no thinking it over. Now. Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> you must need the money badly, Robert. I do need it. But oddly enough, Mr. Destry, that isn't why I'm doing this. No? No. I want to show you you can't play the Lord Almighty and get away with it. Are you challenging me? Yes. You don't think I can do it? I know you can't. I, uh, we, we mustn't get excited, Robert. Uh, there will be conditions to the bet, you understand? What conditions? First of all, you'll never mention this matter to anyone. All right. That seems fair enough. You'll remain within the city limits of New York for six months. You'll spend at least one hour of every day walking the open streets alone. All right. 
You'll spend at least one hour every evening in your own room. Alone. I may come to see you, or, uh... <laughs> I may not. Hmm. Trying to scare me already, are you? Finally, you'll write out a little note and give it to me. There's pen and paper on the desk in front of you. Write it now. Let's hear what I have to write before I do anything like that. You will write... I am a failure. You can't stop harping on that, can you? I am a failure. And this was the only way out. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. A suicide note? Yes. I intend to use it when I, uh... <laughs> operate. And if I won't write it? Ooh. Then there's no bet. All right, I'll do it. Hmm. It's now, uh... Let's see, nine o'clock on the night of January the 10th. If you're alive and not in a madhouse... Does that go into the bargain, too? Yes. At nine o'clock on the night of June 10th, given those conditions, you will receive $25,000. Can't you hear the dice rattle, Robert? <laughs> you're playing with death now. I know it. Uh, aren't you going to finish your brandy? No, thank you. Oh, then uh, pour it back into the decanter. You heard me. Pour it back into the decanter. If you were as careful as I am, you, uh, you wouldn't be where you are now. That's right. Always be thrifty. I can promise you, by the way, that you'll always be perfectly safe as long as you're in this apartment. But that's the only concession I make. Oh, I notice your hands are steady uh, at the moment. I wonder what they'll be like a month from now. <laughs> so you were fool enough to make a bet with John Destry. Listen, Betty. I want to tell you what else happened the same night. I got on a Fifth Avenue bus and started to look through that book that Destry gave me. It was a book that I wanted about poisons. Well, just as I opened it, I felt something sharp prick my fingers. I looked down, and my hands were covered with blood. He had sewn safety razor blades in a line down the inside edge of the cover. Oh, no. Yeah. A little white card fell out of the book, and I read it. It said... See how easy it is to take you off guard? Those razor blades aren't poisoned, but they might have been. Take warning. Oh. Betty, that was six months ago. Six months less five hours of careful, refined torture. And now, I've got only five hours to go. What's he done in the meantime? Nothing. Nothing? I don't understand. Nothing at all. That's the cleverness of it. He's left me waiting, waiting, waiting. Expecting something. Expecting it every hour of the day or night. Once at the laboratory where I work, I opened a box that I thought was from a chemical supply house. And the Mexican tarantula, one of those furry spiders about as big as your fist, oh, no. ran out across my hand. Oh. It was a toy tarantula. He enclosed a card, asking whether I didn't admire it. Bob, this can't go on. I used to think I didn't have a nerve in my body. I could hold a test tube at arm's length absolutely steady for minutes at a time. Now look at me. Don't, please, don't. But the waiting's almost over now. Walking the streets, wondering who's behind you. Sitting alone at night, listening for every step on the stair. He's got very little time left now, and he's got to do something. The question is, what's he going to do? Oh, well, maybe he doesn't mean it. Maybe, maybe he's only doing it to scare you. And lose all that money... Oh, you don't know my stepfather. Listen. Huh? I... I don't hear anything. That's just it. There's no sound of running water. The boats have stopped. Then we're all by ourselves in here. All with him. Yes. Oh, Lord, how I wish I hadn't gotten you into this. Oh, I'm all right. Uh, or at least I think I am. I thought I saw him in the crowd outside, but I couldn't be sure. I, I'm seeing him everywhere. Now, Bob, just a minute. 
Just tell me one more thing. Did you ever see Mr. Destry, I mean face to face, after that first night? Oh, many times. He came to see you? He came to my laboratory once, yes, but mostly I went to see him. And why? Because it was the only place in the world I could feel safe. He's promised that nothing should happen to you while you were in his apartment. Don't you see? It was part of the torture. Night after night he'd invite me. And I'd go. Right up until last night. Last night. We were in that study of his. With the devil masks on the walls. And he was sitting behind the big mahogany desk. My dear Robert, I'm pleased and uh, even touched to have you here on the last night before you, uh, uh, before you... uh... Why don't you say die and get it over with? Oh, well, let's not say die. No? (laughs) The clergy contend that we never die. We only change. Now let that be a consolation for you. Uh, Must you be going so early? There's that one hour at home rule to our bet, if you remember. I remember. (laughs) You're keeping to the rule. Yes, and I mean to beat you at this if it's the last thing I ever do. The last thing I ever do. (laughs) That's an unfortunate choice of phrase, Robert. (laughs) My boy, you haven't a chance. Something's going to happen to you within the next 24 hours when you least expect it. Will you answer me one question? If I choose. Have you decided... How you mean to kill me? I decided that six months ago. And you still think you can get away with it? It's a method which has never been known to fail. I give you my word of honor on that. Is it... Is it... Sudden? Yes. uh, And no. (laughs) Wouldn't you like to know what it is? Good night, Mr. Destry. I... I think I'd better be leaving. No, no, my dear boy. You mustn't go yet. Sit down. Uh, Pour yourself a glass of brandy. No, thanks. Uh, Then perhaps you wouldn't mind pouring me a little. Uh, My doctor allows brandy, though I'm forbidden spirits. (laughs) Uh, I I notice your hands are shaking uh, quite a good deal. They weren't like that six months ago, were they? (laughs) No, no. You were full of confidence then. Oh. (laughs) And it grieves me to see you waste tobacco by lighting a cigarette and putting it out immediately. Oh, it's no use lying to you. But I'm going to beat you just the same. You wouldn't like to back out now? After what I've been through? You'd still have your life. I'll keep it, thanks. Mm, That's very unwise of you, Robert. Still, you must decide. Oh, I was expecting my secretary a little later to dictate some letters. But now, um, I think I'll leave her a message that I've gone to bed and uh, turn in myself. Tomorrow is likely to prove an interesting day for both of us. Here's your hat, here's your briefcase, and let me wish you a fond, peaceful, and happy good night. <laughs> That was last night, Betty. I saw I had five hours to go. It's less than four hours now. If I can keep away from the old devil until nine o'clock. I wish those boats would start running again. Why? Because it's almost as spooky in here as a real old mill. I know. Even that wax dummy on the straw. Any minute now, You're I... expecting to see him move? So am I. Now, don't stand up. It doesn't matter. If the boats aren't running, we can hear anybody who comes along. I hope so. Do you think Destry's got in? Bobby can't have got in. He can't even be here. Why not? Because Mr. Destry told me... Mr. Destry told you? I'm his secretary. <laughs> you know, Betty Andrews, I'm sorry it was you who did this. Did what? You can't guess, can you? Oh, Bob, I didn't come here to trap you or spy on you. If that's what you're thinking, I swear I didn't. No. You only got me to tell you the whole story and lose my bet. I haven't heard a single word you said... 
Bob, please believe that. He didn't send you here, of course. No, no. And of course you never saw me at his apartment last night. No, I swear I didn't. I got there late. He'd gone to bed. I didn't even take off my hat or gloves before I left again. Don't you understand, Bob? I hate him, too. I want to see you beat him. You've got to beat him. You mean that? Look at me and see if I mean it. Betty, I almost believe you. You must believe me. And... Anything else? We better hide behind that dead man, hurry. Those boats have started up again. I wish I could tell you, Betty, what that means to me. Come on, come on, hurry. Wait a minute, you two. But stay just where you are. Where's that voice coming from? Along the tunnel, I think. But it's not Destry's voice. No, it's a man standing up at a boat. He's coming around the corner. I can see him now. Hurry. The old haunted mill, eh? My golly, if this ain't some place to make a pinch, I never heard of one. What do you mean? Make a pinch. Just what I said. Your name Robert Penrill? Yes. Who are you and what do you want? Police headquarters. You're here to come along with me. I want to see you over in New York. About what? I wouldn't know, lady. But it might be about the murder of John Destry. Oh, no! Did you say the murder of John Destry? That's right. Somebody poisoned him last night with mercury cyanide. I wouldn't have got you at all, maybe, if the barker outside there hadn't thought the cops were after you to start with. Betty. Yes, Bob? He's beaten me. He hasn't beaten you. Oh, yes, he has. And I know now the weapon Destry was going to use in killing me. What weapon? It never fails. The electric chair. You mustn't talk like that. Don't you see? He never once intended to kill me in the way I thought. Are you coming quietly, Mr. Pendle? Just a minute. He's poisoned himself. But he's left evidence to show I did it. He's killing me the worst way possible. He's won the bet. The money doesn't matter now. If I'm in the death house for murder, what use have I got for all the money in the world? Andrew, let me introduce myself. My name's Mullen, Inspector Mullen. It's a pleasure to meet you, Inspector. It's a pleasure to be safe again. I've had you brought here to my office for a little quiet talk. You're in a jam, son, and I want you to realize how bad it is. You think I don't realize it? John Destry was poisoned with mercury cyanide administered in a glass of brandy. And only my fingerprints were on the glass besides his own. I can guess. Mr. Destry's body was found this morning lying behind the desk in the study. There was an empty glass with traces of brandy and cyanide. Now, we haven't had the full autopsy report, but the smell of that stuff is pretty distinctive. They tell me uh, you're a chemist, Mr. Penderl. That's right. The boys find that eight grains of mercury cyanide are missing from your laboratory. Where he visited me a month ago. And in your briefcase, which you took away from his apartment last night... He handed it to me. I remember. We found over a thousand dollars in cash. Now, take a look at this note. Did you ever see it before? Look. Yes. I wrote it. You admit that? Yes, yes, yes. It says... I was a failure, and this was the only way out. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. Where did you find it? Torn up in little bits. You started to write a confession, and then you couldn't face the consequences. But you shouldn't have left the pieces behind. You're infinite, my boy. Unless... Unless what? Now, if you'd like to confess here and now, and maybe we did a little deal about second-degree murder, Oh, why... Inspector, why bother to string me along? How do you mean, string you along? There's no second-degree murder on a poison charge. It's the death house or nothing. He saw to that. It's too bad you had to go and kill him, son. Didn't you know he had an aneurysm? A what? Fatal heart disease. He said that he had heart trouble, but... Heart trouble? His doctor says he couldn't have lived eight or ten months anyway. And you might have got something in the will. So that's why he did it. Did what? Killed himself. You still stick to that crazy story you told the boy? He's going to kill me, isn't he? With 3,000 volts of electricity. Inspector Mullen. What are you doing here, Sergeant? Didn't I say I wasn't to be disturbed? All the same, Inspector. I thought I'd better do it. 
There's a young lady here, a Miss Betty Andrews. I think you'd better see her. I'll see her when I'm good and ready. And I think you'd better see her, Inspector. We've just heard from Mr. Destry's lawyer. Well? He said that that young fellow there, Mr. Pendrell, inherits 25,000 bucks in Mr. Destry's new will. Did you hear that, son? Do you see what you'd have gotten if you hadn't gone and killed him? He was keeping his promise, that's all. A fine lot of good it'll do me now. But look, Inspector, I've just talked to the medical examiner, and he says there's no poison in Mr. Destry's body. Say that again? There's no poison in the old man's body. Somebody's kidding you. An empty glass with the smell of mercury cyanide and a dead man with a congested face behind the mask? What did kill him, then? Well, if you'd like to listen to Miss Andrews, Inspector, she's right here now. I think you'd better listen, Inspector. I've been trying to tell you all afternoon. Go ahead, Miss Andrews. I've been over and over it. But until they got the medical report, nobody would listen. Can you tell us what killed John Destry? Yes. Poison killed him. But the sergeant's just been saying there was no poison in the body. Inspector, will you listen? I was at Mr. Destry's apartment late last night. Well, so what? Uh, You didn't kill him, did you? The servant said he'd gone to bed. So I looked into the study to see if there were any instructions. Was Mr. Destry dead then? I don't know. I couldn't see his body because it was hidden behind the desk. I didn't even learn he was dead until late this afternoon. But I did see a full glass of brandy. Uh, A full glass, did you say? Yes. So I picked up the glass and poured the brandy back into the decanter. That's what he always made us do. And I didn't leave any fingerprints because I was still wearing my gloves. And... That was the same glass you later found empty. But you still are not telling us what was the poison that killed John Destry. It was the poison in his own system. He worked out this plot to convict Bob Pendrel. Only just as he stretched out his hand to drink the cyanide... Inspector, I think I see it. It was his last great hour. He couldn't resist such gloating as he'd never known before. That's it. His heart wouldn't stand it. And he fell dead behind the desk. And I think, if you study the expression on his face... You'll find he died laughing. And so ends Will You Make a Bet with Death? Tonight's story of Suspense. The part of Bob Pendrell was played by Michael Fitzmorris. Betty was played by Leslie Woods. John Destry was played by Nicholas Joy. And in supporting roles were Ted DeCorsia and Charles Slattery. Again next Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. A story dedicated to the thrill of the nighttime. The hushed voice and the prowling step. Another adventure in... Suspense. William Spear, the producer. Mark Loeb, the director in the absence of John Dietz. And John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on... Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.